you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. You are listening to the Stephen Avery series. This is episode 33, Overdoses. We will be going over uncanny coincidences and anomalies between the main players in this case. And it is so beyond mind shocking. I mean, we have left mind shocks all along the way in this series. We're now on episode 33, unbelievably. And we've just begun to scratch the surface of what goes down in Manitowoc County. These same individuals involved in all of these shady cases. Is it all coincidental? Now, the cognitive dissonant coincidence theorists, a.k.a. guilters, they maintain, they have their head stuck so far in the sand, they maintain everything is all legitimate. And all of these things are mere coincidences, despite the mathematic statistical chances that it's all mere coincidences rendered completely impossible. But coincidence theorists love their fairy tales. Because, of course... There can never be any corrupt individuals wearing government costumes. That's just an impossibility, right? <laughs> very, very silly indeed. But the mind shocks to come here surrounding drug issues, drug cases, are just beyond insane. If you haven't checked out the previous episodes in particularly, but basically the entire series, I will be referencing previous episodes, Remaker, doctors involved in the Carmen Bootwell fiasco, who again, coincidentally, just happens to look exactly like Teresa Hallback. And the coincidences are just beyond insane. Of course, we have Remaker, the one who technically worked the case on Carmen Bootwell's death. And ironically, ironically, Carmen Bootwell's mother is neighbor's of the dispatch woman who Coburn called in the plates. Andrew, Andy Coburn, of course, the one who was looking at Teresa Hallback's RAV4 license plate when he couldn't have been, and he shouldn't have been. <laughs> and if you follow the case, you know that fiasco. Among many fiascos in what is basically a circus of an investigation where nothing is above board. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Make sure you allow a device to have those notifications come through. Or you can just go to youtube.com slash mindchuck and manually check for updates and peruse our ever-growing back catalog. To keep awareness up in this case, these uh, wrongful convictions of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, and to find truth and justice for the victims of which if Teresa Hallback is one of them, of course, that's one of the most uh, controversial aspects of the case. Technically, there's no scientific evidence that stands up to any kind of logical scrutiny that Teresa Hallback is even dead. But if she is, she deserves justice, and these other individuals deserve justice as well. There's a lot of people apparently being murdered in Manitowoc County and cover-ups galore. And this has been going on for many decades. If you haven't checked out the episode Coincidence County, I go over a plethora of cases with wrongful convictions, shady investigations, all circling around the same individuals, coincidentally. All I'm sure are mere coincidence, just like everything else in the case. Hit the like button, share it across social media platforms, of which you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co podcaster requests. And you could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. So there's, again, a lot of similar individuals circling all of these issues here. So just a quick recap here from the inspiringdad.com on Carmen Bootwell. A long and overdue Carmen Bootwell update. This is, okay, it's long overdue, and there is some misinformation that I need to correct, and I want to help put some of the rumors going around about Carmen to rest. I'm going to make it short and sweet. Uh, 
This past summer, I had the pleasure of speaking with Carmen's mom and brother a couple of times, and they offered a lot of information to me and a couple of other people who are researching the case. They spoke to us freely and didn't hold anything back, although I don't know how he would know that. They weren't even aware that Carmen's name was being discussed in different theories. They wanted to set the record straight, and I'm going to do that. I'm not going to give out a lot of information. I'm not going to give out a lot of information because it is personal, and I just want to set the record straight on some of the bigger misconceptions and rumors that are out there. I also don't want to jeopardize any investigations. Okay, one, Carmen's mom and dad paid for her funeral and cremation. There were a lot of rumors going around saying that Manitowoc County paid for these services, but that is far from the truth. Carmen's dad did whatever he could to pay for his daughter's funeral. And I'm not sure exactly how accurate that is. So depending on which reports you read, apparently Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office assisted the family with funeral arrangements. Now, exactly what that means is unknown. Like, what did they facilitate and how? So the family technically paid for Bootwell's funeral, but apparently Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office told the family they should have her create cremated. This is really bizarre. They advised the family that an autopsy would be done immediately and that they would help with the arrangements for cremation. Arrangements. So they help with arrangements, whatever that means, financial or otherwise. So if it's not financial or if it's under the table or if it's some kind of hush money, how could this inspiring that individual or anybody take their words on blind faith? Now, again, I'm not saying they're lying. I'm saying if something shady is going on and money switched hands in a shady fashion, would people rush to disclose that? Either way, we have, of course, Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office employees involved with funeral homes, <laughs> these same circle of individuals. So the Pfeffer Funeral Home and Cremation Care Center is assisting the family with funeral arrangements. So did this uh, funeral home assist them in some capacity? Did they give them a break on prices and they did technically pay? How would all this done? Obviously, it wouldn't be done in a blade. Obviously, someone from Manitowoc isn't going to walk up to the door and, and give them an envelope full of cash. This would have to be done in a particular way. I mean, it's weird. The coincidence theorists claim that since it wasn't done all out in the open and reported, therefore, it wasn't done. <laughs> I mean, the cluelessness, it's just, it's incredible how some people do not understand that humans are capable of corruption. There are corrupt humans out there. Now, knowing which ones, of course, that's a separate matter. So this is, of course, the funeral home that's connected with Tom Kucerich, the sheriff at the time of Stephen Avery's original 1985 frame up for the assault of Penny Bernston. Again, same individuals involved. So Carmen's funeral is on November 8th, then she's cremated, and then m Bones magically found on Avery's property November 8th. So the funeral was 1 p.m. on the 8th, the Bones were found at 1.30 p.m. <laughs> Sifting started 3 p.m. Avery's arrested the following day, November 9th, Teresa Hallback's death certificate, November 10th. Just a very, very interesting dates, very, very interesting dates. The timeline here is just, I don't, I don't know what to make of it. It's just flat out mind shocking. And then of course, Carmen Bootwell apparently had a boyfriend or ex-boyfriend with connections to the DEA. Uh, this guy apparently escaped from jail at one point as well. And there were DEA connections with the bones being found with Jost on the Avery property. I mean, there's just too much insanity going on here. The coincidences are absolutely mind-shocking. And what's also interesting, apparently in the dispatch reports, Carmen Bootwell was found dead around 8 a.m. And then Andy Coburn was the one that uh, was sent to investigate. And of course, there, there's no proper notes on anything ever involving Andy Coburn. <laughs> Is he on vacation? Is he not on vacation? Did he have off? I mean, there's just no way to ever corroborate anything Andy Coburn is involved in. <laughs> 
And the next call Coburn makes in these uh, November 3rd calls is about the so-called suspect zipper. And we'll be getting into some mind-shocking zipper connections in a moment. So regarding the Inspiring Dad's post here, technically, if, uh, if her family paid, but these arrangements were apparent, there was Manitowoc County's suggestion on funeral home and cremation, which is quite strange. Why would... What place does do they have in telling a family how and where they should handle the death of their and funeral of their loved one? It's just really, really bizarre. So other points here. Carmen was a drug user, but she was not into hard drugs. Her drug of choice was marijuana and alcohol. She wasn't a junkie. Next point. Carmen was not pretending to be Teresa Hallback on Halloween or any time for that matter. There are theories floating around about Carmen posing as Teresa Hallback on October 31st because everybody knew Teresa was already dead, but they needed her to be alive in order to put her at Stephen's property that day. Carmen was at home or school during these key times on October 31st. Carmen was found by her grandmother the morning after her death, November 3rd. Carmen and her friend were hanging out the night before at Carmen's house. Her friend was still there in the morning when her grandmother went into the house and found Carmen unresponsive. So just going back to Coburn for a moment, all of this is going down. Coburn's calling anyone and everybody, including the license plate of Teresa Hallback. Carmen Bootwell happens to be dead. And then, of course, calls about Zipper. This is all going down at the same time. All mere coincidence, probably. Okay, Carmen's mom and brother offered a lot more information pertaining to Carmen, but I will not be publishing that information for a number of reasons. One thing I will say, there are a couple of oddities with the way the state handled this case and how long it took for Carmen to be cremated. Do I think the state used... Carmen to frame Stephen Avery, I'd say there's a chance. I don't know in what capacity, but there's a chance that somehow Carmen was used in the framing of Stephen Avery. Or everything could be a coincidence, and there's nothing further to see here. But I do know that Kathleen Zellner is fully aware of Carmen, and I'm sure she did her own investigation into it, but nobody knows if anything has come of it. Only time will tell. Again, I know this update is long overdue. I had it drafted, but I wanted to find the right time to post it. Okay. This post was originally posted October 6, 2016, and has been updated a couple of times. So, of course, the Carmen Bootwell situation, very, very dubious. And let's get into the more mind-shocking information here. And actually, one more point. Apparently, this was a methadone overdose, and it's, it's strange because... If this is not a hard drug user, or again, this could be parent or you know family members saying what they want to be true versus what it is true, but we do see this in any in in law enforcement cover-ups and conspiracies where there are suspect deaths and they try to make someone out to be more of a drug user than they actually are in order to attempt to sweep things under the rug. Of course, that's anybody who's not new to true crime obviously knows that that is done as well. So, let's uh, let's continue on here. The, these are compilations that I've dug up from various blogs and forums of peop of connections that people have uncovered. So, within... 30 days, we have Teresa Hallback, Carmen Bootwell, Christine Rudy, who I went over in the previous episode, who was killed 12 days after Hallback's reported missing, nine days after Carmen Bootwell, and we have yet another individual here connected to the case, Mark Lee Zipperer. Now, of course, I've gone over the zipperer situations and Teresa Hallback being spotted leaving Stephen Avery Salvage Yard, leaving his property and going elsewhere. Did she go to the zippers after she left Avery's and was this all covered up? Very possible. Now, the zipper connections have been quite, uh, quite a few. So we will go over some, uh, some theories here. Some people believe 
that all three of these individuals, Carmen Boudwell, Mark Lee Zipper, and Teresa Hallback, were confidential informants or had some kind of connection to confidential informants, all within the scope of Corruptua County, where nothing is above board, which is a very, I mean, being a confidential informant is dangerous anywhere, but how dangerous would it be in a place like Corruptawak? That's even more dangerous. Now, were they, all three of these individuals, were there connections to law enforcement that, ha for whatever reason, necessitated their termination, so to speak, and two of them were set up as a drug overdose, and then two birds, one stone situation, or three birds, one stone, possibly, Possibly four, if we if we bring in Christine Rudy and how the, her bones were handled. Again, if you haven't checked out the previous episode on Christine Rudy, make sure you check those out. And, uh, and previous episodes regarding the zippers. So what is going on here with the zippers? Someone posted a comment on light-candle.com. And this was uh, birthday wishes for Teresa Hallback in 2016. Someone posted this, they're titled Carmen's Ashes. Teresa Carmen Mootwell and you got all mixed up. Teresa, this is speaking to Teresa, Carmen Bootwell and you got all mixed up along with Mark Lee Zipper. And w there's a link here to the, uh, an article that I went over before regarding Remaker's comments on Carmen Bootwell's death, drug death, a painful memory. This article is in the Herald Times reporter. And, and there, in this article, there's a bunch of deaths relating to prescription drugs and all of these drug circles. I went over that on previous episodes. Now, the other link here is regarding the zipper death. Mark Lee Zipper died on November 29th, 2005, literally one block away from, guess where? Photography by Teresa. Teresa's photography studio. Literally one block away. Mark Lee Zipper, 28, of Green Bay died unexpectedly Tuesday, November 29, 2005, at his residence. Teresa Hallback disappeared less than 30 days prior. So, this zipper, of which Teresa Hallback may have visited after leaving Avery Salvage Yard, involved in the investigation, there's the zipper voicemail, all of that uh, hoopla, and, and shadiness that, of course, guilters want to just pretend doesn't exist. And it's just really bizarre how out of all the individuals that could die under suspicious circumstances, one block from Teresa Hallback's photography studio, it happens to be Mark Lee Zipper, and he's 28. So there's all these people in their 20s dying suspiciously. You have this strange comment on birthday wishes for those that have passed. It's just, it's it's really bizarre. It's really bizarre. Another comment posted by someone titled Teresa's Friends. May 21st, 2016, the same day as the previous comment. And they give a whole bunch of first names here. Talk to the press. Speak for Teresa. If only you could see the Calumet investigative report. You knew her better than a documentary or online sleuths. Come to Reddit. Help fill in the blanks. We have theories, but tell us about October 30th. The documentary is not disparaging Teresa's memory. It opened people's eyes about her loss. And then Ken Sweaty Kratz has a comment here. I never planted any evidence. I just watched. And, of course, we don't know if that's really him or not, <laughs> but you never know with Ken Kratz. Okay. Okay. So, this is really, really bizarre because how exactly did Mark L. Zipper die? So, Mark's father was fought, lived five miles south of Cuss Road. 
So, of course, in these out-of-the-box theories, if Teresa Halbach is somehow involved in drugs or some kind of confidential informant. Now, the coincidence theorists usually scoff. The cognitive dissonant coincidence theorists who are, I guess, too mentally weak to consider theories outside of their comfort level with the way they pretend their fairy tale reality works because they just can't handle it. But there are confidential informants out there. And there are corrupt law enforcement out there. What happens when they get mixed? It's just, it's really bizarre how many people just do not have the cognitive function to even theorize. I'm not alleging any of this is true. This is mind shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. But again, when we're looking coincidentally, these same areas, Cuss Road just keeps coming up. So these are ways, so... What was what were Teresa Halbach's exact travel coordinates? Of course, if you haven't checked out all of the Mind Shock episodes with the cell towers, make sure you check that out. We go over in detail how cell phone tower pings work and how and what could be tracked and the limitations of such and the time frames. So in these out-of-the-box theories we have, people are theorizing that Teresa Hallback might have left Stephen Avery's to drive to Cuss Road via County Road Q to meet Mark Lee Zipper, possibly for a drug transaction or to meet a mutual friend or associate of some kind. And for the people who think this is all impossible, let's go even further. Into mind shock land. So apparently, a relative of a DCI agent involved in the Teresa Hallback case lived on Cuss Road in 2005. Another DCI agent went undercover as an auto trader photographer. Does anyone want to guess what year? It was 2005. Early 2005, you cannot make this stuff up. So the DCI, of course, the Division of Criminal Investigation. For those that don't know, in Wisconsin, the Division of Criminal Investigation is charged with purely criminal investigative mission and function. The division employs special agents who are sworn law enforcement officers possessing statewide jurisdiction and charged with the responsibility of enforcing the laws of the state of Wisconsin. The division also has a cadre of digital criminal and investigative program analysts who support Wisconsin's law enforcement agencies. Finally, our administrative support personnel help the division be responsive to the citizens of Wisconsin and all of our criminal justice Partners, the DCI has a primary responsibility of investigating crimes that are statewide in nature or importance. DCI special agents and analysts work closely with the local, county, tribal, state, and federal officials to investigate and prosecute crimes involving homicide, arson, financial crimes, illegal gaming, multi-jurisdictional crimes, drug trafficking, computer crimes, homeland security, public integrity, and government corruption, as well as crimes against children. The division also performs special investigations requested by the governor of the legislature. In addition, the division provides extensive training to local, state, and federal officers on current issues in law enforcement. The division provides extensive training to local, state, and federal officers on current issues in law enforcement and performs special investigations requested by the governor or the legislature. And this is directly from doj.state.wi.us regarding what the DCI is and their function. So, for the clueless coincidence theorist guilters who think that even if Manitowoc were corrupt, the state would never be complicit in any way in helping them. So, two issues there. One, we have DCI agents on the ground in the area. One of them is a relative 
li living right on Cuss Road, the other, another DCI agent actually went undercover, not just for any business, but for Auto Trader, the exact magazine that Teresa Hallback happens to work for. All purely coincidental, probably, right? <laughs> I mean, you cannot make this stuff up. So if they're involved in some of the Manitoba corruption, now there's two options here. One, they're involved and they're helping cover up. Two, Maybe they're there investigating Corruptawak. And for whatever reason, they cannot proceed because of, again, these higher ups. We have Vogel. We have all of these corrupt individuals in the court system. Just how corrupt is not only Manitowoc, but the state of Wisconsin. And how much of the DCI would be corrupt. Now, again, we're not talking widespread corruption. We're talking about just a few individuals, but in various positions of power. So it might be tricky to take them all down, particularly if they have allies in certain areas. And who's pulling the strings here? Now, the FBI, it does seem less likely that the FBI would be complicit. But as we've gone over in all these laboratory evidentiary reports and such, the evidence is sent to F the FBI. The FBI does not verify where it came from. It's sent with a label. The FBI gives its report. The FBI has no reason to believe that all of these agencies are corrupt and all of these people submitting are corrupt, even if they are. So, continuing on here with these DCI issues. Now, across the street, so on Queso, page 518 is a mention of one of the DCI investigators on the case in the Appleton field office being one Michael Sass. And one of his relatives is actually living across the street from Leo Richmond on Cuss Road. Leo Richmond happens to be the guy that called in the tip to Queso about Teresa Hallback knocking on his door the night before, this would be November 4th, so he called in this tip on November 5th about the night before 11.30 p.m., Friday, November 4th. Leo said that Teresa was looking for a home in the area. Weigert apparently was not interested. He said he would call back later, but there's no follow-up report or mention of Weigert following up on this staggering report, this staggering tip. Someone saying Teresa Hallback knocked on their door and talked to them at 11.30 p.m. Friday, November 4th on Cuss Road. Okay, Weigert apparently dismisses this or it's erased or any kind of follow-up is completely erased. Coincidentally, right across the street from Leo is a close relative of Michael Sass, DCI agent. Now, how coincidental is that? How coincidental is that? Or at least at the time of the disappearance. Obviously, this is many years later. These individuals might not own these homes now. But at the time... At the time, and then of course, Cuss Road has been the subject of much speculation. There's been a lot of funny activity at Cuss Road, to put it lightly. To put it lightly. And is this all coincidental? Now, from people discussing this, apparently, they do not, they no longer own this house, but... At some point, whether it's the current owner or the current owner of several years ago, people going through public records, this is, of course, everything is public here. I don't discuss anybody not previously named. The current owner, apparently, is, guess who? Ken Kratz Mentor, the head of litigation for Wisconsin DCI. <laughs> Or a family member. That's their uh, their their last name. This is, of course, Doug Hag, who was the uh, head of litig of the litigation department for the Wisconsin DCI. So Ken Kratz's mentor was the head of the litigation department for the Wisconsin DCI. Doug Hag. Do people find that curious? There's a lot going on on Cuss Road. I mean, this is this might be the most mind shocking episode yet. The, the, the stack of coincidences and anomalies is just never ending. Out of all the people 
Now, for the coincidence theorists, they say, well, someone has to own it. Yes, indeed. Now go through all of the houses owned in all of in all of the area, and you won't find these other co you won't find coincidences like these. That's the whole point. So mathematically and statistically, it's quite interesting to say the least. And Ken Kratz's redacted emails that have since been released, he's actually still in constant contact with Doug Hag. And there are, I think, several Doug Hags with two A's. So theoretically, it's possible it's not the same guy, but... If it is, that would be quite curious, would it not? And of course, Ken Kratz did go to the Avery Salvage Yard to overlook the uh, so-called investigation, the planting, whatever you want to call it. Now, the plot thickens here because if this sighting of Teresa Hallback is legitimate, is it possible something happened to her then and at Cuss Road? And then all of these other narratives were spun to cover things up. And then, of course, so Redon's hunting cap is, run th is right there. The Cuss Road site is right there. Everything is going on right there. And with the individuals involved, it's quite curious. Quite curious indeed. Here's an interesting post from Reddit. Somewhere in all the readings about the case, a CI is involved. Auto trader-like magazines have always been a bookie's dream and no doubt a place to launder money for the drug trade. Some theories presented in TikTok Manitowoc have been that Teresa Hallback was working for the Justice Department. If Teresa Hallback had been discovered as being undercover, could that have caused the death of Cousin Carmen? You may not feel they look alike, but I see they could be sisters. Did a certain drug dealer give Carmen an extra heavy dose of heroin thinking she was Teresa Hallback? Now that is a mind-shocking theory we haven't discussed. That is absolutely mind-shocking. Did Teresa Hallback then become too hot for the Justice Department to continue to being an, oper being an operative in Manitowoc County, removed to go on assignment like in the Washington State area. The sheriff of Manitowoc County then makes the best of a bad thing. He uses Carmen's bones to set up Stephen Avery. He has her blood on file, just enough from a vial to make the SUV look like a crime happen. And if needed, Teresa Hallback would donate her blood so that it appeared she was dead to the cartels. Now, that is quite a mind-shocking theory that we have not gone over yet. Possibly the most mind-shocking of all. So, is it possible that Teresa Hallback was working for the Justice Department in some capacity? There was DCI agents involved. There's other CI agents involved. DCI agents involved. Something weird happened, and this is how they covered it up? I don't know. I don't know. Is that possible? Would that explain her family's attitude? And do, does her family even know? Would they even tell them? Would that be considered too dangerous or not? So here's an interesting write-up as well. Again, these are posted on forums, copy-pasted. I don't see sources here. Even conversations with Ken Kratz on Twitter and other individuals. So many things about her bothered me, so I dug. And what do you know, in 1995, a Kathy Williford pops up as a DOJ special agent named in an appeal. And if you try to search DOJ special agent Kathy Williford online, it all comes back to Kathy Williford with a K. Feel caught. So she's both with a C and with a K. And that name is semi-common. I mean, that's not the most original name. So it's tough. But some Twitter posts here. She worked for Auto Trader when she was a stay-at-home mom. Long after working for Wisconsin DCI, she worked for Milwaukee Narcotics, 94 to 97. If her footage is used in the eight-hour final cut, it will be pointed out. No need to point it out in a teaser. So these are statements from hers, DCI interview. Many years ago, before I had children, I was in law enforcement for a time. And then once the kids came along, I stayed home, raised both our children, and went back to work in the last five years full-time in the medical profession. I work in medical billing now. 
For about three and a half years, I worked mainly in narcotics enforcement in Milwaukee. A lot of those cases were, all of those cases were drug related, but I think there's a lot of training that goes along as far as being observant, interviewing people, reading people, and I think a lot of that comes into play and stays with you the rest of your life. In order to work in law enforcement, you have to become certified. So I was in certified law enforcement after getting out of college. When I stayed home to raise our children, the older one was in school and the younger one was starting kindergarten. And I just wanted to find a job that was part time that I could do a couple hours a week, a couple days a week, but still raise the children at home when they needed me. So I saw an ad in the paper for Auto Trader Magazine, and what I really liked about it was that I could set my own hours, I could work out of my house, take pictures of vehicles at my schedule. I think it was in and around December 2004, I started to work for Auto Trader, and I'd work one or two days a week and drive around the geographical area around Sheboygan, Wisconsin, taking pictures of cars that would go in the magazine for sale. I stayed with Auto Trader from about December 2004, I think, till around April 2005, and then I realized that I wasn't really making any money. Okay, so here's the other thing. For the, if there was some kind of undercover DCI component, would this be the statement that was made that, of course, denying any involvement if this is some kind of undercover position? And this was a post on TikTok. Manitowoc case of witness was most likely a DOJ special agent. Found it odd that Angela Shuster of Auto Trader said in her DCI interview, she thinks Williford works for the state of Wisconsin. And this, uh, so this is, so Kathy D. Williford was interviewed by investigator Mark Weiger. And this is uh, page 331, complaint number 05-0157-955. On January 4th, 2006, approximately 1,800 hours, I, Investigator Weigert of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, had telephone contact with Kathy Williford. My reason for contacting Kathy was that she was a photographer for Auto Trader Magazine prior to Teresa Hallback. Kathy states she started working for the Auto Trader Magazine on December 2nd, 2004, and worked until April 20th, 2005. So Kathy's being interviewed by Weigert in regards to her visit to Avery's. And it says here, McGrath then interviewed Angie Shuster, the manager of Auto Trader Magazine. McGrath inquired about any other photographers who had taken photos at the Avery property. Shuster believed that Kathy Williford, a former photographer for Auto Trader Magazine, had taken photos out there on one occasion. Williford had contacted Shuster after Hallback's disappearance and stated that she had been out to the Avery property and that Stephen Avery had invited her into the house. However, she declined. Shuster believes that Williford was employed with the state of Wisconsin. Interesting. And then, of course, Kathy is named in an appeal affirmation as a Wisconsin Department of Justice special agent in 1996. Of course, these are all public documents. So that's interesting. That's interesting. Especially, it seems like an out of the ordinary statement. So regard back to this TikTok Manitowoc post, I found it particularly odd a photographer with Auto Trader is suddenly jumping to the ranks of a state employee. Why wouldn't it be weird if she already was? Kathy Williford is in the new convicting a murderer trailer as the it could have been me sobbing moron. Turns out in 1995, a convicted felon's appeal was confirmed. The arresting officers in that case, some DOJ guy, some DOJ guy, and DOA special agent Kathy W. Name redacted, but you know who it is. However, this Kathy is with a C. The report has nothing to do with Avery. It was found during a search of a lawyer's news website for a case that was affirmed in 1996, and she was named in it. Any online search for Kathy links right back to the one in the documentary. So now, Deb Strauss's call on November 4th, almost a full day before the RAV4 is found, to Queso, offering her help to investigate Stephen because she is, quote, not a fan of that guy, end quote, Makes sense. DOJ set up all the way. A DOA agent takes photographs for Auto Trader, and after four months, she quits the job. Then, ten months later, Teresa, 
who had been to Williford's house. Williford, the only other auto trader employee to ever meet Teresa other than Shuster, ends up dead. And DOJ swarms the Avery property, but not before another DOJ special agent, Deb Strauss, calls Queso before any evidence is found and offers to help investigate. Kathy is documented in court files as being a DOJ special agent. I am sure there is an explanation of why she is an agent, then suddenly not when she steps on Avery's property. But the ball will be in DOJ's court to explain this. Which is more likely? She stopped being a law enforcement agent in her mid-30s and suddenly decided to take photographs of cars for about $8 to $18 per car, pictures in the middle of winter in an area documented by the manager of Auto Trader as not getting much business in the winter months, or she was employed by the DOJ visiting the property where the DOJ would be swarming 10 months later. I'd say it's more likely she was undercover as a photographer on the property to shoot surveillance photos in a way that didn't look suspicious at all. If Kathy Williford stepped on the Avery property on January 2005 as a DCI agent and Shuster confirms her employment, you have to ask why was a DOJ agent undercover with them and at Avery's? Surveillance? Plans for a later frame-up? DOJ would know the trailer and garage layout. Interesting. Very, very interesting. See, the other thing that, again, the cognitive dissonant coincidence theorist guilters say is they wouldn't go over, they wouldn't go through all this trouble just for Avery. But if we're looking at some a major corrupt walk exposure in all these other cases and wrongdoing, possibly some drug trafficking by police officers, if there's way more corruption going on, it's almost like Avery's uh, lawsuit was just, uh, it was most, more of a convenient reason to get rid of Avery while simultaneously sweeping all these other things under the rug that they would never want exposed. So it wasn't really just about Avery. And the other thing is, there were rumors early on, of course, that Stephen Avery knows some stuff. He knows some stuff. His family knows some stuff about how law enforcement conducts business in the area, possibly with these drugs connections or otherwise. So was this kind of a warning shot? Keep your mouth closed or you get framed for murder and put away. Anybody who doesn't tow the corrupt walk line. Is that what's going on here? So Barb Janda in 2007 actually made this strange comment. I think the Hallbacks set this whole thing up. I really do. And that's an interesting quite That's an interesting comment. And then there have been various individuals throughout the case that say they believe that Teresa Hallback is still alive or possibly could still be alive. There's other speculation that Teresa Hallback was a CI specifically getting a job to spy on Stephen Avery or possible other individuals through her job at Auto Trader, which is quite interesting. Quite interesting. The other thing is, what if Teresa Hallback was a CI, was involved in all this shadiness, and she wanted to get out of it? And let's say she saw too much, so to speak. Of course, I'll get into all of the photography issues with her photography business and people she might have crossed paths with in association with law enforcement and otherwise that facilitated them wanting to take her out. But again, let's not fall for false dichotomies here. More than one thing could be going on at the same time. So if she is some kind of CI and she's been to the Avery Salvage Yard many times and then we have the whole Cuss Road situation and the people that live there, all of these ties to DCI, what is going on here? It's just, it's so bizarre. So let's get even more into Mine Shock land. So let's go back to the Queso file. So let's talk, let, Martinez made a very interesting uh, comment. So, so we haven't examined Andre Martinez at length thus far, but we'll do that now. Some people actually believe that he's the one responsible for Teresa Hallback's disappearance. Some uh, basic timeline issues here. 
July 21st, 2005, Andrew Martinez, Andre Martinez, is a customer of Avery Salvage and visited the yard frequently, three to four times per month. His car wreck was taken there July 21st, 2005. And this is sourced from a Daily Mail article exclusive. I know they didn't do it. New claim in making a murder case from fellow prisoner who tried to decapitate his ex with an axe af hours after a missing woman's car was found just 15 miles away. Lawyers for one of the two convicted men in making a murder have been told of an extraordinary claim by another prisoner that he has proof of their innocence. The violent offender, a regular customer of the salvage yard run by the family of the two men, sought out one of their mothers during a prison visit to tell her that her son, Brendan Dassey, and her brother, Stephen Avery, were wrongfully convicted of the killing. Andre Fuentes Martinez, 52, is serving 30 years in Green Bay Correctional after he severely wounded Charlene Edwards with an axe at their shared home in Manitowoc, Wisconsin on November 5th. 2005 while screaming die dirty expletive as he hacked at her his claim of the men's innocence is the latest twist in the case highlighted by netflix making a murder which has enthralled millions around the world daily mail online can reveal it for the first time and a series of links between martinez and avery auto salvage yard where teresa hallback was last seen and where her suv and charred remains were found of course that's not where she was last seen but anyway andre martinez's attempts to kill his ex and Teresa Hallback's RAV4 were discovered on the same day a few miles apart. Earl Avery tells Daily Mail Online Martinez was on the Avery yard when the RAV4 was found. So this is curious. So 1.15 a.m. Manitowoc City, Andre Martinez attacks his ex-girlfriend with an axe. Then goes on the run. And for whatever reason, <laughs> several hours later at 10.20 a.m., Teresa Hallback's RAV4 is found by searchers, and Earl Avery says Andre Martinez was on the property at the time. <laughs> Just another oddity to add. I mean, is Avery Salford George that popular of a hangout that even guys that attempt to murder their ex-girlfriends with an axe want to go hang out there it's just that popular of a spot i guess according to the avery family martinez had visited their auto salvage yard 15 miles from his home earlier that day on the morning of november 5th hallback's car was found at the car yard martinez bought parts at the salvage yard three or four times a month according to the avery's in the year before hallback a 25 year old photographer visited the property her last known whereabouts were at the lot on the outskirts of Two Rivers after she had gone to photograph a minivan for Auto Trader Magazine on October 31st, 2005. Her murder is detailed in the documentary series Making a Murder, which has captivated viewers around the world since it began streaming on Netflix December 18th. One of the three Avery brothers, Stephen, was arrested for Hallback's murder on November 9th, 2005, after her car was found on the edge of the 40-acre property. Hallback's charred bones and remains of her cell phone were found in a fire pit near Stephen Avery's trailer. Or were they? He was charged on November 15th with first-degree murder, mutilation of a corpse, and possession of firearms by a felon. Special prosecutor, the firearm that wasn't his, special prosecutor Ken Kratt said that Avery's blood had been found in Hallback's car and that he was the last person to see her alive. Also not true. Shortly before he was arrested for Hallback's murder, Avery had filed a $36 million federal lawsuit against the county, its former sheriff and district attorney for wrongful conviction. Stephen Avery had been released in 2003 after spending 18 years in jail for a 1985 rape he didn't commit before being freed on DNA evidence. Four months later, after Avery's arrest, his nephew, Brendan Dassey, then 16, told police he had helped rape, stab, shoot, and dismember Hallback on his uncle's order. The teen had an IQ score of 70, which qualifies him as intellectually disabled. He later said his confession was coerced. And of course, this is also a minor. Regardless of IQ, this is a minor without a parent. 
In March 2007, Avery was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A month later, his 16-year-old nephew was found guilty of Hallback's murder and sexual assault and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of early release in 2048. They and members of the Avery family have long maintained their innocence. Sandra Greenman, Stephen Avery's former fiance, told Daily Mail Online that authorities had tunnel vision in the murder case and did not look at other suspects. The 73-year-old, along with Dassey's mother, Barbara Tadaich, and Stephen Avery's mother, Dolores Avery, revealed their suspicions for the first time about the Axeman as an individual who had escaped the police attention. On July 21st, 2005, Andre Martinez called the auto salvage business to have them retrieve his 1997 Volkswagen Jetta after he was rear-ended on the highway and the car was left a complete write-off. Charles Avery said the Avery's collected the car from an off-ramp of I-43 and brought it to the yard where it was stripped for parts. The wrecked car still sits on the property. A vehicle history report tied to the car's VIN revealed that on July 21st, 2005, the Volkswagen was involved in a collision with another vehicle in Wisconsin. The Avery's business logbook from 2005 reveals that on July 22nd, the car was listed at the yard. The owner's details were written down as Rene Camacho with an address on the 1900 block of Franklin Street in Manitoba. Andre Martinez lived at that address, but it is not clear why the name Rene Camacho is listed as Char Charles Avery told Daily Mail Online that Martinez completed the transaction. Camacho later became the son-in-law of Martinez's ex-girlfriend, Charlene Edwards. Camacho did not respond to messages from Daily Mail Online. Charles Avery told Daily Mail Online that Martinez came three or four times a month to the business for car parts. It is not clear whether Martinez was on the Avery property on the day Hallback went missing. But Earl Avery told Daily Mail Online that Martinez was at the yard on November 5th. That was the same day Earl gave permission to volunteers and law enforcement to search for signs of Hallback. Her Toyota RAV4 was found on the edge of the 40-acre property that morning. According to court documents, at 1.30 p.m. that afternoon, Martinez, then 42, attacked his ex-girlfriend Charlene Edwards at her home on the 1900 block of Franklin Street in downtown Manitoba. She was struck twice with an axe and suffered severe head injuries, according to sentencing documents seen by Daily Mail Online. Martinez also swung the hatchet at a child in the home, missing by only a few inches. He also struck a dog with the hatchet, according to court papers. According to a criminal complaint from November 15, 2005, Martinez attacked his girlfriend in front of her son, 16, and 17-year-old daughter, who were thrown across the room by him as they tried to protect their mother. Edwards' son told police that Martinez had let himself into the house with a key to write a note for his mom, who was on her way home from work with her daughter. The complaint reads, Charlene walked into the kitchen and she saw Andre and told Andre she didn't want to see him anymore. Edwards' son said Charlene told Andre she was seeing someone else and Andre called Charlene a dirty expletive expletive. The complaint said the pair began arguing about a Chevrolet Cavalier, which Martinez claimed to have bought but was registered under Edwards' name. The son said Andre became very upset with Charlene and began yelling at her that you can die, you expletive expletive, saying the next time he came over he would smash out all the windows in the house, said he'd burn down the house with the kids in it, and told her, I hope you burn in hell. According to the victim's son, Martinez then grabbed his mother and threw her to the floor on her stomach while she called out to, she called out to her children for help. The children attempted to intervene, but Martinez knocked them to the floor. The complainant further alleges that the son said Andre went into a pantry that was off the kitchen by the stove, and when he came back into the kitchen, he had a hatchet in his hand. He said Andre grabbed Charlene's left leg while she was still lying on her stomach and said, die dirty expletive, as he brought the hatchet up in his right hand about to his head height and struck Charlene with the hatchet in the back of her head, back of her neck. 
With the help of her children, Edwards managed to flee to a tattoo parlor across the street who called 911. The victim was hospitalized with a large wound in the back of her head close to her neck. She also suffered a laceration to her arm from trying to protect her head from the axe. According to the complaint, when asked by an officer why the attack had happened, Edwards said to kill me. That's kind of weird, though, because he's saying he's going to come back and knock all the windows out and burn the house down. But then why is he attacking then? Obviously, he's not very, uh, not a logical individual. Martinez, who was charged with domestic assault on Edwards a month earlier, told her he would kill her if she left him. Following the attack, Martinez dropped the axe and fled the property. He surrendered to police two days later after he was found hiding at a friend's trailer south of Manitowoc. But not before visiting the Avery Salvage Yard. <laughs> Following his arrest, Martinez told the Manitowoc police officer that every time someone talked negative to him, it just fills me up into anger. Sounds like he needed some anger management classes. At the time of the axe attack, Martinez, a Cuban national who had moved to the U.S., was out on bail for a domestic violence assault on Edwards. According to reports, on October 2nd, Edwards drove to a bar where Martinez pulled her car, pulled her from the car by her hair and slapped her. Martinez was charged with the battery of Charlene Edwards and ordered to have no contact with her and stay away from her home. Martinez was also on parole from prison at the time after serving 16 years for a string of burglaries in the Manitowoc area. Prior to that, in 1983, he was found guilty of operating a vehicle without the owner's consent. I, what, what, I mean, is that theft? What exactly, what is, exactly is that charge? Operating a vehicle without owner's consent? I mean, if you steal a car and drive it, is, is that the same charge? He also spent time in jail for petty theft, forgery, and damage to a vehicle. At his sentencing for the axe attacks, the prosecution said Martinez had spent much of his life in prison and added he is a violent man. Whatever he wants, he will stop at nothing to get it. Martinez's defense was the attack took place while he was suffering from a blackout, but a doctor could not support the claim. His defense lawyer, Robert DeWayne, told the court that Martinez abused controlled substances during his relationship with Edwards and claimed they used drugs together. Martinez was found guilty of attempted first-degree intentional homicide in September 2006. Charges of second-degree reckless endangering safety, physical abuse of a child, mistreating an animal, and bail jumping were dismissed by the prosecutor. Why? Martinez was sentenced to 30 years in prison and becomes eligible for release in 2035. He is currently serving his time at Green Bay alongside Brendan Dassey. Dassey's mother, Barbara Tadiyach, told Daily Mail Online this week that Martinez approached her when he was visiting her son at the prison three or four years ago. According to Tadiyuk, Martinez was the inmate assigned to take photos of other prisoners and their families during visiting hours. She said that Martinez recognized her. He spoke real soft so the guards didn't hear him. He said, I know Brendan and Steve didn't do this. Brendan doesn't belong here, Taduch told Daily Mail Online. Tadiyach said that her son did not associate with Martinez or any other prisoner and never talked about his case. She said that he spent most of his time playing card games like cribbage. Brendan's doing pretty good, she said, but he always says he wants to come home. Tadiyach said she had informed one of her son's defense lawyers, Laura, Laura Nirider, about her interaction with Martinez, it is unclear whether Avery's legal team was aware of this information. Martinez's ex-wife, Varian Martinez, told Daily Mail Online that he had nothing to do with the Teresa Hallback murder and that the Avery family had tried before to pin it on him. That's interesting. So instead of some kind of a bitter ex-wife, we have an ex-wife sticking up for her ex-husband here. She said, I know what they're trying to do because I heard this before. They're trying to say my ex-husband was out there. No, he was not out there. I know there are some crazy people. I don't care what anyone says. My ex-husband is not like that. You know, he's kind of crazy, but not like that. Not like what? Someone to visit a salvage yard? She claimed the investigators had already looked at her ex-husband as a potential suspect. She said, a long time ago, the FBI had me and my son come to Burger King to talk about that. Wow, is that the preferred meeting spot of FBI for interviews, Burger King? Is this how they do things in Manitowoc? I told them that he, Martinez, did not have anything to do with that. 
Virian Martinez told Daily Mail Online that she was always with her ex-husband when he went to the Avery salvage yard. She added, we would go out there to get parts for cars. He was never out there by himself. Those people know what they did to that girl and they're trying to blame it on someone else. They know they did that expletive. Well, how would she know she wasn't there? <laughs> Weird. They're not going to pin this on him. He wasn't out there by himself. His ex-wife said that Martinez's axe attack on his former girlfriend was also a misunderstanding. <laughs> Wait a second. His ex-wife thinks that attacking someone and trying to bludgeon their head with an axe is simply a misunderstanding and also swinging at a child and attacking the dog. This is bizarre. This is a bizarre woman. They are not going to pin out there. He wasn't out there. Okay. Virian married Andre, Mart Andre Martinez in August 1984, and the couple divorced in 1997. He was previously married in Cuba, but got a divorce before coming to the U.S. He and his former wife have two sons. She retained sole custody for their sons, according to family court records. Charlene Edwards Ross died of cancer aged 45 on October 9th, 2014, and she is survived by her husband, two sons, and two daughters. Police told Daily Mail Online this week that they had not established a link between Martinez and the Averys. Deputy Chief Tony Dick told the local Herald Times reporter newspaper in 2005 that the suspect had a long history with the police department. When asked about the case by Daily Mail Online this week, Dick, who has since retired from the department, said he had no knowledge of Martinez's connection to the Averys. Sounds like a very astute police chief. The police report on the axe attack was not immediately available from the Manitowoc Police Department. Manitowoc Sheriff's Department told Daily Mail Online that questions regarding the Avery case should be referred to Calumet County Sheriff as lead investigators. <laughs> Daily Mail Online was awaiting a response from Calumet County. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So, that is who this Andre Martinez individual is. Okay. October 20th, he's charged with battery. October 20th, 2005, he's charged with battery by Manitowoc County. October 31st, 2005, Teresa Hallback is last seen at Avery Salvage, or leaving Avery Salvage, although there are some sightings afterwards that are swept under the rug. November 5th, 2005, in the morning, Andre was at Avery Salvage at the time of Teresa Hallback's vehicle being discovered. I don't know. Maybe he really does have blackouts because if he blacks out after the axe attack and then he's just wondering about, oh, I need some car parts. I'll just go to Avery's. And that happens to be when uh, Pam's Pam of God Sturm is magically led to Teresa Hallback's RAV4, which might not even be her RAV4, of course, if you haven't checked out the Mind Shock episodes on the RAV4 issues, of which there is no shortage. Very, very confusing whether or not that was even the same RAV4. November 5th, 2006, at 1.30 p.m. p.m. That was an a.m.? Wait a second. So Andre took an axe to his wife, 1.30 a.m., according to Daily Mail. Okay. Uh, November 7th, 2005, Andre was arrested, 11.45 a.m., by Manitoba County Police. Arresting officer unknown. They keep really good records in 2005 in Manitowoc County. Okay, in questioning after arrest, Martinez said, this is really bizarre. This is really, really bizarre. So, so this is the defendant's statement on third-party responsibility. Case number 2005-CF-381. You can find this on stephenaverycase.org. On page 11, Andre Martinez had been to the Avery Salvage Yard too many times to count, but denied being there on October 31st. ACISS investigative report number 05-1776-113 at 3 and 4. Indeed, he said he had been to the Salvage Yard only two or three times in the preceding six months. He denied killing Teresa Hallback. However, on November 5th, 2005, he attacked his girlfriend with a hatchet. Then, under law enforcement questioning, Martinez made a notable statement. He said that if the Avery family was saying that he killed Miss Hallback, he would take the blame for it because he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison anyway. Is that an interesting statement to make? Martinez said he met Stephen Avery once in prison in 1998, 
perhaps, but that they were not friends, so he wasn't sure. Martinez's story then began to change. The following day, Martinez claimed to a Manitoba County Sheriff's Department sergeant not otherwise involved in this investigation, Sergeant Shalou, that Stephen Avery had informed him of a young girl who had come to the salvage yard on several occasions to take photographs. He claimed that Avery told him that he, Avery, was going to kill her the next time she came. Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department summary at 1, November 17, 2005. Martinez did not explain why he had made no mention of this the day before and did not explain why Stephen Avery would have said that if they had only met that once seven years earlier. So if you saw some guy once seven years ago, you're immediately going to make tell him of what you're planning to kill somebody. <laughs> it's just weird. Twelve days later, I mean, if you're Stephen Avery, like, let's examine this. Ken Kratz probably thinks this is legitimate. But a random customer on your yard, you're just going to tell the random customer, yeah, this girl comes to take pictures. Next time she comes, I'm going to kill her. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Ken Kratz probably would buy that since it, since it uh, makes Avery look guilty, I guess. But would anybody in their right mind ever say that, especially when you have a 36 million million dollar lawsuit coming 12 back to this report 12 days later when interviewed in the green bay correctional institution martinez said initially that he had changed his mind and did not want to speak case to report page 980 but he did he now claimed to be friends with stephen avery and he said that he would quote would commonly go to the junkyard sometimes as often as a couple times a day end quote Okay, okay, so Avery Salvage is that popular. Even these would-be axe murderers, they, they have nothing better to do than to go to the yard multiple times a day. So you go find a car part, then you go for lunch, then you're going back to the salvage yard. I mean, because where else would you go? I mean, that's just the spot to hang out. <laughs> then you leave for dinner, then you're going to come back again, come back at night, come back multiple times a day. Oh, man, let me read that again. This I don't know what to make of this. He said he, quote, would commonly go to the junkyard, Avery Auto Savage, sometimes as often as a couple times a day. <laughs> a day, not a month, not a week, a day. So he would come and go to the junkyard multiple times a day. Okay. All right, let's continue here. He now claimed that he and Stephen Avery had spied on Teresa Hallback from a hill on a previous occasion, admitting now for the first time that he personally had seen Miss Hallback and that Avery had taken pictures of her. To date, the state has not claimed that it has recovered any such pictures. So are these delusional ramblings of Martinez, who has supposedly has blackouts? I don't know. The Caso Report, page 91. He claimed that Avery said that he intended to dispose of Miss Hallback. Caso Report, page 980. And he told an implausible story about Avery suspecting that Miss Hallback was coming to the house to, quote, pinpoint Avery for a crime he did not commit. Okay, interesting. So Martinez is stating that Stephen Avery told him that he was Avery was suspecting that Hallback was coming to his house to pin a crime on Avery. How interesting is that? Supposedly, Avery also said that Miss Hallback had a baggie that he wanted to get. Case to report page 981. A baggie? Does that mean drugs? Is this an insinuation that Teresa Hallback is dealing drugs with, uh, with Stephen Avery? Is she Stephen Avery's drug dealer? Is the... Again, how many layers are here? Is she a CI possibly working for the Justice Department? Is she dealing drugs with auto trader customers attempting to bust a bigger rig? A bigger ring? What is going on here? So, okay, so report on page 981. Asked why Avery would tell him these things, Martinez now claimed that he and Stephen Avery got along very well and that Stephen trusted him. Even Martinez's own son would not support that claim. He denied that his dad had any connection to, with the Averys 
other than purchasing parts and said that his dad never had socialized with or hung around the Averys. Although it would be interesting how he would know that of his dad unless he was with his dad every second of every day. So this was ACISS Investigative Report number 05-1776-136 out of 4. A schoolgirl, K.S., heard from her friend, A.M., that Martinez, Don Hashultz, Stephen Avery, and another Stephen had been at a bonfire and party at the Avery residence. And, and again, with all these parties and bonfires going on, except except the, the night of Halloween, of course, if you haven't checked out the legend of the bonfire <laughs> aspect from the Mindshock uh, podcast, check that out. Obviously, there was no bon- that bonfire that night got canceled. But there were other bonfires, many other bonfires other times. So in some of these parties, so is Martinez really friends with Stephen Avery? And did he, vi- did he visit him at these other parties. Now we have information from a schoolgirl here identified, KS, hearing from her friend AM that Martinez partied with Avery. Were there drugs involved? Who supplied the drugs? What is going on at the Avery Salvage Yard and does it involve law enforcement? AM confirmed that she heard from Don Haynes that Martinez and his friend Roberto Brooks were at the Avery property on October 30th. Is this all made up? Did the police coerce these individuals to make these statements? KH and another friend of AM confirmed that Roberto Brooks, who dates her mother, was told by Roberto Brooks that he saw Teresa Hall back on October 30th and that, quote, he knows all about it, end quote. So Roberto Brooks knows all about it? All about what? All about Teresa Hall back in Halloween? Two Rivers Police Department detail at 3-4, November 21st, 2005. Brooks denied any connection, but had only his unsupported claim that he was at home apparently alone most of the day on October 31st, 2005. ACIS investigative report number 05-1776-161 at 4. Okay, so another guy with no alibi. Indeed, Brooks' girlfriend, Don Hashultz, contradicted him in part. She claimed that she was also at home with Brooks on Halloween and that her son was at home too because he was recovering from surgery on his foot. Case report, page 327. Brooks did admit a long friendship with Martinez, ACISS investigative report number 05-1776-161 at 3. Most recently and cryptically, Martinez wrote to investigator Mike... Mark Weigert, on December 4th, 2006, that he was, quote, sorry to inform you that there's no possible way for me to help you with the truth in Ms. Hallback case. I pray for her family to get the justice they deserve, end quote. He said he felt sorry for not coming forward with what he knows about Mr. Steve A. He ended, just a note to tell you that I won't be coming forward to tell you what I have heard. (laughs) I've heard stuff. But I'm going to tell you I'm not going to come forward with it. (laughs) Martinez is an interesting character. Martinez offered an alibi. His girlfriend's 16-year-old son claimed that he had been together for about four hours the afternoon of October 31st. Case report, page 225. He also claimed to have gone trick-or-treating that evening together. Why a 16-year-old boy would not have been in school on a Monday afternoon or why a 16-year-old would go trick-or-treating with an adult, remain unexplored. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that's an interesting official defendant statement. Court document here that I'm reading, it's, it's, it's funny that they, they phrased it like that. Very, very interesting. So again, we have this Martinez character who made a lot of weird statements. A lot of weird statements. So some people believe, again, Andre Martinez actually was the responsible party for whatever happened to Teresa Hallback. This was posted on the Making a Murderer subreddit by Warnoka five years ago. Of course, that subreddit is a bit of a sham. They, uh, although it's gotten better recently as it's becoming more and more obvious that this was uh, a frame job. So they postulated this. Being a frequent customer of Avery Salvage, Andre had strong knowledge of the yard and the Averys. 
In his court case for the axe attack, he stated that he'd been suffering from major blackouts recently. Police framing motive, the key, if Lank or Coburn were the arresting officers of Martinez. And how crazy is it that the arresting officers are not even listed? What kind of department is this? In 2005, they don't document arresting officers for people for attempted axe murder? What is going on in Manitowoc? This is weird. Okay, either way, if Lank or Coburn were the arresting officers of Martinez and arrested Martinez prior to finding the key, it's quite possible that Martinez, if he killed Teresa Hallback, had the key with him and it was confiscated by officers and planted at Avery's. Why would they do this? Well, they were about to lose the $36 million filed by Stephen Avery. Critical timeline, what time or date was Martinez taken into custody? This was Monday, November 7th, 2005, 11.45 a.m. What time or date was the key found at Avery's? Tuesday, November 8th, 2005. Interesting research, newspaper clippings on the Martinez arrest, November 2005, showcases that Manitowoc County Police Chief Perry Kingsbury was in command at the time. Also, Deputy Chief Tony Dick is also involved. Look at this picture. Isn't it odd that the axe murder and a missing person, Teresa Hallback, are on the same front page of the newspaper at the same time? Top stories of the day, woman missing, man charged in axe murder. I mean, Manitowoc is an interesting place, is it not? Is it not? That's, that's really bizarre. A short time later, Police Chief Perry and two other officers were fired for misconduct. Interesting. Very interesting. So from lawyersandsettlements.com, there's a write-up on this here. Manitowoc, November 21st, 2007. Police Chief Perry Kingsbury brought charges against the city alleging that he was wrongfully terminated following a year-long investigation by a Madison law firm. Attorneys compiling the report recommended that Kingsbury be fired for inefficiencies and official misconduct. He had been promoted to chief in April 2002 as part of a settlement reached. Sources claimed that the city agreed to pay Kingsbury $80,000, which includes $48,000, $576, $48,576.84 in earned benefits he was entitled to as an employee, including vacation, sick leave, and floating holiday payouts. Further, the settlement agreement stated that city officials believe Kingsbury is not guilty of criminal misconduct related to his handling of city funds, and that the former chief did not intend to misappropriate city funds. That's kind of interesting, though, because if he was terminated, why was he terminated? So we know corrupt walk is corrupt, but in terms of how they handle other corruption, were they was was Perry and the and these two other officers were they fired as scapegoats for something? And it's it's weird. It's weird because you don't normally see any kind of accountability in Manitowoc. So that does throw a wrench in a couple things. And it's weird. Martinez tells Barb Dassey that uh, he knows they didn't do it. It is actually kind of weird. Here's another mind shock. Someone dug this up. Oh, wow. I can't, This is the most mind shocking episode ever. I just, I can't deal with this. Th these are too many mind shocks. Again, this was posted on the Making a Murder subreddit. Pamela Sturm didn't just find the RAV4. She may have seen the real killer. I want to touch on what I found yesterday while piling through tons of research and link after link. So former PI Pamela Sturm and her daughter Nicole Sturm volunteered to search the Avery Salvage Yard. Of course, relatives of Pagel. <laughs> Pam and Nicole drove to the main office building where two men were talking outside and it turned out Earl Avery was one of the men whom Pam asked permission if she could search the property, and he agreed that she could after some chit-chat about losing a nephew. Pam noticed a ridge up one side of the property and said she had to search over there. I mean, I guess this is the Pam of God moment. She walked up to that area, and up on the ridge is where she found Teresa Hallback's car buried under some branches, door frame, and the hood of another car. After finding the RAV4, they called Pagel and left a message. They had his direct line given to them by Ryan Hilligas, along with a camera that was borrowed to them by Teresa Hallback's roommate, Scott Blodorn. <laughs> 
very curious how all this happens. But anyway, they waited for the police to come to the salvage yard to check the RAV4. In the transcript for day two of the Wisconsin versus Avery court case, Pam Stern states that while she was waiting the 20 or so minutes that she and daughter Nicole waited by the car crusher, she states that she was in fear of safety since she found the RAV4 on the property. And she states that she pushed Nicole behind some vehicles because she saw a man standing on the hill above the ridge where the RAV4 was located. Behind the ridge where Pam found the RAV4 is the outskirts of the property and then the quarry. There are no cars beyond the ridge, just the hill and quarry. Here's a quote from the transcript. Kratz says, now tell us what happened, Pam says. Well, we waited about 20 to 25 minutes before someone arrived. Before they arrived, we saw a man up on the ridge by the buildings up there. There is a ridge and I got a little concerned. So I like, I said, I put Nikki behind a car so nothing would happen to her. Here's Buting's questioning. And you mentioned a man on a ridge or on the ridge, but up on the hill, kind of back towards the buildings where you were sitting there waiting for 20 minutes, correct? And Stephen Avery wasn't the man, was he? Pam says, I don't know for sure it was too far to see. Buting says, well, who was this man? It wasn't Earl Avery, was it? I don't know. Like I said, it was too far. Interesting. Now, Stephen Avery was obviously at the cabin in Crivet, so it couldn't have been him. So this theory is quite bizarre if it was Martinez. That seems important since I recovered the fact that Earl Avery said that a man named Andre Martinez was on the property that day. And he would be on the prep property several times a month getting parts for his car. And according to him, several times a day sometimes. <laughs> this Andre Martinez is the same Martinez whom later that day, November 5th, went to his ex-girlfriend's house and tried to axe her to death. Now, depending on the AM and the PM that gets mixed up, some people are stating this was, uh, he went to the salvage yard in the AM and then it was 1.30 PM when he hacked her to death. Or vice versa, I don't know if these are typos or not from the Daily Mail online. He was successful in taking a hatchet from the pantry and hitting her in the back of the neck, causing a very huge, almost life-threatening gash to her neck and her arm. He also managed to axe the dog since it was trying to protect the woman, and he also managed to axe one or both of the children. They all managed to escape across the street to a tattoo place called the Cops Mart, and Martinez is serving a 60-year sentence. And Martinez is out on a technicality? Huh. As of five years ago? Huh. Or not. Martinez had a history of sexual abuse, criminal burglary, bigger than all of the Avery brothers together, including Stephen Avery. He has spent most of his life in prison, and he was in the same prison as Brendan Dassey. And Andre Martinez was one of the several persons that the defense attorneys at Avery's trial wanted to present as a possible alternate person who had motive to kill Teresa Hallback. The judge would not let the defense present possible other suspects. Yeah, that's not shady at all. So Martinez admits to spying on Teresa Hallback. So was he also there when they found the rev for? Is this all circumstantial? I mean, every case is allowed one coincidence or anomaly. Once you start piling on dozens and dozens and dozens, of course, even the most clueless coincidence theorists maybe would bat an eye. Is it possible this is the coincidence in the case that a guy that just happens to hack his ex-girlfriend with an axe, attempted axe murder, just happened to be on the Avery Savage Yard when the RAV4 was being found and happened to watch Pam of God Sturm while she was finding it. I mean, this is all, this is all the Twilight Zone. I mean, wow. I really didn't think on episode 33 we would still be having this many mind shocks in this case. I mean, this is just absolutely bizarre. It's just absolutely bizarre. <laughs> and his alibi is a 16-year-old, a 16-year-old going trick-or-treating with an adult. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. All right. So let's go back now. Some people, of course, think that uh, Martinez himself might have rode uh, Teresa Hall back off the road and then done something to her then. And then if he was... I don't know, a deranged loony. He might be curious as to what's going on in the Avery salvage yard if they think Avery did it, if he really did it. So, okay. 
coming back now to the to the auto trader issues and the DCI again. There's so many mine shocks to go over. Of course, this is mine shock. It's very comprehensive. When we mention a guy like Martinez, we got to go deep because again, this is mine shock. So back to the to the queso file. Martinez, the guy who struck his girlfriend with a hatchet, said Stephen thought Teresa was spying on him and was coming to his house to pinpoint him for a crime he did not commit. Is that true? Now, again, let's not fall for these false dichotomies. Is it possible he did know Stephen Avery and they did chit-chat a couple of things and a couple of things got mixed up? And there were, obviously, if Martinez has blackouts and he's a complete loony, we can't trust the information, but there might have been little snippets that Avery might have told him that maybe had some kind of kernels in truth. Did Avery really suspect Teresa Hallback of something? Or did he think she was shady? Or was he she his drug dealer and he didn't trust her? So Jody's stepfather said his co-worker told him there was more going on that was coming out and it involved Martinez. So from the report here, Sunday, November 6, 2005, approximately 9.07 a.m., Special Agent Neil J. McGrath met with Angela Shuster, the manager at Auto Trader Magazine. Special Agent Thomas J. Fassbender asked McGrath to contact Angela Shuster to obtain records from Auto Trader Magazine and discuss the disappearance of Teresa Marie Hallback, who is also employed as a photographer with Auto Trader Magazine. Shuster stated she had been with Auto Trader Magazine for approximately eight years. Shuster has approximately 10 photographers working for Auto Trader Magazine. Each of these photographers covers a territory in Wisconsin and takes photos of vehicles to be displayed in the magazine. Shuster stated that her photographers did not typically meet and believes she is the only person with Auto Trader Magazine who had personally met Hallback when she hired her in Green Bay. The photographers handle most of their own business with the main office by phone, fax, and mail, and these photographers cover various areas in Wisconsin. Teresa Hallback had been employed with Auto Trader Magazine since October 8, 2004. Shuster is Hallback's supervisor and stated that Hallback was referred to her by a customer who needed a photo taken of a vehicle, and Shuster did not have a photographer in the area. The customer, whose name Shuster cannot recall, interesting, stated that he knew Hallback and shortly after Hallback contacted Shuster about being hired with Auto Trader Magazine. Now, is this another anomaly, curiosity, coincidence of sorts that nobody can nail down any names? Because if this unnamed individual is somehow linked to DCI, does that explain it? And of course, they can't have that out in the open, so they have to not be able to recall his name. Shuster believed that Hallback lived in Hilbert, Wisconsin, and stated that Hallback normally worked Monday, Thursday, Saturday. Hallback covers the Green Bay, Appleton, and Calumet County areas. Hallback was temporarily covering Manitowoc and Sheboygan. However, these areas tend to generate less business in the winter months and would be covered less frequently by Hallback. So this is not normally her area. That's curious, considering she'd been out there so many times. I don't know. A lot of these curiosities, it's just, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. Okay, so moving on here. Tuesday, January 30th, 2007, at 1045 hours, investigator Baldwin and myself, Dietering, did interview the following individual at his residence, Eugene Barth in Manitowoc. Barth is the stepfather of Jody Stakowski, previously mentioned in this incident. Investigator Weigert had received a telephone call from Stakowski indicating her father may have some information regarding goings-on at Avery Auto Salvage Area on October 31st, 2005. In speaking with Barth, he indicated a co-worker named David Trice, currently incarcerated at Columbia Correctional Facility for operating while intoxicating charges, had told Barth some time ago a female Trice knows, stated to him there was more to the story regarding the Hallback Avery situation. Barth believes this involves the individual who struck his girlfriend in the face with a hatchet. According to Barth, Trice had talked about a female who had gone to the Averys for some reason, possibly to pick up parts for a vehicle, a friend, or some children. 
According to Barth, Trice had made the comment to him, they were out there and there was more going on that was coming out. Barth did advise us Trice was aware of the fact that Jody Stokowski was living with Stephen Avery at the time this discussion took place. Barth had nothing further to add to this investigation. Okay, let's let's go more into mind shock land here. Martinez stated he was friends with Stephen Avery. He also told us he would commonly go to the junkyard as often as a couple times a day. Martinez told us Stephen Avery told him, meaning Stephen Avery thought Teresa Hallback was coming to his house to pinpoint him for a crime he did not commit. I asked Martinez if Stephen thought Teresa was spying on him, to which Martinez stated that is what Stephen told him he believed was happening. I asked Martinez if Stephen mentioned Teresa by name, to which Martinez stated Stephen did. Martinez also told us Stephen Avery told him Stephen said he wanted to dispose of her, meaning Teresa. Martinez also told us Stephen had showed him a little book which had Teresa's phone number in it. Again, Martinez stated Stephen believed Teresa was spying on him for a crime he was innocent of. Martinez also told us Stephen would commonly mention a baggie Teresa had that he wanted to get. Martinez then stated he remembered on one occasion Stephen said he were up on a hill with a truck in the salvage yard. Martinez indicated Stephen had a camera with him and Martinez and Stephen observed Teresa drive into the salvage area and Stephen took his camera out and was taking pictures of Teresa as she drove in. Martinez also told us he remembers Stephen calling Teresa a little expletive. I asked Martinez when this would have happened, if it would have been before Teresa's death that he told her these things, or after, to which Martinez stated this would have been before Teresa's death and disappearance. Martinez told us he did not believe Stephen would tell anybody else because his brothers would have probably told the police. Martinez states Stephen and he got along very well and Stephen trusted him and this is why he would tell him these things. I questioned Martinez about specific information. Stephen had told him about the death and or disappearance of Teresa Hallback. Martinez stated he did not want to talk about it. Martinez stated his son did not wish him to get involved in the case and he did not want to say any more about it. Martinez stated he was going to be in a meeting with his son this week and he would send us a letter indicated if he wished to speak with us anymore, referencing this case. Okay, I then provided Martinez with a business card and thanked him for his cooperation at which time we left the interview room. Okay, a lot of bizarre things there from Martinez. And then, of course, we have this other possible DCI agent, Kathy, taking photos at the salvage yard as well. It's kind of weird. It's weird. What can you say? Okay, so let's go back to the original point here with Zipperer and Cuss Road. So in this theory, were Teresa Hallback, Carmen Bootwell, and Mark Lee Zipper being pressured to act as confidential informants in a drug sting operation involving local sheriff's departments, Wisconsin DOJ, and the FBI and or DEA? So this is a post here to whom it may concern. If you want to find the killer, look into the connection between Kenneth K Kratz and Ryan Hillegas. Look into the sexting, sexting scandal and the drug addiction. The fact that Ryan had access to drugs 24-7 should shed light on the subject. I can't say any more other than the corruption is deeper than a couple dirty cops. They were only doing what they were told. Anonymous post there. Here's Mark Lee Zipper's obituary. Mark Lee Zipper, 28... Green Bay died unexpectedly Tuesday, November 29th, 2005, at his residence. Mark was born in Manitowoc, July 23rd, 77, to Daniel and Jane Hess Zipper. He attended Holy Cross grade school and graduated from the Michigan High School with the class of 96. Mark was employed by Wilco Cabinet Company of Green Bay. He enjoyed skateboarding, snowboarding, camping, and bicycling. Mark also played guitar in a band. He is, okay, so he's survived by these relatives. Mark is also survived by many cousins. Mark was preceded in death by his maternal grandparents, his paternal grandparents, 
R okay, and then just information on his funeral. Okay. Uh, another post here from TikTok Manitowoc Reddit. I suspect Teresa Hallback made it home and was killed there, either accidentally or intentionally, or a drug overdose. I think Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott Blodorn were in a secret drug business with Weigert, the queso drug investigator. When Weigert discovered that Teresa Hallback had seen Stephen Avery, he called Lank, and they planned to solve both departments' problems and be heroes by framing Stephen Avery. I think the Rav and Teresa Hallback's body, if it was a drug overdose, were moved to Xander Road and set on fire. Manitowoc Sheriff's Office had attempted to free, frame Stephen Avery for a stolen car fire there, a few months before. So this Xander Road car incident is not really talked about much in relation to Stephen Avery, but would anybody be that surprised that Manitowoc is trying to frame Avery for, Avery for yet another crime? <laughs> All right, so let's let's look at the making a murder subreddit. This is an interesting write up here. Avery was questioned about burning a car to destroy evidence in two thousand four. There is no expletive way Avery would have left the Rav in the yard in two thousand four. They questioned him about a Chevy Blazer that was found burned up. It seems they thought Avery burned cars back then. So, September 21st, 2004, dispatch received a call from a person stating that a vehicle is on fire in a field off of Stangle Road. At this time, dispatch dispatched Tish Mills Iyer, D-E-P-L, to respond, or is that supposed to be department, is that a typo? To respond to Stangle Road and Xander Road reference a vehicle car fire. A short time later, they were dispatched to the area while responding. The Tish Mills Fire Department was requesting assistance was needed at the location. A short time later, this, I'm guessing this is the officer statement here. Officer arrived on location where the Tish Mills Fire Department had just put out a vehicle fire in the East Field area off of Stangle Road, just north of Xander Road. As I approached the vehicle, I did observe... I'm guessing this is a license plate reference, which came back to 1991 Chevy black in color to Barbara and Thomas Janda. What? So this vehicle belonged to Janda? The plot thickens. The vehicle was a S10 Blazer SUV in which the interior was fully gutted, all windows were smashed out, the vehicle was approximately 25 yards off the roadway and did not appear to have been the result of a traffic crash. Tish Mills Fire Department informed me that upon arriving on location, they did not view any persons in the vehicle, and while checking the area, they did not note anything in the field area to be suspicious. According to the Tish Mills Fire Department, it appeared that the vehicle was intentionally set on fire and some unknown type of accelerant was used to make the vehicle burn that fast and that hot. In a review of the area, I did not find any evidence. While on the scene of the vehicle fire, dispatch informed me that they received a call from Barbara Janda reporting that her vehicle with the same plate and description as being stolen. It should be noted the initial call of this reported fire came in at 2121 hours with the call of the vehicle being stolen coming in at 2137 hours. At this time, I did ask for a tow service to remove the vehicle from the area and transport it to Manitowoc Sheriff's Office impound area. Dispatch stated that Avery's towing would be responding. <laughs> I informed Dispatch to cancel Avery's towing due to the vehicle ownership being from the same family. Oh, all of a sudden they know what conflict of interest is? <laughs> So there's no problem with Manitowoc, who Avery has a $36 million lawsuit against, searching and finding evidence, or planning evidence, on his property, but they won't allow someone in the same family to tow a burned vehicle. Interesting. 
Interesting indeed. Dispatch then stated that Rabus would be responding to the location to provide towing service. During my investigation, I was informed by one of the fire department personnel that a Chris Kosa pack was traveling through the area and might have seen what had transpired. At this time, I did ask for a second unit to respond to my location in which Deputy Cummings did arrive shortly after. Deputy Cummings remained on location to provide assistance of the vehicle being removed from the area and to follow the vehicle to Manitowoc Sheriff's Office impound. Deputy Cummings did provide evidence control of the vehicle where he did conduct a vehicle inventory of the vehicle. With Deputy Cummings on location, I then proceeded to attempt to make contact with Chris Konopaki. I was unable to speak with Konopaki at this time, but I did leave a message for her to contact this officer. I did speak with Chris Konopaki who stated, uh, so this is now on September 22nd, 2004, I did speak with Chris Konopaki, who stated at approximately 9 p.m. she left her residence on Rocky Court just north of the incident where she was bringing home her sitter. She stated she did travel down Stangle Road and then on to Xander to the sitter's residence on STH 42. During this time, Konopaki stated she was traveling towards Xander, southbound on Stangle. She saw a vehicle facing northbound on Stangle Road with lights off and no one around. At this time, Konopaki stated her best description would be a dark colored car, either blue or black, possible two-door older model. Konopaki stated this seemed a little suspicious but did not want to stop due to her being frightened. She continued to drop off her sitter and within eight to ten minutes later she arrived back at this location where she observed the car that was pulled alongside the roadway was gone and that a vehicle in the field was fully engulfed in fire. At this time, I mean, there's a bunch of numbers here referencing other cases, I guess. Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office received an invoice from Rabas Garage for the towing of this 91 Chevy Blazer, black in color, which apparently had been burned in a field on Stangle Road near Xander Road. The amount of $150 will be satisfied by department and should be collected upon release of the vehicle. September 27, 2004, I, Detective... These, this is a jumbled copy paste job of these uh, files and reports. Followed up, the fire investigator had been called in the scene. Apparently, no photos were taken of the scene or the vehicle that night. Huh. Is this classic uh, Manitowoc <laughs> investigation? No photos? <laughs> okay. Fire investigator Eric Hansen and I viewed the Janda vehicle at the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office impound garage. I obtained photos of the exterior and interior of the vehicle. I observed that this there was very extensive damage to the interior of the vehicle. There was far less damage done to the engine area of the vehicle. It would appear that the fire did not originate in the engine area. There appeared to be more heat damage to the passenger side of the vehicle than to the driver's side. The lowest burn area seemed to be in the area on the floor directly behind the passenger side seat. The running board on the passenger side of the vehicle was completely burned through and destroyed while the running board on the driver's side was still intact. The entire dashboard area and steering column had been completely destroyed by fire, and most of the remnants were laying on the floor of the vehicle. I did observe what appeared to be an AM FM cassette player lying on the passenger floor of the vehicle. There appeared to be little or no personal property inside the vehicle at the time of the fire. I observed that the tires on the vehicle were damaged by the fire, but they did appear to have good tread and they appeared to be newer tires. The spare tire was present on the back of the vehicle and also appeared to be in good condition prior to the fire. At this time, it doesn't appear as though any components had been stripped from the vehicle prior to the fire. It is unknown if any personal property was removed from the vehicle prior to the fire. At this time, we are unable to make a determination as to whether there were any keys in the vehicle at the time of the fire. The entire steering column and steering wheel had been destroyed by the fire and remnants were laying on the floor of the vehicle. We chose not to sift through the debris or further tamper with the vehicle since it was unknown whether or not the insurance company intended to conduct their own investigation and examination of the vehicle. I made contact with American Family Insurance and all of these individuals verified that Barbara Janda had filed a claim. He advised that Barbara has had an insurance policy with them since 2001. He advised there have been no previous claims filed and he was not aware of any recent changes to policy. 
Okay, the insurance adjuster reviewed the vehicle, proposed a settlement of $1,900. At this time, the check has not yet been issued to Barbara. Okay, September 30th, 2004. I viewed the scene of the fire, which was located in a field northeast of the intersection of Stangle and Xander. The field was mostly grass and weeds with some small pine trees planted in it. I located a burned circle in the field, 71 feet to the east of the edge of Stangle Road. It appeared as though the vehicle was driven into a field and parked at this location. The field access was located 300 feet to the north of the northern edge of Sander Road. The burn circle was approximately west and 18 feet wide from north to south. Obtained photos, conducted a search of the grass field. Uh, different, okay, so this detective collected a soil sample from the center of the burn circle. Second soil, control soil sample was collected eight feet to the south of the first soil sample on the edge of the circle. These soil samples were secured in a temporary evidence locker at Manitowoc Sheriff's Office. Observed there were no residences in the immediate area that would have had a view of the entire scene. There was a woods something north and eight large hill obstructed the view of the fire scene. Okay. I attempted to make contact with Barb Janda at Two Rivers, but found no one at home at this time. I made contact with Stephen Avery in the driveway outside of the residence. Stephen lives. Stephen advised that he is Barbara's brother. Stephen was notified of the incident. Stephen stated Barbara often allowed him to use the 1991 Chevy Blazer, which was involved in the incident. Stephen stated he believes that... He may have been the last person to use the vehicle before it was discovered missing. Now, would a guilty person say that? Stephen stated he believes he used the vehicle the day before it was discovered missing. However, he does not recall where he went with the vehicle. Stephen showed me the area where the vehicle was normally parked. He advised that the vehicle would have been parked next to the ice fishing shanty between the two residencies. I asked Stephen if he had a key for the vehicle, and he indicated that he does. I asked him to verify that the key was still in his possession. Stephen removed a large key ring from his pocket, and he showed me a key, which he positively identified as being the key for the Chevy Blazer. Again, are these the actions of a guilty man to just come forward with all this? Oh, yeah, I have the key. I was probably the last person to use it. <laughs> or is this a guy who is this a simple man who's, who basically just admits the truth at every turn. Steven stated that the only other key for the vehicle would be in Barbara's possession. And another interesting point here. This is not just a simple man. This is a simple man who was previously framed for the 1985 assault, who spent many years in jail, in prison, for this frame-up job. So he's been previously framed by the same department, and he's still being completely open and honest. And then, of course, in the 1982 cat incident, he was the one, the only one punished for Yanda, no relation to Janda, being the one who physically picked up a cat and threw it in the fire, and yet Stephen Avery was the one punished for animal cruelty. I mean, it's really weird. If you you and a bunch of drunk buddies are sitting around a fire, your drunk buddy lifts up someone and throws them in the fire, killing them. Let's say that's the situation. And then if he goes to the police off, the police station and admits to doing it, but says there were other people present, would he get punished? I mean, this is bizarre. You let the guy off the hook that actually did the deed. But the other individuals who may or may not have egged him on or participated in some capacity, they're punished, but the actual guy who did the deed is not punished. This is how Manitowoc County deals with Stephen Avery. I mean, it's all very, very bizarre. Stephen stated the only other key for the vehicle would be in Barbara's possession. He stated that he believes that Barbara has her key at this time. He stated that whoever took the vehicle would have had to have hotwired it since both sets of keys were accounted for. Stephen stated he and Barbara were the only ones who ever used the vehicle. He was not aware of any other family members ever using the vehicle. Again, are these the words of a guilty man? Would a, guilt, a guilty guy would say, oh yeah, maybe other people used it as well to try to confound the issue, right? You wouldn't want to make it simple and cut and dry. If you're if you're a responsible party, you'd say you would say, oh, sometimes we left the keys in it. Nobody usually takes it, or uh, things of that nature, right? 
I mean, people come and go. If he said people come and go on the property for parks all the time, no one ever steals anything. So we never thought we had to look out for that kind of stuff. Again, an in, it's interesting to dissect how an innocent versus guilty person would behave or simply say, yeah, it was a common vehicle used. Right? I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's really bizarre how every step of the way, it seems like Stephen Avery is actually telling the truth and has nothing to hide. Stephen stated he was the primary driver of the vehicle and used it more frequently than Barbara did. Again, are these the words of a guilty man? He advised that Barbara owns two other vehicles, which he identified as a Chrysler van and a Porsche. Barbara's hun husband, Thomas Janda, owns a pickup truck. Stephen stated Barbara Thomas and their son Brian Dassey all work together and they usually drive together to work each day. He advised that they normally do not return home until approximately 5.30 p.m. each night. I questioned Stephen about other vehicles that he owns. Stephen stated he owns a total of five vehicles, one blue Cadillac, one Suburban, one blue K5 Blazer, and two Monte Carlos, one blue, one brown. He advised that one of the Monte Carlos does not run. However, the other four do run and are registered. Stephen stated he has insurance on all of his vehicles. He advised that he prefers the Blazer, and Barbara often drives his Suburban. Interesting. And if this is spelled correctly, this is Detective Weicker. Woiker, huh? Asked Stephen if he had any idea who may have had a reason to take this vehicle and light it on fire. Stephen stated that he absolutely has no idea who may have been responsible for taking the vehicle. I asked Stephen if he had any problems with anyone in the past year since he was released from prison. Stephen stated he had absolutely no problems with anyone and he could not think of any reason why anyone would want to damage the vehicle. Stephen stated he is not aware of anyone who have, would have grudges against Barbara or any other family members. Stephen claimed to have absolutely no idea who may have been responsible for taking the vehicle. I questioned Stephen as to his activities on the day the vehicle was taken. Stephen stated he does not recall exactly what he did on that day. He said he may have worked at Avery's Auto Salvage, but is not certain. Stephen stated he believes that he and his girlfriend, Jody Stakowski, left to go somewhere together in his Cadillac. However, he could not remember where they went or what they did. Stephen stated he is certain that they did not use the Chevy Blazer on this date. Stephen could not remember what time they returned home. He stated sometime after they returned home, Barbara came to his residence and told him that the Blazer was missing. After I confirmed that none of the family members knew where the Blazer was, Barbara decided... Okay, after they confirmed that none of the family members knew where the Blazer was, Barbara decided to call it into the police. Stephen stated Barbara then contacted Manitoba County Sheriff's Office from his residence. Stephen does not know what time the vehicle would have been taken. He stated he does not recall seeing the Blazer at any time on Tuesday, September 21st, 2004. I questioned Stephen about any personal property that may have been kept in the vehicle. Stephen stated the vehicle was kept very clean and was not aware of any personal property that was kept in the vehicle. He advised the vehicle would have had a factory installed AM FM radio. He was not aware of any other valuables that would have been in the vehicle. So I believe he's talking about Janda now. The day the vehicle was discovered missing, she was elsewhere all day she stated she was feeling very sick on that day and she never left the trailer jody stated stephen was gone throughout most of the day and she believes that he was likely working at auto avery's auto salvage jody stated she believes that stephen got home sometime after three o'clock jody stated in the late afternoon or early evenings Believe Stephen was outside working on something. She does not believe that he ever left the residence to go anywhere. She went to bed approximately 7.30 because she was feeling very sick. She stated she recalls hearing Stephen come in at the residence at approximately 8 o'clock. She stated she then fell asleep. Jody later recalls waking up and hearing Barbara's voice in the residence. She overheard Barbara and Stephen talking about the missing vehicle. She stated Barbara then called the police to report it missing. Jody stated the blazer is normally kept parked next to the ice shanty between the residences. She was unable to see the vehicle from her residence since it would be obstructed by the garage. Jody does not recall seeing the blazer at any time. She also cannot recall the last time she saw the vehicle on the property. Jody said she does not recall seeing or hearing anyone on the property throughout the day. So, Interesting, right? So this is really bizarre. 
on how I'm guessing it's just weird. They're interrogating Avery. Are they trying to pin this on Avery somehow? But if if Avery did, let's say, let's go to the side of the guilters. If they believe Avery was responsible for randomly burning this car for to get some kind of $1,900 insurance settlement or whatever, I mean, how much could he have sold the car for? I mean, he's got Teresa Hallback coming and taking pictures of vehicles all the time. Ah, uh, it's, it's rough. It's rough. Um, wouldn't they have gotten more money if the vehicle was stolen and not found burned? So what would be the purpose of burning it? Other people say that if the MO to get rid of evidence is taking cars elsewhere to burn them, why would why would Avery leave the Teresa's RAV4 on his own property? <laughs> I mean, obviously that doesn't make any sense at all. But if Avery's a car burner, would it would it be effective to, to do the same thing with Teresa's RAV4 and just take it somewhere and burn it for all the evidence instead of leaving the evidence in it for people to find by just covering it with a couple of branches? <laughs> I mean, again, doesn't really, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. So let me go back to the inspiringdad.com. He had a write-up on Xander Road. There has to be a link between Teresa Hallback's murder and Xander Road. There are way too many coincidences linking them together. This may be the place Teresa was murdered and cremated. This may be where Kathleen Zellner proves Teresa was killed and Stephen was never there because he was on the phone at his house during that supposed time. Yesterday, while going through logs of my blog, I came across a link that was being visited, a link I never created, even though it's automatically created. This link sends you directly to the picture of the Xander Road sign from Stephen Avery's trailer. This might be what Zellner was referencing when she tweeted, check, A-D-U-H-I-D. I think it's too coincidental that this kind of link never showed up on my blogs and disappeared. Redditor One Piece of Gum Left has their own feelings about Xander Road. I was reading the post by Sleuthing Hobbyist regarding a vile smelling fire on November 1st. And this is, a, a, in the Queso report, Paul Metz reported a vile smelling fire on November 1st that cows damaged fences in attempts to get away from. Paul Metz also called the nuclear power plant, which further gives credibility to his claims, as this would have been before Teresa Hallback was even known to be missing. This is on November 1st. Why wasn't this aspect ever mentioned or investigated further? I have to believe that if these people smelled a possible fire four miles away, there'd have to be many who potentially smelled it as well. I count at least 10 houses properties south of Metz's place. If you head south and question those 10 or so residences, you might get a better idea of how far south the source of smell had been or even the source of the smell. The fact that we don't see any further investigation of this claim leads me to believe that the event happening on November 11th was simply not in line with their narrative. So maybe the most solid lead in terms of a body getting burned doesn't get investigated further because it wasn't on October 31st. So that's interesting. That's very interesting. Now, how many coincidences? The coincidence stack is already a mile high. We have so many out of the normal occurrences around this time period we have all these people dying of alleged drug overdoses we there's just so much to keep track of it is mind shocking beyond mind shocking and we have these constant mentions to xander road now which i'll be continuing so this is the the host sleuthing hobbyist made and back to the inspiringdads.com's uh blog post i found another coincidence so unbelievable i felt it needed its own thread as the other post states, there was a fire so vile, it spooked Paul Metz's cows to the point of breaking through fences. And again, how often does that happen? We need control. So is this a weekly thing or has this never, ever happened before? I'm sure his livestock had to be used to normal smelling fires as people in the area probably burned de debris occasionally. As most of us have heard, a burning body is something quite different, foul, and distinct. The report of Paul Metz's interview is on pages 289, 294, and 295 of the Queso reports. It lists his home address in the reports, but that's not where his cattle are. His cattle are on land on Xander Road, just west of Jambo Creek Road. Here's the very weird coincidence. There was a for sale sign from Stephen Avery's Grand Am entered at trial. 
On the back was written an address on Xander Road along with Teresa Hallback's phone number. Huh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting indeed? It didn't look like Stephen Avery's writing and witnesses, law enforcement, were asked if the address meant anything to them. It seemed to me they were being asked because Stephen Avery didn't know why it was written on the back. Remember, countless law enforcement had access to Stephen Avery's property. Stephen Avery's Grand Am for Sale sign with Teresa Hallback's number and the location of her burned body would have been a tidy piece of evidence, don't you think? Until they devised a better and more airtight plan of planting cremated remains right on Stephen Avery's property for a stronger case. Did, that also point leads to the question, were they tr did they originally try to link this Janda car burning off of Xander Road to say that Avery can, that that was Avery's MO. He just dumps cars and or bodies on Xander Road. Huh, interesting. If you pull up the area on Google Maps where Xander Road meets Jambo Creek Road and drop a pin on the property next to Paul Metz's, it shows the address that's on the back of the for sale sign. Two other strange coincidences worth noting, the property directly south of Metz's farm land is owned by a Koenig. And there's a Jason Koenig with Manitowoc Sheriff's Office. And Metz's home address, not the land where his cows are, is on County Road B, directly north of George Zipper's. More very strange coincidences in this case. Redditor Apocalyptic Cynic added this what-if scenario. So what if, one, the Xander Road address was a sudden hustle shot request while Teresa Hallback was in her car doing rounds that day and she jotted it down on the sign quick because it was laying there on the passenger seat. She gives, two, she gives Stephen Avery the sign, perhaps on accident, as she does with all her customers. Three, leaves the Stephen Avery property and goes to the Xander Road site. Four, mystery person does the deed there. Five, Coburn investigates Stephen Avery and does a walkthrough of his place after Teresa Hallback reported missing. Six, sees the sign with address on it and checks it out afterwards. Seven finds the RAV, calls in the plates, and also finds the burn site. Eight realizes there's no way to make the crime stick given the burn site. Nine realizes after conferring with other law enforcement in the depositions that, hey, since Stephen Avery was presumably last to see Teresa Hallback, this set of circumstances is too good to pass up. I mean, we know he's guilty because he got off once before because the bogus DNA evidence contradicted our stellar investigation in 1985. So let's not take any chances this time around and help this along to the rightful conclusion. <laughs> and plus, we can probably save $36 million in the process. Everything falls into place when it comes to Xander Road. There are way too many coincidences. It's even a little freaky if you think about it. What are your thoughts on Xander Road? So is Xander Road similar to Cuss Road in the, all of this insanity? And again, this is without even getting into the CI situations, the DCI situations and agents that may or may not have been involved in Auto Trader and Teresa Hallback, which may or may not have been involved in that. All unknown. So let's go all the way back to these uh, drug overdose situations and these links. So... The uh, back to the TikTok Manitowoc Reddit and this post here regarding Weigert and Lank. So I'll, I'll start it again. I suspect Teresa Hallback made it home and was killed there accidentally or intentionally or a drug overdose. I think Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott Blodorn were in a secret drug business with Mark Weigert. Queso drug investigator. And they called him for help instead of 911 because an investigation at the house would get them all in trouble. When Weigert discovered that Teresa Hallback had seen Stephen Avery via her phone or paperwork, he called Lank and they planned to solve both departments' problems and be heroes by framing Stephen Avery. I think the RAV and Teresa Hallback's body, if it was a drug overdose, were moved to Xander Road and set on fire. Manitowoc Sheriff's Office had attempted to frame Stephen Avery for a stolen car fire there a few months before. Andy Coburn was sent to plant the Xander Road sign, the folded plates, 
and panties and to find the RAV and call it in, causing it to be entered into evidence. But they discovered the recorded jail calls with Jody and the crime scene had to be moved to Avery Salvage Yard. At this point, I think Kratz had gotten involved and made himself the boss, orchestrating the rest of the planting like a trial checklist with little thought to how it would be found. And just another point here, a lot of these clueless coincidence theorists when dismissing so-called conspiracies or more than one perpetrator, they, for whatever reason, cannot fathom that conspiracies don't always go off without a hitch. So when something doesn't make sense to their small, feeble minds, they they just have this hallucination that if there was any conspiracy ever carried out, it would have to have been carried out flawlessly, as if plans can't change, as if things can't be botched and had to be changed last second in somewhat downright stupid ways because of unexpected road bumps, Murphy's Law. This really isn't that hard to understand. I think small children can understand that sometimes things go wrong and you have to either, you have to improvise or go to some kind of plan B, plan C that might not actually be logical or even appear logical, but in the heat of the moment, there's not, you have to deviate from the original plan for whatever reason. And then we end up with what we get, which is this really sloppy botch job, which wasn't really intended as such. But that's the way it ended up. Same thing in the Moore Murray case. Same thing in some of these other cases. Just because something isn't carried out flawlessly and doesn't appear to make sense, that doesn't mean there wasn't a conspiracy of sorts. So continuing on here, it wouldn't surprise me if the RAV in Avery Salvage Yard is a not quite duplicate. A burned car couldn't be hidden there. And the blood in the back of it is not Teresa Hallback's. That's why it wasn't open at Avery Salvage Yard and was covered and moved in the dark. I think Ryan Hillegas got scratched with branches while covering it up in the dark while getting instructions from law enforcement via his phone and the flyover video. Teresa Hallback's keys had either been burned or wouldn't fit the duplicate RAV, so a replacement was made attached to the fob she'd never used and planted at Stephen Avery's. Bullets found around the garage were rubbed with the DNA and planted later, after the floor was dusty from jackhammering. The voicemails were switched. Zipper audio was put onto the Janda video. Zipper was the one with the incomplete address. No wonder the CD is, quote, lost now. I doubt the bones planted in Stephen Avery's burn pit with Teresa Hallbacks, and there was clearly no giant fire there, especially involving tires. I think that Teresa Hallback DNA is from the personal items collected at her home and brought to Avery Salvage Yard. I think the Stephen Avery DNA is swabbed from his sink, the extra stolen groin swabs, sweat and touch, and dripped from a non-EDTA vial that Lank stole from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office evidence lockup. A standard blood draw includes 10 tubes of different colors with different additives. The search of Avery Salvage Yard instigated by Ryan Hillegas, untrained law enforcement, was put off until the duplicate RAV was in place. Pam of God was set up to find it, but was confused because it was a different color than she was expecting and the VIN had been tampered with. I think Ken Kratz wrote the Loopy K's Sakaiki letter, ordered the planning of items in the Janda burn barrel, faked computer searches, and quarry bones, so to trick Scott Tadiuch, Barb Janda, and Bobby Dassey, and Joshua Redont into changing their stories to include a big fire by claiming that Stephen Avery was guilty and trying to frame them. If they didn't comply, they'd be charged as accomplices. That's why Barb Janda was so wishy-washy and Scott Tadiuche was so ecstatic when Stephen Avery was convicted. Brendan was too confused to cooperate and they had to need it out of him. They hoped Stephen Avery would confess to save his young disabled nephew. At a minimum, I think these people were knowingly involved in the cover-up. Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, Scott Blodorn, Mark Weigert, Lank, Andy Coburn, Ken Kratz, Tom Fallon, 
Sherry Coolhane, and Remaker. All of them would benefit from Stephen Avery being convicted or from allowing themselves to be blackmailed. At least one of them has been talking to Kathleen Zellner. Nobody ever dreamed that this case would have a worldwide audience. The mere suggestion of filmmakers having access to the courtroom and family made Kratz apoplectic and desperate to get their footage seized and the project tied up in legal red tape more than once. He's now desperate to sway public opinion and points often to the contents of the documentary series, not the transcripts and evidence. I could be wrong about some or all of this, but all of the evidence fits with a similar scenario. How Mark Weigert knew the Barb Janda appointment was Stephen Avery on November 3rd without having received that info from Singular. Why unemployed nursing graduate was making frequent deliveries to construction worker Scott Blodorn. How Mike Hallback knew to grieve for Teresa Hallback before her car was found. Why Ryan Hillegas and Mike Hallback were acting so squirrely about being on Avery Salvage Yard. Why Ryan Hillegas was working so closely with law enforcement and deemed untrained law enforcement and allowed on crime scene. He was probably familiar to Queso as a drug informant. Why Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott Blow Blowdorn were not investigated. And that is curious. Again, when a, when a female is, goes missing or is met with foul play, it's usually the significant other, boyfriend, ex-boyfriend. Ryan scratches, murder and or planning of the car, only one of 10 colored tubes in unsealed evidence box, totally ignored as crucial evidence, the Xander road sign, the Sakaiki letter, computer searches, quarry bones, large amounts of blood in the back of RAV, missing parts, damage and VIN tampering to RAV, all used for blackmailing witnesses not helpful against Stephen Avery. Kratz's email to Kulhane that Weigert was checking the 1985 blood, what it was, likely the preservative. Zero tire residue plus unburned leaves and grass around the burn pit. Shock and horror. What could be more shocking than Teresa Hallback's closest friends and brother and corrupt law enforcement working to get two innocent men convicted of a crime by using his closest friends and family against him? And this was written by Mr. Precedent at TikTok Manitowoc. Is this the best theory as of yet on the, what happened to Teresa Hallback and how the investigation was so bizarre? He also wrote this, I suspect Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott, and Scott Blodorn were in a secret drug business with Mark Weigert and probably Ken Kratz a known drug addict. That could explain why an unemployed nurse was dropping stuff off to a construction worker a few times a week, <laughs> why law enforcement referred to Ryan Hillegas by a different but similar name, and why no law enforcement thought it was odd that the untrained law enforcement ex-boyfriend of the victim was allowed to wander around a crime scene while the coroner was banned due to conflict of interest. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> the, vic the missing person's ex-boyfriend boyfriend is allowed to wander the crime scene to his leisure while the coroner is banned. It explains why Mike Callback was grieving before his sister's car was found and why Ryan Hillegas butted in to make sure Mike Callback didn't answer the reporter's questions incorrectly. I think Teresa Hallback died of a drug-related accident or crime. Maybe she OD'd or threatened to expose their crimes. Keep in mind, Scott Blodorn is her roommate, who is the friend of her ex, Ryan Hilligas. And they called Mark Weigert directly instead of 911 for help because a reported drug-related death or murder would get them all in trouble. According to the singular rep's testimony, he couldn't have numbers for calls. I think they broke into Teresa Hallback's account to try to get her information so they'd have an explanation for how Mike Weigert, Mark Weigert, knew on November 3rd that Teresa Hallback had talked to Stephen Avery, but it wasn't there. Ryan Hilliger's phone calls were inquiries as to why they couldn't print out the info they needed. 
and the fake list was made to hide the fact that it wasn't available. They had either Teresa Hall back her phone or her completed paperwork between October 31st and November 3rd. Weigert's statement that a reverse search of Barb Janda's number led to St Stephen Avery when we know it could not have is the first provable lie in the case. He lied because he was involved in the framing from the very beginning. For the record, I think Teresa Hallback made it home and died there, either by accident or attack. I suspect Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott Blodorn were involved in a secret drug business with Mark Weiger. And they called him instead of 911 because a drug-related death would get them all in trouble. When he learned Teresa Hallback had, vid had visited Stephen Avery via her paperwork, phone, or stories told by Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott Blodorn, he knew they could solve two problems at once. He called Lank, and they decided to frame Stephen Avery. The original crime scene was supposed to be Xander Road, where there was an attempt by Manitowoc Sheriff's Office to frame Stephen Avery several months prior, but when they learned about the recorded jail calls with Jody, they had to move everything to Avery Salvage Yard. All of the evidence, lies, and strange behavior fit into this scenario or one very similar to it. If Mark Weiger was involved in a secret drug business involving seized or controlled substances. He would benefit by not having to explain how his cohorts were involved in a drug-related death. I'm sure being heralded as a hero who cracked the case within minutes of the phone call and put Stephen Avery away doesn't hurt either. And some responses here, that's assuming a drug connection, and you may as well say the same about Remaker. He was the drug investigator from Manitowoc. Except, of course, Remaker was not co-leader of the investigation. Mr. President responds, Remaker was likely involved too. He and Weigert had a couple of very interesting phone calls about the plan. And he commented that the source of the tightly controlled drugs that killed Carmen Bootwell were untraceable. Perhaps Remaker is one of the people who has spilled the beans to Kathleen Zellner. It all could have started as a cleanup for a secret operation that went awry. I do think Kratz took over the orchestration of the planting once the crime scene was moved. That's why the evidence reads like a checklist of what would be needed at trial with so little thought put into how it was found or treated. Another response here, it would explain the missing screws for the RAV4 dashboard. It would explain the possible Martinez connection to Avery Salvage Yard, the comments about a baggie, Queso Page 980. It would explain the statements made by Jody's stepfather, Queso Page 1052. It would explain how Teresa knew on October 30th when chatting with Harriet on Yahoo that she would be in the area of Avery Salvage Yard the next day, October 31st. And Harriad, so this is Queso, page 291, Harriad, apparently Mark Harriad contacted John Dietering the week of November 13, 2005, indicated he had possibly been online with Teresa Hallback the night before she had disappeared and further indicated she had mentioned going to the Avery property. Harriet indicated the day before Teresa Hallback went missing, he was in an online chat, members.yahoo.com, with someone who he believed to be Teresa Hallback. He was unsure of the date, but stated it was for certain the day before she went missing. Unless he's, I mean, would it have been after? I mean, what? he stated he had tried to contact her via Yahoo on one previous occasion. He stated that he had looked up her profile on members.yahoo.com and searched by location. He stated he found her information along with a photo online. Harriet stated that he had done the chat with her the day before she went missing in Wisconsin chat room. He stated Teresa mentioned she enjoyed photography, and this is one of the items he used when he queried the members.yahoo.com and located her profile. Harriet stated the day before she went missing, he was in a Wisconsin chat room and saw her screen name being active on the chat online. He stated he tried to text message her. Harriet stated he saw in her profile that she was from the Green Bay area. He text messaged her and asked her if she was interested in meeting new people on the internet. He stated they chatted about photography, the outdoors, and other things. Harriet stated the person he was chatting with, who he believed to be Teresa, mentioned st seeing Stephen Avery in file footage 
run on television regarding his multi-million dollar lawsuit. She indicated she had been to Stephen Avery several times before taking photos. According to Harriet, the person he was chatting with stated that friends of hers told her not to hang around Avery's, but she thought Stephen was a nice guy. The individuals Harriet was text messaging with also mentioned she enjoyed taking photos of the old cars, which he believed to be classics, that Stephen had in the area. Harriet stated the night before, the night they chatted online, the person he was chatting with indicated she was going to Avery's tomorrow. So this was apparently between 9.30 and 10 p.m. for approximately 45 minutes. Harriet indicated the person who he was chatting with stated she would be online the next day at approximately 8 p.m. He stated he checked the chat rooms and did not see that subject's profile or screen name listed. He indicated the person he was chatting with specifically mentioned the fact that she worked with Auto Trader Magazine. There was no mention of when the appointment with Stephen Avery was actually scheduled. The person Harriet was chatting with online indicated she was recently single, and Harriet felt this meant she had recently ended a relationship. Harriet stated he and his two-year-old son, he had his two-year-old son the weekend before Halloween and described that weekend as being a cold weekend. He stated that he and his son stayed around the apartment complex, swimming in the pool, etc. Harriet stated he was not sure if he had his son the weekend of November 4th to November 5th. He indicated he goes into chat rooms every couple of days. There was no mention of whether the person he was chatting with preferred wet film to digital photography equipment. Investigation continues. Another post by Mr. Precedent here. I think Ryan Hillegas and Mark Weigert had something going on that made it necessary to frame Stephen Avery to protect both of them. Probably drugs. I think the 22 calls between Ryan Hillegas and law enforcement on the night the RAV was planted show it was a coordinated effort. Another post here by Mr. Precedent. I think, just a hunch that may be wrong, that Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott Blodorn were involved in selling drugs confiscated by Calumet drug investigator Weigert, possibly Kratz also and that Teresa Hallback died at home in the presence of Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott Blodorn of an overdose or injury that would have gotten them all in serious trouble if a coroner learned that she died at home and did an autopsy. They called Weigert for help and got the idea to call Lank, frame Stephen Avery, solve two big problems, and win some big awards and brownie points. I think Weigert is deeply involved in the framing and probably is the orchestrator of it until sweaty Ken Kratz took over. I think Ryan Hillegas was dropping off drugs to Scott Blodorn a few times a week and Teresa Hallback either overdosed and died or threatened to expose a secret drug business with queso and was murdered. She could also have been making deliveries, but I think Ryan Hillegas, Mike Hallback, and Scott Blodorn definitely had a personal reason to help law enforcement frame Stephen Avery and Bobby Dassey and Scott Tadiaicha all got blackmailed into helping. And back to the other Teresa Hallback sightings here, there was the witness who saw Teresa Hallback taking pictures of a cow on the morning of November 11th. The tipster thought maybe Teresa had spent the night in the area before she spotted her traveling south of Whitelaw the morning of Tuesday, November 1st. Was Teresa coming from Cuss Road and heading to a photo shoot, perhaps Steve Schmitz's home, or was she coming from Schmitz's and heading north towards Cuss Road? Her phone still was off network at this point. The first incoming call to her phone since Stephen Avery's incoming call at 4.35 p.m. on October 31st was at 9.49 a.m. on November 1st. Interesting. And of course, uh, Weigert was the one that handled this sighting. How did he handle it? And then, of course, I went over this. This was really shady. November 5th, 10.40 a.m., Baldwin was requested by Weigert to follow up on this info on the sighting. And then as soon as he arrived, Weigert informs him they located Avery's vehicle on the Avery property, and I guess they no longer care about this sighting. It's really bizarre. Really, really bizarre. 
Weigert was also the one who dismissed Leo Richmond's sighting on November 5th about Teresa at his door at looking for a home in the area at 11.30 p.m. So are these too many coincidences to keep track of now? I mean, we're in the stratosphere with coincidences. And Weigert is the one dismissing all of this information that doesn't fit the narrative. Really, really weird. Now, if that really was... See, what's weird? How long was Hallback alive? And... What, what was going on? Because if she wasn't being held captive and panicked on November 5th, like, what's really going on? Because if she's normal but looking for a home in the area, relatives of DCI agents and such on Cuss Road, is everything fine until then, so to speak? Or not? Was she, was she laying low and then something happened and then she couldn't lay low anymore? But when we look at Making a Murderer Season 2, there's some images of Cuss Road with a bunch of black Suburbans. So is this DOJ FBI vehicles? So if the crime scene was going on on November 4th and 5th, what was going on? Was there a tip that has not been made public on what exactly happened on Cuss Road? And apparently the, the DOJ files regarding everything happening at Cuss Road are sealed. So why are they sealed and do the answers lie there? Was there a different frame, jo frame up job or completely different crime scene that has nothing to do with Avery going on with these other agents? And then the lid gets put on that. So the DOJ portable crime lab was at Cuss Road. So, and of course, that could have processed the RAV4 without having it needed to be towed to the crime lab. And the trained techs were all there with the DOJ crime lab at Cuss Road. Another poster posted this. My theory, at Cuss Road, the DOJ or FBI were set up there during the flyover video, which means they were already investigating something else there. Maybe they were tipped off to a dead body being buried there or something of sorts, but you have a very interesting theory for sure sounds logical. A professional photographer doing auto trader would starve to death on what they get paid and the fact that anybody could take pictures for auto trader. I wish there was some way to date the pictures of Cuss Road. Even the pilot says something to Jerry Pagel when they fly over Cuss Road in the plane. The crappy flyover footage was edited to not show things for sure. But why would the cops try to hide the RAV4 when it should be there? Or maybe it's not under the tarp. Another response here, exactly when you see the big black suburbans at a crime, it usually involves a crime the federal authorities are interested in. Gangs, drugs, human trafficking. Most of the time they are out of the regional or state office of the FBI to see if they have jurisdiction over the scene. If Teresa Hallback was working undercover, her missing and a burial site found, the feds would be all over that. It is a red flag that something serious happened. Another response here, back in the time frame of early 2000 to 2005, the country was being hit with rural operations of meth production using old barns in rural areas where the odor of cooking wouldn't be detected by neighbors. It spurred the successful Breaking Bad TV series. There has been some conclusive proof that the photographer prior to Teresa Hallback at Auto Trader was working undercover for the Wisconsin Department of Justice. Drug trade funds from the federal government often require joint task forces with local agencies. I think we're all going to find when the case is solved by Kathleen Zellner that Teresa Hallback was the new operative working the Manitowoc County, Calumet County area up to, G to Green Bay working undercover out of Auto Trader. The video she makes about death could very well have been about the knowledge working undercover. If you get exposed, you will die a horrible death. Now that does indeed point to a new meaning to that video because that is kind of a random video. Huh, that's quite mind shocking.
But continuing the post here, I now believe Scott Tadiaich, Bobby Dassey, and M.O. Who are M.O.'s initials? Intercepted her on Highway 147, tortured her down on Cuss Road, and when done, buried her body temporarily until they figured out a way to dispose of her permanently, thus the dog hits of a corpse at Cuss Road. They did a bad job hiding her SUV near Scott Tediaichi's trailer on Highway 147, and it was seen by the truck driver, thus allowing Andy Coburn to find it and put a new battery from the MC garage into it. And with the help of the sheriff and Lank, and then Mark Weigert and Fassbender, framed Stephen Avery to make the lawsuit go away. Scott Teddy H, most likely using the burn barrel and his company's smelter, disposed of most of Teresa Hallback. The Manitou County Sheriff's Office had Carmen Budwell available for plant for planting some bones in Stephen Avery's fire pit. It's why no perfect match of DNA. It's not because of burning, but her being a cousin. Scott Teddy H and Bobby Dassey alibi each other with the help of Barb. They are able to buy the new house because of the drug trade. The local cops continue taking their bribes to say nothing about their meth operation. Thus, Mark Weigert and Barb remain friends all these years. Stephen Avery is hated by Scott Teddy H because he was interfering being around so much with his meth operation. Thus, why Scott Teddy H says it's the best thing that ever happened when Stephen Avery was sent back to jail. Making a murder or two and all the scenes with Barb started my head thinking, God, she looks like a meth head, a tweaker, then it all fell into place. The other thing that we can't forget is that an FBI agent actually came to Wilmer Seibert's door shortly after Hallback went missing and showed him a picture of Hallback and asked if he knew her, which he didn't. And now we, we actually have FBI agents on location. So to all of the cognitive dissonant coincidence theorists who think this is also far-fetched, I mean, we have all of these black SUVs on location at Cuss Road. We have actual FBI agents walking around asking about Hallback. We, it's just, it's so insane how all of these little pieces of evidence are already there. There's no reaching. There's no far-fetched. It's already established. Now, what it means is unknown, but is this really out of the realm of possibility? And, of course, Seabird is the guy that saw the white Jeep. Uh, uh, Coburn apparently had one as well, and he saw these uh, vehicles that may have been planning uh, the RAV4. So, November 3rd, here's another post on TikTok Manitowoc. One dead, one missing, two framed. November 3rd, 2005 was a seemingly busy day for Manitowoc and surrounding areas. One, Carmen Budwell found of a suspicious drug overdose that morning, approximately 8.30 a.m. Two, Teresa Hallback reported missing later that day at 5 p.m. Three, Stephen Avery shows on the Global Subject Activity Report summary as homicide suspect at 6.34 p.m. Can these three events be connected? It certainly looks as though they can. There was also a warrant issued for Carmen Bootwell's arrest October 10th, 2005. And this is actually very curious. So Carmen Bootwell met with law enforcement days prior to her death. Her grandmother drove her to an out-of-the-place location where Carmen Bootwell sat in the back seat of a law enforcement vehicle, refusing to tell them what they wanted to hear. She was nervous and anxious about this meeting. October 31st, 2005, on the day of October 31st, her family tells me that she was attending school and prepped to attend college and had come home for lunch that day and spoke to her mom about what she was doing for Halloween. Carmen loved Halloween and she loved shelling out candy to the local kids. She told her mom that she was staying home that night and would look forward to her mom stopping by with her little brother in costume. Unfortunately, she never spoke with her again and did not make it over that night to see her. On the day of Halloween, Teresa Hallback is working her Monday at Auto Trader and has an appointment at the salvage yard with Stephen Avery to take photos of his sister's van. 
November 3rd, 2005, approximately 8.30 a.m., Carmen Bootwell's grandmother had gone upstairs and knocked on the door to wake Carmen Bootwell. She did not answer. So Carmen Bootwell had an apartment in the upstairs of her grandmother's home. The grandmother lived downstairs. A few minutes later, an unknown female alerted Carmen Bootwell's grandmother that Carmen Bootwell might be dead. The grandmother went upstairs where she found Carmen Bootwell sitting on the floor, leaning against the stereo and unresponsive. This is kind of weird. An unknown female alerted the grandmother. There's always these unknown individuals circling these, these shady, suspicious deaths, aren't there? Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department was contacted and responded. Conversations between Manitowoc County and Carmen Bootwell's family immediately ensued and her family was told she had OD. So this was before any kind of uh, autopsy or anything? Very, very weird. So the autopsy was on November 4th, the funeral on the 8th. But apparently that, I don't know what's going on here. Huh. So her family remembers placing her in the back of the hearse shortly after 1 p.m. on November 8th. Then she was taken to be cremated, but for some reason it took three weeks for her cremains to be returned to the family. Carmen Bootwell's family questioned her death a few times to law enforcement and were told she was a drug addict and to get over it, and that finding her killer was virtually impossible. Law enforcement never investigated Carmen Bootwell's suspicious drug death. However, Manitowoc County stated in the news article that the case was still open. So Manitowoc County removed the corner that was not allowed on Stephen Avery's property. So technically they had no corner. So Bootwell was driven two hours to Waukesha County morgue. Her autopsy was done by Deborah Kakash. <laughs> oh man, this is just, uh, yeah, this is crazy. The autopsy stated her organs were normal along with low numbers for methadone and alcohol. What is questionable is the mention of markings and their location that she was more apt to have died from suffocation strangulation rather than an OD. During the autopsy, tissue and samples were taken and stored, and there was also a DNA card made for her. Huh. The coroner, Deborah Kakash, had contacted Carmen Bootwell's family daily, always saying how sorry she was. Her last day calling, she called three times with the last conversation being that she was removed from the case and she stopped calling the family. Huh. And her funeral, of course, just happens to be the day supposed bones are found on the Avery Salvage Yard. So I'm going to close this out with an interesting article from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, February 5th, 2015. Federal agencies' payments to confidential informants increase. Federal programs that pay people to tell on others awarded around half a billion dollars during 2014. The bulk of the disclosed awards went to whistleblowers. Their more shadowy cousins, confidential informants, got tens of millions, including $28.8 in payments from a single Department of Justice fund, according to a report sent to Congress on January 29th. The informant payments came out of the asset forfeiture program, which last year re received $4.47 billion through the seizure of proceeds or tools of crimes. The award payments provide a tremendous incentive to individuals to assist in investigations of drug traffickers that result in the seizure and forfeiture of drug-related assets. According to an Obama administration budget statement, the program also helped the FBI to fight criminal schemes in white-collar crime, organized crime, and narcotics trafficking, the administration contends. Federal law enforcement depends on thousands of informants to help with criminal cases, but a review of 154 recent federal acquittals nationally found that one in six involved informant problems. Informants whose work led directly to seizures got $16.8 million from the program, while $12 million went to resources whose work don't, didn't lead directly to criminal assets. A total of $28.8 million continued a steady upward trend from $22.4 million five years earlier. Defense attorneys sometimes argue that tying informant pay to seizures 
perverts the process. Now informants are being paid on a percentage basis and the work is now more profit driven than it is driven for the sake of uncovering criminal conduct, said downtown based defense attorney Mark Sindler, who has defended several clients accused by federal informants. That's morally problematic. Last month, Attorney General Eric Holder barred most use of the federal for forfeiture process by local law enforcement agencies. He didn't curb the power of federal agencies to seize assets of suspected criminals. Last year, the DEA paid informants $20.9 million from their forfeiture program. The FBI paid informants $7.2 million, with other agencies making up the rest. Experts said those totals reflect just a fraction of the agency's payments to informants. I have seen so much game playing with funding and stats during my career that I simply cannot accept these stats on face value, said Michael Levine, a DEA undercover agent for 25 years who is now a court expert on drug stings and has written two books on the case. Each case is different, and when it involves large award cases, the ability to take money from different, sometimes secret funding is limitless. The DEA's policies for using informants are different from those recommended by its parent agency, the Department of Justice. So that's really interesting. So there's definitely a lot of informants out there making a lot of money, so perhaps it's more viable it's more lucrative than others think and with the right connection. So Teresa Hallback just happened to fill the shoes of a previous undercover agent of sorts. I mean, this is all really, really bizarre. The coincidence stack is a mile high now. It's just very, very difficult to write it all off without being just downright silly and completely clueless because what are the chances that all of this is all coincidence? How clueless of a guilter does one have to be to just pretend none of these anomalies and coincidences have anything to do with the investigation? It's just, it's really, really bizarre. And there's plenty more to come in the Stephen Avery series. Believe it or not, we still, episode 33, with so much more left to go over. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the Mind Shock podcast in the Stephen Avery series. If you appreciate the podcast, please donate to our PayPal. Help support the channel. Help us get more episodes out there in more cases to get truth and justice to triumph over all of the corruption and wrongful convictions going on out there. Subscribe to the channel. Make sure you enable notifications. You can just go to youtube.com slash mindshock or youtube.com slash mindshock true crime to see the latest podcasts as they are released and manually peruse our ever-expanding back catalog. Like this podcast, share it across social media platforms of which you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You can also be a guest on the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mindshock True Crime. You're listening to the Stephen Allen Avery series of the Making a Murderer fame. The Netflix show that ignited a firestorm of individuals calling for justice and exposing corrupt walk. Of course, the documentary was heavily biased in favor of Manitowoc by only exposing such a mere fraction of their obvious corruption. That, that was the basis for the entire Mind Shock podcast regarding covering this Stephen Avery case. The Making a Murder documentary didn't even address the fact that Stephen Avery did not physically pick up a cat and throw it in a fire, according to testimony from an individual named Mr. Yanda, who admitted 
in a police statement that he physically lifted the cat and threw it in the fire. The police statement exists to this day. Yanda not even punished, but Stephen Avery punished because that's how they do justice, so-called justice in Manitowoc, a.k.a. Corruptowoc. The individual physically responsible for lifting a living thing and causing its death not punished. Someone else present who may or may not have been involved in some drunk antics, they're punished. But the perpetrator who physically did the act, not punished. That's how they do things in Manitowoc. And the Making a Murder a Netflix documentary didn't even address such basics. Very, very biased. Very, very biased against Stephen Avery. So, anyway, on this episode, this is episode 34, Bobby Dassey. We'll also be discussing Scott Tadiecha who, of course, intersects this case very curiously and is a very dubious individual himself. I've discussed him quite a bit in the past on the podcast. If you're not caught up, at least watch the previous episode, episode 33, CIs and Undercover Agents. It is one of the most mind-shocking episodes in this series thus far, going over all of the issues with FBI, state officials, Manitowoc, local corruption, state corruption, all of this insanity that uh, that just needs to be addressed by any objective, neutral, logical examination in this case. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Help support the channel. Help us get more mind-shocking episodes out there, not just in this case of wrongful conviction, but in other wrongful convictions as well, as well as unsolved cold cases, unsolved murders, and missing persons. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure you allow your device to have those notifications come through. You can also just go to youtube.com slash mindshock or youtube.com slash mindshock true crime. Like this podcast, share it across social media platforms to keep the awareness up, keep the pressure up, and you could also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get a priority for case topic logical analysis, co-podcast your requests. You can also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. It is strongly recommended you have at least a basic children's level understanding of English comprehension. A lot of commenters do not, but they they provide some interesting analysis for Dunning-Kruger fodder as well. So I guess it's all good. So before we get to a lot of these other issues I haven't gotten to regarding Bobby, regarding Bobby Dassey and Scott Tadoosh, <laughs> we will look at the latest information. Zellner drops... The biggest evidence bombshell in the Stephen Avery's case thus far, according to several media outlets. Uh, I'll be reading this article from Patch.com, written by John Farrak, posted April 12th, 2021, mere days ago. Prominent wrongful conviction lawyer Kathleen Zellner believes the recent development should get Stephen Avery a new trial. As if he shouldn't get one based on the fact that there was no actual evidence that held up to logical scrutiny <laughs> regarding the state's allegations. All right, so a former Gannett, Wisconsin newspaper delivery route driver has come forward and signed a sworn affidavit attesting that he notified the Manitoba County Sheriff's Office at the time of Teresa Hallback's disappearance that he saw Bobby Dassey and another man moving Hallback's RAV4 vehicle to the Avery property. Downers Grove, Illinois, wrongful conviction lawyer Kathleen Zellner filed a motion Monday afternoon in Manitoba County accusing prosecutors of Stephen Avery of committing a Brady violation. Prosecutors and police are not allowed to hide exculpatory evidence that may be favorable to a criminal defendant in preparation of trial. And is this the best case example of Brady violations? I mean, they're just every which way you look. It's nothing but Brady violations. Is there anything legitimate against Avery? 
Zellner remains determined to regain Avery's freedom in the murder case that has gained international fame following the December 2015 docuseries Making a Murder. Zellner told Patch that Monday's filing marks the biggest development in her effort during the past five years of winning Stephen Avery's freedom. This is an evidence bombshell in the Avery case, she said. We consider it the most significant witness evidence ever in the case, and it's an objective, non-biased witness who notified police in 2005, and he was ignored. We'll also be examining definitive evidence of that. I think Stephen Avery never would have been convicted had this evidence been known during his trial, and it destroys Bobby Dassey's credibility and links him to the crime, Zellner said. Now, just a quick aside here. Links to the crime of what? Planning evidence or murdering Teresa Hallback who may not actually be dead? So there's a lot of uh, gray area there, but if Bobby Dassey was possibly coerced against his will into doing the planting by corrupt law enforcement officials, what does that mean? And we'll be getting into those theories as well. Back to the article, Zellner's April 11th motion states that new witness Thomas Sawinski came forward and notified her that he was a motor route delivery driver for Gannett, Wisconsin newspapers, which is the largest newspaper publisher in Wisconsin. Back in 2005, Sawinski delivered newspapers to the Avery Salvage Yard along Avery Road during the early morning hours of November 5th, 2005, which was a Saturday. Prior to delivering the newspapers to the Avery Salvage Yard, he turned onto the Avery property and witnessed two individuals, a shirtless Bobby Dassey and an unidentified male suspiciously pushing a dark blue RAV4 down Avery Road toward the junkyard, Zellner's motion stated. The RAV4 did not have its lights on, after Mr. Sawinski drove by Bobby and the other individual and delivered the newspapers to the Avery mailbox, he turned around and drove back towards the exit. When he reached the RAV4, Bobby attempted to step in front of his car to block him from leaving the property. I mean, is this mind shocking yet? For is this mind shocking enough yet for anybody? Mr. Sawinski was within five feet of Bobby, and his headlights were on Bobby during this entire time. So, if this account is all true, I mean, that's clear identification right there. Mr. Sawinski swerved into a shallow ditch to escape Bobby and exit the property. Zellner's filing goes on to explain after Mr. Sawinski learned that Teresa Hallback's car was found later in the day on November 5th, 2005, he realized the significance of what he had observed and immediately contacted the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office and spoke to a female officer reporting everything he has stated in his affidavit. However, the Manitowoc County deputy was not interested in learning additional details surrounding the disappearance of Hallback, Zellner's motion reflects. The officer said, quote, we already knew who did it, end quote. <laughs> I mean, these are some psychic officers here. A psychic police department that just already knows all the crime with no evidence. Mr. Sawinski provided his phone number and was told that Mantua County Sheriff's Officer would contact him, but it never did. So how thorough is Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office? Like, even if they believe they have their guy, would a legitimate, non-incompetent, non-corrupt police department or sheriff's office at least follow up on leads? I mean, this is like them terminating interviews as soon as the RAV4 was found of these people who spotted Teresa Hallback after the alleged murder take pla took place, of course, of which there was no evidence of. And again, if you've listened to the previous podcast, particularly the previous episode, but several other podcasts as well in the Mind Shock series regarding sightings of Teresa Hallback after leaving Avery Salvage Yard. But anyway, this is mind shocking on so many levels because this is not simply a case of somebody who just drove by the area and saw two figures, one of which possibly resembled Bobby Dassey, moving something that possibly resembled Teresa Hallback's RAV4. This is a guy that was directly in the middle of the planting of the, of the RAV4. He actually had to swerve, so he was within five feet of Bobby Dassey, his headlights directly on Bobby Dassey, and he had to actually swerve not to hit Bobby Dassey. Now, this leads even more questions. What, what did Bobby Dassey think he was going to do? 
let's say Sawinski stopped. Well, what happened? Like Bobby and this other individual, what were they planning to do to this guy? Were they real? What were they going to do? Just intimidate him into saying he didn't see what he saw? Were they planning on killing him? I mean, this is this is really, really bizarre and mind shocking. But let's continue the article here. Zellner's motion on her post-conviction filing informs the special judge. There's a lot of special people. We have special prosecutors like Ken Kratz, special judges. I mean, a lot of special people in Corruptua. Okay. <laughs> and, and Sheboygan as well. Zellner's motion in her post-conviction filing informs the special judge from neighboring Sheboygan County that Bobby was the state's primary witness against Mr. Avery at his trial. During his opening statement, Prosecutor Kratz explicitly informed the jury of the significance of Bobby's putative observations on the date of Miss Hallback's disappearance. And just, just furthermore, just furthermore to explain how valuable and how valid Ken Kratz's words are, the integrity with which he speaks and brings to the prosecution. Let's examine another statement from Ken Kratz. So in an interview with Crime Watch Daily, March 1st, 2017, Kratz said, they know the hood latch was a central part of my closing argument. And again, let's look at the case file in his closing arguments, March 14th, 2007, he mentions the, uh, the hood latch, 19 pages in, only one sentence. And the second mentioning of the hood latch is 88 pages in, two paragraphs. In his rebuttal argument, 65 pages, March 15th, 2007, he only mentions the hood latch once in two paragraphs, 40 pages in. So that's approximately one out of 166 pages. So that's less than 1%. So around half of 1%, 0.6% was spent on the hood latch DNA. The planted and or transfer DNA. <laughs> the clearly non-legitimate <laughs> DNA sample that, again, isn't even consistent with Stephen Avery's own DNA. Again, we went over that all in uh, DNA for Dummies. If you haven't checked out those podcasts, check those out. So... 0.6%, according to Ken Kratz, quote, a central part of my closing argument. So how much value, okay, so if Ken Kratz's value, his central arguments are the hood latch DNA, of which uh, the CSI tech didn't even change his gloves after going through Stephen Avery's Grand Am. This is a central part, and then also Bobby is supposedly supposedly is extremely significant. He in explicitly informed the jury of the significance of Bobby's putative observations. So if this is all of these central arguments that have no validity, so we're, we're basing it on eyewitness statements, which of course, this is one of the primary reasons for wrongful convictions are inaccurate statements. Again, not necessarily deceptive liars, although they could be, but just basically fallible humans. Humans are fallible, not that shocking. Is it beyond a reasonable doubt? Not even in the same dimension. I mean, that's not the same thing as physical evidence. And physical evidence that actually doesn't hold up to any kind of logical scrutiny, how much is that evidence worth? How come there's nothing legitimate? There's no chain of custody. There's just compare this case to just about any other case. And it's very clear. I mean, a lot of these clueless guilters, uh, they, it seems like they're not familiar with any other case because they don't know how a case is legitimately tried, how a legitimate investigation is conducted, how there's a chain of custody established, how there's not infinite, <laughs> infinite levels of conflicts of interest and banning the only people without a conflict of interest, like the coroner, from the actual scene. No dogs hitting on any remains in Avery's burn pit. I mean, even the, the legend of the bonfire, just from all of these constantly changing witness statements. So all Ken Kratz has is the, uh, the hood latch DNA from a C CSI tech who didn't even change his gloves after going through Stephen Avery's Grand Am. And that is just reeks of inconsistency to any kind of narrative developed on why it would even be there. And then they're not even testing the fingerprints in the vehicle. 
<laughs> I mean, like, this is just, it's, I mean, it's just, th this case is so mind shocking. I mean, it just, it, it, at a certain point, you're at a loss for words on how, again, this is why I call this a common sense test for adults. I mean, can a functioning adult hallucinate? that this is a legitimate investigation. I mean, it's just, it's really mind boggling, mind shocking. So if that's all Kratz has, and then Bobby Dassey's observations, who's clearly an unreliable witness from so many changing testimonies and statements, conflict of interest up the wazoo, possibly involved in other criminal activity with Scott Tadiacha. So there's so much to go over. Okay. So let's continue the article here. Zellner's motion aims to convince the Sheboygan County judge to overturn Avery's first-degree murder conviction. After several years of investigating the case herself, Zellner said she remains steadfast in her belief that Bobby Dassey was responsible for killing Hallback, who disappeared on October 31st, 2005. Coincidentally, Halloween. A lot of disappearances on Halloween. But the coincidence theorists maintain there, there's, there, there can never be any occult element anywhere. Satanism is all myth. myth there's, that's just a myth. People don't actually kidnap and kill people. <laughs> coincidence theorists are very curious that way. The state suppressed the evidence of Mr. Sawinski's report to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office that he had witnessed Bobby and another individual in possession of and moving Miss Hallback's vehicle onto the Avery salvage yard after Miss Hallback's disappearance and prior to the vehicle's discovery, Zellner wrote. The suppressed evidence from Mr. Sawinski was favorable to the defense and material to the pivotal issue in trial because it would have destroyed entirely the credibility of Bobby as the state's primary witness established that Bobby was directly involved in the murder of Miss Hallback and established that Bobby planted evidence to frame his uncle Stephen Avery. And we don't know who supplied that RAV4 because, again, the flyover of the RAV4 is not there, uh, very clear. But what's interesting is that if this wasn't even Teresa Hallback's RAV4, so Bobby Dassey was tasked with planting another RAV4. I mean, it's just, it's. It's very mind shocking, and of course, another thing that comes up that for whatever reason, cognitive dissonant guilters who are just d devoid of all logic and reason, they think that Zellner would reveal all of her information. Why? The, how would, does that make any sense? She would reveal it all to the public and not have it in court? So whatever she's revealing is obviously not all she has. So, again, it's, it's not a hard concept for, for, for even children to understand, you know, keeping, keeping cards close to the vest. I mean, this is a very easy concept to understand, but for whatever reason, guilters don't seem to uh, be able to have the mental capacity to understand that. During Monday afternoon's phone interview, Zellner told Patch that, quote, I think this evidence shows without a doubt that Stephen Avery deserves a new trial, end quote. And that's obvious on many different levels, not even regarding this. In past court filings, Zellner had also accused Bobby Dassey's stepfather, Scott Tadiash, of being a co-conspirator. On Monday, Zellner said that the Gannett, Wisconsin newspaper delivery driver's description of the man with Bobby Dassey, quote, does not match the description of Scott Taduch, and it certainly does not match Stephen Avery, end quote. The man with... Bobby Dassey moving the RAV4, Zellner said, looked to be at least six feet tall, and he had a beard between eight to 12 inches long. A heavily bearded individual. The following information is the affidavit from Sawinski, the former Wisconsin delivery driver. One, I am of legal majority and can truthfully and competently testify to the matters contained herein based upon my personal knowledge. The factual statements herein are true and correct to the best of my knowledge, information, and belief. I am of sound mind and I am not taking any medication, nor have I ingested any alcohol that would impair my memory of the facts stated in this affidavit. But can Ken Kratz say the same? Two, I resided in Manitowoc, Wisconsin for over 20 years. Three, in 2005, I was employed as a motor route driver at Gannett Newspapers, Incorporated and delivered papers in and around the Avery Salvage Yard. While delivering papers, I drove my personal car, which was a tannish gold four-door sedan. I cannot recall the make and model of the car at this time. Is that a little strange? He didn't even know his own personal vehicle? Wow. 
He doesn't know his own personal vehicle making model. So unless he has a bunch of vehicles, does that seem strange? I don't know. Hmm. Or perhaps if he's owned dozens of vehicles, he might not remember the exact. I don't know. Four, on Saturday, November 5th, 2005, I was delivering papers on the Avery Salvage Yard in the early morning hours before sunrise. I drove down Highway 147 and turned left on Avery Road. Soon after I turned on Avery Road, I witnessed an individual who I later realized was Bobby Dassey and another unidentified older male pushing a dark blue RAV4 down Avery Road on the right side towards the junkyard. Bobby Dassey was shirtless, even though it was early November. The second man appeared to be in his 50s or early 60s, had a long gray beard, and was wearing a worn puffy jacket. Now, is, is that a jacket with Puff Daddy on it, or was it just a jacket that's, that's fluffy and puffy? Unclear. Had a larger frame and was around six feet in height. The RAV4 did not have its lights on. Attached and incorporated herein as Exhibit A are photographs marked where I saw the RAV4. Five, I drove down Avery Road towards the mailboxes, left the Herald Times in the mailbox, and turned around. I felt very afraid as I approached the two individuals because Bobby Dassey attempted to step in front of my car, blocking my exit. I was within five feet of Bobby Dassey, and my headlights were on the entire time. The older man ducked down behind the passenger door. What? I swerved to the right and drove in the shallow ditch to avoid hitting Bobby Dassey. I called out, paper boy, gotta go, because I was afraid for my safety. Bobby Dassey, Bobby Dassey looked me in the eye. And I could tell with the look in his eyes that he was not happy to see me there. I knew that Bobby Dassey and the older individual were doing something creepy. That's the word he used. Creepy. Six, after I learned that Teresa Hollenbeck's car was found on November 6, 2005, I contacted the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office and spoke to a female officer. I reported everything I have stated in this affidavit to the officer. The officer said, we already know who did it. Is that common for officers to say in the middle of an investigation when people are calling in tips? <laughs> I mean, do the guilters really hallucinate that? I don't know. I provided my phone number and they said they would contact me soon. I never heard back from the police. <laughs> Seven, after watching season one of Making a Murder, I contacted Avery's trial attorneys to inform them of what I saw. I never heard back. Now, here, th this point, I know it's controversial. I know it's extremely controversial. But, Buting and Strang are very curious individuals. I will be doing a dedicated pod podcast on them. Some people allege they have ties to the corruption going on. Other people say they were simply unable to overcome the corruption, but there's certain coincidences, let's call them, that just cannot be overlooked regarding to Strang and Beauty. It's just impossible to do. So that's another curious point. His trial attorneys don't care. It's weird. They didn't even they didn't even transfer him to somebody who does. Or they just he never heard back at all. It's just kind of weird. Eight, nothing has been promised or given to me in exchange for this affidavit. And of course, this is another individual that needs a brain fingerprint scan just to confirm it all. But honestly, would anybody be that surprised if what he said was true? <laughs> and Zellner is putting, putting a stake on it. So, again, Zellner is not some random nobody, like, you know, a Ken Kratz type individual. I mean, she's got quite a few exonerations under her belt, quite a few law enforcement corruption exposés. So she's not a newbie in corruption or how the justice system works by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so we have a lot of damning evidence to go over regarding Bobby Dassey, and this is without even getting into all of the computer situations. I might actually have to do a separate podcast on that. Some people believe 
a lot of that computer data was was manipulated in some capacity, but we we have plenty to go over without diving into that. So let's source this theory that Boppy Dassey, possibly with the assistance of Scott Tadiasha, might have done something to Teresa Hallback, or at least have been involved in the cover-up and planting evidence in cahoots with corrupt local and or state law enforcement officials. So where does a lot of this information come from? Let's look at uh, this document, Conversation with Detective Lieutenant James Lank. And this is a statement here by investigator John Dietering. Date of activity, November 5th, 2005. On Saturday, 11.05.05. At 1,457 hours, sometime after arriving back from Earl Avery residence, I, Dietering, was contacted by Lieutenant James Lank, Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. Lank indicated that a member of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department had contact with Stephen Avery's fiance, identified as Jody Stakowski. Jody told the individual from law enforcement she spoke with that in telephone conversation she had with Stephen Avery, Stephen told her that Bobby Dassey had had contact with Teresa Hallback after Stephen did. It should be noted that Jody Stakowski is currently housed in the Mantua County County Jail and that Barb Janda is Stephen Avery's sister and that Bobby Dassey is Barb Janda's son. Lank went on to indicate that Jody had visited with Steve at the jail on Tuesday and at that time, according to Stakowski, Stephen told Jody that Teresa Hallback had come to photograph the car and that was all. According to Lank, Jody Stankowski indicated that on Friday, contact was made between Jody and Stephen, and at that time, Stephen indicated that Bobby had seen Teresa after Stephen had. Investigation continues. Okay, so that's very, very interesting information. Okay, there's a lot of issues here to go over. Let's, uh, let, yeah, let's try to tackle them one at a time here. So, we went over Scott Tadaiche's trailer, which just happened to be near the turnaround where the RAV4 was spotted. I went over that, uh, in previous episodes. You could check those out if you're interested in that whole mess, which was, again, another, other incidents reported and never followed up on. So, Scott Tadaiche... And Barb Yanda were the ones that wanted to sell the truck that Teresa ultimately came, or sell the van that Teresa ultimately came to photograph. Now, some people believe Stephen Avery was already under police surveillance for X amount of other reasons. $36 million lawsuit, they were looking to pin something else on him, they couldn't wait to see what would come up. Did they involve Scott Tadeuch in concocting some kind of scheme that would put Hallback on the property? And did they also rope in Bobby Dassey? And there's a lot of issues, of course, with Hallback, possibly being a CI, possibly being involved in another web, possibly Manitowoc or other corrupt law enforcement officials deciding she needs to be t- she needed to be taken out and they wanted to go with some kind of two birds, one stone situation. Again, I'm not saying anything is true or untrue. This is mind shock where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. All we can do is examine and see what... What adds up? Because nothing the state has presented adds up. So we're forced to look down other avenues. So a co-worker of Scott Tadaiche made a statement to Calumet County Sheriff's Department, quote, uh, regarding Scott Tadaiche, quote, had left work on the day that Stephen Avery was arrested, probably another coincidence. He was a nervous wreck when he left. Another co-worker overheard Ted Deitch saying that, quote, one of the Dassey boys had blood on his clothes and that the clothes had gotten mixed up with his laundry, end quote. That's kind of interesting, is it not? Coincidentally, on one of the only days that someone is alleged to have been murdered on the Avery property, I mean, are there any other allegations of murder on the Avery property? I don't know. I'm sure Mantua 
county was trying to come up with something. But Scott Tadaiche happens to leave work early the day he was arrested and he was a nervous wreck. Is that because he was being contacted by Manitowoc and or other law corrupt law enforcement officials to be involved in this frame up and maybe he didn't want to go along at first and then they just kept putting the pressure on? Or did they have something on him? They were threatening to expose it, whatever the case may be. But so another coincidence, the Dassey, one of the Dassey boys had blood on his clothes. The blood get mixed up in his own laundry. And then Bobby Dassey is shirtless in when he was planting the RAV4, possibly not even haulbacks, but regardless, in November. Does anybody find this curious or coincidental? And let's keep going with the coincidences and the anomalies. I mean, the triggered coincidence theorists are probably running for the hills right now. So Bobby also testified that he saw Scott Tadich passing him on the highway. He didn't know the time, but he said that Scott would know. Bobby was asked why he thought Scott Tadich would know the time, Bobby's response is, well, he has a clock in his car. Now, that's kind of weird because if Bo why would Bobby Dassey think that Scott Tedeiche is always looking at the clock on his car while he's driving? I mean, how many people have their eyes glued on the clock instead of the road? I mean, he himself didn't have his eyes on the clock. Why would he just randomly assume that Scott Tedeiche had the time? and the clock or was he afraid to incriminate the entire botch job was he afraid to incriminate all of the corrupt law enforcement in planning all of this on all of this evidence against Stephen Avery part of all of this uh charade in framing Avery and he was too scared to say the wrong time so he just put it off on Scott Teddy IJ was that his instructions did the, did the special Prosecutor Ken Kratz say that if he got in trouble during any of the testimony, just to, to, to put it off on certain other individuals. And then did, did he specifically instruct the other individuals to, to do whatever they needed to do? <laughs> I mean, we know Colburn slipped up <laughs> with his couldn't have been, shouldn't have been <laughs> looking at the RAV4 license plate. But did Bobby Dassey play it slightly cooler? Maybe, maybe not. So a lot of issues there on in, in that capacity a lot of curiosities regarding Bobby Dassey and Scott Teddy Aisha. Now there's even more issues. So Scott Tadich put himself at the Barb Janda trailer both at 5.15 and 7.30 p.m. on October 31st. Barb Janda confirms that. Tadich claimed to see a fire behind Stephen Avery's trailer and thought that Avery and one of the Dassey boys was there. Lisa Novacek reports that Tadaich did not go to work that day on Halloween. A few days later, at about the time of Avery's arrest, Tadaiche left work when he got a phone call from a hysterical young teenage kid. He was a nervous wreck. Later, he told his foreman that there was some blood on the boy's clothes and it had gotten mixed up in Tadaiche's laundry. Queso Report, page 687. According to Tadaiche's foreman, Tadaiche is a chronic liar and capable of the murder of Miss Hallback or of knowing something more about it. Queso Report, pages 719 and 720. Later, Tadaiche tried to sell a 22 rifle belonging to one of Barb Janda's kids, the Dassey brothers. Queso Report, page 725. There is a 22 caliber bullet that the Wisconsin Crime Laboratory has identified as bearing Teresa Hallback's DNA. There is also a hole in a skull bone fragment consistent with a 22 caliber bullet. Another coincidence? So Taduk is trying to sell a 22 rifle that belongs to one of the Dassey brothers. Now what a coincidence that they also have a rifle of which the same caliber bullet happens to be found, and we won't get into the timeline of how it magically happens to be found in the garage when it wasn't found before, and all of the other magic involved with all of this evidence that keeps coming up at uh, very coincidental time frames <laughs> regarding the frame-up of Stephen Avery. So there's a lot of curiosities around Scott Taddeich and all of these other things.
Now, let's look at an interesting Bustle.com article here. Making a murder shows how Stephen Avery's case has torn his family apart. So, let's see if there's some clues here. Stephen Avery is doing everything he can to get out of prison, and that's including throwing some family members under the bus. Avery was convicted in 2007 of Teresa Hallback's 2005 murder and sentenced to life in prison per the Appleton Post Crescent. But he has always claimed to be innocent and has been fighting for 11 years to get his conviction overturned. Turn. This was this was written by Martha Soren, published October 19, 2018. Part of that process has led to him and his lawyers naming alternate suspects. And so, in that way, the Making a Murderer case has taken the Avery and Dassey families and torn them apart. As seen in making in part two of Making a Murderer, Avery's lawyer Kathleen Zellner was permitted to introduce new suspects in the case as long as they followed the precedent set by the 1984 case of State versus Denny. As Bustle reported, that precedent restricts who's allowed to be named as a suspect. They need to have motive, opportunity, be connected to the crime via evidence, and been nearby the crime scene when the crime was committed. And they couldn't even prove Teresa Hallback was there at the time the crime was committed. So, <laughs> I mean, this is not, nothing was really followed in the Avery case. Since Avery's property, the alleged crime scene, borders his sister Barb Tedaiche's, Zellner has targeted two of Tedaiche's family members as part of her Denny suspect list. According to Rolling Stone, Zellner alleged in a motion she filed that Barb Tedaiche's son, Bobby Dassey, and her husband, Scott Tadich, were allegedly nearby the location of Hallback's last recorded cell phone activity. Zellner also alleged that she had evidence that Barb, Barb's family computer had allegedly made graphic searches related to young women and death during a time when allegedly... Only Dassey was home. Zellner further claimed that Dassey allegedly lied in his initial trial testimony, allegedly to cover up for himself. As seen in the first season, Dassey said at trial that he'd seen Hallback walk towards Avery's house. But Dassey's brother Brian later claimed that Dassey had told Brian he'd seen Hallback leave the property. November 4th, 2005, I distinctly remember Bobby telling me Stephen could not have killed her because I saw her leave the property on October 31st, 2005. These are the words, quote, from Brian Dassey. Furthermore, Barb later wrote on Facebook that she'd allegedly spoken to Dassey, who allegedly claimed to only have seen Hallback's car pull in before he left to go hunting with Scott, and that he allegedly never saw Hallback walk towards Avery's house. And this is her post. Well, I have your answer for all of you that was wondering. Just got off the phone with Bobby, and I asked him, and he told me that he had seen her pull in, but that was it, because he left to go hunting then. He said that is the truth. And of course, boys would never lie to their own mother, particularly if they're involved in criminal activity. Scott has never been charged with anything in the case. Per the first part of the series, Scott's alibi is his stepson, Bobby Dassey. According to the Daily Beast, both men claim they saw each other while driving on their way to hunt. <laughs> what a coincidence. Tadaich did not return Bustle's request for a comment. Bobby Dassey was never suspected by law enforcement in the 2005 crime. Bustle's request for comment from Bobby Dassey's mother, Barb Tadaich, about the ongoing case and his inclusion in the Netflix documentary was not immediately returned. However, Dassey did speak to law enforcement in 2017, a conversation featured in part two of the docuseries where he denied Zellner's accusations. Everything I told during the testimony was true. I had, I have no reason to lie, he said. I'm, at, I'm to the point where, you know, Zellner can blame me all she wants. Deep down inside, I know I didn't do it. That's the only way I can keep going on every day is because I know I didn't do it. He then added that it sucks that people are trying to pin it on me. The one thing I want is for my name to be cleared. Now, let's examine those statements because those are curious. That's curious phrasing. That's the only way I can keep going on every day is because I know I didn't do it. Is this somebody with an extremely guilty conscience? 
of having helped cover up a crime and frame an innocent man, so he has to find solace in the fact that he himself, with his own hands, didn't kill Hallback? Because that's interesting phrasing. I mean, it'd be curious to see what other people think about this, but that's interesting phrasing. The only way I can keep going on every day is because I know I didn't do it. Or is it some kind if he's mentally deranged, is that him trying to convince himself he didn't do it when he actually did? But I think it might, I mean, again, it's, it's difficult to say, but let's say for the sake of arguing, he didn't kill, he didn't kill Hallback. Who knows if Hallback is even dead. But if he got caught up in the mess, helped plant a vehicle, lied about other things, his conscience might be so guilty that the only way he can keep going every day is because he knows he didn't actually commit the physical crime of murdering Hallback. Curious, curious indeed. When Zellner filed the motion that named Dassey and Scott, Barb called Avery in a rage. That conversation aired during the second part of Making a Murder and illustrated how difficult the case has been for both families. Quote, what the expletive is going on? Why is Zellner starting up with Scott and Bobby again? She's going to take down my expletive family again, Barb said to Avery on the phone. Avery countered that he wasn't sure what the evidence would turn up or who it would point to, just that it wasn't himself who committed the crime, as he's long claimed. Barb snapped back that it wasn't Dassey or Scott either. So Zellner better get it right out of her expletive mind, Barb said. I mean, on Mindshock, I often state, the truth is not afraid of investigation. So the investigation goes where, we'll, where we'll, it will go if you're looking at things objectively. Avery then asked about the alleged computer searches. Barb denied even having internet at the time. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Avery claimed she did. And quote, the only time it was on is when Bobby was there alone. I just want to get down to the truth and see who did it, end quote. Barb replied that she also wanted to get to the truth, quote, but you should know expletive better that it wouldn't be my expletive kids or Scott. You know, what, what's kind of curious there, of course a mother would defend her kids, but Scott Tediache, I mean, this guy's as shady as they come, and all of the coincidences involved with him, I mean, it's, it's weird, it's weird. That's when Scott, who was listening in, started loudly yelling at Avery in an attempt to defend Dassey and himself. Expletive Stephen Avery, he is a piece of expletive. He's been all his expletive life, Scott said. The only evidence they got is against him, and he's trying to gasp for air and blame it on somebody else. He's an expletive loser. I wasn't even on the property that day, you, you expletive idiot. <laughs> but didn't he admit to being on the property twice? <laughs> and is that a lot of psychological projection there on the part of Scott Teddy Aiche? Scott then threatened Avery that if Avery ever did get out, Scott would kick his expletive expletive. The phone call ended when Barb's son called on the other line, but not before Scott accused Avery of ruining his life and shouting, I hate him. Meanwhile, Barb could be heard crying, saying, this needs to stop now. Like I said, you will end up with a dead sister because I can't take this expletive no more. So yeah, the Tadaich Dassey family didn't take well to Avery's lawyer turning up every stone she could in an attempt to get Avery's conviction overturned. But Avery, desperate, desperate for her to succeed, just needed the evidence to point to anyone but himself. But it caught two families in the crosshairs of the legal system, and nobody wins when that happens. Except corrupt law enforcement. If corrupt law enforcement is responsible, they've been winning. So curious statements there, what do they reveal? And yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to dissect that. Let's uh, let's look at Scott Tadaichi's trailer situation. So this is right from the Making a Murderer subreddit, which is uh, they do ban people who ask too many logical questions. But every now and then there's some there's some legit conversations that creep in despite the sham moderators. Did Scott Tadaichi's trailer disappear less than one year after Teresa Hallback went missing? In his testimony, Scott Tadich states that he went to his trailer after visiting his mother and before going hunting. In a May 2004 court filing, he provides address A. In the next court filing I can find from March 2006, he provides address B. He lived at address B at the time of Teresa Hallback's disappearance. 
Both addresses are east of Avery Road. With respect to passing Bobby Dassey on the highway while he, Tadaish, was driving west on Highway 147 and Dassey was driving east, this is important. Those who have assumed that Scott Tadaish lived with Barb Janda on October 31st, 2005, have suggested that Bobby Dassey would have had to double back, drive west on Highway 147 for a period of time, then turn to head back towards Avery Road in order to be driving east when Tadaish saw him on the highway. Based on the Dassey trial transcript, Blaine's testimony, we know that Tadaish did not live with Barb Janda on October 31st. In fact, Barb Janda and her then husband were living together at the time, despite having jointly filed for divorce on October 7th. I wonder what his testimony was. Where was he? Scott Tadiech, however, says that Barb Janda was staying with him at the time. Scott Tadiech claimed that Bobby Dassey was going to hunt behind Scott Tadiech's trailer. Now on to the meat. Address A appears to be an unusually secluded backyard adjacent to but on the same parcel as a home owned by a relative of Teddy Aiche's. There is a building there now that could be large enough for someone to live in, but in 2005, there were only two small buildings in the middle of the backyard. My first intuition when looking at the buildings was that they were wood boilers. And I can't get that idea out of my head. I can't be certain, as all you can really see are roofs. Or is it pronounced roofs? <laughs> I have no idea why they would need two of them, unless the idea was to use the boiler for the building in the house that's constructed nearby later. Either way, it's a very secluded spot, but there does not appear to be any trailer. Address B is where things get interesting. If Teddy H lived there on October 31st, address B appears to be just over a mile east of Avery Road on the south side of Highway 147, and the parcel on which it sits is owned by somebody else. In 2005, on the overhead images, in GM, Google Maps, Google Earth from September 2005, and GIS, there is a structure that matches the approximate dimensions of a mobile home. In September 2008, Google Earth image, however, the structure is definitely gone. Strange, but that's almost three years later. In the June 3rd, 2006 Google Earth image, it appears to me that the structure is already gone. That's only seven months after Teresa Hallback's disappearance and barely two months after he had last been interviewed by law enforcement see the progression here. And when law enforcement said Albach was murdered in a trailer, did they mean Scott to the IK's trailer? Or Stephen Avery's? Because there's no evidence in Avery's trailer. I mean, you got guys like Kucharski sitting on the bed while while doing searches, because so obviously they, they would have had to... If they thought somebody was really murdered there in the bed in the trailer, would they be really just hanging out on Avery's bed? I mean, I don't know. Is that how they do things in Corruptwap? Okay. Perhaps it was just moved, perhaps it was destroyed, and there's a reasonable explanation. If Tadaich was involved in Ms. Hallback's disappearance, perhaps the inside of that trailer could contain some of the new evidence that Mr. Avery so desperately needs if he's to make any progress in the legal system. And apparently, so some comments here, Mr. Janda is also friends with Pete Dassey, who is the father of the Dassey kids. Interesting. And Blaine testified that at the time of the murder, Tom Janda lived with him, his mom, and his brothers at the Janda house. By the time of the trial, Scott Tadeiche had moved in with Barb at Barb's house. Now, another coincidence, he's trying to sell this 22 caliber gun days after. Interesting. Interesting. All coincidental, I'm sure. So let's look at this article, updated June 10th, 2019, on this theory. Family of Making a Murderer star Brandon Dassey supports new suspect theory about brother Bobby. Interesting. The Blast spoke with Brad Dassey, the half-brother of Brendan, who is currently serving a life sentence in prison for the murder of Teresa Hallback. 
Last week, Stephen Avery's criminal attorney, Kathleen Zellner, suggested a new person may be actually responsible for Teresa's murder and implied in a series of tweets that Brendan's brother, Bobby Dassey, could be involved. Zelda did not outright use Bobby's name, but noted that her client and Bobby Dassey were the only people who saw Hallback at the Avery Salvage Yard the day she was murdered, adding that the suspect followed Hallback on her way home and got her to pull over, all while Avery remained inside his trailer. She tweeted that the killer is the person who had access and the opportunity to plant Stephen Avery's fresh blood in Teresa Hallback's car and called it a rage killing motivated by rejection. 32-year-old Bobby's possible involvement is not mentioned in the second season of the Netflix show, but Zellner told fans that Bobby cannot be ruled out as a suspect and his garage is currently being searched for DNA. She points to a CD that was used as evidence in the case, allegedly containing thousands of images of sexual violence, which supposedly bears a striking similarity to what happened to Hallback. The images were reportedly gathered when Bobby had access to Brendan's computer, and Zellner believes this could be used to show that Bobby has a history with sexual violence. Stephen Avery definitely believes Bobby was involved and filed an affidavit earlier this year saying as much. There's been speculation that another male in northern Wisconsin was involved in a crime matching the same description as Bobby with the same description of the tattoo he has. So after hearing that, it's really interesting, Brad said of Bobby, adding, Zellner even says criminals always try to blend in with life, family, etc. after crimes as if nothing ever happened. Brad, who dropped a rap song about Brendan and Stephen titled They Didn't Do It, in 2016, says he can't say for sure that Bobby was involved, but thinks Zellner's theory is, quote, incredibly interesting all around and could be possible, end quote. Does that sound like an objective individual? For the record, Bobby was never considered a suspect and was even the state's star witness during the original trial and conviction of Avery and Dassey. And how convenient for Corruptowak if this is how it all went down. Brad, who doesn't have much of a relationship with Bobby, says it's too early to make any judgment calls, but admits he's very impressed with Zellner's legal team and believes the new theory is a very good hypothesis about what happened. Bobby Dassey has never done an interview regarding making a murder and has not yet addressed the allegations regarding Zellner's new theory. Although, of course, we looked at other information regarding that. Okay. Now, there's even more curiosities here regarding Bobby Dassey's alleged criminal activity. So I, I think I might have went over this on the previous episode. If I did or I did, I'll go over it quickly again. Apparently, Stephen Avery was pissed off November 3rd about uh, Barb's boys selling near his house. When he was asked about it, he protects them and saying he doesn't want to talk about it over the phone line because the phone is being recorded. So Stephen Avery refused to sell out his nephews even while in prison. Some people believe that uh, the law enforcement activity was related to this uh, drug activity. So Kathy Williford, of course, we've, we've gone over on the previous episode. Check that out if you haven't seen it. She was in the narcotics department, Department of Justice. So if she was using Auto Trader to get access to certain uh, drug activity properties, like, for example, the Janda residence, which just coincidentally happened to be next to Stephen Avery. So, and Stephen Avery, so there is some corrupt Manitowoc overlap, possibly with other investigations. And, of course, the FBI were already at Cuts Road some, on some other investigation we don't know about, possibly also involving the DCI and other Department of Justice state officials. There's a lot of funny business going on, and a lot of it seems to be overlapping. Does that explain everything? We have one more mind-shocking thing to go over. Who else thinks Bobby Dassey and Scott Tadiaish killed Teresa Hallback? Retired sheriff's deputy 
Conrad Pete Bates think so? So in Stephen Avery's 2018 affidavit, he states that he went to retrieve papers from his vehicle around noon, October 31st, and noticed Scott's Green Ford Ranger parked behind Bobby Dassey's Chevy Blazer. Now keep in mind, Scott Teddy Eichek was on the property, I guess, by his own word twice that day, but then later he says he never was. Steven states that about 15 minutes later, Scott's truck was gone. Did Bobby leave to go hunting around 12, 15 p.m. in Scott's truck? Did Scott tell Bobby to take his truck since it was blocking the blazer? Was Scott the person on the computer that afternoon at 1.08 p.m. and 1.51 p.m.? Did he make the call to Teresa at 1.52 p.m. using a spoof number? Did he call Teresa at 1.52 p.m. using a burner phone? The audio vox phone that was found around the, turno the turnaround near East Twin River near the old dam. And of course, I went over the that audio vox phone. But uh, let's let's do it again for those people that don't remember. So an audio vox cell phone was found near the river in Michigan, close to sightings of Teresa's Rav Four in the turnaround uh, Highway 147, not far from Scott Teddy Iche's trailer. And of course, Jill Ryan saw a suspicious car November 1st, 2005, near Ridge Road by this turnaround by the East Twin River in Michigan. So Jill, on November 11th, 2005, Jill J. Ryan stopped at the command center at Avery Auto Salvage, told investigators she saw a suspicious car across the street from 3405 Main Street, Highway 147 in Michigan. Ryan's statement was noted in, Calico in Queso Log, page 79, but there was no follow-up. Another curiosity, nothing's ever followed up on in this Avery case. I guess they're too busy with their frame job to actually do a real investigation. Kathleen Zellner filed a new motion October 23rd, 2017. She revealed a new witness, Kevin Ramlow, who recently came forward with claims that he spotted Teresa Hallback's RAV4 on November 3rd and 4th, 2005, parked two days in a row in a turnaround 147 near the old dam and bridge over the East Twin River in Michigan. On November 4th, Ramlow saw a missing persons poster of Teresa and her RAV4 in the Senex station in Michicot, recognized the vehicle as being the one parked in the turnaround. He spotted a Manitoba County Sheriff's deputy at the Senex station in Michicot, told him about it. He didn't know the deputy's name, but when he watched Making a Murder in December 2016, a year after its release, he recognized the deputy as none other than Andy Colburn. Confirmation of the poster being set up at the Senex station in Michicot is in the dispatch calls. And, okay, so did Coburn not put anything written in the records and go over on this report and see the RAV4? Did it have a dead battery? Did it need to be swapped for something from a law enforcement battery? And then did he ensnare Bobby Dassey and this other bearded individual to go plant it the next morning? I mean, does the timeline add up for all of this? This is Kevin Ramlow's affidavit. This is Exhibit D in Zellner's October 23rd, 2017 motion. November 3rd and 4th, I was in Michicot. I saw Teresa Hallback's vehicle by the East Twin River Dam in Michicot at the turnaround by the bridge as I drove west on Highway 147. Around midday, November 4th, 2005, I stopped at the Senex gas station at the intersection of Highway 147 and State Street in Michicot. While there, I saw and read a missing person poster for Teresa Hallback. I remember that the poster had a picture of Teresa Hallback and written description descriptions of Teresa Hallback and the car she was driving. I recognized the poster attached as Exhibit A to this affidavit as a copy of the one I saw at the Senex station on November 4th, 2005. I recognized that the written description of the vehicle on the poster matched the car I saw at the turnaround by the dam. While I was in the Senex station, a Manitoba County Sheriff's Department officer came into the station. I immediately told the officer I had seen the car that matched the description of the car on Teresa Hallback's missing persons poster at the turnaround by the dam. In December 2016, I watched Making a Murderer in the series. I recognized the officer who I talked to at the Senex station November 4th, 2005. 
A photograph of this officer is attached as Exhibit B to this affidavit. Having watched Making a Murder, I now know his name is Andy Coburn. Now, another curiosity, another coincidence in this case, December 12th and 19th, 2016, Ramlo knew Scott Tadich through his brother sent text messages to Scott about seeing the RAV4 in the turnaround and telling Coburn about it when he ran into him at the Senex station on November 4th, 2005. Scott never acknowledged the messages. How curious. How curious. Coburn testified that he was not scheduled to work November 4th through the 6th, that these were the three days he was scheduled to be off. He worked a six-day on, three-day off rotation, noon to 8 p.m. shifts, and was scheduled to be off November 4th through 6th. And, of course, uh, we went through all of his uh, shady testimony. Nobody had, can find any records of anything. Okay. So near the turnaround is when this cell is where the cell phone was found. Another coincidence. Andy Coburn and James Lank were with Queso Deputy Craig Wendling when this cell phone was collected into evidence November 9th, 2005. And also of note, Coburn never filed a report regarding this statement of uh, the RAV4 being spotted. Nobody seems to file any reports about anything in Corrupt Walk. Okay. Uh, this is page 185 of Queso. Queso Deputy Craig Wendling noted that Manitowoc Sheriff's Office deputies James Lank and Andy Coburn were with him when he collected into evidence tag number 8451, an AudioVox phone silver in color, model CDM 8815UT star cam. Wendling noted that Coburn did all of the photography for him, but he collected the phone and kept it in his possession. Wendling noted John Campion in his report, but not Pam Stern. John J. Campion, owner of Chiller's Bar and Grill, who was searching with former private investigator Pam Stern, actually found the cell phone. Pam testified that she couldn't recall the day that it was found. Very interesting. She's only good at being guided by God towards a car and a lot of thousands in a straight line. Campion found the phone just east of Ridge Road on Highway 147 in the North Ditch along the gravel line. This is near the sighting of, by Jill Ryan of a suspicious vehicle across the street here, November 1st, 2005. So Pam Sturm, Sheriff Pagel's cousin, coincidentally, found business papers along East Twin River in Michigan. However, she testified she didn't recall any such paper. She testified instead to finding the AudioVox cell phone that Champion found and turning it over to a sheriff's deputy in uniform. She testified she wasn't sure who the deputy was and she never gave a name when cross-examined. And she wasn't even cited in the report as being there. Interesting. Out of the presence of the jury, the judge asked Buting, how did you know to ask questions about it? The cell phone and business papers found near the river in Michigan. Buting explained, we get tips too, just like they do, the prosecution. Sometimes useless, sometimes not. This one sounded like maybe it might be more legitimate, so I thought I would ask her about it, but I had no confirmation of it until today. Weigert claimed to know nothing about the police action taken. <laughs> Another curiosity. When Buting asked her what day she found the phone, she couldn't recall. She said it was after November 5th, the day she found the RAV4 at Avery Salvage Yard. She first testified that it was Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, but later changed her story and said, no, I don't think I worked on the 6th. I think I had off on Monday or Tuesday and I went back to help out. When asked what she did after the deputy took possession of the cell phone, she testified that we met up with the search party again. Pam testified that it was found by the river about a quarter mile outside of Michigan by a turnaround. During Avery's trial, the defense team received a tip from the public about the phone and business papers being found near the turnaround. The prosecution must not have turned over to the defense a copy of Craig Wenling's report, or the defense team overlooked it in the discovery materials. Another curiosity. 
Robert Fabian, Earl Avery's brother-in-law, told Queso investigators that around 8 a.m. November 3rd, quote, he observed... Uh, he observed a green Jeep backed all the way up at a parking area on Highway 147 by the river, and quote, investigators noted that Robert described this area as a turnaround, and that Robert recalls seeing this Jeep at 8 a.m. because he had seen a male subject talking on TV about a green Jeep being in the area. Queso 320. And Brendan Fabian and Seibert also refer to SUVs as Jeep. So in that geographical area, I am not from Corruptowoc or the Corruptowoc area, but people supposedly they call SUVs Jeeps as well interchangeably with Jeeps that are Jeeps. So Irvin Conke would have been the male subject Fabian had seen on TV. Conke was interviewed by a local television station, and he te stated that on the morning of November 3rd, 2005, he saw Teresa's RAV4 in a turnaround on Highway 147, east of I-43. On or about January 21st, 2006, Irvin Conke called Manitowoc Sheriff's Office dispatch, and his contact information was passed on to Queso's Dietering as he does not have long-distance service. Dietering wrote, Queso, page 353, that Conke said he saw a unit parked in the turnaround in Michicot just west of town on November 4th. He said the vehicle was parking facing east and that he observed a large hole in the windshield, as well as a large hole in the driver's side window. Dietering wrote that Conke said the one on television wasn't the same color. The RAV4 in evidence, which looked green or blue depending on lighting, doesn't have a large hole in the windshield or driver's side window. According to Dietering's report, Conkay further indicated that the vehicle shown on television as a result of the preliminary hearing on December 6, 2005, did not seem to be the same unit. Now, this is curious. I mean, this is mind-shocking information that we actually have not gone over. So what are the chances... <laughs> That the day before Teresa Hallback's vehicle or whatever vehicle RAV4 alleged to have belonged to Teresa Hallback is planted on Avery Salvage Yard the day before another RAV4 just happens to be spotted abandoned <laughs> at this turnaround. <laughs> I mean, how high are we going to stack the coincidence stack? And then it's just randomly not the vehicle. And whatever happened to this vehicle with these holes in the windshields that might have been replaced and uh, batteries that might have been switched and possibly it not being the same vehicle. I mean, I don't know. The coincidence theorists are going to have a field day with this one. I mean, it's just, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. This is as mind shocking as it comes. Uh, we have a Reddit user, Gwoodall. Conke made the last comment about the vehicle not being the same unit because law enforcement convinced him it wasn't the right one. In the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office dispatch calls, there are two guys who call in. The older man is upset that the press is asking him questions and saying, but I didn't know. And they transfer his call to Gary Steer to try to calm him down. It just so happens that the man who called has passed away, but the guy with him who is upset is still alive. He was told by law enforcement that he saw the wrong RAV4. I've spoken with a friend of his, and since the man isn't on social media, I asked his friend to please contact Zellner because this man also saw Andy Coburn with the RAV4 that he saw. Funny... Colburn never made a report about the RAV4, yet he was spotted with it. Okay, we're getting even more mind shock territory. If this account is true, so if someone saw Andy Colburn with the RAV4 that, that Andy Colburn actually said he couldn't have been, shouldn't have been looking at with the license plate, was that really Teresa Hallback's RAV4 and did it really have a bullet hole or some kind of hole? in the windshield or, and or driver's side window that were replaced before planting if it was even the same vehicle. And let's say it's not the same vehicle and it has nothing to do with Teresa Hallback. What are the chances statistically? Like, how many coincidences are we going to have in this case? I mean, does a RAV4 show up at random turnarounds with bullet holes or holes of some kind in the windshield driver's side window every week? 
So then it's no big deal that it also happened to be the day before uh, Pam of God Stern magically found to possibly Teresa Hallback's car or whatever vehicle being passed off as Hallback's car be after it was planted on the Avery salvage yard. How coincidental is all of this? I mean, it's just, I mean, this is mind shock central. Avery's neighbor on Jambo Creek Road, Wilmer Seibert, which we've gone over, said he saw a vehicle matching color, style, and size of Teresa Hallback's RAV4 driving into the back of Avery's auto salvage via Quarry War Road's Days before Pam Stern found it abandoned in the salvage yard on November 5th, 2005, Seibert saw an older model white Jeep with paint chipping off the hood, closely following the RAV4 down the access roads into the gravel pits. A short time later, after seeing the two vehicles enter the gravel pits, he saw the white Jeep exit the gravel pits, again using the same access roads just south of his house on Jambo Creek Road, and he actually couldn't recall the exact day. Is it possible they were going to stage Hallback's actual RAV4 and then realize that there was too much other evidence and they had to switch for a decoy RAV4? I don't know. I mean, this is all really weird. So let's, again, let's go back to sh retired Sheriff Deputy Pete Bates and his belief in the Bobby Dassey theory. So once again, uh, the, is it possible Scott Teddy H is making these calls from this AudioVox phone? So did Fassbender lie in the voicemail report about the message that was left by this caller? Scott may have led Teresa into a trap set by the Manitowoc cabal. Perhaps he turned her over to them and then resumed his day by driving Bobby's blazer home. After Bobby is done hunting, he drives to Scott's trailer, which would explain why Blaine, on the school bus heading west on 147 towards Avery Road, saw him driving a green Ford Ranger around 3.40 p.m., heading east on Highway 147 towards Scott's home at 12764 Highway 147, 1.8 miles from Avery Road. Then Scott follows Bobby to his home on Avery Road with his fresh deer kill still in the bed of Scott's truck and helps him unload the deer and hang it in the garage. Then he goes back home and returns later to Avery Road to pick up Barb to go to the hospital, or he simply arranges for alibis from Barb and he never went to the hospital at all that day. Now, does everybody always drive everybody else's vehicle and this is just another day? Or is this the only day, coincidentally, where people are switching vehicles, etc.? So, Conrad Pete Bates retired in 1996 from the Madison County Sheriff's Department in Illinois. He decided to move back to Wisconsin right around the time when the Avery case broke. Bates said, when I came back to Wisconsin, the people around here were going nuts as to whether he was guilty or innocent. Bates contacted Avery's defense attorneys, Dean Strang and Jerome Buting, and offered his services. I said, look, I'm up here and this is going crazy. Do you need any help? I would be more than happy to assist. I've done this kind of work before. Bates called. The defense attorneys hired Bates. Because Strang and Buting lived more than 100 miles from the Calumet County Jail, they sometimes would send Bates to visit Avery. Conrad Pete Bates was Dean Strang and Jerry Buting's private investigators, who is shown commenting several times in different episodes of Making a Murder. Why would Strang and Buting hire a retired deputy who contacted them out of the blue to offer his services as their private investigator? What share did Bates receive of the $260,000 that Avery paid Strang and Buting from Avery's $400,000 settlement for his 1985 wrongful conviction, a.k.a. the frame-up from, uh, from the Benny Bernstein assault? What exactly did Pete Bates investigate? He didn't try to establish a timeline using call detail records, cell tower dumps, and surveillance footage from the routes Teresa may have driven on October 31st. He didn't investigate the people closest to Teresa and establish their alibis. He didn't request a forensic analysis of Teresa Hallback's laptop to determine her online activity, which could help establish an accurate timeline and alternate suspects. He didn't interview Teresa's friends to see if she had plans for October 31st. He didn't investigate Teresa's emails, landline records, or cell phone text messages. He didn't investigate the wedding of a friend that Teresa attended on Saturday, October 29th, or the Halloween party she attended that night. More than a decade later, 
Pete Bates is still suggesting that Bobby Dassey and Scott Tedeich are Teresa's killers. Strang and Buting had the information showing that Hallback's cell phone pinged remote towers, pinged a remote tower when she was supposedly being raped and murdered by Avery and Dassey. Why did Strang and Buting and their only private investigator, former Sheriff Lieutenant Pete Bates, ignore the single most exculpatory fact? That's a curious question. Curious question indeed. That again, I have to do a dedicated episode on Strang and Buting because there are some things that don't add up with them, and I know that's very controversial, but it cannot be dismissed. So here are some interesting stories regarding Pete Bates. Conrad Pete Bates. The Congressional Committee in 1978 looked into Martin Luther King's death had an investigator on loan from Madison County Sheriff's Office. Conrad Pete Bates, who had previously worked for a military agency known to have engaged in illegal domestic spying. Bates came up with the theory that Russell Byers had been offered a contract by two St. Louis businessmen to kill the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in 1966 to 1967. Conrad Pete Bates employed a former FBI informant, Oliver Patterson, to spy for him during the course of the congressional inquiry into King's assassination. And he had some dubious connections to, uh, other things which are quite curious and there were a bunch of misfiled information no <laughs> curiously regarding the king assassination so here's an article from the associated press january 7 2016 making a murder former cop who worked viral case thinks stephen avery is innocent former madison county sheriff lieutenant conrad pete bates said he developed a gut feeling about stephen avery during their jailhouse meetings Bates recalls meeting numerous times face-to-face -face with Avery, the murder defendant whose case has gone viral thanks to a new Netflix documentary making a murderer. During those eye-to-eye -eye interviews, Bates, with more than 30 years of experience as a cop and private investigator in Madison County, formed an impression of Avery. Just as a personal opinion, I think there's a very good possibility he's innocent. Just from the way he talked and the way he, we talked. You get a feeling for these things, I would have picked up some indication, Bates said in a phone interview from his current home in Wisconsin. He added, I don't think he did it. He is just adamant that he's innocent. Bates joined the Madison County Sheriff's Department in 1970 and retired in 96. He then spent eight or so years doing investigative work for criminal defense lawyers in Madison County. In about 2004, he decided to move from Illinois back to Wisconsin where he was raised. That's where his path would cross with Avery's. In 2003, Avery of Manitoba County, Wisconsin, was exonerated and released after serving 18 years in prison for a rape he didn't commit. DNA proved that another man committed the rape. After his exoneration, Avery filed a multi-million dollar lawsuit against Manitoba County and its investigators who handled the rape case. But then, in 2005, a young woman who worked as a photographer for an auto trader type publication went missing. The disappearance of 25-year-old Teresa Hallback drew even more media attention when it was revealed that one of her last scheduled appointments was to take pictures of a vehicle at a salvage yard operated by none other than Stephen Avery and his family. In the ensuing days, searchers found Hallback's vehicle on the sprawling Avery salvage property. Charred pieces of her bones, allegedly her bones, were found in a burn pit near Avery's mobile home, and police arrested Avery on murder charges. So he offered his services. I interviewed everybody we thought was a potential witness, plus the prosecution witnesses, if I could get to them. I talked to them and reviewed every document that was released to us in the discovery, Bates said. And I was kind of a consultant on police procedures and the way things usually and generally operate in police departments during an investigation like that. For the trial strategy, the defense attorneys suggested that members of the Manitoba County Sheriff's Department planted evidence against Avery. The evidence included a key to Hallback's vehicle found in Avery's mobile home, stains of Avery's blood in Hallback's vehicle, and a bullet found in Avery's garage. Bates said he was on hand during one of the series' dramatic moments when a vial of Avery's blood was inspected. The vial was in the office of the county clerk inside a box, office of the court clerk, inside a box containing evidence from the old rape case. The evidence seal on the box 
containing the vial appeared to be retaped and there appeared to be a pin-sized hole in the vial's lid. I looked at it and it's got a hole in it, Bates said. It, it convinced me that you couldn't count on the blood smears in a vehicle being left by Avery himself. There was blood available to other parties. Somebody's, somebody got to that box. Bates said he found it troubling that the key and keychain contained DNA from Avery, but no one else, not even Hallback. Now that's got to be BS, Bates said. It's her key. She's been handling it for years. <laughs> Ken Kratz, the special prosecutor in the case, said the filmmakers never gave him a chance to answer the defense attorney's allegations. He said the documentary ignores up to 90% of the physical evidence that links Avery to the homicide. I mean, what evidence? <laughs> he said Netflix should give him an opportunity to tell his side of the story. Anytime you edit 18 months worth of information and only include the statements or pieces that support your particular conclusion, that conclusion should be reached, Kratz said. The prosecutor in an interview with the New York Times said the film really presents misinformation. Again, it, I mean, agreed. It's very, very biased in favor of Manitoba. It doesn't even reveal 1% of the corruption that went on. Stephen Avery served 18 years for a crime he didn't commit. Now he's on the line again, and some want to see him put away for good. Bates said he thinks the documentary is a fair and accurate representation of the case. I really do. They go into a lot of detail. He said, the other thing that makes it different from a motive retelling of a case is that everything on there was taped as it was happening. Bates said the filmmakers were nice, competent, very professional women. I saw them trying to talk to the prosecution. They tried to talk to Kratz, to the sheriff's department, but they were just dismissed. Bayet's impression of the prosecutor Kratz isn't as favorable. He was an arrogant, snotty, son of an expletive, and you can use that as a quote if you want, Bates said. Bates said that filmmakers interviewed him for hours, but his appearance in the final product make up a total of only about three minutes. They must have filmed 50 hours of interviews of just me over the years, he said. They cut down my appearances in the film. I guess that's not a ringing endorsement for my movie career. Bates said one of the problems with Avery's trial in his mind is that the judge prohibited the defense from pointing to other potential suspects. That's just crazy. It's used in cases all over, he said. We had people we thought looked pretty good. In the film, Bates criticizes the continued involvement of the Manitoba County Sheriff's Department in the murder investigation, despite being advised by the county's district attorney that other police agencies should handle the case. Well, the Manitoba County Sheriff's Department decided to do it its own way, or at least a couple people in the department did, Bates said. Bates argued that the Manitoba County Sheriff's Department had a conflict of interest due to Avery's lawsuit, which ended up being settled for $450,000 after Avery's murder's arrest. You don't say. <laughs> also in the film, Bates questions why no physical evidence or DNA from Hallback was found in Avery's trailer or garage except for the keychain and bullet. She was shot a number of times. There would be massive pools of blood. It wasn't there, Bates told the interviewers. He added, Stephen, I don't believe, is capable of sanitizing that house. Very few evidence technicians would be capable of fully sanitizing an area like that. And they know what to hide and how to hide it. I don't think Stephen could do that. Is Pete Bates doubting Stephen Avery's criminal mastermind genius? Does he not think that Stephen Avery is the greatest criminal mastermind in the history of crime? Weird. Avery and his learning-impaired nephew, Brandon Dassey, were convicted in separate trials of Hallback's murder. Avery is serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Dassey is eligible for parole in 2048. Since the Netflix series, online petitions calling for Avery and Dassey to be pardoned have collected hundreds of thousands of digital signatures. Bates, who resides in Manitowoc, said the community's attitudes about the case have shifted since the Netflix series. Back in 2005, when it started, I'd say... The majority of citizens in Manitoba County were a lynch mob that wanted him convicted right away. Now, I'd say it's probably totally reversed after they watched this Netflix thing, he said. Though Bates' on-screen time is limited, it was just enough that some of my friends recognized me. He said a number of his old co-workers and others from the Metro East have contacted him about the series. I've gotten a lot of messages from them. It's nice to hear from them, he said. They're mostly cops, too. And apparently, a lot of them decided this was a fixed case, too, from what they've seen. 
So a lot of his cop friends, I'm assuming they're non-corrupt if they're willing to call out police corruption, think this was a fixed case. Very, very interesting. Though he thinks Avery is innocent, Bates declined to offer any alternative suspects by name, saying he fears lawsuits. I've got my own ideas about who killed her, he said. The one thing I will say I'm satisfied from my investigation that she was not killed on that property. So this guy is saying that he's confident she wasn't killed on the property. So possibly less confident that it was Stephen Avery, but just confident that she wasn't killed on the property. An article published January 7th, 2016 by Brian Brueggemann, making a murder former cop who worked viral case thinks Stephen Avery is innocent. Updated February 9th, 2016. The investigator who worked for Stephen Avery's trial lawyers has revisited a popular theory about who killed Teresa Hallback back in 2005. Appearing on the teen talk show Corey Taylor Talks on Tuesday, August 22nd, Pete Bates said Hallback's body was burned elsewhere before someone salted her bones in Avery's burn pit, a theory widely accepted by millions of documentary fans and web sleuths. But according to Bates, the person who planted the cremains is not who is currently being eyed as the killer. Bates said it was someone as familiar with the salvage yard as Stephen Avery himself. Bates theorizes that someone without intimate knowledge of the Avery property would be left to circumvent a potentially dangerous entanglement while trying to plant the bones without being seen. Stephen Avery had a pet dog, he said. His name was Bear. He was a German shepherd that nobody was going to fool with. Bear was chained next to that burn pit. He was your typical junkyard dog because that's what it was, a junkyard where he was living. Nobody not known to Bear was going to get in that area. Because the 26-year police veteran maintains that Avery and Dassey are not killers, it leaves just about everyone else in the family as a potential suspect. Whoever did it was known to Bear and was possibly a resident who walked in and planted it, Bates said. Although Bates did not name Avery family members, he said Hallback's death could not have unfolded as the state described. The rape, throat slashing, shooting, and possible dismemberment would surely have left a trail of carnage, but nothing remotely close to a bloodbath was ever discovered in Avery's trailer or garage. Only a speck of Teresa's DNA was allegedly found on a bullet retrieved from the garage floor. For many, that leaves a gaping hole to fill with the explanation of where the horrific acts took place. The state claims the killers had more than enough time to meticulously wipe the crime scene clean. Bates doesn't buy that. You're going to leave evidence behind no matter how good you are, the investigator said. Cutting Teresa Hallback's throat, which is what they are accused of, Avery and Dassey, is a very dirty crime. That there are droplets of evidence left by everywhere, everywhere. The human body keeps blood under pressure. When you invade that pressurized container, blood is going to spray. Who did the slashing, cutting, and burning? That remains an eternal question. Avery's lawyer alludes to Teresa's on-again, off-again boyfriend, Ryan Hilligus, and a possible accomplice, although she says Hallback was beaten with a mallet or hammer. Although the Hilligus theory remains near the top of the list for those trying to crack the case, Bates' interview has prompted social media users to rein back in an earlier conjecture that Brendan Dassey's brother, Bobby, and now stepfather, Scott Tediache, may know more than they testified to. Those theories aside, Bates is on the side of the Stephen Avery truther movement. He says police were convinced from the start that Avery was their man. And when there was little evidence to support that bias, they turned up the heat on Dassey. By making him a co-conspirator, police solidified their case against his uncle, Bates said. Bates did reveal something not previously privy to the public. Information, he says, confirmed that Avery was not treated fairly. Because Dean Strang and Jerry Buting lived more than 100 miles from the Calumet County Jail, they would sometimes send Bates to visit Avery. Bates said during one of those visits, 
A jailer revealed that his conversations with Stephen were being recorded. That's flat expletive illegal, Bates said. I was part of the defense team. They should not have access to what I say. Consequently, when Strang and Buting did visit him, they were really impaired in talking to him. A lawyer has to be able to talk to his client without hesitation. That is probably not grounds for a reversal, but it was indicative of what they did. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So, of course, the, the Bobby Dassey, Scott Teddy IK theory is, of course, uh, one of the theories that's been discussed online to a, to a relatively uh, decent degree. Now, whether or not it's true or not true, the involvement of, of Ryan Hilligans and Scott Blodorn, Teresa Hallback's roommate, I went over them in the previous episode as well. There's a lot that just doesn't add up. And there's just no way around that, despite what all the cognitive dissonant coincidence theorist goofballs out there with Dunning-Kruger too extreme to even comprehend that uh, statistically the amount of coincidences here are just, uh, they don't add up. I mean, that's really what there is to it. Now, what exactly did happen? Of course, we don't know. Uh, unless you were there, you don't know what happened. But this is a very, very bizarre case, very, very obvious law enforcement corruption, regardless of whether or not they committed the crime themselves or other people did and they just framed Avery. We really don't know the real truth, of course, but plenty more to come, plenty more to ponder. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of Mind Shock True Crime in the Stephen Avery series. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal, help support the channel, help us get more podcasts out in more of these mind shocking wrongful convictions and unsolved cases. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications. You could also check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons get a priority for case topological analysis co-podcasts to request. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Share this podcast episode across social media platforms. Keep the awareness up in the case. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. You're listening to the Stephen Allen Avery series of the Making a Murderer fame. The Netflix show that ignited a firestorm of individuals calling for justice and exposing corrupt a lot. Of course, the documentary was heavily biased in favor of Manitowoc by only exposing such a mere fraction of their obvious corruption. That that was the basis for the entire Mind Shock podcast regarding covering this Stephen Avery case. The Making a Murder documentary didn't even address the fact that Stephen Avery did not physically pick up a cat and throw it in a fire, according to testimony from an individual named Mr. Yanda, who admitted in a police statement that he physically lifted the cat and threw it in the fire. The police statement exists to this day. Yanda not even punished, but Stephen Avery punished, because that's how they do justice, so-called justice in Manitowoc, a.k.a. Corruptowoc. The individual physically responsible for lifting a living thing and causing its death not punished. Someone else present who may or may not have been involved in some drunk antics, they're punished. But the perpetrator who physically did the act, not punished. That's how they do things in Manitowoc. And the Making a Murder a Netflix documentary didn't even address such basics. Very, very biased. Very, very biased against Stephen Avery. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. You are listening to the Stephen Avery series. This is episode 35, Re-examining 
the timeline. Because this is a very, very convoluted case with so much corruption across the board that we've gone over in the past 34 episodes. It's hard to keep track. So I wanted to do a regrouping overview, including the new information that's available to look back with a little bit more of a 2020 eye in order to make sense of what the actions of Corrupt Walk looked like early on for the coincidence theorists out there that maintain that this was all a legitimate investigation above board and Ken Kratz acted completely within the scope <laughs> of the law in executing his duties. <laughs> For those that believe that, I don't know if there are any people that aren't uh, related to the individuals in Manitoba County, these law enforcement agents, or possibly other authority-worshipping cultists, that actually believe this was all above board. So we're going to examine all of these timeline issues in retrospect and shed more focus on Ken Kratz and Buting and Strang as well, because there are issues there that I haven't seen legitimately examined, and this is mind shock, so we will be examining them. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you find it interesting, you want to help support the channel, you can donate to our PayPal, just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications, make sure you allow your device to have those notifications come through. You can also just go to youtube.com slash mindshock or youtube.com slash mindshock true crime like and share this podcast keep the awareness and pressure up on social media which there seems to be no shortage of people continuing to discuss this blatant wrongful conviction again even if you believe Stephen Avery's guilty this is a clear example of a wrongful conviction either way like and share the podcast across social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic logical analysis, co-podcaster requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. And if you're just a clueless guilter who didn't even understand the information presented, your comments will just be examined for examples of Dunning-Kruger and how that manifests and silly coincidence theories, unless you actually demonstrate you understood what was presented and provide a logical rebuttal. For some reason, that seems to be very rare on the side of the guilters, but it is welcome. If you want to have a logical, objective, neutral, good faith discussion, feel free to comment no matter which side of the fence you're on. And I'm not even saying Avery's guilty. Uh, Avery's innocent. I've presented multiple theories, all more plausible than anything the state has put forth, about s scenarios in which Avery could be guilty. Split personalities, one of them psychic. I mean, these would all more adequately explain what the, the, the facts and the timeline that we have than anything the state has presented. Because if Avery has a split personality, one of them's trying to set him up, and he's not aware of it, that could possibly explain certain things. But either way, let's jump in here. Here's one of the best write-ups on the Stephen Avery case as a whole. This was posted by Tom Haas on TikTok Manitowoc, one of the only subreddits that, that is actually legitimate in this case. Visual timeline perceptions are what they are. This was posted approximately a year ago. I think there is at least one thing that everyone can agree on. The crime did not happen the way the state presented it at trial. From lack of DNA in the bedroom where a supposed rape happened to lack of protocol followed where human remains are discovered on Avery's property to questionable, and that's if they were even human remains, to questionable evidence popping up at the hands of a department who was supposed to be far away from the investigation. So far away, in fact, that even the former ADA, who has gone on record many times, said that Manitowa County Sheriff's Office should not have been anywhere near the Avery Salvage Yard that day. I'm curious if he spoke up in 2005 the way he is these days. 
one would think it would have mattered more back then. Anyway, back to the point, if we go through a timeline of events and bones found and what the message being portrayed was, you'll see that both Pagel and Kratz, the duo who gave media interviews every day in the early days of the investigation, were very careful to not open the door to any possibility of the crime scene being anything other than Stephen Avery's property. And that's very curious in and of itself because not only is this an obvious sham violating Avery's presumption of innocence and destroying any chance of a fair trial, but their obsession with the crime scene being located at Avery's, even if there's no evidence to support it, while shutting down any logical lines of inquiry regarding the quarry, and of course, Redont is someone that needs to be re-examined. The other reason I'm doing this timeline re-examination is because I will also be re-examining Joshua Redont in the next episode because there's some curiosities that have still never been adequately explained, everything from the birth of the legend of the bonfire to his whereabouts and the timeline of Redont. And these curiosities, again, we, we're going to revisit the entire timeline to see how they fit in. And then when we're taking a look at Kratz, Buting, Strang, and Redont after that, it might shed some interesting light and possible mind-shocking revelations on exactly how this frame job was executed. So 2005, November 5th, shortly after the RAV4 is found on the southeast corner of the salvage yard around 2.45 p.m., Great Lakes search and rescue canine units arrive at Avery Salvage Yard. And of course, the finding of the RAV4 by Pam of God <laughs> going into a beeline to the exact RAV4 location in a lot of thousands and thousands of vehicles at the Avery Salvage Yard. Quite amusing, of course, if you've checked out the previous episodes. Of course, she wasn't the color of the RAV4 is in dispute. She wasn't even sure that that was the RAV4 she was sent there to find, as evidenced by, uh, by the phone call and her dialogue and the court transcripts, which I went over in the previous episodes. Make sure you check all those out. An hour or so later, they are asked to go to the command post for instruction. The GLSAR search team entire report can be seen here. And this is posted on stephenaverycase.org, as well as other documents. They alerted on a, uh, this is pages three to seven here, exhibit 46, sent and cadaver dogs reports. They alerted on a multitude of areas both on the Avery property and in the quarry areas. So again, if you believe Avery's guilty, so he killed her in his trailer, then he killed her again in the garage, then he went to the quarry, sprinkled some remains there, then went to go frame his sister next door. I mean, this is what the state is, when you're putting this information together, I mean, what is the state alleging here? How does this make any sense? They Okay, so yeah, they alerted on a multitude of areas, both on the Avery property and in the quarry areas. And here's the other thing. If someone is planting the evidence and they're coming in through the quarry to plant it, what kind of dog sense would be picked up? Curious questions for those that really want the truth and not defend corrupt walk on blind faith alone, despite a history of framing the exact same guy. <laughs> I mean, this is just insanity. And I'm actually, I'm going to drop a, a tease right here, too. At the end of this episode, I'm also going to reveal another mind shock. Were there previous attempts on Stephen Avery's life? Did someone try to kill him? And why, in the decades leading up to this, and of course, this has to do with these longstanding feuds, and why corrupt law enforcement seemed to really hate the Avery family. Okay, so here we have a map of cadaver dog hits. Shows that there are many hits outside of the Avery Salvage Yard, but no scent of Teresa to corroborate any of those dog hits yet. Daily conclusion, November 5th, law enforcement just began their search for Teresa by scouring the Avery property and vicinities most of the day. Cadaver dogs alert on and off the Avery Salvage property to various forms of human blood and or decomposition. Let me read that again. Cadaver dogs alert on and off the Avery Salvage property to various forms of human blood and or decomposition. 
Also keep in mind, there were no dog hits on the burn pit, and the burn pit is where the state is alleging Stephen Avery burnt Teresa Hallback's remains. And, of course, the legend of the bonfire, many dubious claims there. We'll be continuing to examine that, but if you haven't checked out the podcast on that, you can check that out as well. November 6th. A dog report has a quick summary of this day, noting that the weather was a factor in their attempts to get alerts. However, any alerts that they did receive, they gave to backup personnel in the command post. Daily conclusion, probably the most uneventful day in terms of evidence found in the case. This is November 6th. November 7th, Loof was brought in. 10.35 a.m. started a scent track from the sole of Teresa's shoe at the spot Teresa's vehicle was spotted. Instead of leading straight to Avery's trailer, Loof tracks to the south quarry towards Jambo Creek Road and back to the car. Coincidentally or not, the track leads the same direction that a neighbor of Stephen Avery said that he saw two cars driving into the quarry, one car driving out. And this is, of course, Wilmer Siebert's testimony here. And I'll do a quick recap here from uh, Algoma Photo and Story.wordpress.com, posted April 28th, 2016. What Stephen Avery's former neighbor witnessed. Stephen Avery's former neighbor said he saw things around the time of Teresa Hallback's murder that raise a lot of questions, and no one has asked him about it before. The recent Netflix documentary series Making a Murder has made international headlines and raised many questions surrounding the 2005 murder or alleged murder of Hallback in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin, and the subsequent trial that convicted Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey in crimes related to murder. One of the key pieces of evidence in the case was Hallback's blue-slash-green Toyota RAV4 discovered by a volunteer search party in the rear area of auto Avery's auto salvage November 5th 2005 on the southeast side of the Avery auto salvage off Jambo Creek Road directly beside the entrance to the quarry behind the yard lives Wilmer Siebert a man in his 70s who considers himself friends with the Avery's Siebert said he saw what he thinks may be Teresa Hallback's Toyota RAV4 accompanied by another vehicle a mysterious white jeep days before the search party found the RAV4 on the salvage yard. Now, some people believe his testimony is not credible because he can't remember which day. But wouldn't that make it more credible if it's something that was never taken seriously, never followed up on? Years later, he's trying to remember. He can't remember the exact same day. He's in his 70s. Is the, I mean, to me, I mean, again, he could be lying or mistaken, obviously. Nobody's debating that. But to write off his testimony completely because he can't remember the exact day, that might be kind of silly. Siebert said he was just hanging out in his backyard one day when he saw the RAV4 speeding quickly down the back road that leads into the quarry behind the Avery Salvage Yard, and directly behind it was the white Jeep. About half an hour later, only the Jeep returned, he said. It was a white Jeep, just a smaller Jeep, and it looked like the paint was peeling off the hood. You could see like an undercoating on the hood. The Jeep was what I saw come back out, but I didn't see the RAV4 come out, said Siebert. Siebert cannot precisely remember the day or time he saw the vehicle because of how long ago it was now, but he estimates he saw the vehicles less than a week, perhaps a couple of days or three days before it was discovered by the search party. Siebert said vehicles regularly travel down the quarry road, but he noticed these two particular vehicles because they were driving faster than usual. They must have been going 40 miles an hour, Siebert said. Siebert could not tell who or how many people were in either vehicle. Shortly after the incident, he witnessed the lady found the car back there, said Siebert, referring to the vehicle's discovery by Pamela Sturm as she participated in a volunteer search party. Siebert said he cannot be 100% certain it was Hallback's RAV4, but because it was the same green slash blue color and because he rarely saw RAV4s, he's pretty sure it was. Siebert said that he's been buying parts from Aviato Salvage since before he moved to the home in, the in 1970, 
or in the 1970s. He also raised questions about how the search parties could have found the vehicle so quickly. I don't know how the search party could find that car that quick because I needed a gas tank for a truck once and they gave me the row that it was in and what kind of truck it was and I couldn't find that truck in that short of a time, said Siebert. So knowing the exact location, he still couldn't find it. <laughs> but somehow Pam of God did. And again, if you haven't if you haven't looked at all, if you haven't checked out all of the uh, Stephen Avery Mind Shock series, there's also some some reports that Teresa's friends found the Rav Four earlier than Pam of God. So again, you can look back and check for that. I don't hear that being discussed frequently. And the exact report is this is a supplemental report from November fifth, two thousand five, reporting officer Lieutenant Kelly Sipple. At approximately 2.30 p.m. on Saturday, November 5th, 2005, Lieutenant Sipple of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department arrived at the intersection of Avery Road and Highway 147 to assist the Calumet County Sheriff's Department and the Manitoba County Sheriff's Department in a missing persons incident. On October 31st, a fem- uh, 2005, a female by the name of Teresa Hallback had disappeared. Teresa is a resident of Calumet County. On the morning of Saturday, November 5th, 2005, friends of Teresa were searching the Avery's auto salvage yard where they located her motor vehicle off of the southwest quadrant of the property. Officers from both the Manitoba County Sheriff's Department and Calumet County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene. So that's curious, is it not? Now couple this with another report here, November 2005, so this is uh, another report here, November 5th, 2005, 1117 hours, Lieutenant, I, uh, Lieutenant Herman's report here. I, Lieutenant Herman, spoke with Earl Avery. Earl gave verbal consent at this time for conducting investi- an investigation in the salvage yard. I, Lieutenant Herman, also contacted D.I. Shetter, advising him of the incident. Shetter did respond to Avery Auto Salvage, which time I met with him. Queso investigators and the sheriff arrived on the scene to assist. I, Lieutenant Herman, spoke with D.I. Shetter, who advised that he had spoken to investigator, to Inspector R. Herman about the incident. He was informed that the vehicle had been located in Avery Auto Salvage and that an investigation would take place at the location. At this point, D.I. Shetter and I approached Queso Sheriff Pagel, requesting that their agency take over the investigation due to ongoing civil litigation between Stephen Avery and Manitowoc County. While standing by on the scene, I spoke with Earl Avery. I asked him about the vehicle crusher which was in the yard. This crusher is owned by Norbs Salvage out of Denmark. Earl stated he had used the piece of equipment on occasion and that the owner, Norbs Salvage, did not have a problem with the Averys using it while it was in their yard. Individuals were observed to the southwest of the Avery Auto Salvage in a gravel pit area near a gravel conveyor while officers were on scene. D.I. Shetter and I walked through the yard, again, when he says I, this is Lieutenant Herman's report, where we made contact with five subjects, and these are the names of Hallback's friends. They, these subjects indicated they were friends of the Hallback family and were assisting with search efforts. I identified the persons, and they were advised that at this time the salvage area, yard area is a secure area, and they need to leave the general area. Okay. So basically, there's random people roaming the area at all times. Now, they're saying it's the southwest quadrant of the property, which is curious, because this is where the friends were. And in this supplemental report by Lieutenant Kelly Simple, it stated that friends, plural, of Teresa were searching the Avery's Auto Salvage Yard where they located her motor vehicle off of the southwest quadrant of the property. Now, who finds that curious? That, that's quite curious, is it not? Is it not? So even the finding of the RAV4 is suspect. I mean, everything about the case is suspect. Is there anything that's not suspect? That's a better question. Because I'd like to hear some guilters answer that. But anyway, okay, so back to Seabird here. Chuck Avery, who is also Stephen Avery's brother, 
has owned the salvage yard since the 90s, and he confirmed that at the time of Hallback's murder, the back of the Avery lot could be accessed from the quarry road, but since that time, the rear entrance has been blocked. Siebert said he was not questioned by police or lawyers except for when an FBI agent came to his door shortly after Hallback went missing and, and showed him a picture of Hallback and asked if he knew her, which he didn't. Siebert is a quiet family man, and he said that because no one asked him directly about it at the time, he never thought to tell anyone. I really didn't want to get involved. I didn't know for sure what was going on and how this was going to be handled, said Siebert. Siebert said he is not looking for attention. He is only speaking about it now because net the Netflix documentary made him ask questions. Siebert said during the investigation of Hallback's murder, the police barricaded the quarry road entrance about 50 feet from his back steps and blocked the same section of road that he had observed the RAV4 and Jeep earlier. He said, if anyone moves those barricades, give me a call, but he never gave me a number how I would get a hold of him, said Siebert. Huh. One evening, Siebert said he witnessed Manitoba County Sheriff's Department vehicles driving past the barricade and then going through the Avery property with lights late into the night. So this is, is this weird? What investigation is the FBI conducting? And if you checked out the previous episode, apparently the FBI were there on Cuss Road even before the whole haulback situation. So was there another FBI investigation being run there? And is this FBI agent here talking to Seabird outside the scope of the Hallback investigation and Manitoba County and Calumet County's investigation? Because he wants to know if anybody moves the barrier. Does anybody include law enforcement? Because he's stating here, if anyone moves those barricades. So does he want to know if what police are doing? Because this is an FBI agent. Is he investigating police corruption here? We don't know. Okay, so Seabird said he wanted to report that someone had crossed the barrier, but he didn't know who to call. So he told his daughter, Victoria Seabird, to call local police, who then told her there was nothing to worry about. His daughter confirmed this. Wilmer and Seabird said the next day it was announced on television that they had found Hallbach's keys on the property, but didn't make any claims as to what that means. Which keys? The, the, the spare key? <laughs> Which would have been at her home? Seabird actually likes the Averys and considers them friends. He said since buying his house and raising nine children, neither him or anyone from his family that he knows of had ever had a bad dealing with any of the Avery family. Seibert had even been on fishing trips with Alan Avery, Stephen's father. I can't really find no fault with them because I never had any trouble with them. I always thought they were good people. They treated me fair at least, he said. So are Gilters alleging he's lying? This old man is lying? I mean, somebody paid him off? I mean, this is all, the reports were at least corroborated with his daughter and the, uh, the calls. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite strange. But going back to the timeline here, so, yeah, he saw two cars driving to the quarry, one car driving out. So this November 7th-ish. Again, there's no exact date here in this timeline re-examination. It's credited to November 7th, and it might have been that day. Who knows? Okay, now what's for sure? November 7th, at the same time, 10.35 a.m., Loof is tracking the track. Calumet investigator Dietering is called over to Cuss Road because retired Manitowoc officer Bushman discovers a potential burial site that is as of yet unknown importance to law enforcement. So this is Mike Bushman, who uh, was involved in the 85 frame-up for the Patty Berenson assault. He was one of the arresting officers. He comes out of retirement to finish the job because the first frame-up job didn't stick. So now they're framing Avery again. They have to bring Mike Bushman out of retirement. At around 11.30 a.m., cadaver dogs Brutus and Trace and their handlers arrive for another day of work. They are asked to check out Cuss Road, and both dogs alert to the area of disturbed earth that was discovered by Bushman. And this is all very curious because we don't have the details of the prior FBI investigation in that area at Cuss Road. And or if if Teresa Hallback was some kind of informant working with DCI and or FBI undercover or not, whatever the case may be, if there was another investigation prior, were they worried that corrupt law enforcement would take her out 
and that's why they were keeping tabs on Hallback? Obviously not well enough, unless she's still alive and they did put her into some kind of witness protection, and they were there at the scene, and there was something else going on at Cuss Road that we don't know about. And the FBI didn't want to flex on local law enforcement, so they allowed Bushman and, and these other officers to investigate the area? I mean, who knows? Because that would, would that bring too much suspicion on the FBI if they were not allowing anything on Cuss Road? 1.30 p.m., law enforcement wanted Loof to track for Teresa from the spot Teresa took pictures of the van for sale. Loof started sniffing, showed interest near Avery's trailer where Teresa was confirmed to be outside of, and a magazine from her car was laying on Avery's desk in the week prior. However, what law enforcement did not expect was Loof to keep tracking West all the way to Cuss Road, where a suspected burial site was located just hours before. And of course, this site, Ken Kratz had said it wasn't pertinent to the investigation. I mean, how would he know what information was disclosed? He just expects everyone to take that on blind faith. I mean, it's just, it's really weird. I mean, he really wants everything to be focused on the trailer, the garage, the burn pit, even though there's no real evidence there. 2.30 p.m., law enforcement was perplexed, so they asked a dog handler if a scent can be picked up if the victim is in a car. And the dog handler surmised that it most likely could. So starting south of the famous Cuss Road cul-de-sac, Loof tracks south into the quarry, west, then east, ending about 100 yards south of where the car was eventually found. Loof, going so far southwest of the Avery property, would alert law enforcement to search the quarry areas in the days to come. Daily conclusion, November 7th. 2005. At this point, law enforcement should have an idea that Teresa and or her car were off the property and in the quarry areas. However, no remains were found on this day and no strong scents were detected around the berm that is just west of Avery's residence. November 8th, 8.56 a.m., Loof was back again for more sniffing and searching. Law enforcement wanted Loof to continue the track from the day before. Starting at Avery's trailer, Loof again showed some interest around the garage area, but did not continue because of an aggressive German shepherd. Remember, human bones would be found hours later laying on the burn pit. Once again, Loof went west to Cuss Road and tracked back to the berm west of Avery's through the quarry west of Avery's Savage Yard. Today, Loof seemed to show a lot of interest on the berm that is west of Avery's trailer. The handler made the comment that the scent source is usually within 25 yards of that spot, Avery's burn pit most likely. Now keep in mind, with all of these changing interests in the dog scents, Avery was at the cabin in Crivets, 100 miles north. So someone else is manipulating all of this, all of these remains... <laughs> like what kind of pl who's planting what when and how are the dogs responding because again Avery is up a hundred miles north in Crivets while all this is going on very interesting is it not remains found around 12 47 p.m november 8th manitowoc officer just goes to stand guard near Avery's burn pit and gets bored so he decides to do a mind puzzle regarding the investigation his critical thinking leads him to churn out theories, which ends with him finding what he thought was a human bone about eight feet south of the burn pit area. <laughs> the phrasing here, quite amusing. It doesn't state the queso page number here in reference, but from Josta's report here, November 8, 2005, 1247 hours. I walked to the south end of the property, still keeping watch on the septic tank, while at the southwest corner of the property, I noted the burn pit area, which was located to the south of the garage for Stephen Avery's residence. November On November 7th, I was asked to feed the dogs which were present on Stephen's property and also at the residence to the east of Stephen's. I remember seeing the burn pile at the time while I was feeding the German Shepherd, which was tied up behind Stephen's garage. I noticed there were some items tangled in the cable that the dog was fastened to. While feeding the dogs, 
MTPD officer Jason Koenig and MTPD officer Wilterdink. <laughs> Have we talked about officer Wilterdink before? Due to the aggressiveness of the German Shepherd, I was unable to retrieve the five gallon pails which were placed next to the kennel. This being where the food and water are kept. We were able to keep the German Shepherd far enough from us so that I could pour some food on the ground and also fill up a small water dish. Now, again, going back to the evidence photos, again, check out the previous few episodes because the evidence photos tell a different story because there's a whole bunch of changing items in the area of the burn pit of, of who's bringing what, shovels, all these things. So clearly someone was able to easily be around the burn pit regardless of the German Shepherd there. So maybe just isn't lying. Maybe another officer or a non-officer who planted the remains was m mulling around the area. But in any case, the, the, the scene was ever changing throughout this whole time that we're being asked to believe that nobody went to the burn pit. Again, going back to November 8th, 2005, while I was standing near the southwest corner of, of the Stephen Avery property, I noted several items within close proximity to the burn pile. The items were as follows. There were numerous rings of wire laying in and around the area of the burn pile. I recognized these as steel beltings from inside tires. There was a fire which had not been burned. This was on the southeast corner of the burn pit area. There was a rubber mallet which was on the grass southeast of the pile. There was a metal hammer believed to be a claw hammer laying on the ground northeast of the pile. There was a gravel shovel which was tipped upside down located on the west side of the pile. There was a burned charred metal scraper with a wooden handle attached while which was laying northeast of the pile on the grassy area. There was a frame from a bench sheet that appeared to be from some type of vehicle. This was located in the grassy area southeast of the pile. The cloth or vinyl material which had been on the seat was burned off the frame. Still, while walking on the southwest corner of the property, I noted there were several tires laying on the ground in that corner. There was another bench style of seat on the south side of the property. This one still had the material attached to it. Earlier, when I had been in the command post area, I remember someone mentioning that Joshua Redont had checked on his hunting trailers on Monday evening. He saw there was a large fire burning near Stephen Avery's property. The fire was described as being larger than usual. <laughs> and again, we'll be getting to Redont later. So anyway, this scene that is described, obviously, was changed multiple times. And again, Stephen Avery is at the Cribbit's cabin. And he also states, as we were looking at the ashes laying in the area, it was evident that someone used some type of front end loader to remove ground from this particular location. The ashes were inside the area. As we looked at the ash pile, we observed that there was a bone laying near the south side of the pile on the east side. Without disturbing the bone, I looked at it as closely as I could. It appeared as though it might have been a vertebrae bone. I could see another bone in the pile. At this time, we decided that someone from the crime lab or DCI needed to further investigate the area. Not mentioned above was that Lieutenant Sipple had walked to the pit with me at approximately 1,341 hours and he left the area at approximately 1400 hours. And of course, with all the sifting and dubious nature of the way the crime scene was processed, coroner not allowed on the scene, I mean, this is all outside of the realm of normality by any stretch of the imagination. And it's very possible, it's very, very possible Jost is not in on it. So whoever planted it, whether it was Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department officers or non-law enforcement, whoever planted it might not have informed the officers that found it. They just, they knew it would be found at some point. Keep in mind, again, Avery's at the cabin in Crivets. Okay, at, so continuing the examination of November 8th, at 4.15 p.m., law enforcement asks Loof, and this time another dog, Raz, to start in the Avery salvage yard and see if a track takes them by the conveyor road where Calumet officer Kucharski said cadaver dogs hit on November 5th. And was Kucharski the one that was sitting on the bed, just relaxing in a trailer, a crime, a potential crime scene where Teresa Hallback was supposedly raped and killed at least the first time. And then again in the garage when they, when Lank happened, <laughs> when Lank and Coburn happened to find the, the spare key after searching the exact area multiple times before that's Kucharski. With both dogs scenting together based on Teresa's scent, they don't stay near the Avery salvage yard, but instead 
head southwest out of Avery Salvage Yard towards the conveyor road and keep going west on the, until they get to Country Road Q. The scent of Teresa for the last two days has been taking law enforcement outside of the Avery Salvage property almost every time they are asked to track a scent. Daily conclusion of November 8th, law enforcement finds bones of Teresa on top of Avery's pit but still cannot figure out why the dogs, both cadaver and scent, are alerting outside of the property and all over a quarry that stretches nearly two square miles. I mean, I think they're just not accounting for Avery's other personality, who may or may not be psychic, who's going around sprinkling the bones. They're just not accounting for these psychic split personalities. I don't know why, but they're just not accounting for them. November 9th, citizens were waking up to news that law enforcement were starting to get worried about Teresa's well-being due to some evidence found, quote, on or around, end quote, the Avery property. And this is from a Kerry Antfinger article, the Associated Press. Investigators fear for safety of missing woman. Investigators were still searching Stephen Avery's property Tuesday. Sheriff Jerry Pagel said he refused to provide any details except to say the search included excavations on or near the Avery property. No mention of any quarry areas owned by Joshua Redont or Manitowoc County, even though there was a plethora of interest from unbiased scent and cadaver dogs in the days prior. They forgot to get the dogs in on the frame-up job. I mean, was that the main problem here? <laughs> Around 12.30 p.m., the remains that were found on top of Avery's pit the day before are sent to Dr. Ken Bennett, who is a forensic anthropologist. Dr. Bennett reports that as soon as he opened the box he received, he identified the bones immediately and incontrovertibly as human. He concluded, based on his examination, that the bones belonged to a female between the ages of 20 and 50. And that's quite curious, because we do have other issues regarding the bones and Eisenberg's testimony and also again do we have verifiable chain of custody here because most cases of corruption and frame-up jobs are done in the lab by either switching by switching labels and otherwise so without proving chain of custody here with these remains, I mean, how much is this report worth? I don't know. Armed with the visual ID of human bones, Ken Kratz makes the order to arrest Avery at around 1 p.m. Avery is arrested on an unrelated gun charge that starts chatter at the Calumet County Dispatch Center. And of course, I went over this before too, because the gun wasn't even Avery's. <laughs> Okay, the officer asks the dispatcher to keep it a secret, so naturally she lets the cat out of the bag a short time later. Dr. Bennett is... <laughs> and these are dispatchers gossiping about the Stephen Avery arrest on November 9, 2005, 1.05 p.m. And you can hear this, uh, this clip here regarding this. Joe? Keep this under your hat. Under my hat. Steve and Avery's coming here. Oh, good. When? Um, sometime today. Okay, okay. Rest of the ticket there. On an unrelated charge. Okay. Possession of a firearm. Oh. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. And possession of a firearm is an interesting charge because if his, uh, if his landlord owns a gun, how is that in Stephen Avery's possession? <laughs> I mean, again, we won't get into that. I went over that in previous podcast episodes. Okay. Dr. Bennett is identifying the bones as human, and Avery is getting arrested on an unrelated gun charge after Bennett's visual ID of the human bones. Law enforcement is following up on the cadaver dog hits. The scent dog tracks to see if anything of value is found in the quarry areas surrounding Avery Savage Yard. Around 2 p.m., Kelly Sipple calls Captain Paul Roosh to tell him that they found many more human bones in quarry areas. Gentleman County Sheriff. Hey, Joyce, this is Kelly. Yes. Uh, can I speak to the captain, please? Yes. Kelsey. Hey, Paul. What's up? Uh, did you hear? 
They're human bones that we found? I heard about some of them, yes. Yep, okay. Uh, we got another pile that we found. Okay. Bone in, and our crime scene has now expanded by about two miles. Uh, what we're looking at doing is trying to find, there's no way we can organize a search this evening. Uh, we're trying to find law enforcement staff. Uh, for tomorrow morning to start searching. And uh, I don't have a state patrol supervisor. Okay, I'll call uh, them. How many people are you looking for from them? You know, if we can get up to at least 40, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, what time? And 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Okay. The command post. Okay. And then if you can check with the PD, see what they, if they can provide any staff. I want law enforcement. I, at this point, we're not sure if we really want firemen. We want to stick with... We know what we're looking for evidence-wise, and we kind of want to stick with that. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna—I got Trutson up at uh, command post. I'm just covering a corner right now, and when I get back, he—I think he can provide us some manpower as well. So from Kakana PD. Okay. And Drunen. Or Dr yeah. Yeah. Uh, you got and, some scratch uh, paper there. Yeah. Now what he's, he, what he's doing is. He burned her in the backyard, and that was a real small pile that was left. And we got two five-gallon pails full down at this other site about a mile and a half, two miles away. About a mile and a half away, probably. And uh, we got a few, we got more pails full out along the way somewhere. So. Okay. So they've got pails full of bones between a mile and a half and two, mile, two miles away from Avery's. What are these pails of bones? I mean, this is curious, and this is all swept under the rug, never to be mentioned again. Quite, quite curious. Part of the theory was that the pile on Avery's pit was very small, and more quantities were found away from the yard than near Avery's trailer. This working theory and the human bone piles found around the quarry corroborate the scent and cadaver dog work that had preceded these findings the day before. Again, we have to keep in mind, the dogs were not in on the frame-up. They didn't know about the frame-up. Daily conclusion, Stephen Avery is arrested for a gun possession which was ignored for four days with the help of a visual ID of human bones found laying in a pile on top of his burn pit. In the background, law enforcement keeps working to look for evidence beginning to focus their attention away from Avery Salvage Yard and in the quarry areas. And also, again, we have to keep in mind that the burn pit site looked completely different in all these photographs. So somebody was altering the site while Stephen Avery was at the cabin in Crivets 100 miles north. Okay, November 10th, a day after Avery's arrested, local citizens are waking up to the news that significant evidence was found on the Avery salvage yard, but law enforcement refused to go into details the day before. The evidence, as we know today, of course, includes the pile of bones that were ID'd as human female, 20 to 50 years old, just the day before. While immediate details have not been released to the public, law enforcement knows from their investigations that Teresa, her car, her scent, and human remains were found on both the Avery property and the quarry owned by Manitoba County. They also know that dogs seem to show a lot more interest in the quarry areas than in the Avery Salvage Yard. So if we're going according to guilter logic, so-called logic, wherever you find the bones, they're guilty. So that means that Manitowoc County officials are guilty of murdering Teresa Hallback because her bone, because a majority of bones were found. And if we're not even getting into IDs, because even the bones, even the so-called remains found on Avery's, they don't match Teresa Hallback definitively. If you haven't checked out the DNA for Dummies episodes, check those out on Mindshock and the Stephen Avery case. So it could have, they could not rule out Hallback. They also could not rule out a large percentage of the population. So it could have, those bones could have been a variety of other individuals. Could have been Carmen Bootwell, possibly. Could have been Christine Rudy. Who knows? There's a lot of weird issues in this case. News conference, November 10th, 1.30 p.m. A news conference is scheduled to fill the media and the public in on some of the happenings and maybe even perhaps what caused law enforcement to expand their crime scene by about two miles south, according to Kelly Sipple. What the media and the public are not aware of is the fact that Dr. Bennett has visually examined the bones allegedly found on top of Avery's pit and gave a def definite positive human ID. What most of the media and the public are not aware of is that the dogs and law enforcement showed a lot of interest in the quarry areas that were one to two miles south 
of Avery Salvajard. The press conference starts out with Pagel making the introductory statement. Well, as I am sure everybody is aware, the scope of the investigation is now criminal in nature and we are classifying it as a homicide investigation. It appears that an attempt was made to dispose of a body by incendiary means. However, that attempt was not completely successful. Pieces of human teeth were found on the Avery property and the bone has been determined to be that of an adult female. The teeth are also that of a human being. Pagel starts off with an announcement that law enforcement is positive that the bones were found on the Avery property are human in nature. The first question is if the remains are Teresa. Pagels has a reasonable response, but Kratz chimes in, reiterating something he seemed so sure about that day, but yet seemed to shy away from in 2007 at trial time, only two short years later, emphasized here. Question, how likely do you believe that remains that were found were that of Teresa Hallback? Pagel says, out of respect for the Hallback family, we want to wait until the crime lab has provided proper identification. Kratz states, what we're releasing at this time is that forensic anthropologists and forensic odontologists have determined that with 100% certainty, the bone evidence that has been recovered is that of an adult female. That is human remains and that the teeth are human teeth. From that perspective, we will wait for additional forensic evidence. So he's claiming 100% certainty, adult female. When asked about the possible other crimes being found during the investigation, possible crimes that could sway the perception away from Avery Salvage Yard, Question, are your investigators finding evidence of other crimes out there at the same time they are investigating the disappearance? Pagel says, I do not wish to divulge the information at this time. Another follow-up question about where the human remains were found. Question, can you tell me about where the human items were found or how? Pagel says they were discovered on the Avery property near the residences of the Averys. And I will indicate they were discovered near Stephen Avery's residence. Notice no mention of the quarry. For three days prior to this news conference, most of the action and human bone piles would be found in the quarry. Again, according to the, to the transmissions here, pails of human bones. Pails! I mean, that's a lot of bones. More evasion from Kratz. Question, when were the bone fragments and the blood found, and were they big pieces or small pieces? Pagel says there were numerous pieces of bones in different degrees of size. Kratz says, but I think to comment further on that isn't really, the blood was found immediately. It was found Saturday. We knew about blood on the interior of Teresa's vehicle already on Saturday, the first day we executed search warrants. The bone and other evidence has been discovered throughout this investigation. Notice no specific mention of the quarry when mentioning the bones. Daily conclusion. November 10th. The press conference centered around keeping the narrative around Stephen Avery's property. Media reports are now swirling due to the press conference that human bones were found on the Avery Salvage Yard property near Stephen Avery's residence. This, of course, is only part of the truth, as more piles would be found away from Stephen Avery's property. The media and the public will not hear of those piles or that activity today or any other day. Now, again, let's get some perspective here. In any other case, let's say you have some sprinkling of remains and you have massive pails of bones in another area. If the massive pails of bones in another area were completely hidden from the public, from the trial, what would people think of such a case? Like, let's say you have one individual, he's accused of murder, and there may be, there's some sprinkled ashes or something, some cremains or tiny fragments in, a bur in, in some area on his property, which he might have not even used, and, and that were found while he was away. And then there's pails of bones, admitted pails of bones with recordings of transmissions mentioning these pails of bones and that the and, and ongoing investigation into these pails of, of bones. And it's just never mentioned again. 
<laughs> would people think that was an up and up investigation and a fair trial? I mean, it's just mind shocking. For whatever reason, in the Stephen Avery case, all of this is okay, but in other cases, it would raise an eyebrow. November 11th, media reports are being released with headlines such as Bones Found on Avery Land which of course focuses the narrative only on the Avery property and the Avery family. No mention in that paper about the quarry activity the days prior. As the day rolls on, other papers are also releasing the information that the visual ID of Bennett, unbeknownst to the media and public, was good enough to announce to the world that the bones were that of a human female. The visual ID would not be relied upon at trial when it came to the four piles of human bones found in the quarry. There is no mention in the media of the many buckets and piles of evidence recovered from the quarry area that just two days prior was discussion of law enforcement over the dispatch phone. November 13th, with all of the focus on Stephen Avery, his property, the Avery Salvage Yard, and no mention of a quarry and other possible suspects or a coherent theory, things were looking grim for Stephen and his civil case that he had against Manitowoc County. Even though he could still pursue the civil case while incarcerated, the media was already reporting about how weak his civil case was in the eyes of the public. Man, there really was no evidence of widespread journalistic integrity even back then, was there? Wow, this is crazy. I mean, the headlines, Avery's $36 million civil case up in the air. Facts and lawsuit remain unchanged, but Hallback case would be hard for a civil jury to ignore. I mean, what does one have to do with the other? I mean, even if Avery did murder Teresa Hallback with all of his split personalities, some of them psychic, even if that happened, how does that change the 85 frame up? or all the years he spent in prison while innocent. And he could very well still have an additional lawsuit that all that time in prison made him crazy and made him into a murderer. Again, all due to corrupt and or incompetent law enforcement. <laughs> I mean, yeah, th this, is, this is all very, very mind shocking. Fast forward to 2006, January 12th, Eisenberg meets with Fassbender to discuss progress and later that same day is contacted by Mark Weiger and given more bones that allegedly came from the top of Avery's pit. However, this is the same day that evidence processing took place. Part of this evidence processing was processing burn barrels in all of the five gallon buckets that were found in the quarry areas on November 11, 2005. You can see the photos were taken January 12, 2006. Another view of the buckets can be seen in the background of this photograph. It seems interesting that Eisenberg receives a call from Weigert who just finished processing quarry buckets and burn barrels. None of this information would make it into the media or the public. January 15th, Eisenberg gets another call from Weiger with more bones for her to examine. This time, it contains two tags of interest, 8675, the pelvic bone from the quarry, as well as 8674, recovered from burn barrel number two, the deer camp. None of this information is being released to the public as law enforcement cannot figure out why human bones are being recovered from areas outside of the Avery property. And again, if you haven't checked out the Burn Barrels podcast on Mindshock, check that out. There's so much funny business with the Burn Barrels, chain of custody issues. I mean, this is just never-ending insanity with the Avery case and still quite mind-shocking how anybody can allege this is all above board. Again, whether Avery's guilty or innocent, clearly none of this is above board. February 19th, Eisenberg re-examines the pelvic bone 8675, but also photographs other tags of interest, including human bones from, 76, from 7964 and 8140 that contained human bone. February 27th, Leslie Eisenberg is made aware that there were some cranial fragments. That suggested that Teresa Hallback was shot in the head. This, of course, is a big point of contention for investigators. This new information that they and Eisenberg had showed them that Teresa was shot. Since the perception is that Avery did it, it had to mean that Avery shot her. 
They get so frustrated that Brendan couldn't think of the answer they were looking for, they came right out and asked him themselves. All right, I'm just going to come up and ask you, who shot her in the head? He did. Why didn't you tell us that? So I can't think of it. So clearly reverse engineering the coercion necessary to get Brendan Dassey to so-called confess to this crime. And again, if you look at some of these other conversations with Brendan, he can't keep focus. He's all over the place. And here you have these corrupt officials to Brendan who are these uh, figures of authority berating him and threatening him. And he doesn't know what's going on. Even if they were non-corrupt nice guys, he still wouldn't know what was going on. So compounding to the emotional distress they're inflicting on this kid, I mean, it's just, it's really mind-shocking how anybody can defend this obvious corrupt coercion. It's just absolutely insane. March 1st, Brendan Dassey is coerced to give a narrative that the media and the public were not aware of. It was such a secret narrative that even Kratz himself says they have now determined what happened on Halloween 2005. No mention up until this point about the quarry activities or the other human bones that have been recovered and identified up to this point of the investigation. A clear about face from their actions in November 2005. However, they stayed consistent in the manner that they continued to focus all the details they released to be about Avery and his property. <laughs> April 10th to 11th. On these days, over a month after Brendan Dassey's arrested and the rape, torture, killing on the Avery property is published to the media and the public, Leslie Calumet, Manitowoc, and DCI personnel all met to finally process all of the five gallons of pails found all over the quarry areas. Notice you'll find good old Manitoba County Detective Remaker still involved in the case. Interesting items were recovered, including what looked like blood-stained rock, possible bones, human bone fragments, a bunch of other expletive. None of the items found above were ever disclosed to the media. No press conference was held to expand on the working theory that Ken Kratz and law enforcement held. Again, in an above board case, are these the actions that would be taking place? So they arrest Brendan Dassey and they still don't process any of these human remains and bones or potentially human remains and bones found all over the quarry matching the dog sense. Nobody's interested. It's, it's really weird. It's really weird, is it not? April 25th, Leslie Eisenberg examines a bunch of biological material recovered in the last few months and makes bench notes on each tag number that she examines. Most of these items were from the five-gallon buckets recovered from the quarry. Leslie also makes note of human bones with cut marks in this examination on this day. None of this new information ever made it into the media or the public. The theory was not expanded, nor was the criminal complaint to contain any of these details. The perception was still at this time that Teresa was last on Avery's land and never left. June 15th, Eisenberg re-examined some tag numbers from this case that she had marked for reevaluation. One particular tag number of interest is 7964, which is from burn barrel number two or the deer camp. To this day, no clear verification has ever been given. Anyway, upon further examination, Leslie updates her determination of the bone in the baggie to being human. July 4th, Eisenberg releases her entire report documenting her findings to date. Her findings include multiple human bones that were found outside of the Avery Salvage Yard and a detailed age and sex determination of the bones she examined. Lastly, Leslie identifies 7964 and gives a possible detail on time since Teresa's death because of some clues on the human bone. And this is her note here. The presence of empty pupil casings, tag number 7964, collected November 12, 2005 from barrel number two and identified as burnt bone pieces, suggests that perhaps there was an undocumented interval 
between Miss Hallback's death and the burning episode when her remains may have been exposed to egg-laying flies. However, it is not possible to determine from this analysis if those people casings were associated with the human or non-human fragments identified by the undersigned as collected under that tag number. It is worthy of note, however, that the same evidence tag number yielded the suspected human bone fragment with evidence for multiple cuts. And if you haven't checked out the Mind Shock episode on pupil casings, check that out. We go over that pretty extensively as well. Remember, this bone was recovered from either Burn Barrel Number 2 or the Deer Camp. None of this information was ever disclosed to the media or the public. No press conference was held to expand on the details of the theory that was against Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. The crime was still said to have happened on the Avery property. December 3rd. 2006. Eisenberg submits her second final report on the Avery case. This report encompasses work that took place from July through December 2006, a time where Buting and Strang were squarely focused on Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office as the culprits of planting and possible Denny suspects like Bobby and Scott. Leslie mentions tag number 7964 again and mentions that it has cut marks. This bone does not come from Avery's pit, but rather burn barrel number two, and actually produced other body parts besides just bones. Lastly, Leslie identifies many tag numbers that are human bone. Not suspected human, but directly human. These tag numbers are the items she examined that came from the quarry area. None of this information is ever released to the media or the public. The perception is that Teresa never left the Avery Salvage Yard alive. Fast forward to 2007. During trial and closing arguments, Ken Kratz gave the jury, the media, and the public his thoughts about what he felt about Eisenberg's human determination just three months prior. Attorney Kratz, so the bones in the quarry are really not evidence in this case. And so Mr. Strang has made a big deal out of showing you maps and a little flag and things like that about possible bones. Again, speculation, conjecture is not part of this case. Facts are going to be what decides this case. <laughs> and that's almost comical in nature because they've provided no facts that Avery or Dassey committed any crime here. If you notice what Kratz does, he says the quarry burns are not evidence in this case. He says this, of course, because Eisenberg only testifies in reference to the quarry about tag 8675, the suspected human pelvic bone. Neither the state or defense ask her specifically about the bones she deemed as human in her December 2006 report. The public perception is that all of the bones were found on the Avery property and that Stephen Avery murdered Teresa on Halloween 2005 with the aid of Brendan Dassey. No mention was made of the strong dog interest nearly two miles south-southwest and the many buckets of piles that recovered human bone. Now, I don't know why the guilters are so desperate to ignore all of this if they claim they really are after the truth. So did someone else get murdered in the quarry? Because they're saying they're human bones. They were identified as human bones. And if we're saying that identification cannot be definitive, well, what about the bones that are supposedly Teresa's? So it's, it's just, it's, it's really weird where it's convenient to hallucinate that this is all 100% when it points to Avery. But to claim that there's anything that doesn't lead to Avery, that's all conjecture. <laughs> the psychological projection of Ken Kratz knows no bounds. Fast forward to 2011, September 20th, the infamous day that the many human bones were returned to the family. Many of these bones were found on January 12th, 2006 during evidence processing. To give you a visual of just some of the tags and bags that were returned, see here. You'll note that item 7964, the bag that was identified as human in the summer of 2006 by Eisenberg, was part of this group. None of this was ever reported to the media or the public. Heck, this action violated Stephen Avery's rights, if by nothing else, not notifying him or his lawyer of biological evidence being returned. So wait a second. They're returning bones found in the quarry 
to Teresa Hallback's family, if they're not pertinent to this case, then why would they be returning? If they're not Teresa Hallback, why are they being returned to her family? I mean, these are questions that need to be answered, and nobody's answering them. I mean, I don't know what to make of this. The Mindshock listeners, feel free to, to, to give your thoughts on this. This is all quite mind-shocking. The conclusion here from the onset of their defense of Avery, Buting and Strang had the right track but the wrong targets. The targets were Manitoba County Sheriff's Office and their civil lawsuit. Ken Kratz was more than happy to have that be the case in chief of his opponents because he knew all too well that the energy would be spent there and not in the quarry where neither the media or the public knew anything about the many pieces and cents of Teresa Hallback. The tunnel vision wasn't necessarily only with Manitoba County and Queso. It was with Pagel and Kratz from the early days of November 2005. So yeah, it's, it's all very, very curious. It's all very, very curious. There's no mention, again, also of this FBI investigation taking place prior to Teresa Hallback, possibly having to do with Teresa Hallback being a CI, possibly not. Again, if you haven't checked out the previous episode, make sure you check out the previous episode. But when you're looking at the totality of the timeline and how Kratz was trying to fool everybody, it all makes a lot better sense when you're looking at it in hindsight. And again, Kratz, Manitowoc, they never knew that there would be this level of scrutiny levied upon their corruption and frame-up of Stephen Avery. And this is without even getting into all of the coincidences with Christine Rudy, with Carmen Bootwell. I mean, there's just a never-ending stream of coincidences and anomalies that the guilters just stick their head into the sand, nothing to see here, all on the up and up. You don't see this in other cases. In legitimate up and up investigations and cases and rightful convictions, you don't see any of this. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just really, really bizarre how the guilters desperately cling to the, to the words of Ken Kratz, which are conflicting in and of itself, but there's there's really no substance to anything said here, and it's very obvious on how this is framed in hindsight. At the time, it was a little more difficult, and all these muddying of the waters regarding chain of custody and all these things, was that all by design as well? Or was it a combination of incompetence and corruption? Because obviously, there, there's no evidence that every single member of Manitowoc was in on this frame-up. It could have only been a couple people. Everybody else is just following orders. So, uh, a few comments here regarding this timeline. No mention of blood until the morning of the 6th when the crime lab accessed the RAV4 finding it unlocked. And that those, again, if you haven't checked out the RAV4 episodes in the Mind Shock podcast, there's three episodes. We go into detail the timeline getting the RAV4 to the crime lab, all of the bizarre issues, again, that you don't see in any other case. The only blood mentioned prior was blood in Stephen Avery's trailer on a door frame collected on the 5th by Coburn. The following day, the 6th, they collected more blood from the bathroom laundry area. It's documented in the case of reports and also in the Mantua County Sheriff's Office reports. So what is Ken Kratz yammering about? How the expletive did he know about the blood in the RAV4 on Saturday the 5th? A response here, yeah, that is the one thing that sticks out in my mind. He is so sure of the blood being found on Saturday. Or he realized later on that he expletived up by stating that and had to fix it by the doors were locked and the RAV4 was never opened at Avery Salvage Yard. This case is such expletive of manipulation and corruption. So a couple more comments here. Good timeline analysis, but in focusing on Kratz, for sure a truly despicable man, you're letting Strang and Buting off the hook. They were sent by Wisconsin Attorney General Lautenschlager to ambush the case. Only days, so this is from page 161, Beyond Avery Road, Buting and the Beast by Chad Spencer Kelly. Only days before Fallon comes aboard, less than half a block from Fallon's office, Dean Strang is meeting with Stephen M. Glynn in Strang's office. Strang is a colleague of Fallon, and their offices are located half a block away in Madison, Wisconsin. Civil suit attorney Stephen M. Glynn has recommended 
that Stephen Avery settle and hire Strang and Buting immediately. Strang and Buting were horribly negligent and even and Avery even sued them for ineffective counsel in 2012. There was no DNA expert, coerced minor confession through, though Buting was an expert in that area, and on and on. I mean, that those are all excellent points. I mean, to have this obvious of a frame-up and corruption and violation of Avery's rights, I mean, this is ineffective counsel. I don't know how anybody can argue that it wasn't. In, I mean, even with everything stacked against them by corrupt judges and the corrupt state, it still doesn't explain why they didn't even attempt to pursue these things unless they were compromised or they were in on it or they are just really well-meaning incompetents. But it doesn't seem that they're that incompetent from their interviews. Then again, they did have a pretty good media tour as fallout from the case, so who knows what kind of compromising took place, if any. This is, of course, mind shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. Over 120 closed-door, off-the-record meetings between the state and defense took place with the judge in Avery's trial. And it would be very, very curious if there was a recording device in on those meetings. Because again, if we're talking about truth and justice, blind justice and transparency, shouldn't the public be entitled to know what was discussed during those uh, closed door meetings? Why were they off the record? Isn't this a matter of public record? This is a public trial. Bottom line is Avery won his lawsuit and Wisconsin was potentially on the hook for $1 billion in false convictions from the Innocence Project. From page 30, Beyond Avery Road, Beauty and the Beast by Chad Spencer Kelly. But the truth of the matter is there were 900 Stephen Averys writing to have their cases reviewed. But the state made sure none of those potentially innocent were being fast-tracked to freedom because of the possibility of a great financial loss due to multiple civil lawsuits Dipping into the state budget, if all 900 inmates writing to the Wisconsin Innocent Project were innocent, became insulted by a $25,000 cap off and petitioned on average for a $1.1 million in compensation as Stephen Avery will, then the state budget would be hit hard in the pocket for claims of up to $1 billion. Simply, a new forensics DNA testing was a threat. Thus, Attorney General Lautenschlager assured that the backlogging of the state crime lab was a must. Okay, now here is potentially the biggest mind shock as of yet, and it's not even directly related to Stephen Avery. Now, even the most ardent coincidence theorist, the most authority-worshipping cultist, has to admit, I mean, I would think, I don't know how many Dunning-Kruger goofs think that there's not a single innocent person in prison, but... There's 900 potential wrongful convictions. Now, some of those could really be guilty people, obviously. I mean, even if we say 50% is guilty. I mean, it's still astronomical. They could, if the state, so people go on and on about Avery's $36 million lawsuit against Manitowoc, that's pennies compared to upwards of a billion dollars in liability and compensation to all these other wrongful convictions. Because we know how they do business in Wisconsin. I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious from the Stephen Avery case. But even if, even if only half of these individuals are innocent, now all of a sudden the state crime lab is backlogged with DNA testing. I mean, again, you have to look at it just from a purely budgetary point of view. There's a lot to lose here for the state. This isn't just about $36 million. If we put, for the people that say, oh, there was no way they would get Strang and Buting in on it. When you're talking about upwards of a billion dollars, paying off a couple of people for a couple hundred grand or even a million dollars or even some threats, that's nothing. I mean, have the guilters, are guilters really that clueless about how corruption works and basic human psychology? As if state or government officials have never taken payoffs in the history of the United States. I mean, come on. I'm not saying that happened here. I'm saying to deny that that's a possibility, how silly is that? 
to deny that humans are capable of being corrupt and taking payoffs, being in on the schemes, or dare I say conspiracy, more than one individual, acting in a nefarious fashion. There's upwards of a billion dollars on the hook here. This is well beyond Avery and his $36 million lawsuit. So when you keep that in mind, does it make more sense that Strang and Buting could have been compromised? And that's without even going on to the direct connections with individuals like Lautenschlager. Here's another comment here. Excellent post. The only part I'd strongly disagree with would be the part of Buting and Strang having the right track but the wrong target. I mean, if that were true, what was their track and who was their target? To me, it's obvious they had no clear track and certainly no definitive targets. There were so many opportunities for them to impeach witnesses, discredit experts, and clarify perceptions, which they simply let go by the wayside. It's unimaginable. They were soft on everyone they could have easily hammered, like firing an arrow into the bullseye of a target. Instead, what they did was more like lobbing water balloons over the target so no one got wet. I don't know when people are going to be able to put aside the impression of those two men from making a murderer. Hell, I really wanted to like them too, and accept what it really was, and that is, Buting and Strang were complicit with the state and never approached putting on a vigorous defense of Stephen Avery's rights. There is not one aspect of their defense where anybody can say they fought and they fought hard. Sad but true. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these two men are evil, but I feel it's more likely they caved into peer pressure and just didn't really challenge the state. And that's an interesting post here on Reddit regarding Strang and Buting. Again, we don't know what the real truth is. Did they start off not compromised and then became compromised? I don't know. But there's just, there's such a lack of comparison to how cases and investigations are handled where there is no conflict of interest or where there is a conflict of interest and it's yielded. Because again, all of the planted evidence is being found by Manitoba County officials. I mean, is that not suspect? I mean, it, it's just the whole case should have been thrown out from the get. I mean, it's just so mind shocking. I mean, there are known serial killers with definitive evidence that get their cases thrown out because of, of thing, just, you know, because of paperwork issues or whatever procedures not followed. And here you have just this landslide of corruption and the case isn't thrown out and no evidence of guilt. Where in other cases, you have the murderers. Everybody knows they did it. There's physical evidence. There's witnesses. There's just so much evidence. But they didn't follow protocol. They didn't follow the letter of the law. And their murderers are out in the street. And yet here you have innocent people where nothing was followed. And they're in prison. Or potentially innocent. I know there's a lot of guilters. They think they just vehemently maintain on blind faith and blind faith alone. In the words of the, for the words of the corrupt like Ken Kratz. That Avery's guilty. It's really bizarre. So here's another post here commenting on this. I think the biggest problem faced by Buting and Strang was the sheer volume of information and the amount of time they had to examine everything. Would need to hire a whole team to scour discovery and find everything wrong. The biggest mistake the defense did was to play by the rules while the other side cheated. How can anyone win if the other side cheats? Hides discovery, mislabeled discovery, lied to by the state. They were good attorneys with a dumpster fire. They aren't cutthroat, and they needed to be in Ken Kratz's courtroom. Lloyd, the public defender, dropped the ball. He could have worked on the discovery, but it piled up and then was given over to Buting and Strang in one large lot. They had eight to nine months to work on this. They also trusted that investigators did their job. And is that just making excuses for, for Strang and Buting? All right, so let's move on here to the mind shock everybody has been waiting for. Was there an attempt on Stephen Avery's life all the way back to January of 1982? Or was this all just coincidental as well? So this is an article from Manitowoc Herald Times, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, January 30th, 1982, Saturday. Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department traffic accident. Stephen A. Avery, 19, Route 2, Two Rivers, suffered forehead laceration late Friday night when he was struck by van truck 
What is a van truck? While walking across Highway 163 just south of Two Creeks. Vehicle was driven by Charles D. Ball, 36, of Xander Road, Michigan. And if you haven't checked out the Xander Road curiosities and coincidences, you can check those out on Mindshack. According to report, Avery had walked across the roadway and was retracing his steps when accident occurred at about 11.55 p.m. He was listed in stable condition at Two Rivers Community Hospital. So is this a case of Avery innocently crossing a road at midnight and getting struck? Or was this an attempt on his life? Now, there's really not much to go on here. But it would be curious to note if anything happened to Charles D. Bull striking a pedestrian potential. I mean, this, this could have potentially killed Stephen Avery. And... Other issues, because we, we have this long-standing history of everybody in uh, Manitowoc hating the Averys, these family feuds, these disputes over land. Of course, the Avery Salvage Yard is surrounded by Redont property and Manitowoc County property. All very, very curious that demands more examining to truly objective, neutral, logical individuals that are really out there for the truth. I mean, this really is a case unlike any other Plenty more to examine in the coming episodes, believe it or not. We still haven't even gone over everything in this case. Is it obvious yet? Are there any guilters left that are not related to Manitowoc officers or Wisconsin state officials? I don't know. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Mind Shock True Crime. If you enjoyed the podcast, find it interesting, want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast, hit that bell for notifications. You could also just go to youtube.com slash mindshock or youtube.com slash mindshock true crime. Hit the like button to share this podcast across social media platforms. Help keep awareness up, not just in this wrongful conviction, but in other wrongful convictions as well. Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority. Case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast or request. You could also be a guest on the podcast depending on your queue. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind. Leave them in the comments. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. You are listening to the Stephen Avery series. This is, of course, stemming from the Making a Murder Netflix documentary, which was so biased in favor of Manitowoc County and the state against Stephen Avery. They only revealed 1% or so of the corruption. And that is why the Mind Shock podcast regarding the Stephen Avery case had to start because it was just so biased against Stephen Avery, just in so many different ways. And this is actually episode 36, Strang and Buting, investigating how effective Stephen Avery's counsel was. In the case of the alleged murder of Teresa Hallback, obviously there's no incontrovertible proof that she's dead. She might be dead. Is there any evidence pointing to Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey? Uh, this is episode 36, and we haven't seen anything definitive yet. So clearly this is a wrongful conviction, even if they're guilty. I've said that many times. I am, of course, your host, Bruce McGuire. And we will be examining Strang and Buting extensively in this podcast. There's a lot of conflicting sentiment regarding these two lawyers. And whether or not they did a good job or not, whether or not the stack, the cards were stacked against them so much that they just couldn't do anything, or were they complicit in the entire frame-up and wrongful conviction, or did they set out to be fair? And legitimate and they became compromised somewhere along the way I started examining this in the previous podcast the timeline re-examined if you haven't checked that out make sure you check that out make sure you check out the entire series because I will be referencing points that we have gone over prior 
If you enjoy the podcast, find it interesting, and want to help support the channel, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure you allow your device to have those notifications come through. If it's still not working, you can just go to youtube.com slash mindshock or youtube.com slash mindshock true crime. Like and share this podcast. Keep awareness of not just in this wrongful conviction, but in other wrongful convictions as well. Truth and justice there's what is the harm in verifying truth verifying that justice was served it's very telling when guilters or people that i guess don't believe that there are any innocent people in prisons that they just get all triggered whenever someone wants to re-examine a case to see if they really got the guilty parties and it's just it's really weird there's a common saying trust but verify on mind shock i say distrust and verify because humans are fallible and humans can be corrupt not a revolutionary concept, although for coincidence theorists and authority-worshipping cultists that think police n never get it wrong and court officials and state officials can never be corrupt, I mean, maybe it's revolutionary for them. So like and share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. Okay, so I'm just going to recap where I left off in the previous episode. And these are comments from TikTok Manitowoc. Good timeline and analysis, but in focusing on Kratz, for sure a truly despicable man, you're letting Strang and Buting off the hook. They were sent by Wisconsin AG Laudenschlager to ambush the case. Excerpt from Beyond Avery Road, Beauty and the Beast by Chad Spencer Kelly, page 161. Only days before Fallon comes on board, less than half a block from Fallon's office, Dean Strang is meeting with Stephen M. Glynn in Strang's office. Strang is a colleague of Fallon, and their offices are located half a block away in Madison, Wisconsin. Civil suit attorney Stephen M. Glynn has recommended that Stephen Avery settle and hire Strang and Beauty immediately. Strang and Buting were horribly negligent, and Avery even sued them for ineffective counsel in 2012. No DNA expert coerced minor confession, although Buting was an expert in that area. Over 120 closed-door off-the-record meetings between the state and defense took place with the judge in Avery's trial. Bottom line is Avery won his lawsuit was that had Avery won his lawsuit, Wisconsin was potentially on the hook for one billion dollars in false convictions from the Innocence Project. And as I went over in the previous episode, it's not just about Avery's 36 million. And going back to Beyond Avery Road, Beauty and the Beast, page 30, but the truth of the matter is there were 900 Stephen Averys writing to have their cases reviewed. But the state made sure none of those potentially innocent were being fast-tracked to freedom because of the possibility of a great financial loss due to multiple civil suits dipping into the state budget. If all 900 inmates writing to the Wisconsin Innocent Project were innocent, became insulted by a $25,000 cap off and petitioned an on average $1.1 million in compensations as Stephen Avery will, then the state budget would be hit hard in the pocket for claims of up to $1 billion. Simply, new forensic DNA evidence was a threat. Thus, Attorney General Lautenschlager assured that the backlogging of the state crime lab was a must. And as I mentioned in the previous episode, when you're talking about a, over a billion dollars going into the state budget, it's not just about Stephen Avery. And again, these authority-worshipping cultists who claim that only guilty people are in prison... It's, it's like they're incapable of comprehending that humans are fallible, even if officers and courts aren't corrupt. Humans are fallible. It's not that revolutionary a concept. It's possible to get it wrong. And now the question is, what percentage is wrong? So depending on what you look at, anywhere between 1 and 40% of people in prison are innocent of the crimes they were accused of. Now, I don't know the exact breakdown. It might be 10% are completely innocent of any criminal activity. And then a certain percentage are known criminals, but the particular crime that they're accused of, they were innocent. And that's what they're in prison for. So if some of these are violent offenders or even drug offend nonviolent drug offenders, they weren't guilty of the charge that they're for for which they are serving. And that's a travesty. 
And I don't know how anybody could be okay with that because potentially that's just so many more innocent people will continue to be in prison. But look at the desperation and the shutting down of logical inquiry and review. Because if you're truly objective, logical, scientific, and you really want the truth, blind justice, why wouldn't you review the cases? And we see this all the time as DNA technology progresses. You see more and more people that were actually convicted on DNA evidence being released because they're actually innocent. And the so-called hard science wasn't hard. You're talking about a fallible human technology extrapolating pieces of genetic material and the assumption is that it's a 100% match. Now, 99%, you could say that's good enough, but it's not even really 99% because you're working with limited information, possibly degraded samples, and the technology is amplifying, extrapolating, approximating in order to make these matches. So yeah, sure, it could be accurate or it could not be accurate. I mean, this isn't rocket science to understand that technology has limits. And to hallucinate and pretend there are no limits, that's the silly nonsense that got all these innocent people in prison in the first place. That's why I, I don't think DNA evidence is the only thing that should be relied on. And of course, not all DNA evidence is equal. In certain cases where you have really good samples and you can prove that they weren't planted, they were legitimately collected and all of this, and you have other evidence. I mean, clearly that would point to someone being guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, beyond a reasonable doubt doesn't mean 100% either. But beyond a reasonable doubt, which surely you'd have to be over 90% sure, over 95% sure. Not 50-50, not less than 50. I mean, this kind of silly nonsense, again, is why so many innocent people are in prison. I'll review one more post- I'll review a couple more posts here before I get into the defense of Buting and Strang. Excellent post. The only part I'd strongly disagree with would be the part of Buting and Strang having the right track but the wrong target. I mean, if that were true, what was their track and who was their target? To me, it's obvious they had no clear track and certainly no definitive targets. There were so many opportunities for them to impeach witnesses discredit experts, and clarify perceptions, which they simply let go by the wayside, it's unimaginable. They were soft on everyone they could have easily hammered, like firing an arrow into the bullseye of a target. Instead, what they did was more like lobbing water balloons over the target so no one got wet. I don't know when people are going to be able to put aside the impression of those two men from making a murderer, hell, I really wanted to like them too, and accept what it really was, and that is, Buting and Strang were complicit with the state and never approached putting on a vigorous defense of Stephen Avery's rights. There is not one aspect of their defense where anybody can say they fought and they fought hard. Sad but true. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these two are evil men, but I feel it's more likely they caved into peer pressure and just didn't really challenge the state. A response here, unjust and unfair assessment of Buting and Strang, in my opinion. They did repeatedly challenge the state, which you'd know if you read the transcripts, both trial and pretrial. You're entitled to your opinion of their performance from watching Making a Murder or from reading transcripts, though it boggles the mind how you can say that if you that if you had read them. But you are not entitled to accuse them of being complicit with the state of basically throwing the case which you have done. That is sad. What is sad but true is that you've maligned these men without cause. Shame on you. <laughs> and what's, what's curious is there is this individual might just be psychologically projecting, but there's a lot of dubious links with Buting and Strang and uh, state officials, which we'll be examining. Another response here, I think the biggest problem faced by Buting and Strang was the sheer volume of information and the amount of time they had to examine everything would need to hire a whole team to scour discovery and find everything wrong. The biggest mistake the defense did was to play by the rules while the other side cheated. How can anyone win if the other side cheats? Hides discovery, mislabeled discovery, lied to by the state. They were good attorneys with a dumpster fire. They aren't cutthroat and they needed to be in Ken Kratz's courtroom. Loy, the public defender, dropped the ball. He could have worked on discovery, but it had piled up and then was given over to Buting and Strang in one large lot. They had eight to nine months to work on this expletive. They also trusted that investigators did their job. Another response, I couldn't agree with that more relating to the, uh, to the attack on Buting and Strang. They didn't do the job they were hired to do, plain and simple. 
They never even questioned the so-called partner in crime. Money was the supposed reason for not hiring witnesses, but it doesn't take money to ask questions of the non-experts, like, like Brendan Dassey or even the state star witness Bobby Dassey. They failed and now roam the world with speaking engagements, making money off this case. It's wrong in my opinion. Now, let's look at a more uh, ardent defense of Jerome Buting. This was posted on TikTok Manitowoc four years ago. Okay, so there were some confusing and inaccurate allegations about Buting's relationship with Peg Lautenschlager during the Armstrong case. Buting and Lautenschlager would take on a case in July with an oral discussion with the former Attorney General helping Buting to advance reputation regarding a different wrongful conviction case. Not that Buting needs me to defend him since the facts of the Armstrong case speak for themselves, but here are the facts. 1993, Ralph D. Armstrong, who was imprisoned at Wapun and had served 20 years in prison for the rape and murder of a Madison student, sought help from the National Innocence Project, a New York-based program that seeks to overturn wrongful convictions through the use of DNA testing. 2001, attorney Barry Sheck, co-founder of the Innocent Projects, referred the case to Buting, who filed court papers requesting a new trial for Armstrong. Quote, the state deliberately suppressed and withheld for approximately the last 13 years information that a known third party confessed to the rape and murder of the victim in this case, end quote. Again, this is how Wisconsin operates. We see evidence of this everywhere. July 12, 2005, the Wisconsin Supreme Court overturned Armstrong's conviction after tests excluded him as the source of crime scene DNA. Quite curious. For the defendant, Jerome Buting and Barry C. Sheck, oral argument by Jerome Buting and Barry C. Sheck. For the plaintiff, Sally L. Wellman, assistant attorney general with whom on the briefs was Peggy A. Lautenschlager, attorney general. An amicus curiae brief was filed by Keith A. Finley on behalf of the Wisconsin Innocence Project. Buting and Lautenschlager were adversaries in this case, not partners. August 2005, new criminal justice commission formed for Wisconsin by the State Bar of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin Law School, Marquette University Law School, and Wisconsin Attorney General Peg Lautenschlager to improve Wisconsin's criminal justice system by identifying and remedying problems that have led to wrongful convictions. The new commission was comprised of 27 well-respected prosecutors, police, defense attorneys, judges, and victims advocates, as well as community leaders from outside the system. Among others, the list included Keith A. Findlay, Stephen M. Glynn, and Jerome Buting, likely due to his recent success in overturning Armstrong's wrongful conviction. Also in 2005, the Dane County District Attorney's Office prepared to retry the Armstrong case. However, with the new trial, while the new trial was pending, a woman testified at a hearing that she had called the Dane County Assistant DA John Norsetter in 95 to report that Armstrong's brother, Steve, confessed that he, not Ralph, was guilty of the crime and that he feared Ralph would be exonerated by DNA and come after him if he found out Steve was the real guilty party. The woman said she described Steve's gruesomely detailed confession to Norsetter who did not report this evidence to defense attorneys and did not pursue the lead. Steve Armstrong had disappeared shortly after the crime and never again contacted his brother, Ralph. Steve died in 2005. Wow. Wow. February 2006, based on Buting's experience with his previous wrongful conviction case, as well as his successful appeal of a 2003 case, where the jury selection process was outrageously biased due to widespread publicity. Is it any wonder that Strang teamed up with him for the Stephen Avery's trial? Buting says he and I had worked on other cases where we'd represented co-defendants, so we were familiar with each other's style. He thought we would complement each other, and I think we did as the case went on. 2006, 
More forensic testing was done and the crime scene evidence from the Armstrong case, including mitochondrial DNA tests, an advanced technique that can develop DNA profiles from degraded samples and hair follicles. Mitochondrial DNA tests of hairs from the crime scene included Ralph Armstrong. Because mitochondrial DNA is inherited from one's mother, Ralph and Steve Armstrong would be expected to have the same mitochondrial DNA profile. Further DNA tests of the semen stain from the robe belt excluded Ralph Armstrong again, as well as the victim's boyfriend. Despite those exculpatory results, the state announced it would retry Armstrong for the crimes. Then, despite a court order requiring prosecutors to notify defense attorneys any time evidence in the case was moved or analyzed, Norsetter secretly ordered additional DNA tests. These illegal tests used up the biological evidence, preventing any further testing. Interesting tactics by Norsetter. Moreover, the YSTR DNA testing Norsetter ordered in 2006 focuses on the Y chromosome and would not have distinguished genetic material between males with the same father. Wow, Norsetter is a devious one. Is this the guy Ken Kratz was learning from? <laughs> Full details of the case and the atrocious behavior of the DA Norsetter and the Wisconsin Crime Lab are reported on the innocenceproject.org and also on isthmus.com. September 2008, Buting requested probe of Wisconsin State Crime Lab, which resulted in the Wisconsin Department of Justice doing absolutely nothing about the drunken, dry labbing, unethical analysts at the Wisconsin Crime Lab. And these are documents available on the Department of Justice State website on, in Wisconsin about all of this uh, drunken activity during DNA testing. 2009, Reserve Judge Robert Kinney dismissed the charges against Armstrong, who was then awaiting retrial, after finding the now-retired ADA Norsetter should have disclosed to Armstrong's lawyer a purported confession in 1995 by Armstrong's brother, Stephen Armstrong, which was reported to Norsetter by two women. May 2015, after a federal judge twice rejected Armstrong's civil suit against the state because it wasn't specific enough, Armstrong filed an amended lawsuit, this time naming his defendants. Retired Dane County Assistant District Attorney John Norsetter, retired Madison Police Detective Marion Morgan, retired Detective Robert Lombardo, and two state crime lab analysts. The Court of Appeals rejected the defendants' qualified immunity claims and held that Armstrong's case could proceed. So yeah, Wisconsin and the, and the state crime lab, there's a history of corruption here and covering up corruption. So again, to all the guilters in the Stephen Avery case who hallucinate that the state crime lab is infallible and all these individuals are infallible, quite silly. I mean, there's just so much precedent here. Armstrong claims prosecutor John Norsetter acted in bad faith by allowing the loss or destruction of drug paraphernalia found at the crime scene, evidence that could exculpate Armstrong and implicate the real killer. The evidence was allegedly tossed in a plastic trash bag, placed in an office storage locker, and lost before Armstrong's trial in 1981. Convenient. After the Wisconsin Supreme Court vacated his conviction and ordered a new trial in 2005, two state lab technicians, Karen Daly and Daniel Campbell, deliberately violated a state court order to preserve evidence by destroying an exculpatory DNA sample in 2006. I have no idea about the veracity of the other claims in the original poster's thread against Strang and Buting in the Avery case. There are no sources to check, but okay. So this is curious. Now my comment here is Strang and Buting, how many corrupt law enforcement or state officials start out corrupt. How many of them start out as people with integrity and character and just simply are surrounded by so much corruption and threats they have no choice but to cave or simply, you know, budget financial bribes, whatever, depending on their home situations or even not if they're greedy. Regardless, it's really weird to hallucinate that all corrupt people start off corrupt. It's just really, really bizarre. I mean, I don't know if that's what coincidence theorists just always do uh, in order to pretend there's not there's not the level of corruption that there is. I mean, I don't know. But yeah, it's really weird. If Strang and Buting were compromised, who said they were compromised from the outset? 
they might have fully entered the Stephen Avery case attempting to to represent their client in good faith and find truth and justice. And something happened along the way. Some things were made clear during these 120 behind closed doors meeting with the judge. Something happened. And again, with Peggy Lautenschlager, again, if she was corrupt from the get-go, we also don't know her uh, exact, you know, in pro wrestling, it's called a heel turn. <laughs> when she turned heel, was she always corrupt? Maybe. I mean, I'm not arguing that there aren't people that are just corrupt, evil individuals and they enter professions already corrupt and evil. That's very possible as well. But it's possible corruption. It can be a slow burn process that happens in any in any field or profession as well. So if this is all a show, Peggy, uh, Peggy could have... This whole thing could have been a set-up show to make it look like they're trying to get rid of corruption when they're not. And, of course, she would want to have this kind of controlled opposition with people that she could control in charge of this anti-corruption panel and all of these things. So what's interesting is that there does seem to possibly be a judge here, Judge Adelman, who allowed the Armstrong civil suit to move forward and said that the district attorney and crime analyst did not have immunity. He was also the judge in Stephen Avery's civil suit who said that Tom Kucerich didn't have immunity. So again, the people alleging every single individual is corrupt, it doesn't seem to be. There might be a couple of non-corrupt individuals, but again, with the, with the majority, if, if, if the system is just rigged in a particular way where the critical individuals are not letting the truth come to light, it wouldn't really matter if there was one or a few people not in on it. A response here to all of this, what I get out of this is the Wisconsin Crime Lab has no ethics, no standards or cares about the letter of the law. Dirty, rotten scoundrels puts it mildly. Even the federal judges do not care about truth or justice. It sounded like the lab probably have destroyed Avery's evidence or whatever they called it will be changed or missing. So another response here. Let me guess, made no money, knew the, scar the cards were already stacked against Avery, and a great peril befell them as Tom Fallon subjected? Come on. That is an open public threat by third in command of the state attorney general. The point is, Strang and Fallon are on first name basis, as well are Buting and Lautenschlager. As well, no peril befell them, and Supreme Court Justice Ann Walsh Bradley's kids are partnered in Dean's firm, Strang and Bradley LLC. For great peril that never came, but Strang partnered with Bradley's shows that Fallon's statement in court was an act. I mean, an ounce of iota not of the peril. Is everyone blind? Buting and Strang knew Fallon was the lead power on the case, not Kratz. Fallon had more pull than Judge Willis. But do Strang and Buting mention that this at all now to the public? Open your eyes. The state capitol conducted the conviction, not the judge and DA from small counties. Now, again, referencing the, bill, the potential billion dollars or more on the hook from wrongful convictions, they had, to, they had to shut this case down. So again, would they allow attorneys? Now, if this is true, I'm not saying it's true. If this whole conspiracy theory about the them taking a hit to the budget, I mean, obviously they would take a hit to the budget, but the conspiracy theory is what would they do to prevent that if that had happened? Would they allow non-controlled attorneys to represent Stephen Avery? Another post here by X Avery Files CSK Theory. The point is the citations of Avery in the case of Armstrong cited by Buting the point, Buting was recommended by Glenn and Kelly. They were told by Lautenschlager to recommend Buting. The point, Avery never once picked them on his own accord. Conflict of interest is raised in the merit Buting and Glenn were helping Attorney General Lautenschlager propose to the Doyle administration to the provisions she wanted. Buting is in co continuous contact with both Gahn and Lautenschlager involving the citing of Avery, which the majority of those citings were in the best interest of three bills that benefited the state. 
To be morally fair, he was already working on Assembly and Senate bills alongside the Attorney General for the Doyle administration, and those bills were pending. It is severe conflict to work both sides of the field on Avery's behalf and the state's, which can only conclude Buting had more time invested in political vestiges that were helping to make sure people like Avery wouldn't get awarded millions. He helped to draft the bill that concluded X amount of money in the event the release do does not sue. Buting was seated to help save the Department of Justice millions in the long run regarding people wanting cases opened in 74 counties. Further claims here, the family confirmed that they learned Lautenschlager and Buting were friends in 2011, and they were pissed. I'm assuming he's talking about the Avery family here. More points here. Lautenschlager was not his adversary. She happened to be handling the appeal. They had been in cahoots since Buting helped to fund Janet Reno. Regardless, both were involved with Avery, severe conflicts of interest. You have the two popping up with direct affiliation regarding Avery prior to the case. In defense of Buting, why isn't Buting screaming at his tours to have Fallon investigated? If you think Kratz led that, think again. Lautenschlager had her puppets. Fallon handled the majority of pretrial motions, paved the way for Kratz. Buting was there for it all. Why didn't he tell us that Fallon was the man, not Kratz? Why? Because Fallon is his friend, Lautenschlager's assistant. And on your note of the Armstrong case, Lautenschlager never disputed the first oral comment as opposing. She threw Buting a bone in this case. So you can come to the Buting all you want, but the truth, he and Lautenschlager are great friends behind the curtain, as are Dean and Fallon who are on a first name basis. Strang and Buting are contributing to Wisconsin Innocence Project and Greasebox salary. Don't get it twisted because you are closed minded. 98% of attorneys nationwide are playing for the state. Latin for lawyer. Don't be a sheeple. I have 2,000 plus screenshots from attorney magazines in Wisconsin. Best thing about attorneys is they leave a trail. So you might want to see how evidence of their peril as Thomas J. Fallon subjected and promised because I see not the first iota. In fact, Strang has a Supreme Court Justice Abney Wallace Bradley in his pocket who her kids are partnered with Strang. Who is Fallon's great friend and Lautenschlager's? Buting wasn't just an ordinary lawyer. Buting was board of directors of criminal law section who meets periodically with state capital. Buting was helping to draft the provisions of the Avery bill, plus two separate bills, a Senate and an assembly regarding wrong, wrongful convictions, but not on the prisoner's behalf. But the, attorney, but the state attorney general's behalf to save money for the Department of Justice in the event of another release. Buting never wrote up the state crime lab on 2008 on behalf of Avery. Furthermore, Buting knew about the contamination in 2005 but didn't report it because of Lattenschlager, his alliance, was still superior. But only when Van Hollen became the attorney general and finally adopted the caseloads in 2008 from his 2007 entry to being seated as attorney general did Buting file complaints. Mind you, Van Hollen just bashed Lautenschlager in a public spill only days before Buting filed. You don't want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, politics, Mr. Closed-Minded. I will spin circles around you like a ballerina. <laughs> Glad you bought the biggest sellout defense shenanigans in America. The shoddiest defense ever performing not for the jury. Read the transcripts, lay it all on the table. Nothing could have hurt Avery at that point, good or bad. But the strong points your beloved Buting kept from the jury. And that is truth. Where is the peril? It never befell them at all. Lautenschlager appeared right beside Strang on an April 12th, 2016 panel. It looks like great peril befell them question mark come on get it together they are using media to brainwash you as the state the state to consider avery guilty before he was guilty believe nothing of what you see in the media especially when lawyers that lost a case 
spewing forward to sell out when Avery is no longer their client, and to this smug beauting you defend. Media on their behalf has served its purpose. Pull back, pull the wool back, man. <laughs> okay, interesting. So, if this is all true, again, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. This is mind shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. But there are certainly dubious connections with both Strang and Beauty. Now, not to throw these guys under the bus, but perhaps, since they're knowing the level of, co of uh, corruption they're dealing with, did they think the state was going to kill Stephen Avery? And they basically threw the case in order to spare Avery's life in the hope that this would all be uncovered later on and he would be set free, as opposed to he'd be killed if they tried to defend him properly. Here's an article from the Daily Star. Making a murderer lawyer feared Stephen Avery would be killed in framed suicide. The lawyer who represented Stephen Avery feared he was going to be killed in framed suicide moments after he was convicted for the murder of Teresa Hallback by David Rivers, March 18, 2019. Jerry Buting told Daily Star Online he suspected Avery could have been killed by police because it was, quote, easiest way to get rid of him, end quote. Avery had earlier been wrongfully convicted of rape and attempted murder in, 85, in 1985 before he was released in 2003 after DNA proved his innocence. The Making a Murderer star then pursued a lawsuit that could have earned him millions, but was then convicted of the Hallback murder in 2007. How coincidental. Mr. Buting and co-counsel Dean Strang argued to jurors that Manitowoc County Police framed Avery, as detailed by the Netflix hit. And believing police feared another fight back, Mr. Buting moved to make any potential death look suspicious. Mr. Buting told Daily Star Online, quote, as soon as the verdict came in, they whisked him away out through the little side door that leads to the jail. We had to wait along with his family while the sheriffs escorted the Hallback family out. In the short length of time that it took us to get down to the jail to go and talk to our client, they had already whisked him away in a waiting police car to Manitowoc now that he was convicted. I was frankly paranoid he was going to suddenly end up having killed himself in their theory, that they could have done something and made it look like a suicide. Easiest way to get rid of him, they knew he didn't give up the last time. So I made a public statement at those press conferences we had every single day. I let the media know what happened, and I said they're responsible for him and that he was not in a despondent mood. He was disappointed, of course, but he was certainly not going to kill himself. So if anything happened to him in jail, it kind of put them on notice that it would look very suspicious if something happened to him now. Mr. Buting added, it was very peculiar that they were ready to whisk him away so quickly. He continued, there was no urgency, no rush, no need to take him that day. He had been sitting in jail in a neighboring county for months. I really began to think there was something really nefarious going on here and that the only way I could try and short circuit that was to make a public statement that he was not suicidal and that he would appeal and fight this. And now that they chose to take him so quickly into their custody, the public is watching them and they should be aware that if anything happens to him, they are going to be held responsible. Manitowoc County Police deny framing Avery for the murder. <laughs> As if they would admit to it, even if it were true. <laughs> Retired detective Andrew Colburn sued Netflix and the makers of Making a Murderer for defamation in a case filed last year. He alleged the series insinuated that he planted evidence to frame Avery. Avery, who denies the murder, became arguably the world's most famous prisoner thanks to Making a Murderer. Mr. Buting and Mr. Strang became stars of season one, as the case riled up many viewers around the globe who felt Avery was innocent. Avery's nephew, Brendan Dassey, was also convicted for the Hallback murder. Since then, Avery has been represented by lawyer Kathleen Zellner, whose efforts to appeal the decision were detailed in Making a Murderer Season 2. He has since been granted a right to appeal, which will be held in a circuit court where it will be decided if he should be granted retrial, according to Zellner. 
And as the world awaits the outcome, Mr. Buting has relived the moments after his conviction for the Hallback murder. Mr. Buting, who wrote Illusion of Justice, Inside Making a Murder and America's Broken System, told us, Well, I was hugely disappointed. I thought particularly as they had been out so long, four days, that it would have been a hung jury, if not an acquittal. It was long enough even back then. I knew there were cases where you would think there's no way a jury is going to find somebody guilty and that they came back guilty and the opposite. It's like cases there will be five minutes guilty and they come back not guilty. So juries are unpredictable that way. But, you know, it was sort of surreal. You stand there and it's the worst part of any case when you're waiting for the jury verdict to come back. It's nerve-wracking. You've done everything you can, so now you're just waiting. Daily Star Online has approached Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office for comment. <laughs> All right. So what can we take away from this? Are, is Strang, are Strang and Buting both compromised? One of them's compromised. And did Buting not trust the deal he made because he knows the corrupt people that he's dealing with? So even if they made the deal that... Strang and Buting could only touch on certain aspects of the case that were approved and they weren't allowed to really defend properly and they could only point to corruptions in certain ways, in certain fashion to give the appearance of a legitimate trial. I mean, obviously it doesn't look that legitimate, but it could have been, I guess, if they weren't even allowed, I mean, they could have, they could have possibly hand, handcuffed Strang and Buting even further by not even allowing what they did allow but again if they're putting up a sham a charade they need guys to go along with it so it was part of the deal that they wouldn't kill avery and make it look like a suicide and was buting not convinced that they would hold up their end of the bargain that he went out of the way to make these comments just to make sure they held up their end of the bargain and are strang and buting really the good guys and they knew they couldn't win this one so they just did what they could to keep him alive in the hopes that he would get a legitimate trial later on, for example, with someone like Kathleen Zellner coming in. I mean, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered here. And there's been some Twitter discussion in the past of Manitowoc County specifically suiciding people that uh, wanted to talk. I mean, there's famously, there was the case of one individual who accused law enforcement of Kelly of Ricky Hostetler and the cover up of the of his death which we haven't gone into that in depth perhaps I'll do a dedicated episode apparently law enforcement is responsible for his death and the cover up in addition to all these other deaths and cover ups throughout the decades and this particular individual is supposedly commit suicide but it's it's I don't know if that was ever even investigated. This guy it mentioned fearing reprisal. So that begs the question to how many times have they suicided people? And the one thing that I've mentioned throughout this podcast series is Stephen Avery definitely knows something about how law enforcement operates. Is the reason why he doesn't really spill the beans? And he's made a few little references and phone calls and things like that, but he never explicitly states what the real truth is. Is he fearing for p possibly his parents' safety or his own, which is why there are certain things that he won't say and he wants to only focus on his own innocence in terms of uh, Teresa Hallback? I mean, there's a lot of questions here. How much do, do Buting and Strang really know? How much do they really know? And how much did they know was futile or would result in the death of not only their client, but possibly other individuals? If they really are good guys, what choice do they have depending on the, the severity of the consequences for blowing the whistle on some of these nefarious individuals? And those are the questions that really need to be asked because on the surface, it seems crazy that Buting and Strang... To, to claim that they did a great job. I mean, this is clearly ineffective counsel because th there's no real evidence against Avery. But they played the game. Is it possible because there were threats made? Is it possible that they were bribed or coerced, whatever, but they knew they had no choice anyway, so they might as well have taken these bribes? 
Again, it's very difficult to put yourself in these positions. Anybody can easily say they would have done this or that or been noble and honorable. But life is kind of complicated, and if there are death threats being thrown around with evidence that they would be executed, these threats would be executed. I mean, what choice would these individuals have, particularly if they understand how far the corruption ladder all of this goes? So plenty more to ponder, plenty more to discuss. We'll be looking at Redont in the next episode, and there, there's just so much more to go over. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the Mind Shock podcast in the Stephen Avery series. If you enjoy the podcast, you can, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Like and share this podcast and keep awareness up in this wrongful conviction as well as others. Share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority case topic, logical analysis, co-podcaster requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind. Leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mindshock True Crime. You are listening to the Stephen Allen Avery series of Making a Murder Fame. This is episode 37, re-examining Redont. Redont. And we will look at the issues surrounding Joshua Redont and the Redont Quarry. And this is one of the least discussed aspects of the case. And I believe there was always some funny business regarding Redont. And we are going to attempt to get to the bottom of that in typical mind shock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront instead of faith and fallacy. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure you allow your device to have those notifications come through. Or you could just go to youtube.com slash mindshock. Like and share this podcast. Keep the awareness up in this wrongful conviction as well as other wrongful convictions and unsolved cases. Like, share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get a priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. All right. So let's take a step back and attempt to dissect the Redont narrative. So here's an interesting post from the highly controlled Making a Murderer subreddit. But there is some interesting information that slips through the cracks of the sham moderators on that sub. Here is one such post by a Conan Doyle. A Conan Doyle, five years ago. Only one person was at the quarry, at the hunting cabins late Halloween night, at the crusher the time of the discovery of the RAV4. Redont Joshua. What the hell is Joshua doing going to a hunting cabin late at night Halloween the day Teresa disappears, witness to a bonfire, WTH, from what vantage point, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, period. Bones, mud, and damage on the RAV4 all point to this being a critical component of Teresa's disappearance. Without a doubt, the most suspicious behavior yet. Access to the Avery salvage lot on site Saturday when the RAV4 was found. For me, this report is the smoking gun. The fix was on. Avery was framed and Redont is very likely in some way complicit. And it seems he also owns the quarry where the burn site with the bones was found. According to Brandon Dassey, he is also clearing brush to burn in addition 
he already puts himself on site Halloween the day Teresa went missing, where the bones were found, on his property and is clearing brush to make a fire, shows up at the car crusher when the RAV4 is found. That is a stunning degree of coincidence. And of course, Manitowoc is coincidence county. Here is the location of the burn pit where the pelvis bones were found in the Redon Quarry. Joshua Redont was also on Avery's witness list right next to Zipper. And then, of course, uh, the, there's also the Manitowoc County property there as well. So we have city property, we have Redont's property, and then we have the Avery Salvage Yard. The defendant's witness list. Also curious, a lot of familiar names here. And what's curious here is Scott Blodorn on the witness list, and it says, yes, misdemeanor obstructing or resisting officer on his criminal record, which is curious. A lot of the Averys also have misdemeanors on their record. Bradley C. Check also on this list. We'll be getting into him later episodes. And Joshua Redont and George B. Zipperer, no criminal records listed here in this particular court document, the defendant's witness lists. Some comments here. Redont filed for Chapter 11 in 2014. Josh is a great-grandson of the founder, Fred. His sons took over the business. At least two have since passed. Josh's parents are likely in their 60s. Here is info about Josh's new company that Abiding My Time posted. Josh Redont was the president of Fred Redont & Sons, which filed for bankruptcy in 2014. I believe they have formed a new company, Badgerland Aggregates, LLC. In June 2015, Josh Redont and Bill Vachon represented Badgerland Aggregates at a Town of Gibson meeting, during which they requested conditional use permit and variance to expand non-metallic mining operation on the 34-acre parcel between Jambo Creek Road and Cherney Road. Also, we have, we have a map here on who owns the land around the Averys, and it is just about all Badgerlands aggregate other than Manitowoc County. Very, very curious. And again, land disputes have been brought up in the past, as well as competing salvage yards owned by police. Another comment here, the motive for framing Stephen Avery might be the mineral mining opportunities on Avery property. According to that thread, the quarry pit near the Averys is now owned by Badgerland Aggregate and Manitowoc County. And then of course, I discussed this in previous episodes as well. There might not have been one single motive because the Averys will not, were not well liked going back decades. So it could be a number of factors from various elections in the past, police chiefs, etc., uh, family feuds, and then also land disputes. Were they refusing to sell? Etc., etc. Other comments here. Redont is who appears to be the first person to mention the bonfire at the Avery's on Halloween. Statement was either made on November 7th or November 8th, and he described the fire as, quote, larger than usual, end quote. And a couple of other posts here. I don't see an interview with him, just those remarks. I'm sure he becomes a suspect to many in all this with that hunting cabin. I have mentioned before that there is a conveyor road that goes from the gravel pit right onto the Avery's property. I'd be interested in understanding the relationship between people from the junkyard and Joshua. We know that they set their gun sights in the gravel pit, so maybe they were friendly. Does Joshua have a hunting relationship with Scott, Bobby, etc.? However, on the other side of the coin, it's a mention of a bonfire on the Avery property on Halloween. Something a lot of people are convinced was something Avery confirmed to and others were coerced to accept. And I already addressed that before. If they have intermittent bonfires all the time, is it possible Avery might have not remembered the exact date of the bonfire? Because he said there was one? Or was he confused because there was supposed to be one and then it was canceled according to many individuals? 
Another post here, if I was going to implicate someone for something that I did, I would gladly make comments of how unusually large a fire was that night. Was that was the remarks in response to a question or did he just offer it up? Okay. If he's seen multiple fires over time and one was larger, that's called an observation, doesn't necessarily have to be about implicating someone. Larger than usual implies that there have been other fires. We don't have any indication of how that became known based on the document in terms of he, if he was questioned or not. I'm all for knowing more about Redon because I remember others have mentioned that the Avery land was likely of interest to the owners of the gravel pits that bordered the junkyard. I believe I read before that one of the Dassey boys had said that Redon had wanted them to burn off brush from the edge of the property, but I just find it hard to believe that he would be able to coordinate something like that with the arrival of Teresa Hallback. Definitely worth understanding the relationship between Redon and Steve. Maybe he was aware that Teresa Hallback would be showing up that day, or maybe he just made an observation about a fire that night in the Avery property, and also so if you haven't checked out The Legend of the Bonfire, we went over that on previous Mindshock episodes. There was no bonfire according to anybody other than Radon. And then The Legend of the Bonfire grew after Corruptowoc established that the fix was in and they wanted it to be Avery's burn pit. So they had to manufacture the narrative. And if you go across the timeline like we did... In the Legend of the Bonfire episode, we go through how everyone mentioned there was no bonfire. After many coercions, all of a sudden, there was a bonfire, and then the legend grew with time. With each subsequent interview, the same individual started describing the fire larger and larger. Ten-foot flames, higher than the garage, when initially there, they, they reported zero bonfire. So, very curious. Another post here, this entire time I've been trying to make a connection with this case and the Redons. I believe this is it. I have mapped out throughout the years all of their land acquisition. Literally, the Avery property is the last holdout. The Averys are surrounded by the Redon quarry. They started off rather small and just grew and grew. Through my mapping, I could see the progression. It also seems as if the Averys at one point had some cars parked on the Redon's property at one point, and I am sure that did not bode well with them. When you look at the geographical maps of the Avery property, they are sitting on prime quarry land. I am so happy right now as the hours upon hours I spent mapping this lead might just pay off. I will upload what I have when I get off work. Okay, so yeah, that is curious. If the Averys are the last holdout, that is curious. That cannot be ignored. Another post here, wow indeed, Radon was a really big name back in the day in that city. I have mentioned earlier that the Redons and police did have pleasant agreements between them regarding allowing police to randomly patrol their many gravel pits in order to keep kids from having too much fun. Now you have a Redont in all the same places at all the right times. Interesting. Also, people are also connecting dots to Sergeant Jost, who's, uh apparent discoveries at the Avery burn pit were quite suspect. I went over them in previous episodes. Apparently, Mike Hallback married Stephanie Jost sometime after the trial, maybe a year or two. Somewhere in this thread, they mentioned that Mike Hallback was dating Stephanie Jost in 2005, Sergeant Jost's sister. Rumored but not confirmed. But that is curious as well. I mean, the amount of coincidences in this case is just astronomical. And apparently there was also another Jost who was one of the officers who was supposed to be watching Gregory Allen, Patty Bjornsson's attacker, when they just basically called the officers off. So uh, Allen committed the attack, and that was the 85 frame-up of Avery. And apparently there might have been a Jost related to the Jost involved in the Hallback case. Another post here. Perhaps a midnight drive at the quarry would explain the marks on the RAV4. Nine days ago, I found gates at the Northwest Sand Quarry. Gates are also found at the Redonk Quarry. Something has bothered me about Teresa's RAV4, those damn marks. You know what I'm talking about and the broken glass. What happened? My theory is that a vehicle carried over and passed a beam of any kind, possibly one resembling a U or an H, and was in one way or another mounted in the ground. 
The red dots show the impact with a beam when the car turning to the left, or is it that the beam moves in the opposite direction? This is simply speculation. I thought of some sort of gate or roadblock that one with stress or misfortune could result in metal or plastic damage in a car. Suddenly, I found a gate that looks interesting. I took a screenshot, changed the scale to the equivalent of Teresa's RAV4 damage. And this is all very, very curious. That is very, very interesting. There is possibly a small amount of red paint in the bottom fracture point. That gate could have been pushed open and swung back during entry. It would have been easy to miss turning onto the property and has the right amount of weight and momentum to cause the minor and localized damage. I have been looking as well for the impact object. I went through deer, zippers, towing, golf, cart, Avery's Grand Am. This is the most convincing possibility so far. So let's examine another issue here. What happened first on the 5th? Brutus getting excited around the Dassey barrels or them going back to Redont who says he saw barrel size flames. This was a post on TikTok Manitowoc, a legitimate subreddit. Looked into this in the past but couldn't quite tell. Both happened around 5 p.m. as I recall. A deputy and possibly an unnamed DCI went. They'd been out there to the deer camp already earlier in the day and then searched around the quarry areas around there. I think this was posted by Not New, Not You two years ago. Some posts here. I say Redont for some reason or another. I just can't find his testimony to be credible. It's highly questionable at best. Responses here. I was thinking his recollection might be less independent if his questioners had already been told about the barrel alerts. If he was first, did they then direct the dog handler to the barrels right after, or just coincidence? Unspeakable Kind posted this. Definitely no coincidence, especially in this case that's full of to the brim of speculated coincidences. I don't believe in mere coincidence. Too much supporting evidence suggests that something's amiss here with MCSO and CASO. Actually, the entire investigation. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised that police coerced Redond. They definitely framed Avery for somebody else's murder, that's for sure. And why not give Joshua Redond a brain fingerprint scan as well if he's got nothing to hide? Then there's confusion around him saying barrel and always thought barrel, but in the same interview drawing an X near Stephen's pit and using Stephen's property as the reference point on or near to, though later he just says in the direction of Avery Salvage Yard. Right, I agree, it's definitely suspicious. It makes you wonder if he actually did see anything at all. I believe he was told to say that, but he didn't want to come out and fully tell a lie. So he just said in the direction of Avery. This way, he's not ta taking responsibility of telling a complete lie. Obviously, he changed his story. Other posters chimed in here. I don't think there's any way to pinpoint when they actually interviewed Redont that afternoon. When he mentioned seeing a fire, they asked him to go over to the crime scene mobile unit to give a written statement, which he did around 4.30 to 5 p.m. per the sign-in logs. No way to know if he waited a couple hours or went straight over there after his interview. How does that fit with the summary report? Summary report says at approximately 5 p.m., investigator Steer of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department had spoken with Joshua R. Redont at a deer camp off Cuss Road on the edge of Redont Gravel Pit, Redont stated on Monday. Huh. I can't pull up the sign-in document at the moment, but if I remember correctly, he signed in closer to 4.30, gave his statement, and signed out at around 5. So the approximation of when they spoke to him at the deer camp seems to be a bit off, as a lot of things in their reports are. Nothing to see here. This is all an up-and-up investigation, according to the Gilders. <laughs> the Handler narrative report is hopeless on times. Got there at half three, but then just leaves the reader to guess how long it would take Brutus, etc., to run around the cars and some quarry and back to the command post, and then out to Stephen Avery's trailer, then the Dassey barrels. Or, if go on reverse from wherever they logged out, how long it would take to search a bunch of other cars and machineries and pack up.
I can't recall if Kramer gives any more specific times in her testimony other than talking about the impending gloom at some point. I know she didn't bring her full report or dog training performance statistics, just anecdotes and sweeping case performance claims. I mean, because who needs specifics, right? It's not like they're trying to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, are they? Wow. Okay. So is this all coincidental? Is this all accidental? Being wishy-washy with all of these times, I mean, that makes it so that nothing can be nailed down, which is a pretty good thing for those framing Avery because all of this is really hard to prove. Now, obviously, if they followed the law and we were going for beyond a reasonable doubt, he would have never been convicted, but clearly that's not what happened. But untangling this mess is also problematic when they're, when nailing down all these specifics is so difficult due to all these shoddy reports. Okay, another post here from TikTok Manitowoc by failed expert three years ago. Did Redont know where Stephen Avery's burn pit was located? Confused about what he really thought and what police would have thought. I read somewhere he probably knew where Stephen Avery's burn pit was because Stephen somewhere mentioned he'd previously burned some brush for him. But I'm not sure if either have been actually asked that. In Redont's drawing shown in Making Murder 2... From 2005, not the 2017 re-interview where he marked his viewing spot on Deering's aerial view. The spot he's marked is by Avery's pit a bit to the west. He called that his best guesstimate. His lawyer added it was just a guess. He apparently only briefly looked while driving from 300 to 400 yards away, Deering reports. Where was he looking from? Was the line of sight to there also in line with the barrel out in front north? But view not blocked by the garage. Yet, he's also said he assumed it was a barrel fire due to seeming, seemingly confined. And he always, I think, said it could have been somewhere near Stephen Avery's property or on it. He subsequently just said that all he can say it was in the direction of Avery property presumably including Stephen Avery's property and Barb's property, and who knows what else, the Avery salvage yard, other relatives. So, yes, the specifics are really hard to come by in this case, are they not? So, a poster here said, this is what his handwriting statement, his handwritten statement says, on October 31st at approximately 4.30 p.m., I drove up to my deer camp off of Cuss Road through my gravel pit and observed a fire going on in the proximity of Stephen Avery's home or on Avery property. The fire appeared to be contained to a 55-gallon drum. So there is actually no mention of the burn pit in his handwritten statement here. He's saying it's a barrel fire. I mean, none of these can, none of these legend of the bonfire stories can be kept straight. So this is Exhibit 84. Okay. Exhibit 84, this is the statement of Redont. Steer's report on the interview has the same vagueness about where it was located, but then gives a contradictory location version on the Stephen Avery property located by the Red House. So it's curious how uh, there's just so much inconsistency here. There's no mention of Redont drawing this little diagram of the Stephen Avery and Janda buildings as shown in Making a Murderer, episode 4, 49 minutes in. It doesn't seem to have a mark for where he was viewing from. Here's the conversation where Zellner points to the buildings. So when you draw this map, yep, so that's the area where you're seeing the flame. That was my guesstimation. Yes. Okay, so it's behind. Like, that's Avery's trailer. He's got the garage, and then his sister's place is right there, so it's behind. Redon's attorney interrupts, just so you understand, he's guessing he doesn't see any barrel, he doesn't see any pit. He's guessing from his knowledge of where their buildings were, you know. Roughly, this was his best guesstim guesstimate at the time. And there's also the 2017 affidavit of Redon. And he has here, on November 5th, 2005, I was with several friends at the hunting camp. Law enforcement officers arrived at the hunting camp and asked us if we had seen or heard anything unusual about the Avery property recently. 
To the best of my knowledge, these officers were from either Calumet County Sheriff's Department or the Wisconsin Department of Justice. By this time, there was already news media coverage of Teresa Halbach's disappearance that included coverage of the Avery property. I told the officers that I saw fire orange in color when I was driving from the Redont Sand and Gravel Pit to the hunting camp on October 31st, 2005 at approximately 5 p.m. Man, this time just keeps changing. And sunset, I believe, was 4.40 p.m.-ish. So in one account, he says 4.30, another account, he says 5. I told the officers that I saw the fire from the direction of the Avery property because it was dark or getting dark when I saw the fire. I was not sure where exactly the fire was located. I did not observe any smoke coming from the fire. So a fire with no smoke. Interesting. So this is the kind of magical fire that can just incinerate bones. <laughs> Very curious. The fire did not appear to be spread out, and its flames appeared to be 2.5 to 3 feet in height. Wow, that's a far cry from higher than the garage and 10 feet high. Curious. Curious. These characteristics were consistent with my personal knowledge of burn barrel fires. Because I observed these characteristics, I assumed the fire was contained in a burn barrel. I did not see whether the fire was actually contained in a burn barrel. After I told them this information, the officers asked me to follow them by automobile over public highways to the business area of Avery's Auto Salvage, where law enforcement had a command post. There, I made a written statement at approximately 5.30 p.m. Less than one week after I provided that written statement, two officers who I believe were from the Wisconsin Department of Justice met me at the hunting camp to discuss the fire I saw. I remember them asking me if I was sure that I saw what I said I saw. It seemed to me that they weren't satisfied with my statement about the fire. Specifically, it seemed to me that they wanted me to change my story to include a larger fire. Because they were reluctant to accept my story as true, I eventually asked them what they wanted me to say. They told me that all they wanted was the truth. I advised them that I had been telling the truth. At that time, I was told by the Department of Justice agents that they believed Teresa Hallback's vehicle was driven to the Cuss Road cul-de-sac by driving west through an empty field, then south down the gravel road past the hunting camp until reaching an intersection with a gravel road that ran northeast into the Avery property. They told me that they believed Teresa Hallback's vehicle turned northeast onto that gravel road and entered the Avery property at the southwest corner. It is my understanding that this theory was based on the work of scent tracking dogs. I also read and or heard from others that law enforcement stated they believed Teresa Hallback's vehicle was stored somewhere on the Redont Sand and Gravel Pit property before it was moved to the southeast corner of the Avery property. Does that make sense? So if you were Avery, Teresa's on your property, let's say she doesn't leave, you harm Teresa, then you go b drive the vehicle to Redont's, then you bring it back <laughs> to implicate yourself? Again, the state's case doesn't make any sense, but if Stephen Avery has multiple personalities, one of which... Is trying to is trying to make sure he gets caught for this. I mean, and some of them are in, innocent, some of them are psychic. I mean, he's got so many personalities in order to make this work, according to the way the state said. It just doesn't make any sense. And they're telling this to Redont as well. I mean, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. Then again, I guess nobody suspected that this would be under this much scrutiny all these years later. Later that week, I received a call from law enforcement on my cell phone while at work. I may have been working at one of two gravel pits or a quarry owned and operated by Fred Redon Sons. Incorporated law enforcement asked me to unlock my three hunting trailers so they could be searched. I left work and drove to the hunting camp. When I arrived, there was nobody present. I unlocked my trailers and left. It is my understanding that my trailers were then searched by scent tracking dogs as well as law enforcement personnel. Later that day, law enforcement called my cell phone again. They informed me that they completed the search of my trailers and that I could use them normally. During the course of this phone conversation, law enforcement informed me that they were going to collect the contents of the burn barrel at the hunting camp at a later time. When I returned to the hunting camp, I observed that they had cordoned off the area surrounding that burn barrel with yellow tape. To the best of my knowledge, Wisconsin State Patrol assigned officers to watch the barrel day and night on a rotating basis until its contents were collected. I was not present when the contents of that burn barrel were collected. A few days after November 5th, 2005, I remember seeing tower lights in Manitoba County sand and gravel pit to the south of Redon's property. 
I remember the lights appeared to illuminate the entire Manitoba County pit. I understand that there were suspected human pelvic bones recovered from a gravel pit property south of Avery's Auto Salvage. Upon reviewing a map showing the coordinates at which these bones were found, I believe they were found in the Manitoba County sand and gravel pit. Prior to November 5th, 2005, the only permanent security measures in place to prevent access to the redundant sand and gravel pit by trespassers were private property signs posted at all entrances. There were locking gates or cables at each access road, but they were rarely used. Approximately one or two months before the start of Mr. Avery's criminal trial in 2007, I was summoned to the courthouse. At the courthouse, I was questioned again about my recollection of seeing a fire in the direction of the Avery property on October 31st, 2005. I was not called as a witness to testify at Mr. Avery's criminal trial in 2007. Okay, so that is the information from Radon. Quite curious, especially with the agents being displeased at, at how small the fire was or that it was a barrel fire instead of a pit fire because apparently no one reported any pit fire. So that, that whole pit fire narrative had to be manufactured in order to implicate Avery. It is curious, though, because Redont didn't have to offer that up, that they, that they were pressuring him to say that the fire was larger, but he did. Was that just his conscience trying to at least add some kind of something so that people later on could uncover the truth? I don't know. Very rarely in life are people just 100% pure evil that aren't involved in stuff. And if they are scared or whatever, they might leave little breadcrumbs so that real detectives doing honest investigation can discover the truth. And it's curious because Steer's report says that he says a large fire. Redont never said a large fire. So they're already intentionally misquoting him to manufacture this false narrative of a pit fire. Also, there was some uh, issues with how far away he was. So there were reports anywhere from a thousand feet away, but Dietering says he put down 300 to 400 feet away. So we really don't know. And we'll get into line of sight and whether or not a two, two and a half to three foot fire flame from a barrel could be seen from Redon's location. Another post here. It's so strange that he's basically allowed that it could be Stevens or Barb's barrels but marked the map where Stevens' pit is. So basically could have been any one of the three, assuming he was accurately recalling the day he briefly saw some flames over that way. <laughs> and they've ended up finding or identifying relevant burn things in each of those locations. I wonder why he says or on Avery property rather than saying in the proximity of Barb's home. Huh. Another post here, I'm not sure how he even saw flames if it was daylight. Smoke maybe, but fire is hard to see from a distance in bright sunlight, especially if in a barrel. No idea what he may have seen, maybe heat waves. Also hard to see from a distance, or maybe he just wanted to spread the suspicion around in that law enforcement asked if they could search his quarry. Also, Jandas and Dassies are never mentioned, you'll notice, in anything to do with this. Just Avery's. And that's curious, too, if it was an up-and-up -up investigation where they were just trying to find out the truth, wouldn't they examine all possibilities? And, of course, specifically said, no smoke. So that morning, they asked to search his place that afternoon, I guess. Do we know why exactly? I only vaguely recall something about how light it would have been when he said he saw this. Do you know? He gave an impressively, in a sense, specific time, didn't he? Five days prior, some, saying something had just happened with an employee or something, and it was after half an hour of interview that he's giving his handwritten statement and presumably did his drawing marking by Stephen Avery's burn pit. Enough time to have been influenced, which could have just been a general pressure to have seen something that evening to do with Stephen Avery, late, leading later to planting and confirmation bias because of what Radant said. Be good if the investigators had asked him to confirm he knew about the Janda Dassey household and barrels. I assume at least the former. 
Hmm. I wonder if it's possible to check if a DCI agent was there with Steer. They don't normally go by themselves, do they, or interview by themselves. Usually, if they omit the DCI's name, then it's Deb Strauss, LOL. <laughs> I know Department of Justice refused to release the documents, but could they refuse to even confirm who was present? Another post here, it was after they found the RAV which tells me they suspected it may have been driven through the quarry. I think they said sundown was about 5 p.m. on October 31st, which was the day on which daylight savings ended. And he said he saw the fire at about 4.30, so waning daylight wouldn't just say, yes, he supposedly remembered the time because an employee hadn't shown up. Fassbender was on site by then, not sure about other DCI agents. Kratz and others from the DA's office came to that site the afternoon. They began the log on November 5th, 2005 at 2.25 p.m., and Fassbender and Hunsader are the first names on it. Kratz and others are shown in at 3.20 p.m., and oddly, Kay Peterson, MCSO, is shown on scene at 23.18. I thought he never came to the scene. He said he had no involvement in this case. Had they by this time made the announcement that the case would be handed over to Callum County? I can't find Gary Steer name on the November 5th logs. Some are not checked in by name, but only badge numbers. And about those logs, they are pathetic. Wouldn't you think any adult, especially law enforcement, would know how to keep a check-in and check-out log for Pete's sake? Steer 403 is shown in the next day, November 6th at 701. At least I assume that is the time, and the 403 is his badge number. And by the way, I can't find a 403 on the November 5th check-in log but it's possible he was there before they began even keeping the log. Oh yeah, he says they mentioned that driving theory to him. Weird. So Steer went to Redonce, but apparently not to Avery Salvage Yard that day. Wish there was an official FOIA request maker for TikTok Manitowoc. They seem to have written reports after the fact in many cases. It's possible Steer got this secondhand and never talked to Redont, but was told to write a report. And that's interesting as well, because then it's going to be hard to definitively track anything. Another post from five years ago on TikTok Manitowoc. This is going to be good. Redont's claim of seeing a fire on October 31st. Think about this. A girl is missing. Her car is found on Avery's property. Massive search underway. Now a neighbor comes to investigators and says, Oh, hey guys, I saw this huge fire at Avery's on Monday. Missing girl, car on property, lots of manpower looking for her. What would be the first thing you would do with this new information? Alert other investigators. I just talked to a neighbor. They saw a large fire here on the day she was here. Let's spread out and see if we can find anything burned. See why this is weird? No one bothered with a burn pit until three days later. Keep in mind that time is of the essence in this investigation. They have no idea if the car means she is there, dead or alive, captive, buried and running out of oxygen. Chop, chop, detectives. Instead, they sit on Redont's statement and don't even think about the burn pit until the 8th when Jost apparently stubs his toe on a bone. Just as there was no concerted effort to look for Teresa, there was no concerted effort to look for anything that had recently burned. TikTok, why is this important? Because the warrant they got didn't have an eight-day window on it. Once a cop gets a warrant, they have a reasonable amount of time allowed to search a property. Granted, Calumet and Manitowoc extended the reasonable amount by a great length, but they didn't even look for anything burnt until three expletive days after a local witness tells two of their investigators about a huge fire. So what would this tell us? And this was posted by Haas Gotta Eat on TikTok Manitowoc. Responses here. It tells us law enforcement knew she was dead before they even found her RAV4. It's also my belief that the family knew as well. Hell, even Pam of God and her daughter knew this because when they, quote, found, in quotations, her car, they didn't even look for Teresa Hallback. Question is, when did the family find out? Was it before she was even reported missing? A response by now Biff. Yes, I agree 100%. Here's why. First, show me one TV interview of a family member with a missing person slash loved one not giving up hope before a body is found. People just don't give up hope a day or two after they haven't been found. 
The human brain just doesn't work like that. Mike Hallback talking about starting the grieving process was a huge slip up. No one is talking about grieving before they have exhausted all avenues and effort in trying to find that person alive. Yes, eventually people will come to terms with it, but that is months later, years if there is no evidence suggesting foul play. Sometimes even decades people are still holding on to hope. The second reason is, especially with the level of irregularities in the case and conviction, a family member's instinct is to find out the truth, not to shut down and accept what is being told to you. This is more likely to happen further down the line, years after the events unfolded. I have seen this in other very similar cases where even the father of the missing, never found but presumed dead girl, is asking questions of the case, police procedures, and if the convicted person is in fact innocent. They know they can't get their loved one back, so the search for the truth is the only thing they have left. This is totally absent in this case. The family's lack of outspoken search for the truth to me speaks volume that they had confirmation of Teresa Hallback's death before any so-called evidence was found. A response here, in addition to Mike talking about the grieving process, in the interview on the 4th, Karen says the same thing, go back and watch it. Another response, exactly why the Hallback family went and got themselves a lawyer a few months ago. Another response, I can't imagine a lot of things in this case, but I just can't imagine the family going along with this. If they did, they are all complete and total expletives. I don't care what their reasoning is. Another response, it could be simply a case of initially not wanting something potentially embarrassing for the family to be revealed. Maybe they were told we could cover this up for you and get a criminal off the streets, then slowly things getting out of hand, but by that point it being late to do anything. Huh. That's actually curious, but maybe not even that. Maybe the cops had dirt on them and it was actual blackmail, extortion, something to that extent, where they had no choice but go along with it. Or maybe they said they had evidence of Teresa violating the law in many ways and they were going to release it if they didn't go along with it. So not only was she dead, but they were going to embarrass her and reveal her to be a criminal after the fact if the family didn't go along with the cover-up. I don't know, very dark either way. Other responses here, Mr. President, it tells us they were planning to burn a body, but it wasn't ready to be planted yet <laughs> regarding uh, the original post here, um, the waiting to search after being told of a fire. Another response here by one piece of gum left. A fire question mark? Yeah, okay, we'll get to that, but we have lots of abandoned cars to check first, probably about eight days worth. Great catch, Haas. The pit should have been searched immediately, since burning would be a perfect way to get rid of the body you were searching for, or supposed to be searching for. Another post here. We know they couldn't have searched the first day because they were busy not taking pictures and kicking people off scene like the coroner. <laughs> That's how they roll in Karaptawak. A couple more posts here, too, because supposedly they were afraid of the dog, Bear's dog, and they were too incompetent to call animal control. Another poster said this, I'm honestly surprised no one shot Stephen Avery's dog just out of vengeance. And that's a great point. Cops are known for killing dogs just for no reason at all, but here, they all hate Stephen Avery anyway. There was the botched frame-up job of 85. They don't even need an excuse to shoot the dog. Here, they actually had a built-in excuse. Time is of the essence. They reported, supposedly there's a report on the pit. Why wouldn't they just shoot the dog and examine the pit? All of a sudden, they're, they're going to care about animals or people? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. This was the perfect built-in excuse to, to hurt Avery even further by killing the dog. Another response, I'm not even convinced they needed animal control. A stick, dog tree, and a lead probably would have done the job. <laughs> Weird. Other posters were saying she wasn't dead the day she died, suggesting that she was known to be alive by law enforcement, so there was no urgency to find her. Huh. Another response, I think you've left... The obvious one out, she's dead, but by the time they thought about needing evidence, they had already cremated her. 
or someone panicked, tried to cover it up. The police then realized this would be a great opportunity to frame Stephen Avery. Honestly, the chance of her being alive are so minute, I don't buy it for a minute. Plus, if she was involved, why did they do such a horrible job planting evidence? Rip out a few of her hairs, draw her actual blood, or better yet, give her a small cut to her finger and smear it everywhere. Put her DNA and fingerprints in the house, car, trailer. Literally anything would be better than what they ended up with. <laughs> yeah, it was not a good, it was not a good frame-up job, to say the least. Then again, I mean, if the cops, if they're framing all these other people, if that's just their M.O. and this is how frame jobs go, it's exactly like serial killers. Eventually they get overconfident and sloppy. So if they didn't even think they needed to do a good frame-up job, why, why would they spend extra effort if they never thought anybody would go back and re-examine it just based on their history of frame-up jobs in Manitowoc? So, yeah, I mean, that's definitely curious. Another poster, Bobby Dassey was confused when Ken Kratz was trying to get him to agree that there were four burn barrels behind his family's house because Bobby knew they only had three. Where did the extra burn barrel come from? Maybe it came from the Redonk Quarry where the search dogs hit and tracked Teresa Hallback's scent. If you track down all the metal burning barrels, there are a total of six in evidence. This too, so Stephen Avery's a fire-starting maniac, someone who has four, five, six fires going at once. <laughs> Shouldn't the report say something like, a witness said they had seen more than one fire, with the possibility of another one or more, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, that's a good point, because Avery burns her in the pit, then he takes her to the quarry, then he brings it all back, and then sprinkles some in his sister, trying to frame up his sister. I mean, how many split personalities does Avery have in order to make all these fires and all these different burn barrels and the pit and go back and forth with the quarry sprinkling remains everywhere. I mean, it just does not make a lot of sense. A post by seven pairs of panties here. Even if Bear was so scary to officers, they could have still looked in the burn barrels because they weren't anywhere near the burn pit. <laughs> that's a good point. And that's where Joshua Redont said he saw a fire in. They didn't look in them for days or they kept looking in them for days until something finally showed up or came back from the crime lab. So they look in the barrel, there's nothing there. They look again the next day, and then eventually something shows up, and they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, it's here. <laughs> Another post here, which is quite hilarious. Nobody bothered with a burn pit until three days later. Excellent point, but not surprising, considering this investigation and whoever was making decisions. Special prosecutor, Ken Kratz? How special? is this special prosecutor. <laughs> Their excuse for not searching that burn pit area has always been bare. But that is ridiculous too. Call a dog handler, a vet, somebody put a muzzle on that dog, or remove him. Instead, they do nothing until Jost spies a bone on the ground and immediately thinks it looks human and also thought the area was suspicious. I've said it before, but his report reads like an excerpt from a badly written crime novel. <laughs> It and Pam Sturm's testimony are similar in that respect. I mean, this novel would, would be rejected by every single publisher because it just, it's so ridiculous and nonsensical. Mind-shocking, if you will, that anybody bought this BS. Couple more posts here. If you're furiously looking for evidence of a missing girl in and around the Savage Yard, call Animal Control and have the dog removed so you can actually do your investigation. What the hell is the matter with law enforcement officers from Manitoba County? Doesn't take a brain surgery. Haas Gotta Eat 2 responded, I'm an animal lover and would hate to ever suggest they kill an animal to investigate, but let's be realistic. How many stories do you read about officers invading a home and shooting the family dog, barking and threatening them? They didn't harm Bear because there was nothing there to investigate until the 8th. If anything, the police would have had animal control come in and snare Bear for removal from the property or tranked him. Being afraid of a dog, Jesus Christ, are they cops or third graders with a dog off its leash? Actually, yeah, the tranquilizer is, is a great option there as well. I mean, why kill the animal? But yeah, they just did nothing. <laughs> but we also saw that the area was, as I went over the burn pit in the previous podcasts, the, the scene looked completely different. So it looked like there was a bull. It, a lot of things got shifted around. So it looked like the burn pit was manipulated many times. So the bear excuse was obviously not legitimate in any way. Yep, just move the dog out of the area using equipment that's used every single day in animal control and rescue. Doesn't take a rocket science. Also, they had two trained dog handlers at their disposal that they just didn't use to remove the animals. That, that's funny as well. Another prost. Uh, who in the heck can believe that after Redont tells them it takes law enforcement 
days to in fact look into the Avery burn barrels. This nonsense is just unbelievable. Another, oh, Haas Gotta Eat also posted this. The thinking I have is that Redant's statement was put in Queso's report after they had established the burn pit held her remains. Ha, huh, that's curious. That's very possible with this bunch. Do you think he even said that, or did he agree to say what they wanted to hear with promises of protection like with Bobby Dassey? What's curious, too, is because if they said they found Teresa Hallback's remain on, on Redont's property, Redont, let's say Redont knew it wasn't true somehow, but the cops are saying that it was. What's he going to do? I mean, he's probably going to do whatever they say. I mean, he, it's just it's kind of crazy to think about it from that aspect as well. Another post on TikTok Manitowoc here by Magilla39, cooperating witness slash Brady violation, affidavit of Joshua Redont, Exhibit 85, from the post-conviction filing, relief filing. Zellner makes note of a new affidavit by Joshua Redont, page 136. The filing provides an excerpt from the affidavit, Exhibit 85, which is not yet available to us on the Kathleen Zellner law site. At that time... I was told by the Department of Justice agents that they believed Teresa Hallback's vehicle was driven to the Cuss Road cul-de-sac by driving west through an empty field, then south down the gravel road past my hunting camp until reaching an intersection with a gravel road that ran northeast into the Avery property. They told me that they believed Teresa Hallback's vehicle turned northeast onto that gravel road and entered the Avery property at its southwest corner. It is my understanding that this theory was based on the work of scent tracking dogs, affidavit of Joshua Redont. So the police told Joshua Redont that they believed the RAV4 had been on his property, but they never revealed this fact to the defense. We know that the dogs did react to the vicinity of the RAV4 and could piece together a lot of unreported activity at Redont's quarry, but this is big. The post-conviction scientific testing motion did pressure Joshua Redont into cooperating and exposed this huge Brady violation. Boom. Huh. In the post-conviction scientific testing motion, Zellner impeached his observation about the burn barrel fire and pointed out that he was allowed onto the crime scene multiple times while it was under police custody. Huh. That's curious as well, so the cops are just allowing anyone and everyone <laughs> onto the crime scene. I mean, I don't know, you can't make this stuff up. So in the filing as well, regarding Redont being told this, DOJ investigators never authored a report documenting their conversation with Mr. Redont about the RAV4 being driven from his property and planted on Avery's. Mr. Kratz did not call Mr. Redont as a witness at Avery's trial. The failure to produce this evidence to trial defense counsel was a clear Brady violation because this information could not only have been used to impeach the state's witness, it would also have provided exculpatory evidence for Mr. Avery that the RAV4 was planted on his property. Unless, of course, he's driving the RAV back and forth multiple times, like he is with sprinkling remains all over the place, including Manitoba County's <laughs> prop. I mean, it, you can't make this stuff up. This, this is just insane. Another post here, TikTok Manitowoc, by J.L. Whitaker, four years ago. Redont's fire sighting, 4.30 p.m. Remember that bomb fire? It sure wasn't at 4.30 p.m. I finally got around to trying to listen, rewatch, read Gassy's interviews and interrogations. I couldn't do it. There was more documentation of the investigators than Gassy's speech. They were telling themselves a story and waiting for grunts if they even waited at all. Brendan Dassey's interview slash interrogations. Redont was not a witness to anything but a trash fire in a burn barrel at Janda's, but he could have come across shenanigans at his deer camp even if he didn't do the deed himself. And he could have come across Teresa Hallback in Cuss Road taking photos, put some moves on her at the rear of the RAV4, she resists, he hits her in the head, puts her in the back of the RAV4, drives her to his deer camp around the corner, she comes to, tries to run away from him, boom. And you know what's crazy? That scenario, again, I'm not saying this is true in any way or implicating Redont in any way, but this actually makes infinitely more sense than anything the state came up with against Avery because if the remains are on Redont's, if the RAV4 was on Redont's and planted from Redont's to Avery's, and Redont is the one who initiates trying to see a fire somewhere in the direction of the Avery's to take suspicion away from himself. It makes more sense just on paper from a distance. Again, this is not beyond a reasonable doubt in any way, but just in general for anybody that's who's looked at true crime in any way, I mean, 
Yeah, he, he, he admits to being in the area where the remains are found, where the RAV4 is found. I mean, Joshua Redon is more of a suspect than Avery can be. I mean, it's just weird. Some responses here. Brendan's confession consisted of him saying, yeah, 199 times, nodding yes, 181 times, says, uh-huh, 101 times, saying, I don't know, 40 times, no twice, and shaking his head no 142 times. And I don't know how accurate that is, but it seems like it could be accurate. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Other uh, comments here, that's not acceptable as actual confessing in my book. I often say, yeah, yes, uh, uh-huh, etc., meaning I understand or I'm listening. Not that I agree with the speaker, don't you? And freely offering anything on his own zero times. <laughs> Which would indicate the police did most of the confessing. <laughs> couple more comments here by Missing Truth. Did I read somewhere that Joshua Redont had some brothers? If anyone knows anything, that would be great. I've always thought that Joshua Redont's fire statement was odd to say the least, especially after burnt bones are found. He makes the statement to law enforcement on the day Teresa Hallback's car is found. It's a very odd statement to make, being that trash burning in barrels would not be an uncommon occurrence. He fails to mention to law enforcement that apparently Stephen Avery was burning brush for him that he was clearing. I believe if I was law enforcement and someone had made the statement and burned bones were later found, that person would become highly suspicious to me. Even more so after evidence was found at the quarry, i.e. burned pelvic bone, loofs tracking, vehicle found so close to the court. The fact that these connections were so brushed aside reveals how focused some were on it had to be Stephen Avery. Of course, one law enforcement agency wanted to be Stephen Avery so bad they could taste it. And why? Why did he keep coming back to Avery Salvage Yard when it was closed off? Regarding Redon. I think Ryan Hilligus helped law enforcement because they convinced him Stephen Avery was guilty by telling him his past, and they needed his help to secure a conviction. I think Joshua Redon may have helped cover up a crime and may know what happened. Someone else responded here. He does have brothers. One of them had domestic filed on him twice in 2003, both dismissed, though. This brother is very close in age to Teresa Hallback. Strange things occurred at the camp. Stay tuned. Another post here. What's weird is it couldn't have been Stephen Avery's barrel because he was in the front of the house, not in the rear, where Redont said he saw the fire. He specifically says it was in a barrel. And nothing matches Brendan Dassey's stories. One could come up with a story that allows for the barrel and Stephen Avery's involvement. He gets one of the Janda barrels, puts it in his pit, puts the body in, burns it, then oddly jump, dumps out the cremains and puts them back in the barrel <laughs> and the barrel bag. I don't buy that, but it would have explained the two locations and Stephen Avery doing it. That's never been any story I've heard, though. <laughs> Another post here, adding upon the fact that Stephen Avery agreed to burn some brush for Joshua Redon, Brian said he saw some smoke but didn't think much of it, as he thought Stephen Avery was burning the brush for Joshua Redon. I assume he burned brush in his pit, so if Joshua Redon knew he was burning brush, why would he find it unusual in any way? Other people speculating here that Joshua Redon owed people a lot of money, Chapter 11, etc. Seven pairs of panties posted this. He owned quite a lot of money to people. Sounds like he owed it to people whose names we may recognize. Interesting. Some other observations here by Dillstar. I hadn't noticed this before, but Joshua Redon's verbiage in his written statement is kind of strange. At approximately 4.30 p.m., I drove up to my deer camp in quotations. Observed a fire going on in the proximity of Stephen Avery's home. The fire appeared to be contained to a 55-gallon drum. It just doesn't strike me as something a layperson would write, and it feels far more appropriate in the context of an official police report. Look how closely it matches the verbiage used in the interview report. Steer even uses the at approximately p.m. phrasing two other times in the report, and you'd also think Joshua Redont would be familiar enough with his own camp not to use air quotes on it. <laughs> He put his own deer camp in quotations. 
Or he probably would say up to my camp. Why would he even say up to my deer camp? Or maybe up to the deer camp? Either way, weird. Has anyone brought up that Steer might have written this for him or at least coached him through it? Maybe nothing, but it just struck me as an additional wrinkle to the funny business. The poster Open Mind for You posted this. In my opinion, problem with this approximately 430 burning barrel in the proximity of Stephen Avery's home, hence in proximity of Barb's home as well, is Barb and Scott Tadaisahura. Their testimonies don't match such evidence seeing. And Barb and Scott Tadaisahura supposedly have been around such proximity at the same approximately time, 5 p.m. So where was this huge fire seen from far away from the deer camp in which barrel and who saw it? Right, another lie, and Zellner has exposed this lie in her motion. And Scott Tadaisach, of course, a very curious individual. And we've looked at all of the issues with him in previous podcasts as well. The a post here by Mr. President, I suspect that evidence was planted at the quarry and then Joshua Redont was told that Stephen Avery had murdered Teresa Hallback at the quarry but was trying to frame Joshua Redont to convince Redont to cooperate with Manitoba County Sheriff's Office and report a big fire at Avery Salvage Yard that he couldn't have seen. And that's curious. Yeah, if they said that, that Stephen Avery was trying to frame him, but then why would Avery go back? So he would sprinkle the remains and then go back and put it in his... I mean, none of this makes any sense, of course, but who knows what Redont would have thought after the cops had scared him with that information. Honey Girl 71 posted this. There are so many red flags regarding Joshua Redont and the deer camp. I believe it has been said that it was a popular place for kids and such to hang out as well. So that still leaves the possibility that anyone could have been out there and been the culprit if they were familiar with the area. That's actually a really good point. We didn't talk about that. If they're like teenage kids or whatever, young age people, and they saw Hallback drive by, who knows what kind of element. If they were a bad element, they could have maybe tried to do something to her. Who knows? I can't overlook the bones found, the scent found, the removal of the trailer, the red gate that matches the paint in Teresa Hallback's bumper, and the fact that Stephen Avery was supposedly burning brush for Redon. I have speculated in the past that the bones may have been planted in the brush, and that is how some were found in the burn pile. Redont could have simply moved those ashes to different barrels when he visited the yard to confuse the situation since he knew that his brush would, was being burned at the time. Report seeing a fire in the burn barrels and voila, more bones are found and all eyes turn away from the brush being burned. Also, someone with excess trees and brush would have the materials needed to obscure the RAV4 just enough to make it look like an attempt to hide it had been done. We all know that attempt was staged since the RAV4 tire cover practically announced its presence. Huh. So how heavily is Redont involved? Because, I don't know, is, is that possible? That he mixed Hallback's remains or whoever, Carmen Bootwell's or whomever, I mean, there's so many, I mean, it's just such a cesspool here at this point. We don't know what's what because it's been obfuscated to such an extent. Is it possible that Avery was given possible evidence to burn himself and that's why it showed up? And then that's why Redont had to visit the Avery salvage yard so many times to ensure that the plant job was done correctly? I mean, I don't know. It would point if law enforcement were smart, they would have other people do their bidding like Hillegas and redone however you know the whole finding the key thing doesn't ma i mean there's just so much that else that doesn't add up it just it's such a sloppy job perhaps one or two officers were smart and they tried to get hillegas and redon to do most of the work but other officers weren't and they got overzealous and kratz doesn't seem like a mastermind genius to be able to juggle all this so he could he didn't really have a handle on it as he thought, and that's why it looks the way it does. Is that possible? A couple of more curiosities here. So apparently Zipper's garage has been removed. The red trailer, just a lot of these buildings have been completely removed since then. Is that suspicious by itself? I don't know. I don't know. 
posters here. The red trailer was gone and the property was sold almost one year to the day after Hallback went missing. Sold to who we believe to be Radon's family relatives. The property is still in the family but has undergone some changes. Other people asked, when did the trailer disappear? Around the time of the trial. Very convenient timing. And so the, the last mind shock we will have here for this episode is an 8mm footage released via FOIA. And we will look at this footage. This is f approximate location of Radon's quarry looking at from where he was on one of the roads looking at the Avery trailer is it possible to see a fire in a barrel I mean if you zoom in a whole bunch with the camera like they did maybe but without zooming in it's kind of hard would they would he have seen a 2.5 foot fire from a barrel I don't know I'll leave you guys to discuss that very very curious indeed so definitely some more questions than answers regarding Joshua Redont as always. In the Avery case, it just seems like it's hard to get a handle on anything. And believe it or not, even with so many episodes in, we're, we're still just scratching the surface. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the Mind Shock podcast in the Stephen Avery series. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Like and share this podcast and keep awareness up in this wrongful conviction as well as others. Share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority case topic, logical analysis, co-podcaster requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind. Leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mindshock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire, and you are listening to the Stephen Avery series of Making a Murderer Fame, a very biased documentary that only went over 1% of the corruption that is present in Manitowoc and the state of Wisconsin. In this series, we logically examine the case. Any evidence against Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, of which none seem to stand up against that, any kind of logic or reason or basic common sense in any way, very, very strange. Uh, I've often pondered if there are any guilters out there that are not related or simply friends of people in Man of Manitowoc law enforcement. It's just it's very, very strange. So, in this episode, episode 38, we are going to examine a cult Manitowoc. Make sure you've checked out the podcast, Coincidence County, where we go over tons of coincidences and blatant corruption in Manitowoc over the decades. And in this episode, we are taking a look at the occult aspect. So those familiar with Dave Bogotka and his claims, we'll be examining those as well. 
And it in the post-Epstein era, it's probably not as surprising. Before Epstein, a lot of the coincidence theorists and the cognitive dissonant authority-worshipping cultists, they simply did could not believe that any kind of so-called officials, politicians, law enforcement, could ever be involved in any kind of clubs or cults or human trafficking or any of this weirdness. But now in the post-Epstein era, coincidence theorists are being exposed a left and right as simply Dunning-Kruger goofs who are not believing the evidence right in front of their eyes, the obvious blatant corruption and complicity in these so-called elite circles. Now, what is going on in Manitowoc? Is it also present in Manitowoc? If so, is it really that surprising? I don't know. We're going to have to examine this information with logic and reason on the forefront completely objectively without hallucinating anything is true or untrue examining all avenues in typical mind shock fashion if you enjoy the podcast find it interesting you can donate to our paypal help support the channel help us uncover more mind shocking information regarding this case and other cases you can donate to our PayPal, just check the link in the description. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, like and share this podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topological analysis, co-podcast or request. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. So I'm going to open this up with this comment. I'm not sure if I went over this on the earlier episodes. I actually don't know the source. I'm assuming it's either a YouTube comment or a Reddit comment somewhere. It's, it's quite interesting. It's about the Avery family. So regarding people were asking why people hate the Averys. So, here is someone who lived in the area. That's what decades of listening to everyone you know bash the family over and over again. It's expletive embedded into people's brains, and they refuse to accept the fact that everything they ever heard might be unfair and wrong. My mom has lived in the area for a lot of her life, and she honestly said people have treated the Averys this way as long as she can remember. My wife asked her why that is, and she answered with, I honestly don't know why. Follow-up comment here, so it seems like they are just the local kicking post. Everyone hates on them just to have someone to hate on. Obviously, long-standing feuds, property business disputes can factor into it, but the general population sentiment is that if you want to talk trash, the Averys are the go-to. And that does make things kind of make sense a little bit. I mean, even Stephen Avery, a lot of these uh, clueless, Dunning-Kruger, goofy guilters maintain that Avery threw a cat in a fire when, again, an individual named Yanda, not to be confused with Janda, <laughs> Yanda admitted and signed a police statement that he physically picked up the cat and threw it. Now, Avery was present, and apparently there was a lot of alcohol involved. But there's no evidence that Avery picked up the cat and threw it in the fire. It was a guy named Yanda, and yet he wasn't punished. And I bring this up quite often because, again, there's so many goofy individuals out there that just continue to hallucinate that Avery definitely picked up a cat and threw it in the fire when there's no evidence of that. Now, maybe he did do it. Maybe Yanda just confessed just for kicks. I mean, who knows? But it's curious that Yanda wasn't even punished. He's free to go, and Stephen Avery, who was not the one that picked up the cat and threw it in the fire, he was being a, a drunken moron who possibly was spraying gasoline all over the place, including on the cat. Again, we don't really know what happened. But he's punished, and the guy that actually picked up the cat and threw it in the fire supposedly is not punished. Now, can you imagine that happening with a human being? Let, let's say these two drunk guys, one of them actually picks up a human being and throws him in a fire. He walks off scot-free because he reported his buddy who may have in, been involved in uh, dowsing him with gasoline. Now, dowsing with gasoline is, of course, a crime as well, but it's not the same crime as picking up a living thing and throwing it in a fire, killing it. Now, the way that Manitowoc handles justice is they punish the guy that physically committed the murder of a living entity while they let... Well, they don't punish the guy that physically committed the murder of a living entity, 
but they punish the guy that was only responsible for being present and possibly involved in some drunken antics involving gasoline. This is how they do things in Manitoba. But all these clueless goof guilters seem to think it's all above board in Manitoba. Really, really? I mean, this would be downright hilarious if there weren't two guys sitting in prison who were wrongfully convicted. Again, innocent or guilty. I don't know. I wasn't there. But the, the legal standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, and we're not even in the same dimension. I mean, th there's literally zero evidence that stands up to logical scrutiny that can even be hallucinated to be legitimate in any way. I mean, nothing adds up here. So, let's examine the occult aspects here. So, first of all, do we know what Manitowoc means in Native American languages of the time? Supposedly, Manitowoc means place of the spirits. And you can find this on www.uwsp.edu slash museum slash menominee clans slash places slash chart dot ASPX. And it's just simply a list of the menominee, menominee clans sponsored by the University of Wisconsin. And there's just a whole bunch of Native American words, one of which is Manitowoc, which means place of the spirits. Is that curious to anybody? Let's continue down the rabbit hole. So here is a curious uh, archive. This is from 4chan, so many people will scoff. It was actually posted in Halloween subsection. And this was posted Monday, November 19th, 2018 by Anonymous. Making a Pharmacos, Manitowoc Place of the Spirits. So there's a picture of Teresa Hallback here. Teresa Hallback filmed this in 2003. This is from her filmed uh, interview, so to speak. Quote, so let's say I die before I'm 31. Let's say I die tomorrow. I don't think I will. I think I have a lot more to do. I want the people I love to know that whenever I die that I was happy. And... Some more information here. Her father served on the Tri-Parish Council of the Knights of Columbus. He died at 31, allegedly of a sudden heart attack. Her mother remarried his brother soon after. Her grandfather was also a member. The emblem of the Grand Chancellor of the Knights of Columbus is a skull and crossbones. And we won't be going down the Knights Templar rabbit holes and all of that. However, is that why Teresa Hallback said if she dies before she's 31? Is she expecting to die at 31? That didn't happen because her father did? I mean, it's still curious the way that that's phrased. Huh. So we're going to be going down a whole bunch of mysterious and gruesome deaths in Manitowoc that don't really seem to be as popular in other areas. Now, just for reference, Manitowoc County has a population of 81,442 people as of the 2010 census. So obviously in the previous decades it was less. And that's curious. I mean, 80,000 people, that's, that's not a ton of people. We're not talking a major metropolitan area with millions of people or even anywhere close to a million people or even a tenth of a million people. So keep that in mind when we're going through all these strange and gruesome deaths and murders and so-called accidents, suspicious and otherwise, because you don't really seem to see this in other areas of similar population size. So here is an excerpt, Manitowoc Herald Times reporter, January 29th, 1973. Two daughters, survivors of third family tragedy. Tragedy has, for the third time in eight years, struck a former Manitowoc family, leaving two daughters as the lone survivors. The death Saturday of Mrs. Maureen Den, 30, of Green Bay was tragic enough, but it was tragedy that ended her life of tragedy. Mrs. Den was killed Saturday night in a two-car accident, US-41, just north of Fond du Lac. Her death follows, by almost nine years, the death of her, 
of three of her children in a Manitoba County fire and by five years the death of her husband Walter. The three youngsters, William three, Darla Jean two, and Susan Marie one, were all found dead March 3rd, 1964, in a house trailer on the Denny Farm at, at rural Newton. According to records of the Newton Fire Department, Mr. and Mrs. Denny were in the barn doing chores when they discovered the fire about 9 a.m. The door to the trailer was locked, and the firefighters had to break windows to enter the trailer, according to the records. Tragedy struck again in 1967 when Mr. Den died. Now, for the third time, the Den family was struck by tragedy. According to reports, Mrs. Den and her two daughters were passengers in a car driven by her sister. The northbound Boatman Auto was struck by a car driven by missing name of madison reports indicate the southbound haley vehicle went out of control crossed the median strip went to the northbound lane and struck the auto the den children and three of her children are reported in stable condition at saint agnes okay a passenger in the other car also of madison were treated and released and regarding this fire this is from the sheboygan press may 24th 1967 Fire deaths of tots in 64 blamed for dad's suicide. Despondency over the deaths of three small, ch three small children in a tragic fire over three years ago was blamed today for the suicide of a 20-year-old Newton man, 28-year-old Newton man. Walter C. Den, whose three tots burned to death in a house trailer fire at the edge of the village, March 7, 64, shot himself with a rifle Tuesday evening, only a few feet from the site of the fire. Another post here. Mary Ann Den, 45, of Manitowoc, died Tuesday, November 15th, 1988, at her residence after suffering a heart attack. Funeral services will be at 10.15 a.m. Okay, Friday at the Pfeffer Funeral Home in Manitowoc. Pfeffer, does that sound familiar to anybody? Okay, Mary Ann Hartlab was born... May 3rd, 1943, at Manitowoc, daughter of Henry A. and Marie Rindel Hartlob. She was a graduate of Lincoln High School, class of 1960, and also attended Silver Lake College. She served as an organ soloist at St. Casimir Church, other area churches, the Cleveland VFW, and was also the director of the Senior Memories. Marianne currently operated the Mad House, H-A-U-S, in Manitowoc. Survivors include four sons, all these Denny's of Manitowoc. Okay, other people. All right, another uh, a post here by Anonymous. I wasn't initially alarmed when I saw this, though I humored the idea that the Den family was cursed. However, it would appear this woman's death occurred under highly mysterious conditions. This is a statement dictated by Dave Bogotka, who opened a bar called Dave's Dungeon, interesting name, in 1988 and hired Mary Ann Den to bartend a year later. She soon became the manager. Bogotka claims knowledge of a club in Manitowoc which engaged in orgies and satanic rites. He accuses this organization of destroying his business and possibly murdering Mary Ann Den. He had several meetings with people who claimed to be members of the club, one of whom produced compromising photos of prominent locals. They had begun urging him to become a member after he witnessed a series of surreal events. Bogotka was on his jet ski when a violent rape occurred on a local beach July 29, 1984. He saw the victim bruised and covered in blood fleeing from some sand dunes. Attempting to apprehend the assailant, Bogotka ran towards the dunes and saw several males, none of whom were interviewed by police and none of whom testified at trial. Bogotka remembered two other things very clearly. A, police shouting at him to stop as he ran toward the dunes. Two, police were on the beach before the rape occurred. And this is, of course, the Bernstein assault, which Stephen Avery ultimately was framed for, which is quite curious as well. Same people, most of the same people involved. I mean, how much of a coincidence theorist do you have to be to think that the people that framed Avery when there wasn't tens of millions of dollars on the line wouldn't do it when there was? I mean, just the level of silliness off the charts here. So 
Uh, some other posts here. This is Bogotka's statements. Mary Ann began reporting to Dave that a few men were repeatedly coming in and harassing her. She told him they were telling her that Dave had to join the club. Dave told Mary Ann to blow them off. On the last day Dave spoke to Mary Ann in person, she said she was sleeping with a gun because she was so fearful of these people. Dave suggested they go to the police, to which Mary Ann responded, They are the police. Dave was preparing to travel to upstate Wisconsin on a hunting trip, so he told Marianne he'd figure out what to do when he returned. On November 15, 1988, Dave set off on his trip. He was gone for about a week and a half. During this time, he was unreachable by phone. Upon his return, his mother told him that Marianne had been found dead in her apartment in Manitowoc on the day Dave left. He couldn't believe it. He, ca he called a friend to go with him to Dave's dungeon. The bar was a mess and ransacked. It looked like it had been the scene of a big party. Everything of value was gone. All the liquor, beer, many fixtures, and money. Marianne's boyfriend, Dave doesn't remember his name, happened to drive by the bar and saw Dave's car parked outside. He stopped in and explained to Dave that he'd been the one who found Marianne. He came home and discovered her lying in bed, covered in blood, dead, with a gun on the nightstand. The boyfriend claims he called the police, and when they showed up, they immediately handcuffed him. They suspected he killed her due to all the blood. He wasn't cuffed for long, and they released him. He told Dave they deemed the death a heart attack. Dave didn't get further details about that incident. So a heart attack that results in all of this blood. That's kind of weird. If that's true, that's kind of weird. Huh. Another post here, our sweet little Kelsey left this world, our sweet little Chelsea left this world Monday, March 24th, 2014. Chelsea A. Den, age 22, a Manitowoc resident, was born on September 8th, 91 in Manitowoc. She was a graduate of Manitowoc Lincoln High School, class of 2010. Wow. And it is weird. Are more people from the Den family here dying than any other family? I'd be curious to do a compare and contrast. So it appears Marianne Den's sisters and brother all met untimely deaths as well. Also, Co Colette A. Dvorak, is that a familiar uh, name to anybody? Age 42, died Tuesday, May 3rd, 94. Another post here by Anonymous. So she was preceded in death by a brother, Mike, two sisters, Marion and Susan, her father-in-law, Ralph Dvorak. What does one make of this? And what does one make of the fact that Penny Bernstein, the rape victim in 85, is allegedly related to Teresa Hallback, who disappeared on Halloween 2005? And what does one make of the fact that the same man was charged in both crimes wrongfully in the first if not both cases wow that's weird and it's simply astounding that this relatively small community with a low crime rate has two murder cases in its history in which one a brutal homicide led to the controversial convictions of two males from a family with a long history of police contact one of whom confesses in quotations under interrogation and two a blockbuster documentary undermining the case against the men this is a clear instance of synchronicity if nothing else i suspect that avery dassey and randall rawl functioned as pharmacos ceremonial scapegoats in a ritual show trial for ritual murders and, and we are going down some deep rabbit holes here so these anonymous posters on 4chan, make what you will of them. These newspaper clippings are quite interesting regarding these families and these names that just keep popping up. So the crime rate is relatively low in Manitowoc, but when people do die, it seems like the amount of times they die under mysterious circumstances is astronomical. Because it's not like there's tons and tons of murders, so you would have to say, oh, of course, well, a certain percentage of them would be suspicious. Some of the deaths would be suspicious. Like in New York City or L.A. or any of these big cities, there's so many deaths going on that obviously a certain portion are going to be suspicious. But in Manitowoc, with a relatively low crime rate, they have nothing but 
suspicious deaths. Isn't that weird to anybody? I don't know. I don't know. I guess the coincidence theorists would say it's not weird at all. Another post by a different anonymous here. All of this, coupled with the fact that this town is small as expletive with a low crime rate, is beyond bizarre. Add into the equation how the Avery case has been handled, the terribly obvious faking of evidence and cover-up attempts by the police, and this begins to make more sense than I'm comfortable with. I mean, that's a curious statement. <laughs> it makes more sense than I'm comfortable with. After watching both documentaries, I got the distinct feeling Avery and Dassey were handled the way they were because of what the fallout of their exoneration might entail, as surely an investigation would have to take place. This seems to illuminate why the state would view that as a problem and stimmy it at every possible turn. And you know what else is curious that the Guilters and the Dunning-Kruger crowd don't seem to be able to consider or have the mental capacity or wherewithal to consider? If unraveling the Avery case also unravels all these other cases with the same individuals that were all corrupt, that's going to bring down a lot of people in a lot of different cases. It's not just about the Avery case or just about the $36 million. I mean, it could potentially be over hundreds of millions of dollars for all the other wrongful convictions by the same individuals. Not to mention, if there is some kind of cult operating, I mean, these are dark, dark theories that, if explored and if true... I mean, it's very, very problematic for all involved. So it doesn't, from that standpoint, if that's true, and I'm not alleging it is, if it's true, it would make sense why they would need to keep Avery and Dassey locked up forever and never grant any kind of retrial where there'd be any kind of transparency or accountability. Because 2005 wasn't quite the social media era, social media era with the amount of eyeballs that any kind of retrial would have today after all the attention of making a murder and all these other wrongful convictions. Because back in 2005, wrongful convictions weren't really that exposed. I mean, the average coincidence theorist and authority-worshipping cultist walking around, they probably thought most convicted people were guilty. But now, after all these individuals, it's on the news almost every day somebody's getting exonerated. So it's kind of crazy through the modern lens how there would be a lot more exposed if there was any kind of legitimate retrial. So a couple more posts here. Again, this was sent to me. I don't have a link here. I don't know if it's TikTok Manitowoc or the Making a Murderer subreddit or possibly another site, possibly Web Sleuths. But here is what, uh, here is just a lot more information. Here's a quick rundown. I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss Dave's story about the strange things that go on in Manitowoc. How about this for a strange story and stay strange coincidence? Cop runs Hallback's plate 9.30 p.m. on November 3rd. They know they have the vehicle, but no body. Pretty weak case against Stephen Avery. Another 24-year-old girl, same age and stature approximately, as Teresa Hallback, dies of an accidental, in quotes, drug overdose later that night on November 3rd. The only drug, so this is obviously Carmen Budwell, which we already went over. The only drug overdose in Manitowoc in all of 2005, a 24-year-old girl on that day, did cops manufacture their own body to make a stronger case against Stephen Avery. Cremated remains in a pit, impossible to achieve, with no teeth, no way of identifying through dental records. Read the whole article and you'll see some familiar names and some strange comments, like cops throwing cold water on ever finding the person responsible for supplying the drugs. Really? In a county the size of Manitowoc, no leads on who she hangs out with. Starting to believe nothing is unbelievable in Manitowoc County. That is why I believe Dave 100%. So let's actually go over Dave Bogotka and uh, his saga a little bit more in depth. And this possible secret club, good old boys club of corruption and the occult. So it's also actually curious that this news report came out August 30th, 2005. And this is curious. This was put out on productionsouth.wordpress.com referencing this post. 
New Criminal Justice Commission formed for Wisconsin in an effort to improve, I don't know what newspaper this is from, but in an effort to improve Wisconsin's criminal justice system by identifying and remedying problems that have led to wrongful convictions, legal officials from around the state have formed a new Wisconsin Criminal Justice Study Commission. The panel's first meeting will be held Wednesday, August 31st from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the State Bar Center in Madison. The commission was formed by the State Bar of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin Law School, Marquette University Law School, and Wisconsin Attorney General Peg Lautenschlager. So this is a guards guarding themselves situation where Peggy, one of the top pegs in this corruption board, has to oversee, is, is part of the commission that oversees the corruption, so she can make sure that the true corruption is never exposed to keep an eye on things. So this was a post October 28, 2017 by Production South WordPress.com. The framing of Stephen Avery began August 31st, 2005. On August 31st, 2005, the Avery Task Force was taken over and renamed the Criminal Justice Study Commission by Peg Lautenschlager and none other than Jerome Buting, who represented the criminal law section of the Wisconsin State Bar. This is a fact. And for those that haven't checked out the previous episodes on Mindshuck, I actually go over Strang and Buting. This group had ceded to it sheriffs, Judges, prosecutors, attorneys, senators, DCI, and state crime lab affiliates. Jerome Buting was seated alongside those with a political agenda stemming from Stephen Avery's exoneration. Do you think, out of all of Buting's colleagues, he's really the only one who thinks Stephen was innocent? Think again. Peg Lautenschlager distributed pamphlets in September 2005. The content in these pamphlets were drafted by Jerome Buting, working as her lead author. Keep in mind, October 31st, 2005, it wasn't until over a month later that uh, Teresa Hallback was allegedly killed. So all of this is going on one to two months prior. The content covered was jailhouse snitches, tunnel vision, contaminated DNA, false witness statements, and electronic monitoring of juveniles. How coincidental. This is all quite coincidental. This was basically a how to convict Bible indicating to her bad apples how they were to frame Stephen Avery. Notice Buting neither Lautenschlager defends these very political agendas that the cops used to frame Stephen and Brennan with, and the commission was supposed to prevent this. Follow the money trail. Peg Lautenschlager held three attorney general conferences right before Hallback died. Let me read that again. Peg Lautenschlager held three attorney general conferences right before Hallback died, or allegedly died. Lautenschlager has access to every department that would work with the Hallback investigation and paid them off in advance with money from settling numerous civil suits as the Attorney General. There was no way Stephen Avery was winning a civil suit for $36 million as long as she was the protector of the DOJ budget. She took over the Avery Task Force and renamed it because her hate towards Stephen Avery became personal. After Stephen was arrested and the coercion was in place for Brendan Dassey, Lautenschlager made certain her lead author, Jerome Buting, was assured a spot on the defense counsel to clean up after her. Jerome Buting was there to only compliment the prosecutors in a very highly political conviction. Jerome Buting was attached to Lautenschlager even at the time Stephen hired him. This is a fact. Avery's trial was rigged on both ends. You have to start looking beyond Avery Road and follow the money trail. The research is done. Former Attorney General Peg Lautenschlager has declined to speak for 12 years. Kathleen Zellner, it's time to get her to squeal and Buting. Jerome Buting forgot to tell you. His political affiliation with Lautenschlager before Teresa Hallback's death and after, that for a fact spanned three years starting with Stephen's exoneration. 
My book, Beyond Avery Road, Beauty and the Beast, explains exactly what every one of you have missed. Why? Because Buting had 10 episodes in Making a Murder to blow the whistle on Attorney General Lautenschlager. However, Buting kept your eyes focused on Prosecutor Ken Kratz. Special Prosecutor. Very special. Ken Kratz is a special individual. But Assistant Attorney General Thomas J. Fallon was the main power for the state sent in by Lautenschlager from the same office. This Fallon is Dean Strang's best friend. Starting to make sense how the ball was purposely dropped during the trial, the evidence is real. Buting has been protecting Lautenschlager. When you open your eyes and learn that you have all been deceived, then you'll know exactly how Stephen Avery was framed. For the love of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey and their freedom, this is the book that holds all the answers, all the answers beyond Avery Road. A gentleman, okay, so moving on here to Dave Bogotka. A, a gentleman from Manitoba County, Dave Bogotka, has posted three YouTube videos in which he explains that he was jet skiing by the beach in 1985 when Penny Bernston was assaulted. Avery was convicted of that assault. He went to jail for 18 years and then was exonerated thanks to DNA evidence. On YouTube, the man who saw Bernston on the beach that day says there was something fishy going on. He seems to think the assault actually was connected to the alleged sex club, but pinned on Avery. He believes that many prominent businessmen, cops, and school employees were part of this secret sex club. He claims that a month or two after the attack, he was shown Polaroids of naked members of the club and was encouraged to join. Redditor Denna Abuses Kvath sums it up thusly. The club threatened him because he refused to join. And he suspects them of ruining his business and murdering his manager, a woman who died under suspicious circumstances. Her boyfriend was falsely accused of shooting her, but then the death was ruled a heart attack. So that's kind of weird, too. So they booked the boyfriend. They accused him of shooting her, but she actually wasn't shot and died of a heart attack instead. That's weird. Stephen Avery had no particular reason to rape and murder a woman on Halloween, but Halloween would be the number one day. For a satanic sex cult to have a ritual sacrifice, even if it was just some goth kids playing wannabe devil worshippers for fun. And that's an interesting point. Why Avery, who has $36 million to gain with this lawsuit, why he would kill anybody or draw suspicion to himself, let alone on Halloween. I mean, that is, that is curious. Another user, J.K. Schmidt, writes... I think the sex cult theory is incredibly interesting, especially since it is later revealed that Calumet County District Attorney Special Prosecutor Ken Kratz was sexually harassing a bunch of his clients and had to check into a sex prescription drug rehab program. So here we have our experiences relating to the Stephen Avery saga and The Club operating in Manitoba County by Dave and Sandra Bogotka. Intro. For years, Dave has been sharing this information both offline and on the internet. What follows is a detailed statement. The bulk of it is from Dave about his direct experiences and thoughts on what happened. Dave dictated the statement and his wife, Sandra, transcribed it. The last few paragraphs regarding Halloween 2005 includes events that both Sandra and Dave were involved in. Assault in 1985. On the afternoon of July 29, 1985, Dave was riding a jet ski with a friend on Lake Michigan just off the shoreline of Two Rivers, Wisconsin. And it'd be curious, too, if the friend corroborated everything Dave said. Tom's uh, Two Rivers is a small town in Manitowoc County located adjacent to the city of Manitowoc. There's a large sandy public beach at the location with a jet ski launching area. Dave was attentive to what was happening on the beach and road due to the fact that residents in the area had been complaining to police about noise from jet skiers. That day, he noticed what struck him as extra activity on the road next to the beach. He observed several City of Two Rivers squad cars and at least one unmarked county sheriff's vehicle. Dave knew the unmarked cars. Anyone could drive by the sheriff's open lot and see them. While out on the water, Dave saw a man speaking to the friend he was hanging out with that day. He thought it might be a cop. So he rode his jet ski into the beach to find out what was going on. The man who'd been speaking to Dave's friend had left. 
Dave's friend told him that the guy who turned out to be Penny Bernstein's husband said he was going to call the cops. Dave's friend explained that the man was concerned about his wife who had been jogging north on the beach. She'd not returned in the time frame he expected, and he'd not been able to locate her. Mr. Bernstein was gone for only a short time and then returned to the beach. At the same time, a Two Rivers police officer named Charlie Clow arrived. Dave had seen Charlie Clow driving through the area earlier. The two approached Dave and his friend. Mr. Bernstein suggested that Dave could ride his jet ski up to shoreline to look for his wife. The police officer said he didn't feel that Dave needed to do this. However, Dave thought it made good sense to go look, and so he did. That's weird. So the police officer is encouraging a civilian not to help another civilian and just ride up and down the shore looking for a missing person. Interesting. Dave rode the jet ski north along the shore. As he traveled away from the launch area, he observed a man and a woman walking north on the beach carrying a white towel. Dave didn't know their names, but he recognized them as being local. They were on the beach in the area where there are houses close by. The lay of the land is as such. Heading north from the municipal beach in two rivers, there is a residential area for about a quarter mile. After that, there are no houses close to the beach. It is state land, which consists of beach, dunes, a strip of swampy forested area, and then a road. County Highway O. Dave proceeded on the jet ski for about six miles north along the shoreline until he arrived at Molash Creek. This did not take long as the jet ski could go about 30 to 35 miles per hour. Near the creek, Dave saw another man and woman, so he pulled in to speak to them. He explained he was looking for a woman jogging down the beach had they seen her. They stated yes, they had seen her. She'd run past them and then turn back to the south jogging towards the public beach in Two Rivers. Dave again took off on his jet ski headed south. Dave estimates he rode about four to five miles when he saw a woman in a mad run from the sand dunes. She was running as if for her life. Her swimsuit top was missing and she was covered in blood. The couple Dave had seen earlier walking with the white towel were sitting on the beach in front of the location where the woman was running. Penny Bernstein was the woman. They were looking at Dave. He pointed to the dunes behind them as he was driving towards the shore. At this point, the couple on the beach saw Miss Bernstein. Dave drove his jet ski up on the beach so fast he lost control and was flung off. He got up and was on the scene as Miss Bernstein ran past him to the couple who covered her with the towel. Around the same time, Bernstein and two police, two Rivers police officers, Charlie Clow and Bill Barrow, ran up. Miss Bernstein was embraced by her husband and was sobbing and was very upset. Dave asked the police what had happened. They told Dave she was assaulted by a man. Dave grew up in the area and was very familiar with the trails between the beach and the road. His first thought was to go after whoever had done this to the woman and catch the guy or at least get a license plate from any cars that might be on the road. So he took off running up the dunes. The dunes were high enough that a person standing on the beach could not see over them to the area beyond. As Dave crested the first dunes, the police behind him were frantically yelling no, no, and for him to stop and return to the beach. Dave halted on top of the dune, and it was at this point he witnessed several men in the area behind the dunes. One man was to the south of Dave, about 20 to 30 feet. This man was lying prone on the dune, peeking over the top toward the scene on the beach. Dave isn't positive, but he thinks he was wearing a suit like a business suit. Another man was standing about 20 to 30 feet to the west of Dave. He got a good look at this man. He appeared to be picking things up from the ground, but stopped when he saw Dave. Dave says he was bug-eyed, mouth gaping, wide open with surprise as they made eye contact. He also looked a lot like Gregory Allen. Of course, Dave did not know about Gregory Allen at the time. However, after seeing his picture years later, Dave immediately said that he looked like one of the guys he saw in the dunes. Closer to the woods, further west from Dave, there were a few other men who seemed to be walking in the direction of the woods. All the people were dressed in plains clothes, no uniforms. The officers behind Dave were greatly agitated and yelling at him. So Dave returned and walked back to the beach. The officers there told Dave that Miss Bjornsson had passed out and that they, the police, had people over there and they didn't want Dave to mess up the crime scene. Was that not the crime scene, though? Or was it? At this point, Dave got back on the jet ski and proceeded south to the Two Rivers Public Beach. 
The other thing that's curious, I, I we never went over this, but is it possible Bernstein was assaulted by more than one guy, like these other police officers, and that she was just threatened into pointing the finger at Avery? I mean, that would be even a darker turn here, but okay. At this point, Dave got back on the jet ski, proceeded south to the Two Rivers public beach. Miss Bernstein was escorted down the beach to an ambulance that was waited that was waiting dave doesn't recall filling out an official statement but does remember the cop but does remember the cops implying that he dave didn't need to do anything further because he didn't witness anything significant so witnessing the victim running from a particular area is not significant and witnessing all these other people in the area is not significant weird the Bernstein's later sent Dave a thank you note and a gift certificate for use in their candy store in Manitowoc. Dave learned through the media that Stephen Avery had been charged in the assault and details that were presented to the public. He also heard from locals that the good old boys club were taking care of the situation to make sure that Stephen Avery was sent to prison. Naked Pictures, the club. Not long, a month or two after the incident on the beach, Dave was at Two Rivers Tire and Muffler, where he worked. A co-worker approached Dave and said a man wanted to speak to him. And this man is known, but his name is not listed here. This man was and is a very prominent member of the community. Side note, we have not stated this person's name. We feel this individual is very influential, having held office in local and state politics, and we are concerned about backlash. This man spoke to Dave and told him that we would like to invite you to join a special men's club. He showed Dave some photographs. In them were naked men, some of whom Dave recognized. There were at least two high school teachers and a junior Ramblers football coach. They appeared to be engaging in sexual acts. There were multiple men in each photo, like some kind of group thing was going on. The guy told Dave that the club members met at various hotels and venues in the area, and not to worry, sometimes they got girls. He stated that many business owners and prominent people were in this club, and that it was advantageous to be a member. He said Dave should come and talk to him and let him know if he wanted to participate. Dave was freaked out by this. He was 19 years old at the time, and didn't know what to say. He put the guy off and said he'd get back to him. Afterwards, Dave recalls feeling stunned. He was mystified as to why this guy would show him these pictures and invite him to join this club. It was extremely weird. First learning about a club. Now we're going back to, in time to describe incidents that happened when Dave was a kid. He feels that they also relate to this club and are relevant to painting a picture of the culture that is part of the Manitowoc County area. On several occasions, when Dave was between four and eight years old, he was the victim and witness to domestic violence. These acts were committed against his family by a police officer. In one of the last and most dramatic of these incidents, Dave and his family, single mother and younger sister, were forced to go into hiding because the police officer who committed the acts could not be located. Dave and his family left town and hid out at some sort of Catholic-affiliated retreat in northern Wisconsin. Despite the police, a priest, several nuns, and a guidance counselor being involved and aware of the specifics of the incident, the events seemed to get covered up. It was later implied to Dave not to worry. The good old boys club had taken care of it. Fast forward to Dave's freshman year in high school. After Dave quit football, two boys on the team began to bully Dave. One of the boys' fathers was rumored to be a big shot in this good old boy's club. These two began spreading rumors about Dave's mother. They said that the boy's father, the one rumored to be in the club, had made derogatory claims regarding Dave's mom. The stigma of this followed Dave throughout his school days. Later on in the 90s, Dave had another run-in with his father in regards to the club. Dave's Dungeon. In 1986, when Dave was 20, he bought a bar in the city of Manitowoc on 21st and Hamilton Street. And Hamilton Streets. You can own a bar when you're 20? 
So you just can't serve or drink alcohol, but you can own the bar. Interesting. The bar was called Dave's Dungeon. It was in the basement of a building, the top portion of which consisted of apartments. The place wasn't open more than a few weeks, and a man came in while Dave was bartending. I guess you can bartate, bartend when you're 20 in Manitowoc in 1986. Dave didn't know the guy. He sat at the bar and ordered a few beers. He explained to Dave that he was sent by the club to speak to him. He went on to say that Dave needed to go to the basement of the Eagles Club located in Mantuoc in order to join this club. He didn't say who Dave was supposed to see, just where he should go. He was insistent that Dave must join this club. Dave asked him why. Why would he be interested in joining this? The guy then explained how it worked. Essentially, he described racketeering to Dave. He didn't call it that, but it was the textbook definition. Dave told this fellow sure just to get him to leave him alone, but he had no intention of going to join anything. Time passes, month or two walks by, into the bar walks the junior Ramblers football coach. This was one of the guys in the pictures Dave was shown after the assault on the beach. The guy is friendly to Dave, but starts reeling off the same speech as the man who had been in there before. Dave needed to go to the Eagles club and join this club. Dave has the aha moment. This football coach was in the pictures. This is all part of the same club. This reinforces Dave's desire not to become involved with whomever it's so important he goes see in the Eagles basement. Dave blows the guy off telling him sure he'll go down there. Not. <laughs> Over the course of the next year, the... In the course of the ne over the course of the next year that Dave was actively tending his bar, the same guy from the photos comes in several times. On each occasion, he adamantly requests that Dave go join this club. He practically begs Dave, telling him things such as, you don't want to get on the wrong side of these guys. Finally, the last time Dave encounters this fellow, he becomes belligerent. He starts yelling and waving his fist at Dave. Before storming out of the bar, he tells Dave he'd better take care of joining or else something is going to happen. There were other people in the bar at the time who witnessed this. They even asked Dave what the guy's problem was. That's interesting. It's always interesting when there's individuals around who can corroborate these stories. Something to add is that almost immediately after Dave opened the bar, there had been one problem after another. Three different people were suing him. The city authority on housing was getting after him about the apartments in the building. There were burglaries and vandalisms. And vandalism. It may have just been bad luck, but Dave wonders now if it could have been related to him refusing to join this club. Mary Ann. About a year after Dave opened the bar, he hired Mary Ann Den. Mary Ann had operated a bar called Pat and Mike's just down the road from Dave's dungeon. She began bartending and then proposed managing the bar. Dave was pleased with the job she did, and she took over the bulk of the day-to-day -day responsibilities. Marianne began reporting to Dave that a few men were repeatedly coming in and harassing her. She told him they were telling her that Dave had to join the club. Dave told Marianne to blow them off. On the last day Dave spoke to Marianne in person, she said she was sleeping with a gun because she was so fearful of these people. Dave suggested they go to the police, to which Marianne responded, They are the police. Dave was preparing to travel to upstate Wisconsin on a hunting trip, so he told Marianne he'd figured out what to do when he returned. On November 15, 1988, Dave set off on his trip. He was gone a week and a half. During that time, he was unreachable by the phone. Upon his return, his mom told him that Marianne had been found dead in her apartment in Manitowoc on the day Dave left. He couldn't believe it. He called a friend to go with him to Dave's dungeon. The bar was a mess and ransacked. It looked like it had been the scene of a big party. Everything of value was gone. Marianne's boyfriend, Dave doesn't remember his name, happened to drive by the bar and saw Dave's car parked outside. He stepped in and explained to Dave that he'd been the one to fa who found Marianne. He came home and discovered her lying in bed, covered in blood, dead with a gun on the nightstand. The boyfriend claims he called the police, and when they showed up, they immediately handcuffed him. They suspected he killed her due to all the blood. He wasn't cuffed for long, and they released him. He told Dave they deemed the death a heart attack. Dave didn't get further details about the incident. The boyfriend went on to tell him about the huge free-for-all party that had taken place. It had occurred the weekend after Marianne's death. He said he didn't know who opened the bar and or started the party. 
but apparently there were possibly hundreds of people there. What the heck in that little bar? After this, Dave decided to go talk to Marianne's teenage son. He didn't provide any useful details either. Dave did contact the police to report what had happened in his bar. He was informed that there was nothing the police could do. Wow, that's curious. So he goes to report this, and then they're like, oh yeah, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> that's weird. Dave was forced to declare bankruptcy, and that was the end of Dave's dungeon. In the years after, Dave crossed paths with individuals who claimed to have been at this party. Several times he heard that people from the club were at the party giving everything away. So was this the something is going to happen that Dave was promised by the naked football coach guy? Another invitation. In the mid-90s, estimates it was 1995, Dave again experienced a brush with the club. He'd been invited to a local supper club, bar and restaurant by friends. He suspected these friends were knowledgeable about the club, and he'd recently begun asking them about it. They'd consistently avoided answering. On this night, after the restaurant crowd had thinned, the friends told Dave they had, su had a surprise for him. They led him over to some people sitting at another area of the bar. As he approached, a man introduced himself. It turned out he was the father of the kid who had spread the rumors about Dave's mom in high school. This guy said he wanted to invite Dave to join a special club. After realizing who the guy was, Dave told him to get bent. He also confronted him about the rumors regarding his mom and the harassment he and Marianne had been subjected to by this club. The man seemed stunned, and Dave headed out of the place. His friends caught up with him at the door and told him he had to go back. They were adamant that Dave should make nice and that he couldn't refuse this information. Dave asked them why he should. They said, for jobs, work, and money. He explained why he had no use for the guy handing out the invite and basically told them no thanks and left. Although another curious question for Dave Bogotka would be why he stuck around in the area from 86 to 95 in the first place after all that business with the club. Stephen Avery again. Stephen Avery gets exonerated for the assault on the beach. He's released from prison on September 11th, 2003. I wonder if that's also a curiosity where they set that up somehow, some kind of occult reference. Dave sees this playing out in the media and can't believe it. Once again, the events he witnessed on the beach that day in 1985 are fresh in his mind. As time passes, Stephen Avery files his lawsuits, etc. Dave and Sandra follow the news coverage. Dave looks forward to further investigating Dave looks forward to further investigation into the crime on the beach. He's always felt there was something off about the things he saw that day. That, along with all that Dave has experienced regarding this club, is certainly enough to have him very curious about what in the hell is going on in the community. On the evening of October 31st, 2005, Dave and Sandra load their bicycles into the back of their truck. They drive from their home in Two Rivers, where they park by Walsh Field and unload the bikes. They ride around town checking out the Halloween decorations and getting some exercise. As they are heading back to their truck, they pass through the parking lot of Patsy's Highway 42 Mobile Mart in Two Rivers. At the gas station, Dave spots Stephen Avery. Dave says to Sandra, look, there's that Stephen Avery. The two stop their bikes on the edge of the gas station parking lot and watch him for a few minutes. He's driving a dark colored larger Ford truck. He's wearing a red and white jacket. He seems to be filling gas cans, the red plastic type. There also appears to be a blonde female with him. Sandra mentions to Dave that it looks like Stephen Avery is doing pretty good. Dave and his wife leave the area and continue back to their truck. Time, not sure of exact time. It was soon after dark. So someone found the following, which Dave posted on the Manitowoc Topics Board in 2009. January 6, 2009. I see the Avery thing is back in the news. Here's what I have to say about that. I was involved in the search for the woman who got raped on the beach in the first Avery case. I was the first one to see her coming over the sand dunes and can say, looking back at it, I was disappointed by the police response. Here, here we are standing where the guy who did it could not have been too far away. I suggested to the cop trying to chase down the guy. 
he said no, we would mess up the crime scene. And it was left to the courts. I never testified because I did not really see anything, but what I did see was a very badly beaten woman who was horribly traumatized. After they convicted Mr. Avery, I would have been all for doing away with him. However, now we know what happened there. Funny, a friend of mine who was involved with the police back then told me that they were making sure he did not get out of it. Then on Halloween, the night of the recent killing, I was on a short bike ride in TR. Who did I see? Stephen Avery. He was getting gas at Ummy and Patsy's, filling gas cans in the back of his blue F-250. He had some people with him, including a young girl. However, I do not believe it was Miss Hallback. I almost expletive after the news came out. What are the chances of me getting that close to both crimes? It was funny. Our eyes met, and he gave me that stupid Stephen Avery grunt and looked very cocky. I also made eye contact with the girl sitting in the front seat. I think it was his niece. However, I was not paying a lot of attention. I did point him out to my wife, though. He was kind of a local character, being on the news so much with his lawsuit. I sent this info to the police and the DA and never heard a word. I have also heard, so the police had no interest in Avery's movements on Halloween. <laughs> the police had zero interest in, in Avery's movements. This is curious. Wow. I sent it, okay, I have also heard rumors flying around the area, Fisherville, that some of his, bo some of his buddies had a go at her also. The cops never get anything done, right? I have a feeling there is a lot left to the story. Detectives described their search on November 6, 2005 of Avery's truck, a Ford 350, which was parked in front of his garage. This truck matches the description that Bagotka gives of the truck, dark-colored, larger Ford, that he saw Avery driving shortly after it got dark on October 31, 2005. It got dark around 5 p.m. that day. Bagotka saw Avery's at Patsy's Highway 42, Mobile Mart at 816 22nd Street, Two Rivers, Wisconsin filling gas cans, the red plastic type, and there was a blonde-haired woman with him. So that particular night, apparently sunset began at 4.50 p.m. So the sex club rumors. Now, there seems to be a lot of locals on this sub. Can any locals corroborate the YouTube videos in Dr. Nephilim 666 channel? I believe that was Dave Bogotka's channel, about some weird sex club that is composed of many powerful people in the area. Not sure if I believe this dude, but he seems honest enough, and the videos were posted a while before the documentary aired. Maybe he just fi finished watching True Detective Season 2. It may not be true, but one thing is certain, something very strange is and has been going on in Two Rivers. Some follow-up posts here. The possibility that major business owners and other powerful players in the community take part in these groups and hypothetically coerce and blackmail people into compliance is not far-fetched. If he witnessed something on the beach that day, it's not unreasonable to imagine they wanted him in that club to compromise him and his potential testimony. It also doesn't seem unreasonable to imagine a group with that sort of widespread influence flaunting their capacities to threaten people and flex some of their muscle. That, I imagine, was the purpose of showing him the photograph there may perhaps be to an element of arrogant nonchalance, but that doesn't exclude the possibility of revealing to him the reach of this club, teachers, businessmen, cops, etc. We need the people in the community, perhaps more logically people who've since left the community, to corroborate the possible truth behind these claims. I would be inherently skeptical of anyone currently living in and around the Manitoc area with potential reason to discredit his story. The fear of dangerous reprisal for blowing the whistle on this sort of thing should not be taken lightly. That being said, it's important to approach both sides of these stories with open-minded skepticism. I'm personally of the mind that the presence of some organized club would help justify and explain the inexplicable behavior of the Sheriff's Department, Dassey's defense teams, and possibly even Judge Willis and Fox as the proceedings unfolded. It's also equally possible, as others have alluded in various threads, that the psychology behind psychophants like Len Kaczynski goes a long way towards explaining his willingness to aid the prosecution. The point is, there's a lot going on here. We'd be remiss to not consider every possibility and explore every angle, the club included. 
Someone actually found her cemetery listing, and it's not 1986, it's 1988. What that means, I don't know, unless it's a typo on the cemetery listing records. Or Bagatka was off by two years? Huh. Or one year? A supposed local posted this. I'll tell you one thing. It's pretty expletive interesting that while I see businesses and homes shutting down and be put up for sale on a constant basis in this area, I have never seen so many for sale signs and I've lived all over, including as far away as Florida, while the same families who have a name in the area always seem to do just fine regardless of how good or bad the economy is. <laughs> That's an interesting curiosity, isn't that? Just ask the judge in the in the Dassey case if his home has lost any property value over the last few years. Then go out, knock on the door, and ask his neighbors the next question. Huh. A post by Ed Vaness here. I've known and worked with Dr. Nephilim666 slash Dave for many years, and I can tell you what he says is true. He does not BS. Wow. Just in Ion posted this. It's all a bit Twin Peaks. Even Two Rivers sounds eerily familiar. Teresa Hallback, Teresa Banks from Twin Peaks. A post from Bloated Bastard stated this. I thought about it too. Everything about this county sounds like Twin Peaks. A post from Dave Bagotka here. Mrs. Beerston talked about the jet ski thing in an interview a few years back, but it was like the cops did not want me to be involved from the start. I also got a $50 gift certificate from them to the candy store. Some of the local homeowners were complaining about noise of the jet skis. The story I was told on the heart attack was it ruptured into her lungs and windpipe, and she aspirated the blood. I always thought it sounded kind of shady, but she was a very heavy drinker and in pretty bad shape for a 42-year-old. She was the, she was managing the bar and I was working full time. I never got a straight answer from anybody. What happened to all my expletive? It was like they were as scared as her boyfriend after he found the body about talking who did what. She was also doing my taxes and all the paperwork for the bar and all of it got thrown away. So I had to file to the state to get back what she had sent them. It was such a mess. If you look up my name on the WCCA, you will see the tax warrants I got in trouble for. Them guys slammed me hard. I ain't making expletive up, and my memory is pretty good yet. So here's an interesting post by Etherspin. They thought he had seen anomalies and spotted the actual perp. Verse Avery, who the cops in the club wanted away for potentially car ramming one of their members. So, regarding Bagotka, they, they thought he had seen anomalies, spotted the actual perp on the beach, and wanted blackmail material on him so they could stop him reporting anything about that day should the need arise. Besides the club, Dave says they were routinely sending people in requesting drugs and that when he wasn't on site at the bar they'd managed to bust the place for letting in minors huh that's weird the stakes are high avery was put away henceforth assume i'm buying dave's info and also the cops actively tried to fit avery up instead of being biased mixed with incompetence there are a lot of careers at stake well, you'd like to think, but nothing has happened since Avery was freed. In other jurisdictions and countries, I think heads would roll for sure. Which means normal wages, but also potential kickbacks for favors, which would make an average wage seem more meager. As for the club, it might seem far-fetched, as might the prospect of Calumet turning a blind eye to dodgy stuff with Lank. I think that brown-haired cop was a decent guy as opposed to the smart-ass cop who was there the day the key was found, perhaps examples of a partially compromised force. But once there is significant power in one town, you have people from the next town marrying sons of corrupt people jumping across to Calumet, intentional planning of corrupt people, 
Example, you take a guy who has been at Manitowoc in his role for 20 years and is eligible for retirement, but instead offer kickbacks to jump across the Calumet and apply for a job he is overqualified for, he aces the interview because of aptitude and experience and winds up also on the selection panel for new low-level employees and can favor newbie cops who are connected to dicey club people as well as controlling which people are on call or called in when something goes down. This would allow corruption of a major crime so it can be blamed on the next person on the club's hit list. It sounds complex and far-fetched, but it's just another form of organized crime, and unfortunately, organized crime is still far too prevalent the world over. If you were part of this corrupt team, like imagine for a second that Kratz or his assistant were compromised, how cool would it be to have someone like Kaczynski so peeved that he didn't get that job as a judge, wasn't he, who works with Mike Kelly under the employ of Dassey in the guise of defense, completely screws his case up, extracts all manner of conflicting but usable confessions from him. This changes the perception of Avery for the public and by extension the jury. Man, it would just be win-win and the fact that Kaczynski is not in jail or barred from practicing along with Michael, my god, the ribbon Kelly, makes you think, hmm, that judge who wouldn't let Brendan Dassey dismiss Len and get a new lawyer, same person not finding Len in contempt of court, is he compromised? So here's a post from David from Dave Bogotka's wife, and it is curious too, because if his wife didn't corroborate this, people would really write him off as an insane lunatic. But he's got a number of individuals corroborating his stories. Hey y'all, I'm Dave's wife, the guy who made the videos, yes. Dave is not excellent on video and he does tend to skip around. He'd be the first to admit this. Anyway, we've seen several places where people intended to summarize his videos and they mix up the details and sort of butcher it. I have now transcribed a written statement of the events Dave's exper Dave experienced. He dictated to me, and this is what we went over earlier before jumping into these comments. I met Dave in 1999 and I've heard all this info a lot throughout the years. So apparently, as far as 99, he'd told her this information. So he didn't make this up after the documentary just for attention. The last part, Halloween evening 2005, I was with Dave for that part. I think we did a pretty good job in providing most of the important details. Dave's felt bad about this stuff for years. We hope that, some, that somehow sharing this info helps. And an interesting post, uh, someone asked her if they watched the Making a Murder documentary and what were their thoughts about it. So... Dave's wife here responds, we watched it, it's good. I think it does an excellent job of showing that there were plenty of problems. As far as Stephen Avery goes, Dave told me he and many of his family were a bit different years ago. But Stephen family members used to come to the open air bar festival area where Dave was a bouncer at Harps Lake. And he says he never had any troubles from them. Dave did hear about the cat burning incident around the time it happened. He did hear that Avery and others put flammable stuff on the cat and tossed it in the fire. That being said, Avery admitted to it at the time, got in trouble for it. Although, again, Yanda was the one who admitted in a written police statement that he picked up the cat and threw it in the fire. But Avery admitted, of course, that he was there and he was somehow involved to a certain capacity in a drunken stupor. I don't know what to make of that. I'd also add that when I was growing up, I'm aware of many boys in my class in a very small town who abused animals. Some of it was pretty horrific. It pissed me off. But those guys didn't grow up to become rapist murderers as far as I know. Based on what Dave has told me, I'd say the Averys are a close-knit bunch, but they have their family drama. Drinking, domestic altercation, family feuds, etc. I know a few people like that, and I'd say it's fairly common. I don't think it makes it obvious people in those situation or culture are going to be murderers by default, but I also do not know what happened to Teresa Hallback. Could Avery have murdered her? Yes. Do he and Brendan Dassey deserve a fair trial according to the laws of our land? Yes. Did they get one? It doesn't appear they did. If law enforcement was so focused on Avery, did they neglect to follow up on other leads? There's also a lot of talk that supports that. And so, a murderer could still be on the loose. Also, all the club stuff, whatever that is, a mafia-like organization racketeering group that engages in orgies, 
prominent businessmen, politicians going around whipping out naked pictures to show people. That's totally weird in my book. But hey, if consenting adults want to get together to have sex parties or whatever, fine. But if it's being used as a means to blackmail, coerce, manipulate people, business, politics, that's shady. Not to mention the rumors about the occult stuff. Dave and I think that this group, the club, could most definitely be involved in the Avery saga, as well as a multitude of other corruption. Do we think police judges, others in political positions, people of great influence could be involved in this club? Of course, it seems highly likely. Precisely what this club has or had orchestrated in this case, investigation crime, we can only speculate. So much does not add up, I think most people would agree on that. Another post here, I agree, when listening to Dave's video on YouTube, I got such a bad feeling when he stated that a couple of these guys from the club lived next door to Avery. So who's he talking about? Is he talking about Radon? Because I did go over Radon in the previous podcast. Make sure you check that out if you haven't. There's some shady issues with Radon. Again, I'm not alleging he is or isn't responsible for anything, but there's some unanswered questions for sure. I don't know how far-fetched this is, but if some of Avery's neighbors were members of this so-called club, they don't even have to be neighbors, maybe just police officers, investigators, DAs, could they have been the ones to orchestrate the murder? Could have it been some form of ritual? This murder is too coincidental. It happened just two days before Manitowoc is supposed to pay out tons of money to Avery. Also, could the Dassey boy have overheard something or was told to say what he said? The story he initially told is a bit sadistic. I feel like he's keeping a secret but is scared to tell the truth. Maybe he was threatened. I don't know, but the prosecutors from Calumet County didn't seem right to me. They gave me a creepy feeling when they talked. When I heard about Kratz being a sex addict, I said to myself, I knew it. Also, the police officer that called in the tags, something was a, wasn't right about him either or his tag story. Another post from Dave Bagotka here. Something else. I was messing around one night with a woman I knew in one of the apartments above my bar that was empty at the time. I ended up leaving some used condoms on the floor. I went up there the next day to get rid of them, but to get rid of them before a possible new renter was going to look at the apartment and they were gone. Somebody had keys to the place because it was burglarized more than once. So when I am implicated by these expletives in their next satanic ritual, that is how they got my DNA. I could never figure out who would want to take something like that and why. Looking back, I feel a lot of what I thought was just bad luck was these guys setting me up. I had multiple personal injury lawsuits against me. The slumlord department was on me steady. I had a guy suing me for a fixture that was in the place when I purchased it. It was broke into and burglarized it got busted for serving minors. I had undercover cops in there all the time trying to buy drugs from me, and I never sold drugs. It was like I had a target on my back with the other local bar owners. They were always messing with me and turning me in for stupid expletive. I also said it was a rumor about JFK, but I have heard it from more than one person that you would never think would be involved with something like this. I know it sounds crazy. That is why I never believed it and just gave my opinion on what it could be, the NSA and CIA are decades ahead of the general public with technology, and now you can buy devices that can speak right into your head, and even control things like drones and a mouse on a computer with your mind. If you want to call me a liar or crazy, fine, but look expletive up before you do. Yeah, I mean, that, that, those technological advances and leaps are, are pretty crazy, of course. I mean, I don't know what the estimate is, that the military is about 50 years ahead of civilian tech, something like that. So here's another post. I don't know if this is Bagatka or his wife. We reported the info to the sheriff's department now 10 years later after this is the info regarding them spotting Avery at the gas station. Now 10 years later, after the documentary, everybody suspects the sheriff's department of being super corrupt and obviously not the ones to report anything to, so it seems. But at the time, we thought we were doing the right thing in reporting it to law enforcement. We have reported to both the old attorneys and the new attorney. Not one of them has returned our calls or emails. We've been told that an employee at the gas station also saw Mr. Avery that night. 
But we do not know if this person has gone to the lawyers. We've been encouraging anyone with info to speak up. Now it is the time while the eyes of the world are on this. So that's pretty much the rundown with Bogotka. Uh, we'll see what he responds to. He usually does comment on Mindshock videos, so we'll see if he has any further statements. But moving on here regarding uh, various people, this is the Manitoba County death list. This was apparently copy-pasted from a Facebook post a long time ago. Okay. At what point do we exit Coincidence Territory and enter Horror Movie Land? October 5th, 1926, Officer Leo Roque of the Manitowoc PD was shot to death after answering the doorbell at the Combined Police and Fire Station. The case was never solved. The entire investigative file went missing back in the 30s, so there was a whole cloud of suspicion surrounding that investigation, said Two Rivers Police Chief Joe Collins. That was back in the day of Prohibition, and it was suspected that he may have been working on an alcohol case of some sort. June 15, 1970, Emma Fick, 76, was killed when an unknown assailant repeatedly bashed her head into a tombstone. In St. Mary's, in St. Mary Catholic Cemetery in Manitowoc, her purse was found in the scene and nothing appeared to have been taken. She was not sexually assaulted. So someone took this 76-year-old woman's head and just bashed it into a tombstone repeatedly. On June 15, 1970. Actually, surprisingly, that was not Halloween. So this is the murder of Mrs. Emma Fick. In 1970, Elmer Scherer was chief police for the city of Manitowoc. Elmer, if you'll recall, is a first cousin to Dolores Avery. In June of that year, the body of an elderly widow named Emma Fick was found in St. Mary's Cemetery on the city's south side. The coroner determined that she'd been killed by numerous blows to the head. Okay, so apparently the Roll brothers and their involvement in the death of Mary Glander, these guys were brought up in suspe as suspects in Mrs. Fick's murder, but the DA determined there was no connection. So apparently Mrs. Fick had a son who told authorities she was planning on moving into a nursing home. And Emma Fick's husband had passed away years before in a quite an odd fashion. So let's continue the Twin Peaks craziness here. Flies responsible for man's death, August 5th, 1921, the Journal Times. Flies were the indirect cause of the death of Oscar Fick, town of Newton Farmer, who was kicked by a horse. Fick had gone into the barn to feed the animal, which had been bothered by flies. While in the stall, he was struck in the abdomen by a hind foot of the horse. When he failed to return to the house, his wife went to the stables and found her husband groaning and helpless. He was removed to the local hospital, died after suffering for 20 hours. He was 28 years old. I mean, it is curious. Like, how often... It would be curious if Manitoba County, even back during this time period if they had proportionally higher killed-by-horse deaths than any other plays. And so Fick's maiden name was Karsten. She has four brothers. One of them was named Herman. And her brother, Herman, was the sheriff of Manitoba County from 1929 to 1932. Prior to that, he was the chairman of Manitoba County Board of Supervisors. Does any other town or county have this many strange murders all surrounding law enforcement or law enforcement families? I mean, it's just kind of weird, especially with a population that's not that high. Like, it, it just, it makes it, I don't know. I don't know. It's weird. New Year's Day, 1971, Jeffrey Ksida, 18, an honor roll student and recent graduate of Reedsville High School, was found beaten to death along a road near Cato in Manitowoc County. The Waikasha Daily Freeman reported on January, 1st, uh, January 8th, 1971, Dennis Faber was arrested at a manufacturing plant in Two Rivers and charged with the murder. On September 17th, 2016, however, USA Today published an article about memorials for the deaths of Roque and Xida, stating that to date no one has been charged in the homicide. 
And here is a newspaper clipping, January 20th, 1971, Faber Freed, Doe Probe Considered. So they did not, not ordered, bound over for a trial in the death of Jeffrey Xida. The DA's office is contemplating a possible John Doe investigation. Faber had been held in the county jail without bond since the early evening, January 7th, when he was arrested at his place of employment at Two Rivers. So I guess there was no evidence against him. Why was he why was he arrested in the first place? Who knows? Was that another frame up that didn't that simply couldn't stick or didn't stick? July 10th, 1972, Mary Glander, 88, was beaten to death in her apartment after which several things were reportedly stolen and two fires set. Randall Rawl, likely a relative of Rick Rawl. Wow. See Ricky Hochstetler. Rick Roll, Rick Rawl, man, is charged with the murder based on the testimony of Sue Nelson, 13, despite eight alibi witnesses and the state failing to present any of the supposedly stolen items. That is echoes of Stephen Avery as well. Then, of course, there's the Deborah Sukawati case, which we went over prior. This is a cousin of Carmen Woodwell. Disappeared September 24th, 1977, a day after the fall equinox. Her body was later found in a gravel pit owned by the Redont family. Curious. Teresa Hallback's sprinkled remains might have been on the Redont properly as well. A local Ronald Fankel was arrested. He maintains his innocence to this day. The Redont family wields powerful influence in Mantua. They have served as directors of various community associations and of the county bank. Members of the family have also belonged to the Knights of Columbus. One member of the family is married to the only granddaughter of a top officer of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office. The Redonts owned a hunting cabin situated directly behind the Avery property, and also several gravel pits and quarries where police found flesh, blood, and charred bones. Joshua Redont was the first person to report a bonfire on the Avery property, which every member of the family denied until after repeated police interviews. January 22, 1980, the body of Irene Rodig, 43, had been found naked and bound by rope after officers responded to a suspicious fire at her residence. How many suspicious fires are there in Manitoba County as well? Rodig was mentally challenged and had worked for the Holiday House, a workshop for people with mental disabilities. Nothing had been stolen, no motive, nor suspects were ever established. Rodig had been speaking to her mother when the doorbell rang approximately two hours before the fire. Her mother asked if she should hang on, and Rodig told her not to, as she knew who was at the door. Forensics tests confirmed that she had intercourse within 48 hours of her death. Mary J. Ziegelbauer, a student at Marquette, was found brutally raped and murdered in Manitowoc County January 24th, 1983, allegedly by a juvenile who had been released from police custody less than 24 hours earlier. Wow, is this shades of uh, Gregory Allen, too, just being under police surveillance and then the police surveillance removed just in time for the Berenstain assault? Weird. Her father, Robert, was the Manitoba County Executive in 2005 and one of the top officials who issued direct orders inexplicably banning the county coroner from the Avery property during the Hallback murder investigation. Is it also weird that all of these officials or individuals have family members that are connected to all of these bizarre murders and unsolved crimes. I mean, is that weird to anybody? I don't know. May 13th, 1984, tax auditor Thomas Dresser died in Manitowoc County after drinking cyanide-laced Coca-Cola. The investigation was presided over by Sheriff Thomas Kuserik and DA Dennis Vogel, the key figures in the cover-up of the 85 Bjornsson assault. Days later, Vogel announced that their investigation had concluded that the victim committed suicide. <laughs> he laced his own Coca-Cola with cyanide instead of just taking the cyanide. <laughs> on November 30th, 1984, on the eve of the Greater Feast, Louise Frank, 64, disappeared without a trace and has never been found. October 1st, 1988, Sherry Spaeth Duval, 38, disappeared without a trace has never been found. November 15th, 1988, Marianne Den, a friend and employee of Dave Bogotka was found in her bed covered in blood. Her boyfriend was initially arrested, though the police later changed the story and bizarrely deemed it a heart attack. 
The Gattaca claims that Den was being harassed by members of the occult-based club that he claims existed in Manitowoc and that she was sleeping with a gun because she was in fear of them. When he suggested they contact the police, she replied, they are the police. November 2nd, 1990, All Souls Day. The body of Nathan Terrence II was found floating in, Ma in, in Manitowoc River. The father was arrested and convicted, but strong evidence later emerged showing he was railroaded and that his wife and her paramour may have killed the baby. The truth remains unclear. And if you haven't checked out Coincidence County, I, I went over some of these cases in that as well. Pamela Claflin was brutally raped murdered around the fall equinox of 1993 after leaving a bar in Manitowoc. The man who was arrested and convicted, Randall Matea, maintains his innocence to this day. It later emerged that one of the state's witnesses, a convict, received a sentence reduction and beyond that, money for his testimony. It also later emerged that a reputedly corrupt police officer with scars on his face had been pulled over while off duty and had the victim's personal effects in his glove compartment. One significant revelation was that the rape kit tests were actually negative for Matea, not positive, as Deputy Sheriff Gene Koosh, who played a key role in framing Avery for the 85 assault, falsely presented them in perjured testimony during the trial. Koosh served with the U.S. Army security agencies in Vietnam and may have participated in the Phoenix program. Officer Dale Ten Haken of the Manitowoc PD was killed execution style with shots to the head and abdomen on the fall equinox, 1997. I mean, these equinoxes seem very, very popular to, to commit murders. Two teenagers were arrested and convicted on the testimony of their girlfriends who escaped possible charges by turning state's evidence. They had been captured with the assistance of Julie Kramer, who later resurfaced in the Hallback investigation. Both young men were represented by public defender Len Kaczynski, the Army intelligence asset who worked hand-in-hand -hand with the state to deliberately sabotage Brendan Dassey's defense. True to form, Kaczynski began airing to the press that his client's story was hard to believe. One of the alleged killers now practices witchcraft in prison. Ricky Hochstetter was killed in a hit-and-run in 1999 that was investigated by many of the same police personnel later involved in the cover-up of the 2005 murder of Teresa Hallback. There were persistent reports that a police officer had killed him purportedly accidentally while driving drunk. Among the early suspects were Sheriff Tom Kusarek and Rob Herman, who is now the sheriff. Another was Rick Rawl, who knew Stephen Avery and to whom Avery had placed a 40-second phone call to on Halloween 2005 when Hallback disappeared. The circumstances surrounding this call have never been established. And I suppose a dedicated episode to Ricky Hochstetter is in the works because that's a bizarre case as well. And then, of course, Teresa Hallback, which we won't go into. Carmen Bootwell, we won't go into. We already went over all of that. So let's continue here, though. November 26, 2008, hunters found the remains of Arirat Chuprevich, who had been missing for five years in a shallow grave near the line dividing Manitowoc and Brown counties. She had been shot to death. Her husband was a retired doctor, and, and she had been pursuing a degree in international studies at St. Norbert College. In 2014, there were reports that a number of people had been murdered in Manitowoc County in a very short period of time, some at a local sports bar. The police denied these rumors, though some locals believed the murders were being covered up by police a reaction that suggests such things aren't uncommon in Manitowoc County. So that's weird. So there was supposedly a whole lot of murders in a short period of time at a local sports bar. So I'd be curious how they were reported. Were they just reported as occurring elsewhere or innocent death or more innocent deaths? Who knows? And then, of course, February 13th, 2016, shortly after the release of Making a Murderer and a day after the occult holidays in bulk and Candlemas, Cor Yang was shot to death in Manitowoc after answering his door. Yang had been arrested on Halloween 2005, the date of Hallback's disappearance. Manitowoc local Stephen Grimm had committed suicide July 1st, 2016. He had posted on Reddit that he knew Tom Kusarek's daughter, Nancy. He alleged that she and her brother had been subjected to horrific physical and sexual abuse in the basement of their home. He also alleged that Kusarek had hit Ricky Hochstetter. He claimed he was being harassed by police, and it was shortly afterwards was found dead. Grimm, who had served in the Navy from 74 to 77, was well regarded in the community. 
However, he had been arrested earlier in the year after breaking into a school while high on drugs. He reportedly thought he was a knight. So there are actually some, some more, there's quite a bit more madness here going back even farther. September 4th, 1858, three brothers named Thomas of the town of Mishicot, Manitowoc County, Wisconsin, have been arrested on the charge of beating a bohemian whom they met in the road so as to occasion his death. The bohemian population of the town were much excited and threatened to lynch the parties who were kept in jail for their own safety. Then we have October 6, 1880. 17-year-old girl in Wisconsin confesses to killing her mistress because she scolded her. Hmm. December 9, 1905. Son's awful crime slays mother with flat iron then mutilates the body thought to be insane. I went over these on uh, Coincidence County episodes, so you can check these out if you want more details on them. May 23rd, 1940, Manitowoc. Mother kills son so he can join some dead boy. Hmm. February 5th, 1969, Manitowoc. Vietnam veteran held in shotgun slaying of his father. So let's go farther down some of these occult rabbit holes. This is cultofweird.com, November 16, 2019, by Charlie Hintz. Another trip down the weird back roads of Wisconsin in search of Satan and other wholesome family activities. So the Miro Manufacturing Company in Manitowoc, once one of the world's largest manufacturer of aluminum cooking utensils, whose early offerings were showcased at the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago, and the entrance still stands to the demolished factory. Okay, Wendigo Fest. Wendigo Fest is an annual Halloween gathering held in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. With three days of live music, sideshow performances, haunted cemetery tours, celebrity guests, and more, it's becoming the largest Halloween festival in the state. Predictably, it sparked controversy from Manitowoc's Christian community in its first year. One local business owner in particular seems to have made it her mission to save everyone's souls from eternal damnation. Jody Dubinsky, owner of Treasures in downtown Manitowoc, said this festival is darker than it seems on the surface. She became concerned when her own research turned up old Native American tales of a creature called the Wendigo, sometimes spelled Wendigo with an E, which eats human beings and devours their souls particularly young children. But that's not all. The festival was held on the first weekend of the Halloween season that year, October 6th and 7th. 6 plus 7 woefully equals the unlucky number 13. And if that's not bad enough, the costume parade was planned to go backward up a one-way street. Clearly the work of the devil himself. <laughs> so apparently they picked Manitowoc for this. Very curious. Continuing on here, what I'm actually working up to is that while some fret that the Wendigo Fest brings Satan to Manitowoc, the city is no stranger to weird and evil. It is, of course, the setting of the controversial true crime docuseries Making a Murder on Netflix, and if this guy is, is to be believed, may even be home to a secret satanic club comprised of Manitowoc's elite who hold their rituals in an abandoned haunted school in St. Nazian's. Places of spirits. In other countries over the years, people recognized the places of power. Neil Gaiman wrote in his 2001 novel, American Gods. Sometimes it would be a natural formation. Sometimes it would just be a place that was somehow special. They knew something important was happening there that it was some focusing point, some channel, some window to the imminent. And so they would build temples or cathedrals or erect stone circles or, well, you get the idea. That particular passage was in reference to roadside attractions like Wisconsin's own House on the Rock, but it's an idea that can fit into a slightly more broad perspective as well. Dotted with effigy burial mounds and brimming with ancient lore, the physical and spiritual landscape of Wisconsin is largely shaped by its Native American heritage, 
and their mystical places of power. The name Manitoba, for example, is said to derive from an Anishinaabe word for the area that translates roughly to the dwelling of the Great Spirit, or a similar word from the Menamini language meaning place of the spirits. Is there something intangible about certain places that stirs up concentrated levels of strange activity? If so, the Manitoba area may be one such vortex of weird. The city sits on the shore of Lake Michigan and has its roots in Great Lakes shipping and shipbuilding. But for explorers of the strange and unusual like you and me, Manitowoc is significant for a few more peculiar points of interest, which I vowed to visit next time I was in town. Then he goes on to talk about chocolate, but then he talks about Sputnik. Wow, Sputnik 4 spacecraft was launched into space May 15, 1960 to study life support systems that were later used in the manned Vostok craft. Four days later, when it was supposed to return to Earth, the re-entry procedure was botched and Sputnik went off course. The craft ascended into a higher orbit from which it would not return for over two years. The, de the descent model finally re-entered Earth's atmosphere September 5, 1962, breaking up and scattering chunks of smoldering mold for miles. Residents of Manitowoc reported seeing as many as 24 pieces falling from the sky that morning, some plummeting toward the ground with a sound like thunder. At the intersection of North 8th and Park, just feet from the Rar West Art Museum, a 20-pound piece, piece of debris embedded itself in the street. Two police officers on patrol spotted the chunk of metal in the street and believed it fell off a truck, decided to leave it. It wasn't later when they heard the news about Sputnik that they realized what they had found. And apparently the brass ring is in, still in the street there today, and there's also the annual Sputnik Fest, which is held there. Curious, curious. Then we also have the haunted World War II submarine. The USS Cobia submarine at the Manitowoc Maritime Museum. The USS Cobia was launched in 1943 and sank 13 Japanese vessels during its World War II study. Today, the Cobia serves as an international memorial to submariners at Manitowoc's Maritime Museum. And it may still be the home of one particular crewman who didn't leave his post alive. The Cobia did see some action in World War II and a gentleman was killed on one of the guns. A cult of weird reader said in an email a few years ago, To this day, they say he haunts the submarine. My pastor's daughter used to be a tour guide on the submarine and can tell you stories about dropping keys to the grate on the floor and returning with them hanging on the wall. Huh. Then we, of course, have the Lake Michigan Triangle, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, paranormal activity on the Great Lakes. This was in atlasobscura.com. Beside the Bermuda Triangle, few areas in the world have a reputation for the bizarre like the Lake Michigan Triangle. Although it is relatively unknown on a global scale, especially compared to Bermuda, it has a storied history of the unexplained as any place on Earth. Stretching from Ludington to Benton Harbor, Michigan, and to Manitowoc, Wisconsin, the Lake Michigan Triangle, Triangle has inspired numerous accounts of activity that are difficult to explain by rational thought. The mystery began in 1891 when a schooner named Thomas Hume set off across the lake to pick up lumber. Almost overnight, in a torrent of wind, the Thomas Hume disappeared along with his crew of seven sailors. The wooden boat was never found, and an extensive search failed to recover even a piece of driftwood. After the turn of the century, strange events happened at steady intervals. One of the more mysterious is the case of Rosa Bell. In 1921, 11 people inside the ship, who were all members of the Benton Harbor House of David, disappeared, and their ship was found overturned and floating in Lake Michigan. While it appeared that the ship had been damaged in a collision, no other ship had reported an accident and no other remains had been found. Many found the incident particularly eerie because the Rosa Bell had been rebuilt after an earlier wreck in the 19th century, very similar to the one in 1921. A legend around these incidents grew, reports flew in from around the Triangle claiming that a variety of strange occurrences happened during passage through the area. Some claimed the Triangle was a part-time portal and that it either slowed up or sped up time immensely during the passage. Others maintained that UFOs were seen in the area or reported bright lights in the sky. Over the years, chilling personal accounts bolstered the legend, and soon many were writing about strange weather phenomena or just a great feeling of uneasiness while navigating inside the swath of lake.
Throughout the 20th century, thousands made their way through the triangle, and they have yet to document anything supernatural. Although personal experiences have varied, the legend has grown powerful enough as an entity unto itself to keep many away from the triangle. Whether out of general caution or real fear of being the next to disappear, the superstitious make careful navigation to avoid the Lake Michigan Triangle. Speaking of UFOs, we also have to look at the 1968 incident in Manitowoc. So this was actually a USA Today Network Wisconsin article, Meredith Gudzinski, June 7th, 2019. On January 21st, 1968, more than 25 people saw a round, dark, gray object about the size of a hot air balloon in the sky. One witness claimed the object appeared to drop sparks and debris as it moved through the air. Ultimately, the object landed at Berg Farm, which is in the Madison area. Already at the farm was a sheriff's deputy and three kids from the neighborhood. A witness recalling the event said someone saw something on the ground on the Berg Farm. The farmer recovered a piece of metal from the UFO crash and gave it to an investigative journalist called mysteriously Mr. S in the story. Does this sound like Roswell? If you haven't checked out our Roswell podcast, check that out. The investigative journalist was staying at the local Holiday Inn while he was putting his piece together. A bit later, the farmer telephoned the journalist to inform him that someone claiming to be a fertilizer salesman came snooping around and was especially inquisitive about the piece of metal that he had passed along. The farmer was becoming increasingly very nervous and wanted to see the investigative journalist in person again. The journalist, now feeling a bit more nervous himself, hid the piece of metal in the back of the TV set in his motel room instead of carrying it with him as he had been doing previously. As a precaution, Mr. S asked the hotel staff to keep an eye on his room while he was away meeting with the farmer. Not completely surprisingly, a maid would later report seeing two men rifling through the belongings in his room. At his meeting with Mr. S, the farmer told him he wanted the metal chunk returned to him. After his conversation with the so-called fertilizer salesman, he now thought the metal object might be a national security risk. Mr. S returned to the Holiday Inn feeling a little disappointed he had to return the object. Can you believe this? Like in the 60s, people actually return what they're asked to. Upon his arrival, he found the two men waiting for him in his room. They told him he had something in his possession that they wanted him to hand over. Naturally, they were referring to the chunk of metal the farmer had given him and that it was their job to pick it up. Mr. S wisely asked to see some identification. They responded by asking him which agency ID he would like to see and that they would gladly produce it. Wow, that's curious. Eventually, after more conversation, Mr. S was persuaded to give the piece of metal to the two men. Afterward, the investigative journalist called a friend, Mr. Steiger, who helped him track the license plate of the two men who had come to the Holiday Inn to pay him a visit. Turns out the car was owned by a gentleman with links to the CIA. That's right, folks. A Roswell-style incident took place right here in Wisconsin. That story came from a book titled UFO Wisconsin, A Progress Report by Noah Voss. This story was from 1968, but in April of this year alone, 355 national UFO sightings were reported to the National UFO Reporting Center. Okay, so this was in the Manitowoc area. That is very curious, is it not? So there you have it. A lot of occult and strange activity in Manitowoc, the Manitowoc area. It's just a never-ending stream. It really does not seem to be like other areas in any way either in law enforcement or just all of these bizarre cases throughout history and even uh, some kind of paranormal occult activity. So I hope you guys enjoyed another edition of Mindshock True Crime in the Stephen Avery series. You can support the channel, donate to our PayPal, just check the link in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for taste, topic, logical analysis, co-podcaster requests. Questions, comments, theories, not suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, just leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.
you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire, and you are listening to the Stephen Allen Avery series of Making a Murderer Fame. This is episode 39, The Mike Bushman Chronicles. This episode has been a long time in the making, examining the enigma that is Deputy Mike Bushman of the esteemed Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. And uh, (laughs) we will be going over everything and anything Mike Bushman. As always, if you find the Mind Shock podcast interesting and informative, want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Like and share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon to help spread the word about wrongful convictions such as this one as well as others. Patrons do get a priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. So Bushman was, of course, one of these guys who just happened to come out of retirement as soon as there's a missing person. <laughs> he was one of the officers who actually physically arrested Stephen Avery in the 1985 frame-up by Manitowoc County regarding the Penny Bernstein assault. We've gone over that many times. Make sure you've listened to the other podcasts or are at least well familiar with the case, not just making a murderer, because that was a highly biased documentary, only highlighting about 1% of Manitowoc County and the state of Wisconsin corruption. I mean, just really, really small, minute highlighting of the rampant corruption going on in that county and state. So Bushman, as soon as... So, so Teresa Hallback goes missing, and all of a sudden, everyone just assumes it's Avery. As soon as the word Avery is uttered, Mike Bushman all of a sudden scrambles to come out of retirement to pin this on Avery. Does anybody find that suspicious? <laughs> I mean, this is the same circle of individuals involved in the 85 frame-up framing Stephen Avery when there wasn't a $36 million lawsuit on the line. Very, very curious. I mean, if there are any guilters left, that I mean, I don't know how they would explain that. But let's go over a few posts here. This is from TikTok Manitowoc, one of the only non-sham subreddits regarding the Stephen Avery case. This was posted by Eddie Beavy, the curious case of Deputy Bushman. One big player in the game that has flown under the radar, but seems to be one of the more well-connected officers, is a gentleman named Mike Bushman. Some brief history on Deputy Bushman. One of the arresting officers from the 85 rape case. Retired prior to 2005. Retains part-time reserve deputy with Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office, signed into the Avery Salvage Yard for the November 7th search at 7.38 a.m. So this is just for the search. (laughs) Leads the search that finds the evidence in the burn barrel. Wow, what a coincidence. Also leads the team that finds the Cuss Road burial site. Another coinky dink. But the oddity with Bushman does not stop with the Avery case. Most people on this sub know of the Hochstetler case. So this is the MTSO report, January 28th, 1999. 1,300 hours. There was a meeting on the second floor of the administration. Officers present were Deputy Jost, Deputy P. Herman, Deputy A. Coburn, Deputy Glazier, Detective Sergeant Lank, C.I. Gene Koosh. Inspector Peterson and me, Lieutenant Mike Bushman. This is quoted from the report. Officers were advised that Deputy Herman was now assigned to this case full-time and will be spearheading the investigation follow-up duties. I was assigned to crack down all Crime Stopper reports and file them together in one location. Detective Nicholson was assigned to provide computer programming to help with timeline, suspects, and suspect vehicles. 
Deputy Glazier, Deputy Jost, and Deputy Coburn were assigned to check suspect vehicles and follow up on Crime Stopper reports. Detective Sergeant Lake and C.I. Cooch will organize. Detective Conrad will help with the investigation if needed. Deputy Herman will do follow up investigation of suspects associates, coordinate and update and maintain a current list of suspect names and vehicles for the follow up. So this is two and a half weeks into the investigation. Notice some familiar names. So this seems to be the crew that comes in to cover up any uh, shady business. Anytime there's shady business in Manitoba County, these guys seem to be the usual suspects. So he was also asked to start a probe that on the allegations that Herman and his brother had been involved and declined. <laughs> These individuals do not investigate themselves. Why is the retired arresting officer from the 85 case involved in a police investigation that has been turned over to Calumet County because of conflict of interest? How is this not guy not higher on our list of crooked cops in the county? So many questions with this guy. Edit. He's also connected to the Carmen Bootwell overdose. October 2001, Bootwell was cremated at a funeral home owned by the spouse of Lieutenant Mike Bushman, who was one of the officers who arrested Avery in 85 and who later participated in the search of the area in and around Avery Auto Salvage. Wow, is this coincidence stack high enough for even the most devout coincidence theorist? Does anybody find that strange? So, <laughs> Carmen Bootwell, the cousin of Teresa Hallbeck. Now, if you haven't checked out the Bootwell episode, make sure you check that out. I mean, just highly suspicious under many counts. But his, uh, his in-laws own this funeral home where it just so happens that she's cremated. Again, not the only funeral home in the area. This isn't the middle of absolute nowhere. There's a decent-sized population in that county. So a lot of different funeral homes out there. So the, the, the response is here. Bushman was retired. His wife's funeral home cremates Bootwell. Then he shows up to volunteer search and, and finds the remains in the burn barrel and the Cuss Road burial ground, which was marked off, and Lincoln Coburn secure the scene. Isn't it kind of funny that nobody except Bushman is able to find anything? <laughs> it's Bushman, Lincoln, Coburn that, that are finding everything. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird, kind of weird. They have to have a guy come out of retirement to find stuff. <laughs> Why isn't anybody else finding anything? You can't make this expletive up. Even if the remains are Teresa Hallbacks, Mike Bushman's in-laws, which I'm sure at that age he's very close with, own a funeral home with, crema with cremation capabilities. He could have burned Teresa Hallback or taken some of Bootwell's remains, shown up at Avery's, and planted the bones to get his buddies and himself off the hook for their 1985 frame job. And again, this whole investigation was turned over to Calumet County. So why are all of these Manitoba County Sheriff's officers even coming out of retirement, coming out of the woodwork to plant evidence? Kind of weird. Why are they even there? He had motive himself. It looked like there was going to be a deep dive into the entire Penny Bernstein case. And certainly some of the players involved would roll over on each other. So he seals the deal in the sketchiest aspect of this entire case. The mystery remains. I can't believe this hasn't been discussed more frequently over the years. So another interesting post here by user since deleted. I mean, the coincidence stack is just going to get higher. Who, who played basketball with the Calumet County coroner? And I mean, these researchers, I mean, they go deep. They go deep. So they dug up articles from November 29th, 1969, Manitowoc Herald Times. And Mike Bushman is indeed a basketball player. Who was called in with the K-9 unit to help investigate a vicious sexual assault in the city of Manitowoc just two weeks before the attack on Penny Bernston? Oh yeah, that guy again. And yeah, he married into a family that has been in the funeral home business for a long time in Manitowoc and Valders, but his wife is not involved in the business, but that doesn't mean that he couldn't pull a favor or two, though. 
What is much more interesting is the Sipple funeral home. You have Deputy Sipple playing a key role in the burn pit bonds. You have a client of Teresa Hallback's named Craig Sipple. And there's a funeral home in New Halstein named Sipple Funeral Home. The Sipple and Hallback families are very prominent in that area. Many Hallbacks have used the Sipple Funeral Home over the years, and their families are even connected through marriage. Wow. Okay. So apparently, law enforcement are just involved in the funeral home business and salvage yard business. How convenient to cover up anything that needs to be covered up. Very convenient. Holy, on the other responses here, holy expletive, I knew I knew the name. Remember the hit and run of Ricky Hostetler in 1999? Well, yup, Deputy Bushman was head of the investigation. Here is where it is reported on the connection. USA Today Network, Wisconsin, John Farrak, Missteps Hamper, 1999, hit and run death probe. Ricky Hostetler was killed walking home from her friend's house during a snowstorm in 1999. The hit and run driver was never identified. The cold case has been plagued for years of long-standing allegations of a cover-up involving the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. See, the other thing about the coincidence theorists, the authority-worshipping cultists, they keep hallucinating that there's no way that Manitowoc is corrupt where you have just this history of corruption in all these cases. I mean, it's not like it's just one or two cases. I mean, it's seemingly all these cases reported on in the newspapers about these allegations of corruption. The demonstrable 1985 frame-up of Stephen Avery. I mean, how many other cases do we not even know about where there's frame-ups? I mean, the most shocking th thing at this point is how sloppy the frame-ups and cover-ups are. So perhaps, I mean, I don't know. This is all just really, really weird. But continuing with this article here, from the start, the criminal investigation into the 99 hit-and-run death of teenager Ricky Hostetler was seriously flawed. And was that by design? From insufficient follow-up to the discovery of vehicle parts near the pedestrian's killing to the failure to seek assistance from the Wisconsin Department of Justice or the Wisconsin State Patrol to using faulty evidence collection procedures... Is that kind of like not switching gloves between examining Avery's Grand Am and the uh, RAV4, which may or may not have been Teresa Hallbacks, on the Avery Salvage Yard property? <laughs> the missteps may have prevented the boy's killer from being brought to justice, a review by U.S. Today Network Wisconsin found. Shortly after Hostetler, 17, was struck while walking home on the side of the country road, residents in rural Manitowoc County began finding broken vehicle parts in the snow. On the morning of the fatality, Robert Jeffrey of Newton found parts scattered in the snow at the seldom used intersection of Center and Newton Roads in rural Newton. If the fleeing driver had turned onto Center Road, the village of Cleveland was about five minutes away. Several sources who had ties to the investigation suspected that the hit-and-run driver was probably headed towards Cleveland. But this critical clue soon fell by the wayside under the direction of Lieutenant Mike Bushman, the road deputy put in charge of the homicide by then Manitowoc County Sheriff Tom Kucerich. Another familiar name here. According to Bushman's report, the Newton resident was unable to tell me which direction the suspect vehicle may have went after the pieces fell off. Another major misstep occurred just five days after the fatality. Who's who in Ricky Hostetler's homicide? On the day of Hostetler's funeral, multiple car parts were visible in the thawing snow at the far edge of the victim's driveway along Manitowoc County CR. The boy's body was found 50 yards up the road. The parts were right up the road, Manitowoc resident Sylvia Schmidt told USA Today Network Wisconsin. I just remembered... I was thinking this doesn't look like it had been weathered. The parts appeared to be a section of headlight housing with letters and numbers stamped into it. Manitowoc Sheriff's Deputy Jason Jost reported at the time. <laughs> Another familiar name. I also observed three other pieces of plastic lying just around the corner, Jost's January 15, 1999 report stated. All four of, of the parts appeared to be from a newer style car, Jost wrote. 
There had been no other recent collisions along the two-lane highway around the time of her son's death, said Debbie Hostetler, the victim's mother. Nevertheless, Bushman determined that these fresh car parts were not relevant to his investigation. <laughs> You really can't make this stuff up, people. I mean, is it possible that all of these Manitoba County Sheriff's officers, they just simply have some kind of mental disabilities? They're just not operating with a full deck, and it's incompetence instead of corruption? Or maybe it's a mix of both. Perhaps it's a mix of both. But, I mean, how dumb do they have to be to think that other people will just lap this stuff up with zero critical thinking? I mean, it's kind of weird from that perspective. Kind of weird. I checked with Lieutenant Bushman, and due to the fact that the pieces looked newer, he did not believe they belonged to the suspect vehicle on the hit-and-run fatality. Just wrote his 99 report. At this time, no further follow-up will need to be done. <laughs> so the solution is just to not investigate at all because they look kind of new. I mean, do they have all these other solid leads that they're, they're, they're working on? Like, they got nothing, and then they're saying this is also nothing. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is just mind-boggling, mind-shocking, if you will. It was probably part of the vehicle that killed Ricky, she told USA Today Network Wisconsin. Document state gives Manitowoc County suggestions to solve the Hochstetler hit-and-run. DCI interviews Rob Herman's ex-girlfriend. <laughs> A review of the Sheriff's Department's case file indicated Manitoba County never explored the possibility that a car might be involved in the crime. I mean, yeah, hit and run, definitely no car involved. <laughs> oh, man, just when you think this case can't get any crazier, like the way they investigate other cases in Manitoba, I mean, at least they're consistent. I mean, you got to give them that. They seem to be consistent. <laughs> Within hours of the overnight crash, juvenile detention center Lieutenant Rob Herman, now the county sheriff, assured Bushman that the hit-and-run vehicle was an 85 to 88 Chevy truck Suburban or Blazer. I mean, how would he know? <laughs> Unless he was the one who did it. Days later, Bushman speculated that the tiny pieces of broken grill found along the rural highway may also belong to an 88 to 91 full-size van. It seemed that every decision Herman and Bushman made put Manitoba County further away from identifying Ricky Hochstetler's killer. I mean, is it possible this level of stupidity is not corruption or cover-up? Is it possible? I mean, I don't know. Manitoba County Sheriff Robert Herman, a misdirected investigation. Within hours of the crime, Herman directed the law enforcement agency to obtain a larger master vehicle registry from the state based solely on vehicles he wanted Manitowoc County to look for. So basically, if he was the perpetrator or he knew the perpetrator and they wanted to cover it up, he would clearly have the means and ability to make sure nobody looked in the right direction. <laughs> UPS overnight delivered a large packet from the DOT of all 85 to 88 Chevrolets and 85 to 88 GMC trucks Bushman wrote in his January 14th, 1999 report. Contact was made with several local police administrators by phone, and a request for assistance was made. This was a recipe for disaster, the DCI discovered several years after the fact. There were numerous instances when Manitowoc deputies inadvertently checked the same vehicle three or four times. <laughs> I mean, again, is it possible this is just sheer stupidity? Is it possible? Is Hanlon's razor a factor in the Hochstetler? In the Penny Bernston in the Teresa Hallback cases. Is it a factor? Never mistake for malice what can adequately be explained by stupidity. This is what Bushman told state agents in 2004. Bushman stated that the Wisconsin Department of Transportation provided the Sheriff's Department with a list of approximately 25,000 vehicles in a five-county area that matched the description of the striking vehicle and all of them were cleared. Seriously, they checked 25,000 vehicles? I, I find that hard to believe that they have this kind of diligence just, just based on all these other things, but anyway. Timeline of key events in Manitowoc County's hit-and-run death of Ricky Hochstetler. The DCI, however, was troubled by Manitowoc County's overall investigation methods on Hochstetler's case. In reviewing the reports, many of the vehicles that were reportedly cleared do not have detailed descriptions of how they were cleared. Special Agent Eric Setkowski advised Bushman. 
This review assumes that every officer did a physical inspection of every vehicle, looking closely for signs of repaired, replaced parts in areas that were damaged or could have been damaged. If each officer for each vehicle inspected did not follow that procedure, there is a possibility that the striking vehicle was missed. Even though there were strong suspicions that the hit-and-run driver had roots in southern Manitoba County, given the hit-and-run driver's path of travel, Bushman and Herman's decisions kept department efforts focused elsewhere. <laughs> I mean, you cannot make this stuff up. How the web is weaved with the same names coming up again and again. So also interesting, some people dug up these old newspaper articles from 1965 regarding all of these individuals, Herman, Pfeffer, and even Scott Tadiaisache's grandfather, Victor Tadiaisache. And apparently they have some, so they founded a bank or something? And then, I mean, they're all connected? That's really weird. I mean, again, you would, obviously some names would continue to come up, but it's just, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Hmm. Weird. So apparently... Scott Tadiaisache's grandfather was uh, a prominent member of the business community in Manitowoc. Perhaps the apple fell very far from the tree, skipping a generation. Okay. So this Pfeffer funeral home, this is Mike Bushman's wife's family's funeral home, as we mentioned before. Okay. So a lot of coincidences regarding Mike Bushman. I mean, does it, does it strike anyone else as odd that he just randomly comes out of retirement and shows up on a location that, that has been ceded to a different county due to conflict of interest and just starts so-called investigating and happens to be the one to find all this so-called evidence in the barrel, cuss road, everything. Does anybody else find that weird? And then, of course, his wife's family also cremates Carmen Boudwell's uh, remains, which uh, may have been swapped for haulbacks. I mean, clearly, Bushman has motive, means... And opportunity. Again, this is mind shock. The only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. But we recognize Mike Bushman has motive, means, and opportunity. That's clearly established. A very interesting, uh, some posts here just as a quick recap. Thanks for highlighting Bushman's involvement, though I'm not really sure what to make of any of this. Do you think Hallback was cremated at Bushman's wife's funeral home and that's how he had the bones to plant? If the police were involved in the actual murder and had Hallback's remains, they wouldn't need anything from Carmen Bootwell. And the answer here is, if they didn't have Hallback's remains, then they needed Carmen Bootwell's. This is probably why every piece of evidence of her being dead was not positive because those cremains were not hers. Partial match, in which, of course, Hallback could not be excluded, as well as many other individuals who could not have been excluded from that result, and no teeth. If they had her cremains, like you said, why not positively say that's her? Why the need for a partial match? Why not put up a couple teeth there? It would have been identified quickly, and Ken, Ken, Ken Kratz didn't need to create the perceptions are what they are. So, yeah, that's, that's very, very curious. In which case, is it possible Teresa Hallback was still alive at that time, but they either wanted her dead, either she was some kind of CI, if you haven't checked out the previous episodes about the auto trader fiascos and the possibility that it was a CI, or she just simply had some information on corrupt law enforcement in the area and something happened Maybe they had her, maybe they didn't, maybe they were keeping her alive for a particular reason, or maybe they just didn't have her at that time. Some people believe she's still alive, but either way, whether she's dead or alive, at that time they needed other bones to plant. So another solid post here regarding Bushman being the group leader of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office. 
officers at the scene of which they were not supposed to be at on Avery Salvage Yard. Here's a post by Miss Minkster. Retired Deputy Bushman was the group leader of the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office officers, including so-called bone finder Jost, who, in quotations, discovered the cell phone barrel the morning of November 7th, and not one Calumet County Sheriff's Office deputy anywhere in sight. <laughs> So why was retired Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office Deputy Bushman, who was also one of Stephen Avery's arresting officers in the 1985 frame-up, leading a search of law enforcement officers and not a group of volunteers as stated in the CASO report later that day? So who's, who's fudging these CASO reports? So they said he led a group of volunteers? as opposed to the actual Manitoba County Sheriff's Office deputies who aren't even supposed to be there due to conflict of interest. That's weird. Why didn't Manitoba County Sheriff's Office, Office Deputy Siders mention that Bushman was retired in his testimony or in his report? Manitoba County Sheriff's Office Deputy Siders testimony, day six, page 149. Myself, along with Sergeant Scott Senglaub, Deputy Mike Bushman and Sergeant Jason Jost responded to Avery Road, would be the Avery Salvage Yard, to assist Calumet County Sheriff's Department searching the property. Again, why, ha why is Calumet County not finding anything? I mean, out of all probability. <laughs> what were your responsibilities upon arrival at the scene? We were to make contact with the officer in charge at the scene to get the daily duties. Okay, were you given a specific job that day? We were informed by the OIC officer in charge to get into search groups. The search group I was in was search group A. Our team leader of that search group was Deputy Mike Bushman of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. So in the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office summary report, page 13, November 7, 2005, 0800, I, Deputy Siders, along with Sergeant Sanglaub, Sergeant Jost, and Deputy Mike Bushman responded to Avery Auto Salvage to assist the KSO with searching the property and the surrounding area. The group which I was put in, which was Group A, and the team leader was Deputy Mike Bushman. Also in the group were officers from KSO and volunteer firefighters from surrounding fire departments. And uh, the poster here in brackets, which KSO officers? Because apparently that wasn't verified. While searching the land north of Stephen Avery's residence, a cornfield, I came across a burning barrel which was in my section of area to search. The burning barrel was located out front of Stephen's residence next to the cornfield. And the comment here, contrary to Sider's repeated mentions of the cornfield, this burn barrel is directly in front of Stephen Avery's trailer. So it's a wonder it wasn't discovered sooner, say on the 5th or the 6th. <laughs> I mean, the timeline with all the burn barrels, I went over this all in previous episodes. I mean, nothing really adds up here. But continuing the report here, I approached the burning barrel and looked inside. I observed some burnt, melted plastic items. As I looked closer at the plastic item, it appeared to me to be a cell phone. I noted there was an M emblem on the front of it. It appeared to be the emblem for a Motorola 5 brand cell phone. I showed Sergeant Sanglob these items and he called the team leader, Deputy Mike Bushman, over to look at the items. Deputy Bushman observed the remains of what appeared to be a cell phone, contacted the OIC and informed him we had some items that needed to be looked at by the detectives. We were informed that the DCI would be en route to our location to check out the items. However, based on DCI Heimerl's testimony, it was he and Siler. Okay, anyway, does anybody believe that nobody would have just glanced in the barrels right next to the trailer? <laughs> in the days prior? I mean, really? <laughs> I mean, then again, the RAV4 is not there and the helicopter flyover. So, I mean, make what you will of this case. The DCI did arrive at our location. Uh, however, the commentary here is Heimler and Siler. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> signed in at Avery property at 8 a.m. out at 8.26 at a.m. and then returned at 9.40 a.m. out question mark in at 10.08 a.m. out question mark in at 12.02 out at 1.42 p.m. So this must have been in the 10 a.m. time frame. Back to the report here. They also believe that this was a cell phone. As they looked through the burning, the DCI informed me that they believed there were parts to a camera in there. The DCI informed Sergeant Sanglaub and me, Deputy Siders, that they would take custody of the burning barrel. After the DCI took custody of the burning barrel, Sergeant Sanglaub and I continued our search of the property. Uh, the commentary here is Siders and Sanglaub signed out at 12.30. 
30 p.m. So basically, they're kind of the commentary here is that none of this report adds up. But okay, another theory here. This is going to be another uh, McGuire theory here. Again, I'm not alleging it is true or untrue. So just based on all this information with Bushman, the funeral home, the searches, the timeline's not adding up. Is it possible they did not have Hallback or even her vehicle or her camera or her phone at the time of their plan to plant Carmen Bootwell's bones to be a stand-in for Hallback's bones in this Avery frame up? Now, what if they did have her? Now, again, maybe they maybe they never actually got her, or but possibly they got her cell phone and or camera and or other things at a later time, so they could only plant it later. So they didn't have it to plant in the first days. They had to plant it later. So obviously these burn barrels would have been searched. Obviously all these areas would have been looked at prior, but they, they didn't have the evidence to plant. That's why it shows up later. So this was kind of an evolving plan, so to speak. And then maybe they really did kill Hallback later, but at that point, I mean, what kind of swapping could be done? Because they, do, they did send something to FBI Crime Lab. I mean, there's... There's a lot of moving pieces here. So if the frame-up job evolved as it went along, does that account for all the problems? Because no doubt this is not a perfect frame job by any scope of the imagination. This seems to be a collection of mostly dumb individuals attempting this frame-up job, which is why there's all this obvious, blatant uh, nonsense <laughs> when examining the case. And perhaps one or two people with a little bit of brains, but the timeline was not ideal. Again, Murphy's Law here, for whatever reason, coincidence theorists either think that criminals pull off conspiracies without a hitch, or there is no conspiracy. It's really weird how these Dunning-Kruger goofs, guilters, whoever you want, or in other, cons in other conspiracies too, these coincidence theorists, it's like they're too mentally deficient to understand that, first of all, not all criminals are geniuses, and even if they are, things go wrong, the unexpected happens, not only to geniuses, but also to dumb criminals. So it's not like every conspiracy would go off without a hitch. I mean, this isn't rocket science, but for whatever reason, these goose have a lot of trouble with this. But continuing on here, what happened to team leader Deputy Bushman? This was Bushman's day. Signed it at 7.30 a.m., 7.38 a.m., with Todd Herman, <laughs> another buddy there. Out at question mark, in at 12.50, out at question mark, in at 4.15 p.m., out at 4.45 p.m., in at question mark, out at 5.33 p.m. According to Dietering Report, case of page 137, by 10.35 a.m., retired Manitowoc County Sheriff's Officer, Office Deputy Inspector Michael Bushman had discovered a possible burial site at Cuss Road which tied up he and other queso officers and other DCI most of the afternoon. That is curious. Who were the queso officers with these Manitowoc County Sheriff's deputies during the cell phone barrel discover discovery? There were 24 queso officers signed in during the time frame the barrel was found. Also on the property, Ryan Hillegas and Scott Blodorn. In at 9.03 a.m. and out at 9.53 a.m. So a former boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, allowed on the property. There are no conflict of interest there. Not only does Siders fail to mention which queso officers were on his team, not one queso officer writes a report on the cell phone barrel discovery. The first mention of it is in Baldwin's report, queso page 135. Does anybody else find that suspicious? So... Queso, the, the non-conflict of interest county, supposedly, or at least less conflict of interest, they're not involved in this? They can't verify anything by Bushman and his team? <laughs> I mean, what are the guilters making of all of this information? I mean, the level of mental gymnastics one has to do to hallucinate that this is all on the up and up. I mean, this is in excess of Olympic. This is Olympic level mental gymnastics. I mean, Olympic gymnasts would be jealous of these kind of performances to justify this investigation as legitimate in any way. 
And Baldwin's report, at approximately 1.15 p.m., I was requested to stand by the garage burn barrel at Stephen Avery's house until evidence technicians arrived on scene. I did stand by with this until approximately 3.39 p.m. when the barrel was covered by Calumet County Sheriff's Deputy Ken Matuzak. So another coincidence here, November 7th was Mike Bushman's only day on the Avery property during the nine-day search, but it sure was a productive one. <laughs> So you have all these dozens of officers. They got nothing. Bushman shows up and magically he's getting all this stuff done. He's finding cell phones. He's finding burial sites at Kusra. <laughs> so this rusty, out of practice deputy comes out of retirement and is leading search team. <laughs> on the property of the guy that he arrested and framed for the 1985 Penny Bernstein assault. <laughs> is everybody following this? I mean, this is clearly all on the up and up, right? <laughs> I mean, you really can't make this stuff up. If this was a movie, a Hollywood script, this would get rejected because nobody would believe this level of plot holes that any, any that any that anything would happen this way. <laughs> Man, you can't make this stuff up. Couple more follow-ups here. Was this the day one of the barrels came back and Ertl was dragged away to Cuss Road? The original poster responded here, yes. Dragged away to Cuss Road by Bushman's possible burial site. Isn't that convenient? Another response here, obviously with the tight ship they were running security-wise, <laughs> It wouldn't have been difficult for anyone to come in the front, sign in, then leave, return to the property without being detected. That being said, when you were writing reports after the fact, which I have no doubt they did, you can try to be consistent. But with this with a case this involved, you are bound to trip yourself up. Bushman could not have been the team leader at the same time he was finding a possible burial site elsewhere. Furthermore, why aren't team leaders active duty officers? That way, if there is a discovery or important event, there's an active law enforcement there to document and call the right people, etc. If you think about this, it would be brilliant if law enforcement was conspiring to plant evidence. A retired deputy doesn't have a job to lose or a career to kill. He is already done. Hmm. Response here, exactly. I would chalk it up to Siders getting his report wrong, except he also testified that Deputy Mike Bushman was the team leader. Based on the cross-reference I did with all these half-assed reports, it looks like the cell phone barrel was found around 9 to 9.30, 9.45 at the latest, and DCI met Siders and another officer at the barrel of between 10.15 and 10.30. Bushman was gone after they found that barrel. Could risk having DCI or Queso document he was there, I guess. Couldn't risk that. And makes his Cuss Road ruckus around 10.30. Also, Ryan and Scott were on the property around that time, too. But yeah, why the hell is a retired deputy the team leader for law enforcement? In the case of report, Dietering and I believe Tyson, too, refer to him as retired, but leading a group of volunteers. Another response here, like I said all along, there are only two options to explain this case. Every questionable occurrence, look at the officers around. These officers that keep popping up at the best times or find all the per pertinent evidence, either number one, they are all cognitively impaired to the point they shouldn't or couldn't function as officers, or number two, they knew what was going on and now are playing the game, I wasn't aware, can't recall, didn't know, we aren't supposed to do that, card. Come on, man, somebody knew. So Siders claimed he had turned custody of the barrel over to Heimerl and Seiler after they examined it. This had to be after Heimerl and Seiler's 10.08 a.m. sign-in at the property. In Heimler's testimony on page 153, he says it was in his custody until it was transported to Queso or wherever. Quote, he did not know specifically where it went, end quote. <laughs> Solid chain of custody there. <laughs> But Heimerl and Seiler signed out at some unknown time after they took custody of the barrel, then back at 12.02 p.m. 
At 1.15, it was turned over to Baldwin, and Heimler and Seiler signed out of Avery's at 1.42 p.m. It's not transported to Queso until 3.39 p.m. So it wasn't exactly on Hermes' testimony as he stated in his testimony, in, in Hermes' custody as he stated in his testimony. <laughs> I mean, this is the worst chain of custody ever. I mean, anyone could plant anything at any time. But the actual question Kratz asked was, quote, now evidence this burn barrel included eventually was taken off site or to a central repository or a central place where it is held. Is that your understanding? Hermie responds, yes. WTF kind of question is that? So what I get out of that is that the evidence in the barrel was in Hermes custody and transported to Queso or wherever, but the actual barrel was being guarded by Baldwin and transported to Queso at 339. So basically, it's all shady as hell and made more obvious by the way Kratz parses his words, then quickly moves on to the next subject. Yeah, Ken Kratz is one special kind of prosecutor that can't be denied. <laughs> so another post here, Haimo was also involved in the March 1st and 2nd, 2006 searches of the Avery garage. He found two bullet fragments during this search. One was located in a crack in the floor and did not yield evidence. The other was found towards the rear of the garage. Hallback DNA was extracted from this fragment. That's curious. That is very curious. Huh. Hmm. Some other posts here. What were Scott and Ryan doing there? That's a very good question, probably bringing over Teresa Hallback's cell phone and camera or any cell phone and camera to dump in Bushman's barrel. <laughs> Great post, interesting to say the least. What was Mike Bushman's motive? Definitely a motive. My theory being that the barrel and items were collected and burned somewhere else and then returned for discovery. What was Bushman's motive? I don't know, other than he was involved in Stephen Avery's 85 case. Other than that, he seemed like a pretty decent guy with other news stories I read about him. However, he was involved in the search for Gregory Allen two weeks before Penny Bjornsson was attacked. After the attempted rape and assault on young women who lived near Penny Bjornsson, Bushman was called in to do a search with his canine. This was on July 15, 1985. Penny Bjornsson assault was on July 29th. I don't know if he had a vested interest in getting Stephen Avery convicted because he feared he might somehow get drawn into the civil suit. He knew the perp they were looking for that night was Gregory Allen, and then a week later he arrests Stephen Avery for Penny Bjornsson's assault. And then, of course, uh, the Hochstetler case, he seemed intentionally botched as well, so I don't know if I would call Mike Bushman a good guy. Here's another interesting post. I always had this question. Why did it take them so long to find the barrel at Stephen's house? <laughs> they found Barb's burn barrels on what, the 5th, and hauled them away and brought one back before they found this one. Why didn't they take the one that was right in front of Stephen's plane? <laughs> Who was their chief suspect? <laughs> Maybe because they needed a nice receptacle for their deposit. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Another post here, problem with the barrels are not how many of them and how they've moved in or out. Problem is the dates and its context. The first bones had been found in Barb's barrel number two on November 6th. Bones. Wow, you would think the normal investigation reaction should be high alert. Let's get the coroner here. Let's look around immediately. Let's look inside other barrels and pit at the same date, right? Wrong. <laughs> they did nothing. <laughs> Stephen Avery Bauer was found the day after November 7th, and the pit was not available, occupied by dog. <laughs> and of course, we've gone over that multiple times. Apparently, they don't have any animal control. They don't have any dog handling uh, officers. They simply do not care enough to just draw the dog away with food or whatever, which can easily be done. Okay, two days later, November 8th, and of course, no coroner, no photos, no videos, no grid, nothing. Just a bunch of human bones collected in a garbage bag. Nothing to see here, people. Clearly, this investigation is on the up and up. 
Another response here, big problem with the barrels. They were so compromised, I'm surprised they were admissible at all. Seizing and then returning one of them, what kind of law enforcement does that? Then Ken Kratz tells them, no, you should have kept that barrel, so they go get it again. <laughs> Meanwhile, the chain of custody is broken. I mean, how is their chain of custody in the first place? Looking at all these reports, it looks like there was no, there was no traceable chain of custody in the first place. The barrels, like so much else in this case, became questionable because of their handling of them. Another response, that would have been the perfect day to do it with this distraction taking place. The next day was the day the bones were discovered, the key was found, and the license plates were, plates were found. So basically, once they, a certain narrative was spun, all of a sudden everything could be found where it wasn't found before. Another post here, it is interesting that he came in with Herman. He obviously had no credentials of his own to justify his being there, let alone being assigned as team leader. How on earth were they able to pull off the lie that Calumet was in charge? Another post here, great catch. Every time he signed in, it was either with Herman, Jost, or other Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office. How on earth did they get away with lying about Bushman's status with Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office in court? There is now no piece of crucial evidence in this case that isn't tainted by Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office. That's a great point right there. I mean, is there any evidence that isn't tainted, so to speak? Another response here. With enough time and resources, I think you can line up testimony with reports and other discovery materials, vet the investigation, and find plenty of instances of perjury, false reports, or other potential misconduct. In this instance, the beauty of the setup, if there is one, is Bushman is retired and likely doesn't have to do any reporting or other obligations, and Jost was never called to testify, even though he found the bones and whatnot. Doing advanced cross-checking in real time at trial without knowing who would be called and what their testimony would be in advance would have been hard for the defense to do. <laughs> Last post here, Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office, we're supposed to only be assisting with resources. Hmm, right. I guess this meant providing the resource who arrested him in 1985. No conflict of interest to see here. <laughs> Oh, man, you definitely cannot make this stuff up. So there you have it, the chronicles of Mike Bushman and his uh, circle of good old boys in Manitowoc County. What do all the Mind Shock listeners think of Mike Bushman and the Stephen Avery case and his history with Stephen Avery and these other individuals? Their names just keep popping up. That's it for now. Plenty more to come. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the Mind Shock podcast in the Stephen Avery series. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Help us come out with more mind shocking content to keep up awareness in wrongful convictions, cold cases, missing persons cases, and more. Like and share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.